You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which is separated into two parts. This is lecture one of the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul. Lecture one is entitled The Merging of the Three Spiritual Streams in the Bhagavad Gita, given on December 28, 1912. Today we stand at the point of founding the Anthroposophical Society in its narrower sense. Footnote, Dr. Steiner is referring here to the expulsion of the Anthroposophists from the Theosophical Society. A full account of these events can be found in Gunther Wachsmuth's book, The Life and Work of Rudolf Steiner, pages 186 to 189, available from the Anthroposophic Press, Incorporated. End of footnote. Just at this opportune moment we would do well to remind ourselves of the importance and significance of our cause. What the Anthroposophical Society desires to be for modern culture should not, indeed, be different in principle from what we have always cultivated within our circles here as theosophy. But perhaps giving it a new name may call to mind again the earnestness and dignity with which we intend to work within our spiritual movement. From this viewpoint, the theme of this cycle of lectures has been chosen. At the beginning of our anthroposophical initiative, we will discuss a subject which, in, a most, in the most manifold way, is able to indicate the importance and meaning of our spiritual movement for the cultural life of the present time. Perhaps some may be surprised to find two such different spiritual streams as the great Eastern poem of the Bhagavad Gita and the letters written by one so closely connected with the founding of Christianity the Apostle Paul brought together. Footnote. The title Saint has been omitted in mentioning the Apostle Paul. This is in keeping with the German edition, and its use appears irrelevant in the context of these lectures. And footnote. <clears throat> we can best recognize the nearness of these two spiritual streams if we first indicate the place held in our time by the great Gita and everything connected with it, and then the inthrust of what laid the foundation of Christianity, the thought and work of Paul. Much in spiritual life today differs from what existed only a relatively short time ago, but just this difference makes necessary such a spiritual movement as anthroposophy. Only think how, not long ago, when a man entered into the spiritual life of his time, he had to consider three thousand year periods, one pre-Christian period and two others not quite completed, which have been saturated with the spiritual outstreaming of Christianity. What could such a man have said to himself who stood within the spiritual life of mankind up to a short time ago and could not justify a theosophical or anthroposophical movement as we mean it today? He could have said, At present something is entering spiritual life whose source can only be found in the thousand years preceding the Christian era. For not before this time do individual men as personalities have any meaning for spiritual life. However great and overpowering much in the spiritual streams of earlier times shone out to us, individualities did not stand out from what was the foundation for those streams. We need only look back to the spirituality of the old Egyptian or Chaldean Babylonian epochs to find a continuity in their spiritual life. Personalities as such, spiritually vigorous, came into prominence only in the following Greek period. Great teachings and a sweeping outlook into the far reaches of the cosmos are to be found in the Egyptian age, but only with the Greeks do outstanding figures begin to arise, like Socrates or Pericles, Phidias or Plato, Aristotle. Personality as such comes upon the scene. That is the outstanding characteristic of spiritual life in the last three thousand years. <clears throat> I mean by this not only the important personalities, but the impress spiritual life makes upon every individual personality. If we may say so, in emphasis is put upon personality during these three thousand years. Thereby the spiritual streams become significant in that personalities feel a need to take part in them, finding their inner comfort, hope, peace, inner bliss and security through them. Because until a comparatively short time ago we were only interested in history, insofar as it proceeded from one personality to another, we had no deep understanding of what had occurred before the last three thousand years. 
<clears throat> with Greek civilization began that history that was the only history we had understood until a very short time ago, and at the turn of the first into the second millennium occurred all that was connected with the great being of Christ Jesus. In the first millennium the distinctive contribution of Greece predominated, whose source lay in the mysteries. We have often described what flowed out from them to the great poets, philosophers, and artists in every domain. For if we rightly understand Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, we must seek the sources for understanding them in what flowed from the mysteries. Likewise, to understand Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, we must seek the source of their philosophy in the mysteries, not to speak of so towering a figure as Heraclitus. You can read about him in my book Christianity as Mystical Fact, how he relied entirely on the mysteries. Then we see how, with the second thousand years, the Christ impulse poured into spiritual development, gradually spreading through Greek culture and uniting itself with it. This second millennium so took its course that the powerful impulse of Christ united with what has come down to us as life and living tradition from the Greeks. We see how quite slowly Greek wisdom, feeling, and art were organically merged with this impulse of Christ. So passed the second thousand years. Then the third millennium of personality culture began. How differently does the Greek, Greek influence show its effects during this epoch? We see it when we consider such artists as Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci. No longer does one observe Greek culture externally as something historically great, as was done in the second millennium. In the third, men had to turn directly to what came from Greece. We see how these three great artists let, let themselves be influenced by the great works of art coming to light again, how Greek culture was absorbed ever more consciously, in contrast to its unconscious influence felt in the second millennium. We see how this Greek influence was consciously embodied in a world conception, for instance, in the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. How necessary it was for him to unite what flowed from Christian philosophy with that of Aristotle. Here, too, the Greek influence was assimilated, so that together with the Christian influence it poured out in philosophical form, and with Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo in artistic form. <clears throat> this whole line of development continued on through spiritual life, even when a certain religious opposition appeared with Giordano Bruno and Galileo. In spite of all this, Greek ideas and concepts kept cropping up everywhere, particularly in relation to viewing nature. It was a conscious absorption of the Greek influence. But this did not go back further than Greek times. In all the people, not merely in the educated or the more highly cultured, but widespread among the simplest souls, such a spiritual life arose consciously out of the flowing together of Greek and Christian impulses. From university to peasant's hut, concepts taken from Greek and Christian ideas made their way. Then, in the nineteenth century, something quite unique entered, something actually formed and brought to light first by what is called theosophy or anthroposophy. There we see a single example of mighty forces in action. When, for the first time, the wonderful poem of the Bhagavad Gita became known in Europe, leading thinkers were enraptured by the greatness of this poem, by its profound content. It should never be forgotten that such a wise spirit as Wilhelm Humboldt could say after reading it <clears throat> that it was the most profound philosophical poem ever to come before his eyes. He made the beautiful comment that he was rewarded for living to be as old as he was by having been able to become acquainted with the Bhagavad Gita, the great spiritual song that sounded over from the primeval holiness of Eastern antiquity. <clears throat> How beautiful it is that slowly, even if not yet reaching a wide circle, much of Eastern antiquity poured out into the nineteenth century from the Bhagavad Gita. But this poem is not like other writings that came over from the ancient East, writings that always convey to us Eastern thought and feeling from one or another point of view. In the Bhagavad Gita, however, we meet with the flowing together of all the various streams and points of view to be found in Eastern thinking, perception, and feeling. That is the significance of the Bhagavad Gita. Now let us look into ancient India. Overlooking unimportant features, we find, rising up out of dim prehistoric times, three subtly different spiritual streams, 
one definite stream we encounter in the earliest Vedas. Then, in the later Vedic poems, we see its further development. It is a definite, but if we may put it so, a one-sided stream, which we will describe presently. <clears throat> then we find a second stream in the Sankhya philosophy, and a third, different one, in yoga. Those that meet us as the Sankhya system of Kapila, the yoga philosophy of Patanjali, and the Vedas have distinctly different colorings, which bring about their one-sidedness and through it actually their greatness. It is the harmonious interpenetration of all three streams that comes to expression in the Bhagavad Gita. What each of these three streams has to give us is to be found again in the Gita, not as a conglomerate, but as a harmonious blending into one organism, as if they had belonged together originally. It is the greatness of the Gita that it describes in such an all-inclusive way how the spiritual life of the East receives the contributions of these three streams. First I will briefly characterize what each of them can give us. The Veda stream is most pronounced as a philosophy of unity, the most spiritual monism imaginable, and it comes to completion in the Vedanta. If we are to understand the Veda philosophy, <clears throat> we must keep in mind that it is based on the idea that man finds the deepest within himself, actually as his own self. What he encompasses in ordinary life is a kind of expression or imprint of this self, that is, that man can develop, and he gradually brings forth from the foundations of his soul the depths of his own self, as if slumbering in him is his higher self. It is not what present-day man knows directly, but what works in him as that toward which he is developing. When man will have achieved what lives in him as his self, he will become aware, according to the Veda philosophy, that this self is one with the all-encompassing world self. <clears throat> that is, that he not only rests with his self entirely in this cosmic self, but is one with it, relating to it in a twofold way. The Vedantist conceives the relationship between man's self and the world self as an in and out breathing, we could say. As outside is as outside is air in general, and within us is the portion of it we have breathed in, so outside is the great self, actively alive in and permeating everything. And when we give ourselves to observing it, we breathe it in. We breathe it in spiritually and with every feeling we have of it, with everything we receive into our soul. All knowledge, wisdom, thinking, feeling is spiritual breathing. <clears throat> what we take into our soul as part of the world self, but which remains bound up organically with it, is Atman, is breath, as indistinguishable from the general world self as the air we inhale is part of the air surrounding us. As we breathe out physically, so does the soul go out in devotion to this world self, giving the best that it has prayerfully and in sacrifice. That is the spiritual outbreathing, Brahman. Atman and Brahman, like in and out breathing, make us participants in the all encompassing world self. A monistically spiritual philosophy, which is at the same time a religion, meets us in the Vedas. Their blossom and fruit is that which brings such blessing to man, such assurance to the innermost and the highest reaches of his soul. The feeling of union with the universal, world encompassing and permeating self the undivided nature of the cosmos. The Vedic philosophy, we cannot say the Veda word, since Veda means word, deals with the unity of the world, with man's existence within the whole spiritual cosmos. <clears throat> the word Veda was itself breathed forth, according to the Vedic conception, by the all-encompassing unitary being, and can be taken into itself by the human soul as the highest formulation of knowledge. Accepting the Veda word means taking in the best part of the all-powerful self. It means becoming conscious of the connection between each human self and the all-encompassing world self. What the Veda says is the word of God, which is creative and is born again in human knowledge. Thus human knowledge is joined with the creative permeating principle underlying existence. Therefore what is written in the Vedas was considered as divine word, and he who was filled with it was the possessor of the divine word. 
In a spiritual way, this word came into the world and was set forth in the Veda books. <clears throat> Those who mastered these books took part in the world's creative principle. The situation is different in Sankhya philosophy. When this first meets us, as handed down by tradition, we see exactly the opposite to a teaching of unity. We can compare it to the philosophy of Leibniz. Sankhya philosophy is a pluralistic philosophy. The separate souls who confront us, human and divine, are not traced to a unified source in Sankhya philosophy, but are considered as existing singly from eternity, so to say, or at least as souls whose origin is not sought in unity. The plurality of souls is what meets us in Sankhya philosophy. The self-dependence of each single soul is sharply brought out. The soul pursuing its development in the world, enclosed within its own being. Against this pluralism stands what Sankhya philosophy calls the prakriti element. We cannot indicate it well by the modern word, word matter, because this has a materialistic meaning. <clears throat> As used in Sankhya philosophy, this is not the meaning intended in using the word substance, matter, which contrasts with the multiplicity of souls and yet does not lead back to unity. There is multiplicity of souls and also what we can call the material basis equal to a primal flood streaming through the world spatially and in time, out of which souls take the elements of their outer existence. They must clothe themselves in this material element which is not led back to a unity with the souls themselves. So it is that in Sankhya philosophy this material element is primarily and carefully studied. Not much attention is given to the separate souls. Each is considered a reality entangled and bound up with the material basis and in this materiality it assumes the most varied forms showing itself outwardly in the most varied ways. A soul clothes itself with this basic material element, which, like this single soul, <clears throat> has been thought of from eternity. The soul expresses itself in this material element, thereby taking on various forms. It is the study of these material forms that meets us, especially in the Sankhya philosophy. Above all, <clears throat> above all then, we have the most primeval form of this material element as a kind of primal spiritual flood in which the soul submerges. If we were to look at the beginning of evolution, we would find an undifferentiated material element and a multiplicity of souls dipping into it to carry on their evolution. The first to meet us as form, not yet so differentiated from the unity of the primal flood, is spiritual substance itself at the beginning of evolution. <clears throat> Next comes buddhi, with which souls individually can clothe themselves so that if we think of the soul clothed by the primal flood substance, its appearance is not yet distinguishable from the general surging flood. Since the soul is not only enclosed in this first form of the general flood, but also in what can arise next, it can be unsheathed by booty. The third element that takes form, whereby the soul can become more and more individualized, is ahankara. That is the continually descending form of primal matter. So we have primal matter, whose next form is buddhi, and the next, ahankara. A fourth form is manas, following are the sense organs. Next, the finer elements. Finally, the material elements that we have in our physical environment. This, we may say, is the line of evolution as meant in Sankhya philosophy. Above is the most supersensible element of a spiritual primal flood, gradually condensing to the coarse elements, from which the coarse human body is built. In between are the substances out of which our sense organs are woven and the finer elements that give rise to our etheric or life body. Note well that all this constitutes sheaths for the soul, as meant by Sankhya philosophy. Even that which arose from the first primal flood is a sheath of the soul wherein it is contained. Thus, when the Sankhya philosopher studies buddhi, ahankara, manas and the senses, the finer and coarser elements, he means the evidencifying sheaths in which the soul comes to expression. <clears throat> we must be clear that the way the Veda and Sankhya philosophies confront us is only possible because they were formulated in those ancient times when a primal clairvoyance existed, 
at least to a certain degree. These philosophies came into being in different ways. The Vedas depended on a primal yet for earliest humanity a naturally existing inspiration that man had no part in creating, except that he prepared himself in his whole being to receive quietly and passively this divine inspiration that came by itself. It was otherwise in the development of the Sankhya philosophy. There one could say it was similar to our present method of learning, only that we are not permeated by clairvoyance while they were. It was clairvoyant science, inspiration bestowed by grace from above, that produced the Veda philosophy. Science as we cultivate it today, but carried on by people endowed with clairvoyance, that was this was Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> Therefore this latter left the purely soul element undisturbed. It said, In what one can study in the outer supersensible form, souls express themselves, but we study these outer forms in which souls clothe themselves. So we find a developed system of forms as they meet us in the world. As we in our science find the total of nature's facts, only that in the Sankhya philosophy one advances to a supersensible observation of phenomena. This philosophy is a science which, though attained through clairvoyance, remains a science of outer forms, not pressing on into the realm of the soul, which remains untouched by the studying. One who devotes himself to the Vedas feels his religious life entirely united with the life of wisdom. Sankhya philosophy is science, is knowledge of forms in which the soul expresses itself. At the same time, its adherents can feel alongside their science a religious devotion. How the soul element then inserts itself into the forms, not the soul itself, but the way it is inserted, this can be followed up in the Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> How the soul increasingly guards its independence or descends further into matter can be discerned in Sankhya philosophy. One has to do with soul nature, which indeed descends, but in the material forms protects its own being. A soul nature that has submerged in outer form, but has proclaimed and revealed itself as soul nature, lives in the sattva element, S-A-T-T-W-A. A soul immersed in form, but which, it, but which is, so to say, overwhelmed by the form and cannot rise above it, lives in the tamas element, T-A-M-A-S. When the soul can, to a certain extent, keep a balance between its own element and its expression in form, it lives in the rajas element, R-A-J-A-S. Sattva, rajas, tamas, the three gunas, G-U-N-A-S, are the essential characteristics of what we call Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> Again, it is otherwise with that spiritual stream that comes down to us as yoga. This deals immediately with the soul's nature and seeks ways of taking hold of the soul directly so that it rises from its present situation to ever higher stages. Thus, Sankhya observes the soul's sheaths and yoga leads it to ever higher stages of inner experience. Devotion to yoga, therefore, signifies a gradual awakening of the higher forces of the soul so that it may experience what is beyond everyday life and can discover ever higher stages of existence. Yoga, then, is the way to the spiritual worlds, the way, of, the way to freeing the soul from its outer forms, the way to its independent inner life. Yoga is the other side of the Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> it acquired its great importance when that inspiration from on high given by grace in the Vedas could no longer descend. Yoga had to be resorted to by those souls who, belonging to a later human epoch, no longer received any direct revelations, but had to work their way up from lower stages to the heights of spiritual existence. Thus, in the primeval Indian time, there arose three sharply differentiated spiritual streams, the Veda, the Sankhya, the Yoga. Today we are called upon to bring them together again, by lifting them out of the foundations of the soul and the depths of the cosmos, in the way suited to our present age. You can find all three streams again in our spiritual science. Only read what I sought to present in my occult science in the first chapters on the human constitution sleeping and waking, life and death. Then you have what is, in today's meaning, can be called Sankhya philosophy. 
Then read what is said there about the world's evolution from Saturn to our time, and you have the Veda philosophy in modern terms. In the last chapters dealing with man's development, you have yoga expressed for the present time. Our age must unite in an organic way what radiates over to us out of ancient India in these three philosophical streams. For that reason we must also be concerned with the wonderful Bhagavad Gita, which in a deeply poetic way contains as if in a summary the three streams reaching so deeply into our age. We must seek something like congeniality between our spiritual striving and the deeper content of the Bhagavad Gita. Not only in the whole of our present-day spiritual streams are there points of contact with the older spiritual streams, but in details as well. You will have recognized that in my occult science an effort was made to present things entirely out of their own inherent nature, never borrowing anything from history. Anyone who really understands what is said there concerning Saturn, Sun and Moon cannot find any assertion taken from historical sources. Out of the subject itself are the statements made. But how remarkable it is that what bears the imprint of our age harmonizes in critical places with what sounds over to us from ancient times. Here is one small example. At a certain place in the Vedas we read somewhat as follows about cosmic evolution, quote, In the beginning <clears throat> darkness was enveloped in darkness, everything was an undifferentiated flood. There arose a great void which was everywhere permeated by warmth, unquote. Now I ask you to recall what was taken from the event itself concerning the constitution of Saturn, where its substance was spoken of as comprised of warmth. Feel how what is newest in spiritual science coincides with what is said in the Vedas. The next passage runs, quote, Then the will first arose, which was the first seed of thinking, connecting existence with non-existence, and this connection is found in the will, unquote. Remember how in new terms the spirits of will were mentioned. In all that we ha- have had to say in the present time, we have not sought to be in accordance with the old, Rather, the harmony has come of itself, because truth was sought there, and truth was sought again here, on our own ground. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, we are met at once with a poetic glorification of the three spiritual streams we have described. In an important moment of world history, important for that ancient time, the great teaching that Krishna himself gave to Arjuna is presented to us. The moment is important because it was when the old blood ties were loosening. In everything that will be said in these lectures on the Bhagavad Gita, remember what has often been referred to, namely how the ancient blood ties, racial connections, tribal kinships had special significance and only gradually did they cease. Recall everything said in my lecture, The Occult Significance of Blood. Loosening these blood ties caused mighty warfare to break out, described for us in the Mahabharata, of which the Gita is an episode. There we see how the descendants of two brothers, still tied by blood, separate as to their spiritual direction, how that which through the blood had previously given them a unified point of view takes different paths. So there is conflict, because conflict must arise through this separation, wherein the blood ties also lose their importance for clairvoyant knowledge. With this separation, then, the later course of spiritual development sets in. To those for whom the old blood ties have no significance, Krishna appears as the great teacher. He is to be the teacher for the new age set free of the old blood ties. Tomorrow we shall describe how he does this. Here we may say what the whole Gita poem shows, that Krishna deals with the three spiritual streams we have mentioned as an organic unity, and imparts this to his pupil. <clears throat> How then must this pupil appear before us? In one direction he looks up to his father, in the other to his father's brother. The cousins are no longer to stay close, they must separate, but now each line is taken hold of by a different stream. Arjuna is dominated by the question, quote, How will it be when that which the blood ties would hold together is no longer there? How is one's soul to find its place in spiritual life if this life can no longer flow along as before, under the influence of the old blood ties, everything must come to ruin, unquote, or so it seems to Arjuna, that things must be different, but without such an outcome is the content of the great teaching of Krishna. 
Krishna now shows his pupil, who is to live through the transition from the one epoch to the other, how the soul, to maintain its harmony, must take in something from all three spiritual streams. The Vedic teaching of unity is rightly presented in the teaching of Krishna, likewise the essence of the Sankhya teaching, and of Yoga. For what lies behind all that we are to learn from the Gita? Krishna speaks somewhat like this, quote, There is a universal creative word that contains the creative principle itself. As the air undulates and comes alive with the sound of man's voice when he speaks, the cosmic word surges and lives in all things, creating and ordering existence. So does the Veda principle breathe through all things. It can be taken up by man's understanding into his soul life. There is a ruling, surging creator word, and an echo of this is in the Vedas. This word is the creative force in the world and is revealed in the Vedas. End quote. <clears throat> that is one part of the Krishna teaching. Man's soul is able to understand how the word comes to expression in the world's forms. Man learns to know the laws of existence in seeing how the separate forms show an orderly expression of the soul spiritual. The teaching about these world forms, about the laws underlying them, and their ways of working, this is Sankhya philosophy, the other part of Krishna's teaching. Even as he makes clear to his pupil that behind all existence is the world creative word, he emphasizes that human understanding can recognize the separate forms, that is, can take world laws into his own being, world word, world law, echoing in the Vedas, in Sankhya, this Krishna reveals to his pupil. He also speaks to him of the way <clears throat> that leads the individual pupil to the heights, where he can share in knowledge of the world word. Krishna speaks also of yoga. Threefold is his teaching of the word, of the law, and of reverent devotion to the spirit. Word, law, and devotion. These are the three streams by which the soul can carry on its development. They will always be working on the soul in one way or another. We certainly have seen how the new spiritual science in its new manner of expression must seek these three streams. But the epochs of time differ, and the threefold form of the world picture is brought to man's soul in the most varied ways. Krishna speaks of the world word, the creator word, of the structure of existence, of the devotional deepening of the soul, of yoga. The same trinity meets us again, only in a more concrete living way, in a being thought of as walking the earth, embodying the divine creative word. The Vedas approaching, excuse me, the Vedas approached humanity in abstract form. The divine logos of which the Gospel of John speaks is the living creative word itself. What we encounter in the Sankhya philosophy is the lawful ordering of cosmic forms, transposed historically into the old Hebraic revelation, becomes what Paul refers to as the law. Faith in the risen Christ proclaimed by Paul appears as the third member of the Trinity. What yoga is with Krishna is carried over by Paul, in reality into faith, which should take the place of the law. Thus Veda, Sankhya, Yoga are the dawn of what later rose as the sun, S-U-N. Veda arises again in the being of Christ himself, appearing actually in historical development, not pouring abstractly into the expanses of space and time, but as a single individuality, as the living word. In Sankhya philosophy we met the law, in what was shown there as the material basis, prakriti, evolved down to coarse substance. The law reveals how the world came into being and how individual man is formed within this world. <clears throat> this is expressed in the old Hebraic doctrine of the law, in all that Moses represents. Insofar as Paul points to this law of the ancient Hebrews, he points to Sankhya philosophy. Insofar as he points to faith in the risen Christ, he indicates the sun preceded by the dawn in yoga. So in this remarkable way arises that which met us in its first elements as Veda, Sankhya, Yoga. <clears throat> what came before us as the Veda appears in a new but now actual form as the living word, out of which all things were made, and without which nothing is made that was made, and which in the course of time became flesh. Sankhya appears as the historic law-founded representation of the way the world of phenomena, the world of coarse substances, came into being out of the world 
of the Elohim. Yoga is transformed into what was expressed by Paul in the words, quote, Not I, but the Christ in me, unquote, which means that when the power of Christ permeates and absorbs the soul, man rises to the heights of the divine. Thus we see the existence of a unified plan throughout world history, how Orientalism prepared it, how what first emerged in abstract form appeared in such a remarkable way in more concrete forms in the Christianity of Paul. We shall see that precisely through grasping the connection between the great Bhagavad Gita and the epistles of Paul, the deepest mysteries are revealed concerning what may be called the activity of the spirit in the collective education of the human race. Because one must feel such a new element in this new era, this modern age must go back beyond the time of Greece and develop understanding for what lay behind the first pre-Christian millennium, for what appeared as Veda, Sankhya, and Yoga. So as Raphael in art and Thomas Aquinas in philosophy had to turn back to Greek culture, we will see how in our time a conscious adjustment must be made between what the present time means to achieve and what existed before the Greek age, reaching into the depths of Eastern antiquity. We can allow these depths of ancient culture to come nearer to our soul when we observe those different spiritual streams in their wonderfully harmonious unity as they meet us in that greatest philosophical poem, as Humboldt said, the Bhagavad Gita. The end of lecture one. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which is separated into two parts. This is lecture two of the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul. It is entitled The Fundamental Concepts of the Gita, the Veda, Sankhya, and Yoga, given on December 29, 1912. As mentioned yesterday, the Bhagavad Gita has been said to be the most significant philosophical poem ever produced, and anyone who studies it seriously will find this statement fully justified. Attention will be drawn in these lectures to the artistic merit of the Gita, but above all to the significance of its mighty underlying thoughts and the lofty knowledge of the world from which it grew and for whose glorification it was created. Looking thus into the foundations of the Gita becomes especially important because it is certain that in all its essentials, particularly those related to thought and knowledge, it is communicated to us from a pre-Buddhistic age. So we can say it is the spiritual horizon surrounding the great Buddha, out of which he developed, that is characterized for us in the content of the Gita. It lets us see the spiritual constitution of the ancient pre-Buddhistic Indian civilization. We have already emphasized that the thoughts of the Gita are an organic blending of three spiritual streams, moving and living within one another in such a way that they are seen as one. What is found in the Gita is a unified whole, as a spiritual expression of primeval Indian thinking and perception is a beautifully grand and immeasurable view of spiritual knowledge so vast that modern man, not yet acquainted with spiritual science, cannot but doubt the grandeur of its dimensions, for he has no possibility of gaining a point of view regarding these depths of knowledge. Ordinary modern methods of research do not help one to penetrate these depths. At most, these methods only make it possible to look upon the Gita as a beautiful dream, once dreamt by mankind, that may inspire wonder, but can have no value for science. Those who have studied spiritual science, however, will be amazed at the depths of the Gita and will admit that in primeval ages the human spirit penetrated into knowledge that can only be attained again through the gradual development of spiritual organs. This arouses admiration for the insight shown in those past ages because out of world content itself we are able now to rediscover and confirm the truth of it. How wonderful it really was that those primeval men were able to raise themselves to such spiritual heights. To be sure, mankind in those days was especially favored in possessing the remains of an old clairvoyance that was still alive in human souls. 
Not only were men led into the spiritual worlds through the use of special exercises in meditation, but the science of that time was impregnated, in a certain sense, by the knowledge and ideas provided by the remains of the old clairvoyance. Today we recognize, for quite other reasons, the accuracy of what has been handed down to us from that source. But we must understand that in that ancient time delicate distinctions concerning the being of man were arrived at by other means than they are today. Subtle, astute concepts were drawn from what men could know, concepts that were clearly outlined and that could be applied to spiritual as well as to external physical reality. Thus we find it possible to understand their ancient point of view, if in some instances we only transpose the terms we use today for our changed point of view. <clears throat> in our spiritual research, we have sought to present things as they appear to contemporary clairvoyant perception, so that our kind of spiritual science represents what can be attained today by spiritually minded men out of their own effort. In the early days of theosophical teaching, less was done by means derived directly out of occult science than by methods aided by the designations and nuances of concepts used in the East, namely those that had been carried over by old tradition from the time of the Gita right into our present time. For this reason the older form of theosophical development, to which have now been added our present methods of occult investigation, worked more through concepts preserved in tradition, especially the concepts of the Sankhya philosophy. The Sankhya philosophy itself, however, underwent a gradual change through the alteration of thinking in the East, and at the beginning of the theosophical movement the being of man and other secrets were described in the later terminology of Sankar a Karya, the great reformer of Vedic and other Indian knowledge in the 8th century AD. Sankara Karya, I'm going to spell his name S A N. K-A-R-A-C-H-A-R-Y-A -A -A. I'm going to pronounce that Sankarakarya. We will pay less attention today to the expressions chosen at the beginning of the theosophical movement, but in order to get to the foundations of the knowledge and wisdom of the Gita, let us look rather into the primeval Indian wisdom found especially in the Sankhya philosophy. We will best understand how the being and nature of man were considered in the Sankhya philosophy if we keep in mind the fact that a spiritual seed is inherent in every human being. This fact has often been expressed by saying that in a human soul forces are slumbering that will gradually emerge in the course of human evolution, the highest we can see now and that man will in future attain is called spirit man. Even when man has risen to the stage of spirit man he will still have to distinguish between the soul that dwells within him and spirit man itself. Just as today a distinction must be made between our innermost soul and the sheaths that enclose it, the astral, etheric and physical bodies. Just as we consider these bodies as sheaths, distinguished from the soul itself, which for the present human cycle is divided into three parts, the sentient, intellectual and consciousness souls, just as we thus distinguish between the threefold nature of the soul itself and its system of sheaths, so in future we shall have to reckon with the soul itself that will then be divided in a way corresponding to our present sentient intellectual and consciousness souls. And the sheath nature will then have reached the stage of development we call spirit man. But the human sheath, in which, so to say, the spirit-soul core of man's being will be enclosed, the spirit man, will only have significance for him in the future. Nevertheless, that into which a being is to develop is always in existence. The substance of spirit man in which our souls will one day be ensheathed has always been in the great universe and is there at the present time. Today other beings already have sheaths that will some day form our spirit man. Thus the substance of which the human spirit man will one day consist already exists in the universe. This fact derived from our teaching was already known to the old Sankhya doctrine. What exists in the universe in an undifferentiated, non-individualized state 
flowing like spiritual water, filling space and time, and providing the basis from which all forms, past, present, and future, come forth, was known by the Sankhya philosophy as the highest form of substance. It is that substance which this philosophy considered as continuing from age to age. Let me read that again. It is that substance which this philosophy considered as continuing from age to age. Just as we speak of the beginning of our earth evolution and of how all to which the earth has since evolved was present in spirit as substantial spiritual being, so did the Sankhya philosophy speak of its original substance, of its primordial flood, from which all forms, physical and superphysical, have developed. This highest form is not yet relevant for contemporary man, but, as has been shown, the day will come when it will be. The next form that will evolve out of the primal flowing substance, coming from above downward, we recognize as the second principle of man, the life spirit, or to use an eastern expression, buddhi. Again our teaching tells us that man will, in the normal course, develop buddhi only at a future stage. But as a spiritual form principle, it has always been present in other superhuman beings and was thus the first form differentiated from the primal flowing substance. According to the Sankhya philosophy, buddhi arose out of the first form of non-soul substantial existence. Now when we consider the further evolution of the substantial principle, there appears a third form, which the Sankhya philosophy calls ahankara, whereas buddhi stands, as it were, on the border of the principle of differentiation and merely suggests individualization, the form of ahankara appears as completely differentiated. When ahankara is spoken of, therefore, we must imagine buddhi as organized downward into independent, real, substantial forms that then exist individually in the world. To create a picture of this evolution, let us imagine as the primal substantial principle an equally distributed mass of water. Then it wells up so that forms appear, not as separate drops, but as forms that emerge like little mounds of water from the common substance, with their bases still in the primal common flow. This condition would represent buddhi. If we further imagine these mounds of water detaching themselves into drops, into independent spheres, we would have the form of ahankara. Then, through a certain thickening of the individualized form of each separate soul form of ahankara, there would originate what is designated as manas. Here we must admit that the naming of these sheaths differs slightly from our designations. In considering human evolution from above downward, according to our teaching, spirit self, manas, follows after life spirit or buddhi. This designation is absolutely correct for the present cycle of humanity, and in the course of these lectures it will be shown why. <clears throat> we do not insert ahankara between buddhi and manas, but for our concepts we unite it with manas, and the two together are called spirit self. In those past ages it was quite justifiable to consider them as separate for a reason that I shall only indicate today and later develop further. At that time one could not use the important characteristic that must be employed today if we want to be understood. I am speaking of the influences of Lucifer on the one side and of Araman on the other. This characteristic is absolutely lacking in the Sankhya philosophy. For in a human constitution that had no occasion to look toward these two principles, because it could not yet feel any trace of their force, it was quite justifiable to slip in the differentiated form of ahankara between buddhi and manas. So when manas is spoken of in the sense of the Sankhya philosophy, it is not the same as when spoken of in the sense of sankarakarya who considered manas identical with spirit self, even though manas differs in the sense of the Sankhya philosophy. We are still able to characterize clearly what manas actually is in this sense. Let us then consider man living his physical existence in the sense world. In his physical existence he lives in such a way that he perceives the reality of his surroundings by means of his senses. Through his sense of touch, by means of his hands and feet, by handling things, walking and speaking, 
he has an effect upon the surrounding physical world. So expressed this agrees entirely, so expressed this agrees entirely with the Sankhya philosophy. But how does a man perceive the surrounding world by means of his senses? Well, with his eyes he sees light and color, light and dark, and the shape of things. With his ears he perceives sounds, with his olfactory organs he senses odors, and with his organs of taste he receives taste impressions. Each separate sense is a means of becoming aware of a particular part of the external world. He opens himself to it through these doors of his being called the senses. But with each sense he approaches one limited area of the world. Something like a unifying principle in us combines these different areas of the outer world for us, as even our ordinary language shows. We speak, for instance, of warm and cold colors, although we know that this is only a manner of speaking and that in reality we become aware of cold and warmth through the organs of touch and light and dark colors through the organ of sight. When we speak of warm and cold colors out of this feeling of inner relationship, we are using terms appropriate to one sense in describing the others. We express ourselves in this way because in our inner being there is a kind of intermingling between what we perceive through sight and what impresses us through the sense of warmth. More delicately sensitive people, on hearing certain sounds, can inwardly form ideas of color. They may, for example, associate certain tones with red, others with blue. Some activity within us, therefore, holds together the separate senses and makes out of their separate activities a unity for the soul. <clears throat> if one is sensitive, one can go even further. There are people who may, on entering a town, experience an impression of yellow. In another town they may experience red, in others white or blue. Much of the totality of our impressions expresses itself inwardly to us as color. The separate sense impressions are thus united inwardly in an overall collective sense that does not belong to any one sense alone. It lives in our inner being and floods us with its quality of wholeness by incorporating the individual sense impressions into it. It may be called the inner sense. It may all the more be called so because all the usual inner experiences of sorrow and joy, passions and emotions are united again with what this inner sense offers us, so that we can also describe some emotions as dark and cold, others as warm and full of light. Thus we can also say our inner being in turn has any effect upon what forms the inner sense. Therefore, in contradistinction to the several senses directed to the different areas of the external world, we can speak of one that fills the soul. It is not connected with any single sense organ, but uses the whole being as its instrument. To describe this inner sense as manas is quite in harmony with the Sankhya philosophy. <clears throat> According to it, what organizes this inner sense into substance develops out of ahankara as a later product in the world of forms. So it can be said that first there was the primal flood, then buddhi, then ahankara, and then manas that is found within us as our inner sense. If we want to understand this inner sense, we proceed today in such a way as to see how our separate sense perceptions join in a common inner sense. This is the way we proceed today because our process of cognition travels along a reverse path as compared with that of ancient times. When we look at the development of our way of knowing, we see how it starts from the differentiation of the separate senses and then seeks to rise to the unified inner sense. Evolution was the other way around. In the developing world, manas first evolved out of ahankara, then the primal substance, the forces that form the separate senses as we carry them within us, differentiated themselves. This does not refer to the material sense organs that belong to the physical body, but to the forces underlying these organs, the formative forces that are wholly supersensible. So when we descend through the stages of the evolution of forms, we come down from ahankara to manas in the sense of the Sankhya philosophy. Then manas differentiates into separate forms and yields those supersensible forces that build up our separate senses. 
because the soul is involved in viewing these separate senses, it is possible to bring the content of the Sankhya philosophy in line with our teaching. This philosophy tells us that inasmuch as Manas has differentiated into the separate world forces of the senses, the soul has immersed itself in these different forms but has remained distinct from them. Inasmuch as it does so, and also submerges itself in Manas, it works through, is interwoven with, and is entwined in these sense forces. As a result, the soul, as spirit soul being, places itself in connection with the external world in order to feel pleasure and sympathy in it. For instance, the forces that constitute the I, E-Y-E, have become differentiated out of manas. At an earlier stage, when the physical body of man did not exist in its present form, so says Sankhya philosophy, the soul was immersed only in the forces that constitute the I, E-Y-E. We know that the human eye of today was laid down germinally in the old Saturn time. Yet only after the withdrawal of the warmth organ, which is to be found today in a stunted form in the pineal gland, did the eye develop, which is to say comparatively late. The forces out of which it evolved were already there in supersensible form, and the soul lived within them. The Sankhya philosophy also points out that because the soul lives in this principle of differentiation, it is attached to and develops a thirst for existence in the external world. Through the forces of the senses, the soul is connected with the external world, hence its inclination and longing for worldly existence. In a way, the soul sends feelers out through the sense organs and by its forces is connected with outer existence. This connection by way of forces, understood as a real sum of forces, we understand to be the astral body of man. The Sankhya philosophy speaks of the combined working of the separate sense forces, which at this stage are differentiated from manas. Out of these sense forces, the finer elements arise, which we understand as the human etheric body. This etheric body is a comparatively late development. So we must picture to ourselves that evolution has taken place in this order, in this order, Primal flood, buddhi, ahankara, manas, the substances of the senses, and the finer elements. In the outer world of the kingdom of nature, these finer elements also exist in the plants as etheric body. In the sense of the Sankhya philosophy, we have to imagine that the development of every plant has its origin in the primal flood, which has carried out a whole evolution from above downward. In the case of the plant, however, this all takes place in the supersensible and only becomes real in the physical world when it densifies into the finer elements that live in its etheric body. With man it is different. In his present development, the higher forms and principles of manas have already revealed themselves physically. The separate sense organs have appeared externally. With the plant there is first found that later product that arises when the sense substance densifies into the finer etheric elements, whose further densification produces the coarse elements of which all physical things consist that we encounter in the outer world. When we go then from below upward, as we can see in the sense of the Sankhya philosophy, how man is membered into a coarse physical body, into the finer etheric body into an astral body, an expression not used in Sankhya philosophy, but instead force body, which constitutes the sense organs. Next, into an inner sense, manas. Then in ahankara, the principle underlying human individuality, which enables man to have not only an inner sense for perceiving the separate areas of the senses in the outer world, but also for feeling himself as a separate individual being. Following Ahankara come the higher principles that first appear in man as Buddhi and in what other Eastern philosophy customarily calls Atma, recognized in its cosmic meaning by the Sankhya philosophy as the spiritual primal flood previously described. Thus in the Sankhya philosophy the constitution of man is presented completely, how in the past, present and future his soul is ensheathed in the substantial external nature principle 
the word nature, meaning not only the outwardly visible, but all stages of nature up to the invisible. <clears throat> in prakriti, that is, in all the forms from the coarse physical body up to the primal flood, dwells purusha, the spirit-soul element, which is imagined as being monadic in every individual soul. The separate monadic souls, therefore, are to be thought of as without beginning and without end, just as the material prakriti principle, which is not material in our materialistic sense, is also thought of as without beginning or end. A multiplicity of individual souls is thus imagined, that plunged into the prakriti principle and developed downward from the highest differentiated form of the primal flood, with which they surrounded themselves to embodiment in coarse physical bodies. Having reached this lowest stage, <clears throat> and having overcome the physical body, they turn back and evolve upward again, thus returning to the primal flood. Finally, they free themselves even from it and enter as free souls into pure purusha. And that word is P-U-R-U-R, excuse me, P-U-R-U-S-H-A, purusha. When he, we allow this knowledge to act upon us, we see that this primal ancient wisdom is based upon what we can attain again today by means of our meditation. The Sankhya philosophy also shows that it has insight into the way the soul may be united with each of these form principles. The soul may, for example, be connected with Bodhi in such a way that within Bodhi it realizes its full independence as much as is possible in it. In such a case the soul nature, not Bodhi, predominates. The opposite may also occur. The soul may enwrap its independence in a sort of sleep, envelop it in lassitude and laziness, so that the sheath nature is most prominent in such a way that every moment, gesture, and look communicated by the coarse physical body recedes before the fact that the spirit soul nature is expressing itself within him. We have a man before us whom we see in the coarse physical body that stands there, yet in his movements, gestures, and look something appears that makes us say, quote, this man is entirely spirit and soul and he only needs the physical principle as a means of expression. The physical principle does not overpower him. He is everywhere the master over it. Unquote. This condition in which the soul is master of the external sheath principle is the sattva condition. It may manifest as well in the soul's relation to buddhi and manas as in its relation to the body with its fine and coarse elements. To say that the soul lives in sattva means nothing else than a certain relation to the soul to its envelope, of the spiritual principle in the soul with relation to the nature principle, of the purusha principle in relation to the prakriti principle. But we can also see how a man's coarse physical body quite dominates him. Parenthesis, no reference to moral characterizations is intended here, but only pure characterizations as they exist in the sense of Sankhya philosophy. When seen with spiritual eyes, no moral consideration whatever is involved. Parenthesis. <clears throat> Such a man may appear to walk about weighed down by his physical body. He may have put on so much flesh that his whole appearance seems influenced by his weight, making it difficult for him to express his soul in his external physical body. When a man moves the muscles of his face in harmony with the speaking of his soul, the sattva principle is master. When quantities of fat imprint a special physiognomy on a man's face, the soul principle is then overpowered by the external sheath condition, and the soul's relation to the nature principle is that of tamas, T-A-M-A-S. When a balance exists between the sattva and the tamas states, when neither the soul has mastery, as in the sattva state, nor the external sheath nature, as in the tamas condition, when both are in equilibrium, the condition may be called rajas. Satwas, sattva, rajas, and tamas are the three gunas and are of special importance. We must distinguish, then, between the characteristics of the separate forms of prakriti and the highest principle of undifferentiated primal substance down to the coarse physical body. This sheath principle is one characteristic. The other is what the Sankhya philosophy characterizes as the relation of the soul nature to the sheaths, regardless of what the particular form of the sheath may be. 
This characteristic is revealed through the three conditions, sattva, rajas, and tamas. When the profound depths of such knowledge are brought into view, and an attempt is made to visualize how deep an insight into the secrets of existence this science had, in order that it might give such a comprehensive description of living beings, our souls become filled with admiration. We say to ourselves that it is one of the most amazing occurrences in the evolutionary history of mankind that a knowledge appearing again today in our spiritual science out of the dark spiritual depths should have already existed in those ancient times, obtained as it was by different methods. All this knowledge existed previously and it is perceived again when our spiritual attention is directed to those primeval times. <clears throat> Let us now turn to the succeeding ages. We see what is usually referred to as the spiritual life of the different periods, the old Greek age, the following Roman age, and the Christian Middle Ages. We turn from these older cultures to modern times, to our age in which spiritual science brings us something that has grown out of the primal wisdom of mankind. As we survey all this, we can say that often throughout these ages even the smallest glimmering of that primeval knowledge is lacking. Gradually the knowledge of that grandiose sphere of existence, with its supersensible, all-embracing, ancient perception, was lost. Indeed, the purpose of evolution for three thousand years has been to replace that primal wisdom with external knowledge of the material, physical plane. Nevertheless, it is interesting to see how in the age of Greek philosophy there still remained on the physical plane something like an echo of the old Sankhya knowledge. Echoes of the real nature of the soul are still to be found with Aristotle, but they are no longer such as can be clearly connected with the ancient Sankhya knowledge. Aristotle still divides the human being into the coarse physical body, though he scarcely mentions it, and into what he believes to be the soul nature whereas the Sankhya philosophy knows these are only the sheaths. Then there is the vegetative soul, which would coincide with the finer elemental body, in the sense of the Sankhya philosophy. Where Aristotle believes he is expressing something soul-like, he characterizes only the relations between soul and body, the gunas. In this he describes merely sheath forms. Then that which reaches out into the sphere of the senses, into what we call the astral body, Aristotle indicates as a soul principle. He no longer clearly distinguishes the soul from the bodily part, because for him the soul has already been submerged in the bodily shape. He differentiates rather the aestheticon and distinguishes further in the soul the orecticon, kineticon, and the dianoeticon. Footnote Friedrich Hebel explains these terms in the following way. The human physical body as a mere mineral substance is sarx, S-A-R-X. This Greek word sarx, for body, means that, means that which is contained in the sarcophagus, the, the coffin. The principle which makes the body alive and lets it rise from the sarcophagus is threptikon, the vegetative or nutritive soul. Furthermore, the living being has the soul of sensitiveness, aestheticon, the soul of desiring, orecticon and the soul of moving and understanding, kineticon. Man alone, among all living beings, has reason, noesis. This appears in its highest aspect as dianoeticon. The dianoeticon comes from the spiritual world, from nous, and quote from the Gospel of Hellas at the Pasophic Press, Incorporated, 1949, page 247, and a footnote. These are to him... These to him are gradations of the soul, but there is no longer a clear distinction between the soul and its various sheaths. Aristotle believes he is presenting a classification of the soul, while the Sankhya philosophy grasped the soul in its own being as a monad, and all its differentiations were, so to say, covered by the sheath or the prakriti principle. Therefore, with Aristotle, there is no longer a remembrance of that primal knowledge found in the Sankhya philosophy. When, however, in the material domain, he speaks of light and darkness and colors, what he has to say is like a surviving echo of the principle of the three conditions. There are some colors, he says, that have more darkness in them, and others more light, and still others between these two. In the colors ranging between blue and violet, darkness predominates over light, 
so a color is blue or violet becomes because darkness prevails in it. It is green or greenish-yellow when light and darkness are more nearly in equilibrium. A color is reddish or orange when the light principle overrules the dark. The Sankhya philosophy <coughs> contains this principle of three conditions for the whole compass of world phenomena. It is sattva, for example, when the spiritual predominates over the natural. Aristotle uses the same char- characteristic when speaking of colors. He did not use the word sattva, but it would be correct to say that red and reddish yellow pr- represent the sattva condition of light. This terminology was no longer used by Aristotle, but he still retained the principle of the old Sankhya philosophy, where green represents the rajas condition as regards light and darkness, and blue and violet, in which darkness predominates, represent the tamas condition. Even though Aristotle did not use these terms, the whole way of thinking that is found in the Sankhya philosophy regarded in darkness, and blue and violet, in which darkness predominates, represent the tamas condition. Even though Aristotle did not use these terms, the whole way of thinking that is found in the Sankhya philosophy regarding its spiritual grasp of world conditions shone into him. Hence his teachings on color were an echo of this old philosophy. Even this echo, however, was lost. We find the first glimmering of the reappearance of the three conditions, sattva, rajas, and tamas, in the external world of color, in the hard battle that Goethe carried on. For after the old Aristotelian division of the world of color into conditions of sattva, rajas, and tamas had been completely obliterated, so to say, it reappeared in Goethe. Today Goethe's system of color, brought to birth out of the principles of spiritual wisdom, has been subjected to blasphemy by modern physicists. From their own standpoint, of course, they are right in disagreeing with Goethe, but it only shows that in these matters they have been abandoned by all the good gods. That is fitting for contemporary physicists, who may therefore cast abuse upon Goethe's teachings concerning color. If modern genuine science wanted to make any connection with occult principles, it ought directly, today, to stand up for Goethe's theory of color. For in it is to be found again, in the midst of our scientific culture, what once reigned as the spiritual principle in the Sankhya philosophy. You can understand why, many years ago, I set myself the task of bringing forward Goethe's color theory to be evaluated as a physical science while resting upon occult principles. For it is wholly relevant to say that Goethe's division of color phenomena represents the three states of sattva, rajas, and tamas. So, gradually, as out of spiritual darkness into a new chapter of spiritual history, new methods bring forth what humanity once attained by entirely different means. This Sankhya philosophy was pre-Buddhistic, as is obvious from the legend of the Buddha. The Indian teaching rightly relates that Kapila was the founder of the Sankhya philosophy. The birth of Buddha in the dwelling place of Kapila, in Kapila Vastu, indicates that he had his roots in the Sankhya teaching. His very birth placed him at the spot where that personality once worked who was the first to formulate the great Sankhya philosophy. Now imagine the relation of this Sankhya doctrine to the other spiritual currents we have mentioned, yet not as many Orientalists and as the Jesuit Joseph Dalman presents it today. In various parts of ancient India lived men who had become differentiated in accordance with these three spiritual streams, since by that time the primal state of human evolution no longer existed. In northeast India, for example, human nature was such that it inclined to the concepts given in the Sankhya philosophy. In an area more to the west, the tendency was to conceive of the world according to the Vedic doctrine. The different spiritual nuances arise, therefore, out of the differently gifted human natures in the different parts of India. Only later, through the Vedantists, having carried their work further, much out of the Sankhya philosophy had been worked in with the Vedas as we now have them. Yoga, the third spiritual current, arose because the old clairvoyance had gradually diminished and new ways to the spiritual world had to be sought. Yoga differs from the Sankhya point of view in that the latter is the view of a genuine science, a science of outer forms, which actually only grasps these forms and the way the human soul is interrelated with them. 
how the soul is to develop in order to reach to the spiritual worlds, is indicated by yoga. What was an Indian man to do, who at a comparatively later time wanted to develop himself in a way that would not be one-sided? What was he to do if he wished not merely to advance by concerning himself with external forms, but to raise his soul, nature, so as to achieve again the illumination that the Vedas had originally given as if by grace? An answer is provided by Krishna to his pupil Arjuna in the sublime Gita. Such a soul would have to undergo a development expressed like this. Quote, yes, it is true that you see the world in its outer forms, and when you are permeated with the knowledge of the Sankhya philosophy, you will see how these forms have developed out of the primal flow. You will also see how form after form changes. Your vision can follow the origin and dissolution of forms. Your eyes see the birth and death of forms. But when you consider thoroughly how these forms change, how form after form arises and vanishes, then you are led to contemplate what comes to expression in all these forms. Accurate observation will lead you to the spiritual principle living in all these forms, transforming itself within them, sometimes more according to the sattva condition, at other times more after the forms of the other gunas, yet always freeing itself again from these forms. Such a thorough observation will direct you to something permanent which, compared to form, is imperishable. The material principle, to be sure, is constant, but not the forms you see, which come into being, arise and fade, which go through birth and death. Yet the sole spiritual element continues. Direct your attention to that. In order, however, to be able to experience this sole spiritual element within and around you and to identify it with yourself, you must develop the slumbering forces in your soul. You must yield yourself to yoga, which begins with looking up devotionally toward the soul spirit element of existence, and with the practice of certain exercises leads to the development of these slumbering forces. End quote. In this way the pupil rises from stage to stage by means of yoga. Devotional reverence for the spiritual element of the soul is the other way that leads the soul forward to that spiritual element living in unity behind the changing forms, that element once proclaimed by the Vedas through grace and illumination. What is to be looked for behind all changing forms the soul will again find through yoga. So a great teacher might have said to his pupil, quote, Study the knowledge given in the Sankhya philosophy, in its forms, in the gunas, considering the conditions of sattva, rajas and tamas, through the forms of the finest down to the coarsest substance. Study these with your understanding. Then admit that there must be something permanent, something unifying in it all. Then by thinking you will have penetrated to the eternal. But you can also begin with devotion. By means of yoga you can push on from stage to stage and ultimately reach the spiritual that is at the base of all forms. From two sides you can approach the eternal, through a thoughtful contemplation of the world and through yoga. Both will lead you to what the great teacher of the Vedas describes as the unitary Atman Brahman that lives in the outer world as well as in the inmost being of the soul, which in oneness exists at the world's foundation. On the one side you will attain it by thinking through the Sankhya philosophy, on the other through devotion by means of yoga. End quote. As I have shown in my pamphlet The Occult Significance of the Blood, it is possible to look back to those ancient times when clairvoyant power was still united with human nature through the blood. But mankind has gradually advanced from that blood-bound clairvoyance to a kind more truly soul-spiritual. In order not to lose this connection with the soul spiritual, naturally attained in those ancient times of close tribal and folk blood relationships, new methods and new and ways of teaching had to be found during the transition from the period of blood relationships to the time when these relationships no longer prevailed. It is the sublime song of the Bhagavad Gita that leads to this transition to new methods and tells of the battle fought between the descendants of the two royal brothers of the lines of Kuru and Pandu. On one side is represented the age that was already past, when the story of the Gita begins, that time in which the old Indian perception still existed, and men still based their way of living upon it. 
In the blind King Dhritarashtra of the house of Kuru, we see the line that reaches over from ancient times into the new era. We see the king in conversation with his charioteer. He stands on the one side of the warriors. On the other side are the sons of Pandu, who are related to the others by blood, but who are fighting them, because they are in a state of transition from the old times to the new. King Dhritarashtra, who is characteristically described as blind because it is not the spiritual in this line but the physical that is to be transmitted, is told by his charioteer what is happening on the other side among the sons of Pandu. To them is to pass for future generations what is of a more soul and spiritual nature. <clears throat> the charioteer tells the king how Arjuna, the representative of the Pandu warriors, is instructed by the great Krishna, the teacher of mankind. He tells how Krishna gives to his pupil Arjuna all the knowledge of which we have been speaking, of the possibility of achieving again, if thinking and devotion are developed through Sankhya and Yoga, what the great teachers of mankind had incorporated in the Vedas. In grandiose language, as much philosophical as poetical, we are told of the instruction given by Krishna, the great teacher of the new age that had abandoned the old blood relationships. Here something else shines through to us out of those ancient times. In the basic considerations of the pamphlet, The Occult Significance of the Blood, and elsewhere, I have indicated how the evolution of mankind proceeded from the time of the old blood relationships to later differentiations, whereby the striving of the soul was transformed. The noble song of the Bhagavad Gita leads directly to this transition. <clears throat> Through the instructions given to Arjuna by Krishna, it is made clear how men who no longer possess the old clairvoyance dependent upon the blood must press on to what is imperishable. The Gita thus stands as an illustration of what from observing directly out of the events themselves I have often spoken of as an important transition in the evolution of mankind. What particularly attracts us in the Bhagavad Gita is with what penetrating perception it speaks of man's path, of the way he must take to gain the enduring in contrast to the transitory. At the beginning of the poem, the charioteer, relating the happenings on the battlefield to King Dhritarashtra, pictures Arjuna standing there, his soul torn over the prospect of having to fight the Kurus, his blood relatives. Arjuna asks himself, quote, Must I fight against those who are linked to me by blood? Unquote those who are the sons of my father's brothers. There are many heroes among us who must turn... Oh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. That wasn't the end of the quote. Sorry. Arjuna asks himself, quote, Must I fight against those who are linked to me by blood? Those who are the sons of my father's brothers? There are many heroes among us who must turn their weapons against their own relatives. On the opposite side, there are heroes just as honorable who must direct their weapons against us. Unquote. In great torment he continues, quote, Can I win this battle? Ought I win it? Do brothers dare to raise the sword against each other? Unquote. Then Krishna, the great teacher, comes to him and says, quote, First of all, give thoughtful consideration to human life and examine the circumstances in which you find yourself. In the temporal bodies of the Kurus, against whom you are to fight, live soul beings who are eternal, who only express themselves in these temporal forms. In your fellow warriors also live eternal souls who only express themselves in the forms of the outer world. You will have to fight, for your law ordains it. This is for you to accomplish, decreed by the outer earthly evolution of humanity. You must do battle. This is the will of the moment that signifies the transition from one period to the other. Should you mourn that forms fight against other forms, forms in transition battling against other changing forms? Whatever of these forms will lead the others to death. What is death? What is life? The changing of forms is death, and it is life. Similar are the souls of those who are to be victorious to those who will now go to their death. What is this victory, and what is this death compared with that to which a thoughtful study of the Sankhya philosophy leads you? Compared to these eternal souls now opposing each other, yet remaining beyond the reach of battle. End quote. In this magnificent manner, out of the situation itself, we are led to see how Arjuna is shown that he should not suffer torments in his innermost being, but only do his duty calling him to battle. 
that he should look beyond what is passing and involves fighting to the eternal that lives on, whether as conqueror or as the conquered. So a powerful tone is sounded in a unique way in the sublime Gita, a tone heralding a significant event in human evolution, the perishable confronting the imperishable. We are on the right path when instead of having abstract thoughts about the matter, we let its feeling content work upon us. We proceed in the right way when we perceive that Krishna in his instruction is trying to raise the soul of Arjuna from the stage at which it stands, entangled in the net of the transitory, to a higher stage in which it will feel itself elevated beyond everything transitory, even when the transitory presents itself to the soul directly involved in such a distressing form as a victory or defeat, as inflicting death or suffering it. In the Bhagavad Gita we see verified a statement once made about the philosophy set forth in it. Quote, the Eastern philosophy was at the same time so much a religion in those ancient times that a person given to it, however great and wise he may have been, was not without the deepest religious fervor. And the simplest man who only lived the religion of feeling was not without a certain amount of wisdom. Unquote. Thus we, this we feel when we see how the great teacher Krishna not only influenced the ideas of his pupil Arjuna, but also worked directly into his feeling, bringing him to contemplate the transitory and the torments of the transitory existence. In such a significant situation, he raises Arjuna's soul to a height far above everything transitory, above all its mis- miseries, pain and sorrow. The end of lecture two. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which is separated into two parts. This is Lecture 3 of the Lecture Cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul, entitled The Joining of the Three Streams in the Christ Impulse, given on December 30th, 1912. The significance of such a philosophical poem as the Bhagavad Gita or similar works of world literature can only be rightly valued by one to whom they are not mere theory but a destiny, and world conceptions may be destiny for mankind. In the last few days we have met with two varying concepts of world philosophy, not to mention a third, the Vedic, which are Sankhya and Yoga. When rightly viewed, these two show in the most eminent way how world conceptions can become destiny for the human soul. In the Sankhya philosophy, one can bring together all that a man is able to achieve in knowledge, in conceiving ideas, in a survey of world phenomena, everything in which the life of the soul finds expression. When we also designate as such an aspect of knowledge, what still remains of such knowledge in the normal man of the present day, what still remains of this world conception that can be expressed in ideas put in scientific form, although it stands at a much lower level spiritually than the Sankhya philosophy, we can say that even in our own age we can still feel as destiny that which was felt as destiny in the Sankhya philosophy. Of course this will only be experienced as destiny by someone who in a one-sided way devotes himself to such a philosophical study one whom we might call strictly a scientist or a Sankhya philosopher. What would be the sole experience of such a person, his attitude toward the world? These are questions that really can only be answered out of experience. One must know what takes place in a soul that devotes itself in such a one-sided way to one aspect of a world conception, thereby using all its powers to acquire a world conception in the sense characterized here. Then such a soul can study in detail the various forms of world phenomena. It can come to the most complete understanding of that which comes to expression as active forces in the world, as forms ever-changing. If in one of its incarnations this soul, through its capacities and karma, only finds the opportunity to live into world phenomena, so as to acquire knowledge chiefly through reasoning, this would, in all circumstances, lead to a certain coldness in the soul's whole life. <clears throat> this would happen whether or not it was illuminated by clairvoyance. According to the temperament of that soul, 
it would take on more or less the character of ironical dissatisfaction with world phenomena, or it might lose interest and feel a general discontent with such knowledge as it proceeds from one phenomenon to another. Everything <clears throat> that so many souls in our time feel when confronted by a science conditioned to scholarship, the coldness and barrenness that depresses them, the nagging dissatisfaction, all this can be perceived when we examine such a soul's attitude. It would feel desolate and uncertain of itself. It might well ask itself, what if I gain the whole world and know nothing of my own soul, feel nothing, sense nothing, experience nothing, an emptiness within? To be crammed full of all the science in the world and yet be inwardly empty, that can be a bitter fate. That would be like being lost amid the phenomena of the world, like losing everything that would be of value to one's inner being. This condition exists with many people who possess some sort of learning or abstract philosophy. It is found in those who, unsatisfied in realizing their emptiness, have lost interest in all their knowledge and seem to be miserable. It can also be found when someone meets us with an abstract philosophy and begins giving out information in abstract terms on the nature of the Godhead of cosmology and the human soul. We feel it is all in his head, that his heart has no part in it, that his soul is empty. We feel chilled when we meet such a soul. Sankhya philosophy can lead to such a destiny, one that brings a person to realize that he is lost to himself, like one possessing nothing of his own, and from whose individuality the world can gain nothing. Let us take the case of a soul seeking development in a one-sided way through yoga, a soul lost, as it were, to the external world, and disdaining to know anything about it. Quote, what good is it to me, unquote, said, such a person says, quote, to learn how the world came into existence. I want to find out everything from out of my own self. I will advance myself by developing my own powers. Unquote. This person may perhaps feel an inward glow and may often appear somewhat self-contained and self-satisfied. Be that as it may, in the long run he will not always be so self-complacent, but in time he will be prone to a sense of loneliness. When one who had led a hermit's life while seeking the heights of soul development goes forth into the world and comes in contact everywhere with world phenomena, he may perhaps say to himself, What do all these things matter to me? Because he confronts these glorious revelations as an alien, without understanding, lonely, this one-sidedness will lead him to a fatal destiny. <clears throat> How often do we meet such people? How can we really get to know a man who is using all his powers in the development of his own being, and thus cold and indifferent, passes by his fellow men as though he wished to have nothing in common with them? Such a soul can feel itself lost to the world, while to others he can appear excessively egotistical. Only when one sees these life connections does one experience how world concepts become destiny. Behind such great disclosures and world views as are to be found in the Bhagavad Gita and the epistles of Paul, we see the influence of destiny. We might say that if we only look a little behind the Gita and also the epistles, we find a direct ruling of destiny. <clears throat> it is often indicated in the epistles that the real salvation of soul development consists in the so-called, quote, justification by faith, unquote, in contrast to the worthlessness of external works because of what the soul can gain when it finds the connection with the Christ impulse. That is, when it takes into itself the great force that flows from a true understanding of the resurrection of Christ. When we meet this in the epistles, we feel that the human soul is thrown back upon itself and can be estranged from all external works, thus coming to rely entirely upon grace and justification by faith. But then the external works are there in the world, and we do not wipe them out simply by turning away from them. We collide with them in the world. Again, destiny rings out in all its greatness. Only when things are looked at in this way can we realize the force of such utterances of mankind. <clears throat> now these two mighty works, the Gita and the Epistles, are outwardly quite different from each other, and this external difference acts in every part of these works upon the soul. We not only stand and wonder before the Gita for the reasons we have been considering, but also because it strikes us as being so poetically great and powerful. 
In every verse it radiates the great nobility of the human soul. Everything spoken by Krishna and his pupil Arjuna lifts us above everyday human experiences, above all passions and everything that disturbs the soul. We are transported into a sphere of serenity, clarity, calm dispassionateness, freedom from emotion, into an atmosphere of wisdom, when even one part of the Gita is allowed to work upon us. By reading it, our whole humanness is raised to a higher stage. We feel all through it that we must first have freed ourselves from a good deal that is only too human if we wish to allow the divine character of the Gita to affect us in the right way. With the Pauline epistles, all this is different. The sublimity of poetical language is lacking, as is the dispassionateness. When we let the epistles work upon us, we feel over and over again that what Paul says comes from a person who is passionately indignant uh, at what has happened. Someone Sometimes the tone is harsh and scolding, or one might even say condemning. What is stated about the great concepts of Christianity, about grace, the law, the difference between the law of Moses and Christianity, the resurrection, all this is put forth in a tone that is supposed to be philosophical, or in the nature of a philosophical definition. But it is not, because in every sentence one hears a Pauline note. Every sentence reminds us that a man is speaking who is either excited or is expressing justified anger over this or that which others have done. He speaks in such a way about the highest concepts of Christianity that we feel he is personally involved and gives the impression of being a propagandist of these ideas. Where could sentiments of such a personal nature be found in the Gita as are to be found in the epistles when Paul writes to one of the communities, quote, How have we ourselves interceded for Christ Jesus? Remember that we have not become a burden to any. How we have labored day and night that we might not be a burden to any. Unquote. How personal all this is. A breath of the personal surely runs through these epistles. In the sublime Gita, on the contrary, a wonderfully pure sphere is to be found, an etheric sphere, that borders on the superhuman and at times extends into it. Outwardly, therefore, there are enormous differences between these two works. It would be the blindest prejudice to refuse to admit that through the great song there flowed the union of mighty world concepts, and that something of lofty purity, impersonal, calm and passionless, was given to the Hindus. <clears throat> in contrast, in the very first documents of Christianity, the epistles of Paul, we find an entirely personal and often passionate expression, utterly devoid of calm. Knowledge is not attained by turning away from the truth and refusing to admit such things, but rather by understanding them in the right way. Like an unshakable signpost, let us therefore keep this contrast in mind during our following considerations. It was pointed out in the lecture yesterday that the Gita contains the significant instruction given by Arjuna, given Arjuna by Krishna. Now who exactly was Krishna? This question above all must be of interest to us. It is impossible, however, to understand who Krishna was if one is not familiar with something I have already mentioned in different places, namely that in earlier ages the system of giving names and designations was quite different from what it is now. Actually, it does not matter in the least what a man is called today. <clears throat> Little is known about a man in our time by learning that he is called Miller or Smith. Also, every one will admit that not much is really known about a man simply on hearing that he is a privy councillor or something of the kind nor is much known about people simply because their designation indicates their social rank, or they are to be addressed as Your Honor, Your Eminence, or only Dear Sir. In short, all these titles do not say much about a person, and it is easy to convince ourselves that other designations in use today do not reveal much either. In past ages this was different. Whether we see, whether we use the terms of the Sankhya philosophy or those of our own anthroposophy, we can start from either and make the following observations. According to the Sankhya philosophy, man consists of the coarse physical body, the finer elemental or etheric body, the body that contains the natural, law-filled forces of the senses, the body called manas, ahankara, and so on. But, when we observe men as they stand before us in this or that incarnation, we find they are different. In one, the ether body is more strongly expressed. In another, the laws of the senses predominate. 
in the third the inner sense of manas, in the fourth ahankara. The other higher members do not need to consider as they are excuse me, the other higher members we do not need to consider as they are not yet in general developed. Or in our own language there are people in whom the forces of the sentient soul are more active than those of the intellectual soul. Still others in whom forces of the consciousness soul predominate, others again in whom something inspired by manas plays a part, etc. These differences are to be seen in one's whole manner of life and point to the real nature of the man himself. For reasons that are easily understood, it is impossible at the present time to name a man according to his nature in the sense of what I have just said. With the widespread disposition of humanity as it is today, if one were to say that the highest a man could attain in the present cycle of his development was a trace of ahankara, everyone would be convinced that in his own being he expressed ahankara more clearly than anyone else. He would feel hurt if he were told that this was not yet the case, because a lower principle still ruled in him. It was not so in olden times. A man then received a name indicating what was most essential in him. This was especially true when there was a question of putting him above others, perhaps by giving him the role of a leader. He would then be given a name, expressing his most outstanding characteristic. Suppose that in past ages there was a man who in the most comprehensive way had brought manas to expression within him, a man who had certainly experienced ahankara but had allowed this as an individual element to slip more into the background so that for the sake of his effectiveness in the outer world he had brought his inner sense, manas, to the fore. According to the laws of the older, smaller evolutionary cycles, and only quite exceptional men could have embodied this, such a man would have been called upon to be a great lawgiver, a leader of great masses of people. It would not have been enough to name him as one named other men, but instead, according to his most outstanding capacity, quote, a manas bearer, unquote, while another would be designated merely as quote, sense bearer, unquote. one would have said, there is a manas bearer, a quote, unquote, manu. A man's name in past ages must be understood as descriptive of the most prominent member he possesses of the human organization, that which is foremost in his particular incarnation. Suppose that what thus specially came to expression in a man was that he felt a divine inspiration, that he had to put aside all question of ruling his studies and actions by what the external world decrees through the senses and through reasoning bound to the brain. Instead, in all things he listened to the divine word that spoke to him and thereby made himself a messenger for the divine substance that would speak through him. Such a man would have been called a, quote, son of God, unquote. Even at the time of the Gospel of St. John, right at the beginning of the first chapter, such men were still called, quote, sons of God, unquote. The essential point <clears throat> was that everything else was left out of consideration when the significant element was expressed. Everything else was unimportant. Consider two men, one just an ordinary man who allowed the world to act upon him through his senses and who then reflected upon it with the intellect bound to his brain, and the other, an individual into whom the world of divine wisdom had streamed. According to those ideas out of the past, one would say that the first man was born of a father and mother, begotten according to the flesh. With the other, the messenger of the divine substance, no consideration would have been given to the usual content of a biography, as with the first man. To write such a biography of the second man would have been folly, for the fact of his fleshly body was only incidental, not the essential thing. His fleshly body was, so to speak, only the means through which he expressed himself to other men. For this reason it is said that the Son of God was not born of flesh, but of a virgin, directly from the Spirit. And the essential element in him which rendered him of value to humanity was descended from the Spirit. In past ages that element alone was stressed. In certain schools of initiation it would have been considered a great sin to write an ordinary biography recounting everyday occurrences in the life of a person who is recognized as specially significant because of possessing the higher members of human nature. Anyone with even a faint feeling for the sentiments of those ancient times can only consider biographies such as those written today of Goethe, for example, 
as being in the highest degree absurd. Let us remember that in those days men lived with ideas and feelings such as these. Then we can understand how this ancient humanity could be permeated with the conviction that a Manu, in whom Manas was the prevailing principle, appeared, but seldom and must wait long epochs of time before appearing again. If we think of what can live in a human being of our era as the most essential part of him, which every man can dimly sense as the secret forces capable of raising him to heights of soul, if we think how this exists in most men only in rudimentary form and very rarely becomes man's essential principle, if we think of a personality who only from time to time appears in the world in order to be a leader of men, who is higher than all the Manus, who dwells as an essence in every man, and who as an actual person in outer life appears only once in a world epoch, if we let such a concept take shape, it brings us near to the being of Krishna. Krishna is universal man. He is, one might almost say, all humanity thought of as a single being. Yet he is no abstraction. When people today speak of mankind in general, they speak of it in the abstract. Because we have become so largely ensnared in the sense world, abstraction has become our common fate. To speak of mankind in general is a vague concept that does not come to life. Those who speak about Krishna as man in general do not mean that kind of an abstract idea. They say, this being lives potentially in every man, but only once in every world epoch does he appear and speak the language of man. With this being, however, it is not the external fleshly body, not the more refined elemental body, not the forces of the sense organs, not ahankara, not manas, that is significant. The important characteristic is what in buddhi and manas is directly connected with the great universal substance, with the divine that lives and weaves through the world. From time to time, beings such as Krishna, the great teacher of Arjuna, appears for the guidance of mankind. Krishna teaches the highest human wisdom, the highest that humanity can attain, and he gives it as his own nature, yet in such a way that it harmonizes with every human soul. Everything contained in the words of Krishna is to be found as a predisposition in every human soul. So when a man looks up to Krishna, he is looking up to his own highest self. But he is also looking up to another being in whom he honors what he himself has the predisposition to become. The other is a separate being from himself and bears the same relationship to him as a god to man. In this way must we conceive the relation of Krishna to his pupil. Then the key tone of the Gita will sound out to us as though it concerned every soul, a tone ringing through every one in such an intimately human way as to make the soul feel guilty if it did not have a longing to listen to these great teachings. On the other hand, it all seems so calm and without emotion, so dispassionate, so sublime and wise, because the highest in every human being speaks here, that which is divine and yet appears incarnated once as a divine human entity in the evolution of humanity. How exalted are these teachings! So much so that the Bhagavad Gita rightfully bears the name, quote, sublime song, unquote. Here we meet with a teaching given in exalted words, that everything appearing as changes in the world, arising and passing away, birth and death, victory or defeat, still have expressed in them something imperishable, eternal, permanently existing. He who wishes to view the world rightly must struggle through the transitory and reach this eternal element. We have already met this in the reasoned reflections of the Sankhya philosophy on the permanence to be found in everything transitory, on the quality before God of the conquered and the victorious souls when the door of death closes behind them. But Krishna also tells Arjuna that by another path a soul can be led away from thinking of everyday matters, and that is through yoga. Thus there are two paths by which the soul may develop. One is to pass from one phenomenon to another, making use of the wealth of related ideas, whether or not they are illuminated by clairvoyance. The other path 
is where a man turns his attention entirely away from the outer world, closes the door of his senses, shuts out all that reason and understanding can say about the outer world, closes himself to all he can remember, having experienced in his ordinary life, then endeavors to enter into his inmost being. <clears throat> By means of suitable exercises, he tries to draw forth what rests within his soul. He directs his efforts toward the highest that can be imagined, which, out of the force of contemplation, seeks to rise. When this happens, he rises by means of yoga ever higher, until he reaches those higher levels attainable by first making use of his bodily instrument. He attains those stages in which one is set free of all bodily organs and lives, as it were, outside the body in the higher principles of the human constitution. In this way he raises himself into a completely different form of life. The phenomena of life and their activities becomes spiritu become spiritualized. He approaches ever nearer to his own divine nature and enlarges his individual being to that of cosmic being, to God, in that he loses the limits of his own individuality and is merged in the all through yoga. The pupil of the great Krishna is then given methods by which he can rise in one way or another to these spiritual heights. First he is shown the difference between the two attitudes to be faced in the outer world. It is indeed a tremendous situation that the Gita here presents. Arjuna must fight his blood relatives. That is his outer destiny, his task, his karma, the sum of the deeds he must first accomplish directly in this situation. In these deeds he lives as external man, but the great Krishna teaches him that a man only becomes wise, only unites himself with the eternally divine, when he performs his deeds because they prove to be necessary in the outer course of nature and of human evolution. Even so, as a wise man, he must free himself from them. He performs the deeds, but in him there is something that at the same time acts as onlooker, something that takes no part in the deeds but says, I do the work, but I could just as well say that I let it happen. <clears throat> one becomes wise by looking on at what one does as though it were being done by another, by not allowing oneself to be disturbed by the pleasure the deed gives, nor by the sorrow it causes. Quote, it is all the same, unquote, says Krishna to Arjuna, Quote, whether you are in the ranks of the sons of Pandu or are there among the sons of Kuru, whatever you do, as a wise man, you must make yourself free from the Pandus and Kurus. If it does not affect you whether you are to act with the Pandus as though one of them or with the Kurus as though you were a son of Kuru, if you can rise above all this and not be disturbed by your own deeds, if you can live in your deeds like a quietly burning flame, protected from the wind, undisturbed by anything outside you, and your soul, undisturbed by its deeds, lives quietly beside them, then do you become wise. Then does your soul free itself from its deeds and no longer inquires as to their results. Unquote. For the results of one's deeds concern only our narrowly limited soul. But if deeds are performed because the development of humanity or world events require them, then they are performed without, without regard to consequences, whether they lead us to what is dreadful or glorious, to suffering or delight. This lifting oneself above one's deeds, this standing upright, no matter what one's hands may carry out, even to what one's sword may do, or what one speaks, this uprightness of one's innermost self in face of everything, one may speak or do with one's hands, this it is to which the great Krishna leads his pupil, Arjuna. Arjuna is directed to a human ideal, presented in such a way that a man can say to himself, quote, I perform my deeds, but whether I or another performs them, I observe them. What happens by my hand or is spoken by my mouth, I see as objectively as I might watch a loose rock on a mountainside roll down into a ravine. Though I may be in a position to know this or that and to form concepts of the world, I remain quite separate from them. I can say in me lives something that is suited to me, that knows, that knows, but I look on as if it were another one who knows. In this way I free myself even from my knowledge. I can become free of my deeds, free of my knowledge, free of my understanding." Unquote. An exalted ideal of human wisdom is presented here. 
when the spiritual is finally reached, where the demons or holy spirits are encountered, they also can be looked upon externally. The man stands there, free from everything going on around him, even in the spiritual worlds. He looks on, goes his own way, and takes no part in in what engages him, because he has become an onlooker. That is the teaching of Krishna. As we have heard that these teachings are based on the Sankhya philosophy, it is understandable that in many places this philosophy can be seen shining through, as when Krishna informs his pupil that the soul living in him has various ties, to the coarse physical body, to the senses, to manas, ahankara and buddhi. But Arjuna himself is apart from them all. If he regards these entities as external, as sheaths surrounding him, if he is conscious that as a soul being he is independent of them all, then will he have understood something of what Krishna has tried to teach him. If he is aware that his connections with the outer world, with the world in general, were given him through the gunas, through tamas, rajas and sattva, then he has learned that in ordinary life man is connected with wisdom and kindness through sattva, with the passions, emotions and thirst for existence through rajas, and that through tamas he tends to be lazy, idle, sleepy. Why does a man in ordinary life feel enthusiasm for wisdom and kindness? Because he has a connection with that foundation of nature that is designated as sattva. Why does he go through ordinary life joyful and eager for outer existence, for life's outer manifestations? Because he has a relation to life indicated by rajas. Why do others go through ordinary life sleepy, lazy, inactive, feeling oppressed by their corporeality and finding it impossible to rouse themselves any moment to prevail over their bodily natures because they are connected with the world of external forms, which in Sankhya philosophy is expressed through the condition of tamas. The soul of the wise man, however, must become free from tamas, It must sever its connection with the external world expressed in sleepiness, laziness and torpor. When this is done, then the soul is only connected with the external world through rajas and sattva. If he further extinguishes his passions and emotions, his thirst for existence, retaining only his enthusiasm for kindness, compassion and knowledge, he remains connected with the external world through sattva. But when a man has also become liberated from the urge to goodness and knowledge, when as a good and wise man he is independent of how he expresses himself in the outside world, when kindness has become a natural duty and wisdom is as something poured out over him, then he has also broken his tie with sattva. With the three gunas stripped off, he has freed himself from all connection with every external form. Then he triumphs in his soul and has come to understand something of what the great Krishna has wanted to make of him. What then does a man grasp when he strives to become the ideal that Krishna holds before him? What does he come to understand? Does he understand the forms of the outer world more clearly? No, he had understood these before, but now he has raised himself above them. Is he able to comprehend more exactly the relation of the soul to external forms? No, he had already understood that, but now he has raised himself above it. It is not what it he meets in the multitude of forms of the outside world, <clears throat> nor is it his connection with these forms that he now understands when he strips off the three gunas. All that belongs to early all that belongs to earlier stages. As long as one remains in tamas, rajas, or sattva, one has a relationship with the natural foundation of existence. One adapts oneself to social relationships and to knowledge and acquires the capacities for kindness and sympathy. But when one rises above them all, that, excuse me, but when one rises even above all that, one has stripped off all connections with the preceding stages. What comes before one then? What then does one comprehend? There comes before his eyes just what these are not. What is it that is distinct from everything one acquires? along the path within the gunas. What only can that be? It is none other than what one finally recognizes as his own being. For everything belonging to the external has been stripped away. In the sense of what has previously been said, this is Krishna himself, for he himself is the expression 
of what is highest in man. That is to say, when man has worked up to the highest, he stands face to face with Krishna, the pupil to the great teacher, Arjuna to Krishna himself, who lives in all things that exist and who can truly say of himself, quote, I am not a solitary mountain. When I am among the mountains, I am the most gigantic of all. When I appear upon earth, I am not a single man, but the revelation of the consummately human, who appears only once in a world epoch as a leader of mankind. That am I, Krishna, the unity in all forms. Unquote. In this way, the teacher himself sets forth his own being to his pupil. At the same time, it is made clear in the Bhagavad Gita that this is an exalted revelation, the highest to which man can attain. So, to stand face to face before Krishna, as Arjuna is some, as, Ar, as did Arjuna, sorry, so to stand face to face before Ar, Krishna, as did Arjuna, is something that could come about through gradual stages of initiation. It would happen in the depths of a yoga schooling. It can also be represented as flowing from the evolution of humanity itself, as given to man by an act of grace. Thus it is expressed in the Gita. As if in a sudden great leap, Arjuna is lifted high and finds Krishna bodily before him. He does not appear as a man of flesh and blood, however, because such a man would represent the non-essential in Krishna. For what is essential is that which is essential in all men. But as the other kingdoms of the world represent fragments of man, so all that comprises the world, apart from man, is Krishna. The rest of the world disappears and Krishna stands there as the One. As the macrocosm is related to the microcosm, as mankind as a whole can be compared to the small everyday man, so does Krishna stand in relation to the individual man. Should a man gain this conception through an act of grace, his human comprehension would not be sufficient to grasp it, because if one looks at the essential in Krishna, which is only possible to one possessing the highest clairvoyant power, he appears quite different from anything man is accustomed to see. As though man's vision of the human being, the vision of Krishna in his highest nature, were uplifted above all else, so there comes before us at the moment in the Gita, the sublime human being, beside whom everything else in the world appears trivial in comparison. It is this awesome being before whom Arjuna stands, and his power of comprehension forsakes him. He can only stare and haltingly try to express what he beholds. That is understandable, for by all the means he has known up to now, he has not learned how to take in such a revelation and describe it in words. The way Arjuna puts into words out of the depths of his soul what he feels as he actually sees the great Krishna is one of the most magnificent outpourings ever given to humanity in connection with art and philosophy. <clears throat> in words he had never uttered before, words such as he was unaccustomed to speaking, could never have spoken before that moment because he had never seen such a sight. He stands there before Krishna and begins to utter the words that come to him to say, Long quote. All gods do I perceive in thy body, O God. So also the host of beings, Lord Brahma enthroned upon the lotus, the rishis and the heavenly serpent. I see thee in countless forms, O God of all, with many arms and bodies, eyes and mouths, forms with neither end, middle nor beginning. I see thee everywhere, O infinite form. Thou, appearing to me in all these forms, with diadem, with cudgel, and with sword, like a flaming mountain radiating outward in all directions, stunned do I behold thee, dazzled in my vision as by fire, and the immeasurable brilliance of the sun, the everlasting, the highest one can know, the greatest good, all this thou art, and more. As guardian of eternal law and justice, as timeless primal spirit thee I see, without beginning, middle, nor end, limitless power thou hast throughout all space, large as the moon, yes, even as the sun itself thine eyes are shining, and from thy mouth there comes a stream of radiant light like sacrificial fire. I see thee, how thy radiant glow streams out a warmth to fill all heaven and earth, and spaces in between, and with it too the whole resounding with thy vibrant power. 
With thee and heaven alone I stand, Wherein the three worlds live, And to my gaze the awesome figure hovers over all, While waves of wonder round about thee roll. I see how multitudes of gods come to thee, singing out thy praises. Affrighted do I stand with folded hands, as seers and the blessed to thee sing songs of glory. Adityas, Rudras, Vasus, Sadyas, Viswas, Aswins, Maruts, Ushmapas, Gandharvas, Yakshas, Siddhas, Azuras, all the blessed praise thee and look to thee in wonder. A body so gigantic, many mouths and arms and thighs and feet, and many bodies with many open maws and frightful fangs. Before all this the world and I, too, tremble. Thou the heaven-shaking one, I see, the radiant one, the many-armed, with great flaming eyes and fiery mouth, my soul is quaking. No support, no peace I find, O Krishna, who for me is Vishnu's very self. I look into thy threatening being, which firelight works on beyond the end of all the ages. I am aware of thee as I cannot be of anything else. O oh, have mercy on me, Lord of all the gods, thou habitable shelter for all the worlds. End quote. He turns and points to the sons of the Kuru tribe, Quote, These sons of the Kurus, this throng of noble heroes, Bhishma and Drona, and the best warriors among us, they all prostrate, worship thee, o'erwhelmed with all thy fiery power and grandeur, primal origin of universal being. I yearn to know thee. I cannot comprehend what now I see, all that is here revealed to me. Unquote. In this way Arjuna speak. Excuse me. In this way does Arjuna speak when he is alone with that which is his own being, when it appears objectively before him. We are confronted here with a great cosmic mystery, a mystery not because of its theoretical content, but because of the overpowering feeling it arouses in us when we are able to grasp it correctly. It is so full of mystery that it must speak differently to all human feeling than ever in the world was anything spoken before. When Krishna himself speaks, what resounds to the ear of Arjuna rings out so. Quote, I am time, who destroys all worlds. I am come to snatch men away. Although you bring them to death in battle, even without you all the warriors standing in phalanx are prey to death. Arise then unaffrighted. You shall win honor in conquering the foe. Exult over the beckoning victory. Not you will have slain them when they fall in battle. Through me they have already died, they all. Before you can bring them to death, be but my tool, my hand in his work, Drona, Jayardana, Bhishma, Karna, and the other heroes in the war, I have slain them already. Now you go kill them, so that what I have done will appear in illusion outwardly. When they fall dead in Maya, killed by me, now you kill them so that which I have done will seemingly appear as done by you. Fight! They will fall by your sword, whom I have killed." Unquote. We know that the instruction given by Krishna to Arjuna among the sons of Pandu is related to the blind hero Drit Dhritarashtra, king of the Kurus, by Sanjaya, his charioteer. Continuing this report of what is happening on the battlefield, Sanjaya says that when Arjuna had heard the words of Krishna, he trembled, folded his hands, and, though seized with fear, bowed low to Krishna, and with faltering but reverent speech said, quote, What right doth the world rejoice in thy glory, and stand before thee in fearsome awe? The Raja spirits, terrified, flee in every direction, while the saintly hosts bow before thee. And why should they not do homage to the primal creator, more worthy even than Brahma. End quote. Truly we stand before a cosmic mystery. For what does Arjuna say upon seeing his own self before him in bodily form? He addresses his own being as though it were higher than Brahma himself. We are face to face with a mystery. For when a man speaks to his own being in this way, his words must be understood without anything of the feelings, perceptions, ideas, thoughts of ordinary life entering into his understanding. 
Nothing could put a man in greater danger than to bring into these words of Arjuna a feeling such as he might otherwise have in life. If he were to do this, not realizing this was something unique, not sensing it as the greatest cosmic mystery, if he were to meet a Krishna, his own higher being, with but ordinary feeling, then insanity, megalomania, would be as nothing compared to the illness that would befall him. Long quote. Lord of all gods, thou art everlasting, eternal, the highest, at once all that is and all that is not. Thou art supreme, most ancient among spirits, the most sublime treasure in the whole universe. Thou art the one who knows in consciousness. Thou embracest everything, every form existing. Thou art the wind, fire, death, the moon, the ceaseless surging of the cosmic ocean. Not only the highest of the gods thou art, but the ancestor of the highest, the name itself. Worship must be thine a thousand thousand times and more. To every aspect of thy being, thou art all that ever a human can be, powerful as only the total of all power can be. Thou bringest everything to perfection, thou art all. If impulsively I deem thee my friend, calling thee Krishna, Yiva, friend, unmindful and too familiar before thy greatness, if I do not rightly honor thee in thy traveling or in stillness when thou art at rest, when thou art with the most divine or the commonplace, whether thou be alone or with other beings, if in all this my reverence is faulty, forgive me then immeasurable one. Thou Father of the world, who set it in motion, and in which thou movest, thou art teacher above every other teacher, incomparable in all three worlds. Prostrate before thee I seek mercy, Lord God. Fear him who reveals himself, excuse me, from him who reveals himself everywhere. In fearsome awe I tremble to see in thee what has never before been beheld. Show thyself to me as thou art, O God. Be merciful, fountainhead of the universe. Unquote. Truly, we, have con we are confronted with a mystery when one human being speaks to another in this manner. Again, Krishna speaks to his pupil quote, I have revealed myself to you in mercy. Before you stands my highest being, radiant, primal, immeasurable, conjured up through my omnipotence. As you see me, no other has ever seen. Through the forces now given you by grace, you see me as never was I revealed. Neither in the Vedas, nor through sacrifices, not by any holy dispensation. None has attained to me through study, nor through any kind of ceremony. Not after dreadful penance can one see my human form as you now see it. Mighty hero, be not frightened nor bewildered at sight of my terrifying figure. Fearless and high-minded shall you behold me, when again you see me in familiar shape." Unquote. Then Sanjaya tells the blind Dhritarashtra that when Krishna had spoken these words to Arjuna, the immeasurable one, without beginning and without end, supreme above all powers, vanished, and Krishna showed himself again in his friendly human form as though he wished thus to reassure the shocked Arjuna. Arjuna spoke, quote, Now I see thee once more before me in thy human form. Now consciousness and knowledge return to me, and I am myself again, unquote. And Krishna said, quote, That shape of mine you have seen, which was so difficult for you to behold, is the form even gods have endlessly longed to see. The Vedas do not indicate my shape, nor will it be attained by repentance, nor by charity, sacrifice, nor any kind of ritual. Through none of these am I to be seen in this form you have now seen. Only one who knows how to free himself from all Vedas, from repentances, charities, sacrifices and ceremonials, and in solitude look upon me reverently, only he can recognize me in the form you have seen, and can become one with me. He who does as I have inspired him to do, who loves and honors me, who cares not for the world and is full of love for all creatures, he it is who comes to me, O my son of the tribe of Pandu." Unquote. Here is a cosmic mystery communicated to mankind at a most significant cosmic hour, at a time when the old clairvoyance, dependent upon the blood, ceases, and human souls must seek new paths to what is unending, to the eternal. So is this mystery brought to our attention, that at the same time we may observe all that can become dangerous to man when he is able to see his own being, which he himself has brought to birth. 
If we grasp this deepest of human and cosmic mysteries, which reveals our own being through true self-knowledge, there stands before us then the greatest world riddle. But it may only be put before us when it is reverenced in all humility. No intellectual comprehension suffices to approach this cosmic mystery, only the right feeling. No one may approach this mystery which speaks out of the Gita who cannot do so reverently. This feeling alone makes possible a complete comprehension of it. How, directly by means of what the Gita reveals about a certain stage of human evolution, fresh light can be thrown upon what is to be found at another stage, as shown in the epistles of Paul, this will occupy us in the further course of these lectures. The end of Lecture 3 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which is separated into two parts. This is Lecture 4 of the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul. It is entitled The Essence of the Bhagavad Gita and the Significance of the Pauline Letters, given on December 31st, 1912. Already in the beginning of yesterday's lecture I pointed out how varied are the impressions we receive when we let the calm, dispassionate, wisdom-filled character of the Bhagavad Gita work upon us, then think of what pervades the epistles of Paul, the personal opinions and aims, passionately expressed, often in a spirit of agitating propaganda, at times even with temperamental scolding or with boiling rage. In the Gita, the way its spiritual content comes to expression reveals a wonderful artistically rounded form, so perfect that we can hardly conceive it more so, both as poetry and philosophy. In contrast, in the Pauline epistles, one often finds such an awkwardness of expression as makes it very difficult, a real hindrance in ferreting out his deep meaning. In spite of all this, it is true to say that these epistles give the tone and establish the directives for the development of Christianity, as the harmonized tones of the Eastern world concepts come to expression in the Gita. Indeed, in the epistles, all the significant truths of Christianity are to be found, those regarding the resurrection, the meaning of faith as compared to the law, the nature of grace, the life of Christ in the soul or in human consciousness, and much else. All this is put in such a way that again and again, it, in presenting Christianity, one must proceed from these Pauline epistles. Everything in them relates to Christianity as the Bhagavad Gita relates to the great truths about freeing oneself from the immediate activities of living, so that the soul may sink itself into observing everything, into contemplation, into raising itself to spiritual heights and purifying itself, in short, in preparing itself for union with Krishna. Everything here characterized shows how difficult it is to make a comparison between the two spiritual revelations. One who does so superficially would doubtless give a higher place to the Gita because of its purity, serenity, and wisdom. But if he does so, it is as if he had before him a full-grown plant with a beautiful blossom and beside it a seed, and then says, This plant with its gorgeous, fully developed blossom is much more beautiful than the insignificant plant seed. But it might be that out of the seed would come one day a still more beautiful plant and blossom. One does not make a true comparison when one looks directly from a fully matured plant to an entirely undeveloped seed. So it is as if one compares the Bhagavad Gita and the epistles of Paul. In the Gita is the fully ripened fruit, a wonderfully beautiful outgrowth of human evolution throughout thousands of years, which finally comes to a ripe, wise and artistic expression in the sublime Gita. In the epistles is the seed of something entirely new which grows and must continue to grow. Only when one sees it as germinal, as prophetic of what could come of it after thousands and thousands of years of development into the future, can one sense the full significance of this steadily ripening seed laid into the human soil by the Pauline epistles. For a true comparison this has to be considered. Then it is also clear that what some day should be great 
had first to pour out of the human soul in a homely, chaotic form from the depths of the Christianity in these epistles. Thus the significance of the Gita and the epistles for the collective evolution of mankind on earth must be judged differently, not merely according to the beauty, wisdom, and inner perfection of form to be found in a finished product. For a comparison of the two world concepts given in the Gita and the epistle, one must first ask what is their main concern. Through being able to view in historical perspective everything connected with these concepts, we see that their chief concern is with the entrance of man's ego into the stream of human evolution. If one traces this process, one finds that in pre-Christian times this ego lacked independence. It was still rooted in hidden depths of the soul. Not yet was it possible for it to develop itself. This could only come about through the inthrust of what we call the Christ impulse. That which can take place since the mystery of Golgotha and was expressed in the words of Paul, quote, not I, but Christ in me, unquote, could not have existed previously in the human ego. But in the millennium before the mystery of Golgotha, when the Christ impulse was drawing nearer, there was gradually prepared what then should occur through the entry of this impulse into the human soul. It was prepared in such a way as came to expression in the deed of Krishna, within himself then, in the sense of the Pauline formula, quote, not I, but Christ in me, unquote, man had to seek the Christ impulse after the mystery of Golgotha. Before that <coughs> event, it had to be sought as a revelation coming to him out of the cosmos. And the further back one goes in time, the more brilliant, the more impulsive one finds this outer revelation to be. So we can say that previous to the mystery of Golgotha a certain revelation came to mankind from outside like sunlight streaming down upon an object. In such a way did the light of the spiritual sun illuminate man's soul from outside enveloping it in light. After the mystery of Golgotha the Christ impulse worked within the soul like spiritual sunlight as if the soul were a self-illumining body radiating its light from within. Looked at in this way, the fact of the mystery of Golgotha becomes a significant borderline in human evolution. Before the Christ impulse entered the soul, it was like a drop shining with the light radiating into it from every direction. After this mystery, if the soul had taken in the Christ impulse, light streamed out from it as from an inner flame. With this in mind, we can express this whole relationship with the designations we learned to know in the Sankhya philosophy. If our spiritual eye, EYE, is turned to a soul that before the mystery of Golgotha was shown upon by spiritual light from every side, it appears to be in the sattva condition. In contrast, after this mystery had taken place, the soul appears as if the spiritual light were hidden in its depths, the soul's own nature concealing it. It is as if the soul's substance ensheathed the light that contains the Christ impulse. Now is this not the situation up to our time, especially in our own time in regard to everything man experiences externally? Observe a man today as he has to be occupied with outer knowledge and activities. Then how, like a small flame giving a feeble light, the Christ impulse lies deep within him, enclosed by the other contents of his soul. In contrast to the pre-Christian condition called sattva, this relationship of spirit to soul is the tamas condition. Viewed in this way, what did the mystery of Golgotha bring into human evolution? It transformed the manner of spirit revelation from the sattva condition to that of tamas. Through this humanity advanced, but it also constituted, one might say, a deep fall, not occasioned by the mystery, but by humanity itself. The mystery of Golgotha caused the tiny flame to grow ever brighter, but it appears to be faint compared to the powerful light that shone upon the soul from all sides before the event, because progressing human nature was sinking ever deeper into darkness. Thus the mystery of Golgotha is not to be blamed for the tamas condition of the soul as it relates to the spirit. Rather, the spirit made it possible for the tamas condition to come again in the distant future into the sattva condition, which is now kindled from within outward. 
In the sense of the Sankhya philosophy, the Rajas condition lies between that of Sattva and Tamas and is characteristic of the evolutionary period in which the mystery of Golgotha occurred. As to the manifesting spirit, humanity itself went the way from light to darkness, from the Sattva to the Tamas condition during the thousands of years surrounding the mystery of Golgotha. To make it more exact, and then he has a picture, a line A to B, the Chaldean Egyptian, underneath it says Chaldean Egyptian, and then in the middle Greco-Roman, and on the right today, and above those in two sections, the 7th century BC lies between the Chaldean Egyptian and the Greco-Roman, and the 15th century lies between Greco-Roman and today. If we indicate the evolution of mankind by the line A to B, up to about the 8th or 7th century BC, all human culture was in the Sattva condition. Then began the age in which the mystery of Golgotha occurred, and around the 15th or 16th century AD, a transition to the Tamas age definitely set in. Using our customary terms, the first epoch, which for certain spiritual revelations fell into the Sattva condition, coincided with what we call the egypto chaldean period. What was of the Rajas condition came in the Greco-Latin epoch. That of the Tamas condition is in our own age. We know that in post-Atlantean times this egypto chaldean era is the third, the Greco-Latin the fourth, and ours the fifth. There had to take place, we might say, according to the plan of human evolution, a deadening of outer revelation in passing from the third into the fourth period. How was mankind actually prepared for the flashing up of the Christ impulse? If we wish to be clear about how man's spiritual relationships in the egypto chaldean epoch differed from those of the following epochs, we must recognize that in this third period the people in all those lands, including India, still possessed a remnant of the old clairvoyance. That means they not only saw the world through their senses and their intelligence bound to the brain, but also through the organs of the etheric body, at least under certain conditions between sleeping and waking. To picture a man of that era, we must recognize that for everyone viewing the outer world of nature as we do now through our physical senses and reasoning, this was but one way of experiencing the world. They did not arrive at knowledge. They only looked at things as they were in action, side by side in space, and successively in time. To achieve knowledge, they had to come into a certain condition, not cultivated, as with us, but quite natural, which happened as if by itself, as the deeper forces of their etheric bodies were aroused so as to produce knowledge. Out of such knowledge emerged all the wonderful wisdom that appeared in the Sankhya philosophy, also what has come down to us in the wisdom of the Vedas, though this belonged to a more ancient time. Thus man attained knowledge in that time, either by bringing himself into another state of consciousness or feeling himself transported into it. He had his everyday consciousness, in which he used his eyes and ears and carried on his activities with his ordinary intelligence, but he used these faculties only in his outer practical affairs. It would not have occurred to him to attain knowledge or science by such means. For this he had to employ what came to him in another state of mind, wherein he activated his deeper forces. So, we can conceive man in that ancient time as having his everyday body, and within this his finer spiritual body, his Sunday body, if I may put it so. With his everyday body he did his everyday work. With his Sunday body, woven only out of the etheric body, he perceived and developed his science. It would be correct to say that a man of that time would be astonished that he now obtained knowledge by means of our everyday body, never putting on our Sunday bodies when we want to know something about the world. How then did a man of that time experience all these conditions? When he gained knowledge through his deeper powers, for instance, in developing the Sankhya philosophy, he did not feel as man today feels, who, when he wants to gain knowledge, has to strain his intellect and think with his head. To gain knowledge, he felt himself to be in his ether body, which was only slightly extended into what today is the physical head, but was more defined in the other parts of the body. Man then thought much more with the other members of his etheric body. In the head, the ether body was the least developed, so that in thinking a man felt lifted out of his physical body. But in such moments of forming knowledge, of scientific thinking, 
he felt also as if he were united with the earth. When he took off his everyday body and put on his Sunday body, he felt as though forces flowed through his whole being, as when forces coursing through our limbs and feet connect us with the earth, and when flowing through our hands and arms connect themselves with our body. He began to feel himself as part of the earth. On one side he was aware of thinking and knowing in his ether body, and on the other that he was no longer a separated man, but a part of the earth. He felt himself growing into the earth. Thus the whole inner way of experiencing changed when a man put on his Sunday body and prepared to gain knowledge. What then had to happen to bring this third epoch to a close and let the fourth one enter? If we wish to understand this, it would be well if we felt our way into the whole way of designating things. A man in that ancient time who experienced what I have been describing would say, quote, The serpent has become active within me. Unquote. His being had been extended into the earth. He felt his physical body not as the active part of him, but that a serpent like appendage of himself stretched into the earth, and the head was what stuck out of the earth. He felt this serpent think- being to be the thinker. He could indicate it so. His ether body stretched into the earth like a serpent, and while he, as physical man, was outside the earth, when he was thinking and understanding, he penetrated the earth and thought with his ether body. So in ancient times, to apprehend something meant, quote, I stir into action the serpent within me. I feel my serpent nature, unquote. What then had to happen to bring about the new way of knowing? It was to be no longer possible for man to feel himself extended into the earth through his limbs and feet. Also feeling it to die away in his ether body and had to pass instead into his physical head. If you correctly picture this change, you will find it well expressed by saying, quote, one is wounded in the feet, but with his own body he crushes the serpent's head, unquote, which means the serpent's head ceases to be the organ of thinking. The physical brain kills the serpent, which takes revenge by withdrawing man's feeling of belonging to the earth. It bites one on the heel. At such times of transition from one form of human experience to another, there is conflict, since the two forms still exist side by side. A father is still there after the son has lived for years, yet the son bears in him what derives from the father. The characteristics of the fourth, the Greco-Latin epoch, were present while those of the third epoch were still active in people and nations. Such intermingling naturally goes with evolution, but the influx of the old and the old receding alongside it brings it about that they do not understand each other well. The old does not understand the new. The new must protect itself from the old, must assert its faith, its life in the face of it. Yet while the new is there, the forefathers, who have not assimilated the new, project their qualities into their descendants. In this way we can characterize the transition from the third to the fourth period of human culture. Now, there had to be a hero, one might say, a leader who is an outstanding representative of this process of killing the serpent and being wounded by it, and who at the same time has to rebel against what, to be sure, is related to him, but whose faculties still shine into the new, into the new out of the past era. Humanity must go forward in such a way that what generations are to experience, some one person must first experience in its full greatness. Who was this hero who killed the head of the serpent and rebelled against the significance of the third epoch, leading mankind out of the old Sattva period into that of Tamas? This hero was Krishna. How could this be more definitely indicated than by the oriental legend showing Krishna as a son of the gods Mahadeva and Devaki, who entered the world amid wonderful happenings, that is, as a bringer of something new. Continuing with my analogy, he leads men to seek knowledge by way of their everyday bodies. He slays the Sunday body, the serpent. He has to resist what his kindred bring over into the new age. Such a person is something new, wonderful. So the legend relates how Krishna, already at birth, was surrounded by miraculous occurrences, and that his uncle Kanza sought to kill him. Here in his uncle we see the in-thrust of the old forces that Krishna had to oppose in order to kill off the influences of the third epoch, hindering mankind's evolution. He had to rebel against Kanza, 
as being of the old Sattva era. Among the most significant miracles surrounding Krishna, the legend tells how the powerful serpent Kali wound around him, but he succeeded in crushing its head, whereby he was wounded on the heel. Thus the legend directly reflects an occult fact, as legends do. One should not give superficial explanations of legends, but really understand them, see them in the right relation to true knowledge. Krishna is the hero of the declining third post-Atlantean epoch. The legend tells us that he appeared at the end of this age, so everything hangs together when rightly understood. Krishna is the one who killed the old faculty of perception and cast it into darkness. He did this in his outer manifestations, bringing into eclipse what had surrounded mankind earlier as sattva knowledge. He is shown in the Bhagavad Gita as the one who gives to one single person to compensate for what he had taken away, instruction for attaining through yoga what to normal humanity was being lost. Thus for the world Krishna is the destroyer of the old sattva knowledge, and at the same time he appears at the end of the Gita as the lord of yoga, who leads the way again to the knowledge that has been left behind, that knowledge which can only be recovered if man ceases to be dominated by what he has drawn about him like everyday clothes and returns to the old spiritual condition. Such was the twofold deed of Krishna. As a world historical hero, he crushed the head of the old serpent knowledge and forced humanity to enter into the physical body, whereas earlier everything contributing to man's egohood streamed into him from outside, from now on it would only be possible by means of the physical body to develop his ego as a free self-dependent entity. Thus Krishna was a world historical hero. He restored to individual man for meditation, contemplation and inner discovery what was once lost. It is this which enters in such a grand way in the Gita scene that we let work upon our souls at the end of the lecture yesterday. Arjuna confronting his own nature, but seen outwardly, outspread through all space, without beginning or end. If we examine the Gita exactly, we come to a place in the Gita that again makes us wonder at its limitless greatness. People today must find this passage impossible to explain. It is where Krishna reveals to Arjuna the nature of the Avayata tree, the fig tree, saying that with this tree the roots grow upward and the branches downward, that its single leaves are those of the Veda book, which together contain the Veda knowledge. Now, this is a peculiar passage. What does it mean? To understand it, we must go back to the old knowledge and see clearly its effects. Man today only gains knowledge through his physical organs. The old knowledge was gained, as we have said, through the etheric body. Not that the total man was etheric, but his knowledge came through the part of his ether body that was in the physical. Imagine for a moment that you are perceiving in your etheric body with its serpent. That was an objective fact which no longer exists for man today. At present, <clears throat> he observes much in his environment quite naturally. But look at him as he views the world. There is one thing he does not see. No man can see his own brain when he is observing. No one can see the marrow of his own spine. But this impossibility ceases when one observes by means of the ether body. Then a new object appears. Otherwise invisible, he sees his own nervous system. But he certainly does not see it as an anatomist at present sees it. Rather, he has the feeling, quote, There you are in your etheric nature. You look upward and see how the nerves spread into all the organs, collecting together up in the brain. You feel that it is a tree, with its roots stretching upward and its branches extending down into all the limbs, unquote. <clears throat> Actually, this is not experienced as small enough to be contained within our own skin, but as a great world tree, the roots reaching out into space and the branches downward. One feels himself a serpent, seeing this nerve system objectively before him. Remember that in earlier lectures I said that man, in a certain sense, is a plant upside down. We must put all our observations together to understand this remarkable scene in the Gita. Above everything one marvels at that ancient wisdom which today must be brought to light again by new methods out of the depths of occultism. Then one experiences what this tree reveals, what it is that grows out of it as leaves, the Veda knowledge streaming into one from outside. The wonderful picture of the Gita now stands before us, the tree with its roots going upward, 
its branches downward, its leaves containing knowledge, and man himself the serpent on the tree. Perhaps you have already seen this picture of the tree of life with the serpent. Everything has significance when one looks into all these ancient symbols. Here we encounter the tree, its roots extending upward, its branches downward. One has the feeling he is in the reverse position to the tree of paradise, and that has a deep meaning. For the tree of paradise stands at the initial point of another chapter of evolution, that which works on through the old Hebraic era into Christianity. Here, then, is indicated the whole nature of ancient knowledge. When Krishna explicitly says to his pupil Arjuna, quote, Renunciation is the power that makes this tree visible to man, unquote, he indicates how man turns back to that ancient knowledge by giving up everything he has attained in the subsequent course of evolution which we described yesterday. This is the glorious gift that Krishna makes to this single individual, his pupil Arjuna, as payment on account for what he had to take away from humanity in general for their everyday use. That is the essence of Krishna. What must Krishna's gift to his individual pupil become? It must become sattva wisdom. The more clearly Krishna gives this wisdom to Arjuna, the more profound, serene and... Thus Krishna becomes the lord of yoga, who leads back to the primal wisdom of mankind. Always does he seek to overcome that soul force that even in the sattva age concealed the spirit. He wants to bring to his pupil what the spirit was in its primal purity before descending into material substance. So only in spirit does Krishna stand before us in that dialogue with Arjuna that we presented yesterday. With this we come to the end of that epoch that saw the last of the old spirituality. We could follow it so as to see the total spiritual light at its beginning, and then its decline into materiality, in order that man find his independence, his ego. When the spiritual light had come as far as the fourth epoch, a kind of transition set in, a rajas condition, between spirit and the outer soul faculty. In this period the mystery of Golgotha occurred. Can one describe this era in terms of sattva? No. One would miss just what belonged to that age. To express correctly something in the Rajas age, using this term as in the Sankhya philosophy, one must not speak out of the state of detachment, but out of the personal, out of the indignation over this and that. In this way Paul spoke out of the Rajas condition. Just feel the throb of many a word in his letters to the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, the Romans, the struggling to get free of something, the rage, the personality characteristics often breaking through. That is the style and character of these epistles. They must be so, while the Bhagavad Gita must be detached and personality free, since it is the finest blossoming of the declining age. But to every man it gives a substitute for what is being lost and leads him back to the heights of spiritual life. Krishna had to give his own pupil the highest blossoming of the spirit because he was required to kill the old knowledge for humanity, to crush the head of the serpent. The sattva condition had faded out by itself. It was no longer there. Anyone speaking of the sattva condition while in the following Rajas era could only have referred to it as something ancient. A person living at the beginning of the new age had to express what now was the determining influence. Personality had entered human nature through its seeking knowledge by means of the organs and processes of the physical body it had begun to use. That personal element speaks from the Pauline epistles. His personality thunders his indignation about everything bearing the darkness of materiality. His letters often reverberate with words of anger. But this also means that these letters cannot speak in the severely conclusive phrases with a wisdom-filled, sharply delineated detachment to be found in the Bhagavad Gita. Such wisdom can only be spoken when a man is free from outer concerns and is lifted triumphantly to the Spirit, where he becomes one with Krishna. Thus can one describe the wisdom-filled path of yoga to the greatest heights of soul. The new element in the world, the victory of the Spirit over the merely soul-like, could only be described out of the Rajas condition. He who first did so in a way vitally important to human history described it with utmost enthusiasm, in such a way that people knew he was deeply involved, shaken to the roots as he confronted the manifestation of the Christ. 
In that moment he encountered it personally. For the first time he confronted what henceforth would be working for thousands of years into the future. It took hold of him so as to personally seize upon all the powers of his soul. Therefore he did not describe it in the philosophical, wisdom-filled, definitive concepts of the Bhagavad Gita, but had to tell of the resurrection of Christ as an event of direct personal involvement. Should it then not be a personal experience? Should Christianity not permeate the intimately personal, filling it with warmth and life? Truly, he who described the Christ event for the first time could only do so personally. In the Gita, the main thought rises, excuse me, in the Gita, the main thought lies in rising to spiritual heights through yoga. Everything else is only touched upon. Why is this? Because Krishna, in giving his instruction, deals with this one pupil, not with what other men feel as their relation to the spiritual. So Krishna describes what his pupil should become, achieving ever higher spiritual realms. What he describes leads to ever more mature conditions of soul, therefore to ever more impressive and beautiful pictures. Also, only in conclusion do we see the contrast between what is spiritual and what is demonic, which somewhat confirms the beauty inherent in the soul's ascent. All those out of whom only the material speaks, who live in materiality, who believe that with death all is finished, these are demonic in nature. But what is said merely to enlighten, the great teacher really is little concerned with it. Above all, his task is the spiritualizing of the human soul. Only in passing may yoga speak of its opponent. Paul, above everything, has to do with humanity as a whole, which lives at the time when darkness is breaking in upon it. He has to orient his view to everything this epoch of darkness brings about in human life. Paul, above everything, has to do with humanity as a whole, which lives at the time when darkness is breaking in upon it. He has to orient his view to everything this epoch of darkness brings about in human life. He must show the contrast between this darkening influence common to all and the seedling to be brought to life in the human soul as the Christ impulse. He also is to point up every aspect of materialism, every possible vice that has to be battled against by what he has to give. This at first is like a tiny flickering flame in the soul and can only gain strength if there is enthusiasm behind his words, words pressing to victory, revealing a personalized power of feeling. So remote from each other are the presentations of the Gita and the epistles. In the Gita, detached impersonal description, but Paul must work personal expression into his words. This accounts for the tone and style of both, showing in almost every line. Artistic perfection can be achieved only after maturity. At the beginning of a development there is bound to be more or less chaos. How is it that all this happened as it did? We find the answer if we return to the striking beginning of the Gita poem, where we saw how the related warriors opposed each other man to man, the victors and the vanquished alike connected by blood ties. The time had come for passing from the old blood relationships on which clairvoyance depended to differentiating and mixing the blood streams as characterizes the new age. This involves a transformation of the outer physical nature of man and the changes in cognition necessarily connected with it. A different kind of blood mixing, another meaning for blood, now enters human evolution. If we study this passing from that ancient era to the new one, parenthesis, you may recall my booklet, The Occult Significance of the Blood, parenthesis, we find that the clairvoyance of ancient times was dependent on people having the same tribal blood whereas with a mixing of tribes the old clairvoyance was destroyed and the new cognition bound to the physical body superseded it. The beginning of the Gita points to something external that is bound to the human form. Especially in the Sankhya philosophy are such form transformations mentioned. What pertains to the soul is, so to say, left in the background, as we pointed out. Souls in their multiplicity simply exist behind the forms, we found a kind of pluralism in the Sankhya philosophy, which we could compare with the philosophy of Leibniz in the modern age. If we thought ourselves into the soul of a Sankhya philosopher, we could imagine him saying, quote, Here is my soul, expressing itself either in the sattva, rajas, or tamas condition, 
as it relates to the forms of the external body. Unquote. But this philosopher would observe that these forms change. One of the most significant changes shows in the different way of using the etheric body or in the transition in blood relations that we described. This is an outer change in form. The soul is not touched by what the Sankhya philosophy is concerned with. The outer changes of form suffice for considering the transition from the old Sattva era to the new Rajas era on the boundary of which Krishna stands. Here it is the external transformations in form, more external to the soul, that come into consideration. Outer changes in form were always to be considered when one epoch passed into another. With the transition of the Persian into the Egyptian era, there was a change different from that of the Egyptian to the Greco-Latin. Further back, from the primeval Indian to the Persian, was a still different change in form, but a change did occur then also. In fact, it was merely a change in form that marked the passing of old Atlantis to the post-Atlantean world. <clears throat> One can follow this through the indications given in Sankhya philosophy, which show that the soul lives in these forms but is not influenced by them. Purusha remains untouched. Thus we find a remarkable kind of change that Sankhya philosophy expresses through its own concepts. But behind it stands Purusha, the individual soul quality of every person. So this philosophy merely says that this individual soul element exists in the external relation of the three gunas, sattva, rajas, tamas, but is not disturbed by them. The teachings of Krishna, Lord of Yoga, point continually to the soul element, certainly. But knowledge as to the real nature of the soul is not forthcoming. Guidance as to how the soul should develop is the highest he imparts. Change in the outer forms, no change in the soul itself, only hinting at such a change. This hinting we discover in the following way. When a man desires to rise through yoga from the ordinary to the higher soul levels, he must free himself from outer activities, from worldly knowledge. He must become his own observer. By rising above all externalities, the soul gains its inner freedom. This is the case with ordinary humanity. But with a person who enters upon initiation and becomes clairvoyant, this does not remain so. Outer materiality does not confront him, for it as such is maya. It is reality only for one who can use his own inner instruments. Now what is it that takes the place of matter? That comes before us when we look at the initiation of olden times. While the ordinary man in his everyday life confronts matter, prakriti, the soul of one becoming initiated through yoga faces the world of the asuras, the world of demoniacal powers which he has to fight. Matter is that which provides resistance. The asuras, the powers of darkness, they are the enemy. But all that is only hinted at. There, so to say, we glimpse something of the soul and we begin to feel what the soul is. For the first time, then, in doing battle with the demons, the asuras, this soul activity perceives its own being spiritually. In our language we would designate this battle, though it appears only in miniature, as that which becomes visible as spirits in action, when matter shows its spiritual nature. Even in miniature it appears to be what we know as the soul's battle with Araman when it enters upon initiation. But even in doing this we remain entirely within the soul's being. Then that which was formerly the material spirits grows to gigantic size, and the soul confronts a mighty foe. Soul stands against soul, the individual soul against Araman's kingdom in the wide expanse of the universe. The lowest level of Araman's kingdom is what one fights in yoga. But now Araman himself confronts us, observed as we express it. His full powers, his whole kingdom opposes the human soul. The Sankhya philosophy knows the relationship of the soul to outer materiality, when the latter has the upper hand as the tamas condition. One initiated through yoga is not only in this tamas condition, he is battling against certain demonic powers, into which, to his view, matter has been changed. In our conception, we see the soul not only when it relates to the spiritual element in matter, but when it confronts the purely spiritual, the aramonic element. 
In the rajas state, according to Sankhya philosophy, matter and spirit are in balance. They swing back and forth. First one is up, is high up, then the other. When this condition leads to initiation, then, in the spirit of the old yoga, it would lead to an overcoming of rajas into sattva. For us it does not yet lead to sattva, but here another battle begins, the battle with Lucifer. Now as we view it, we confront Purusha, which is only hinted at in the Sankhya philosophy. Not that we merely hint at it now. It actually stands right in the center of the battleground against Araman and Lucifer, soul opposing soul. Purusha appears to Sankhya philosophy as primevally distant. When we go deeper into what their en- let me read that again, when we go deeper into what there enters the soul's nature, still indistinguishable from the Aramanic and Luciferic elements, then in Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, there are only the soul's relations to material substance. In our terms, we now find the soul between Araman and Lucifer vigorously struggling and battling with them. This is something that could be seen for the first time in its whole magnitude through Christianity. In the old Sankhya teaching, Purusha was, so to say, left undisturbed. There the condition was described that arose when Purusha clothed itself in Prakriti. When we enter the Christian age and into its esoteric foundations, we can penetrate Purusha itself, characterizing its threefold form as the soul, the Aramanic and the Luciferic elements. We are now concerned with the inner condition of the soul itself in its struggle. What had to come lay in the transition occurring within the fourth epoch through the mystery of Golgotha. What then happened? With the passing of the third into the fourth epoch came what may be described as merely a change of form, yet it now involved the transition from Prakriti to Purusha itself, by which one inwardly felt how Purusha was completely emancipated from Prakriti. Man was not only torn away from his blood ties, but away from Prakriti, set free of everything external to him. He must now come to terms with it in his inner nature. Here the Christ impulse enters into him, the greatest transition that could have occurred in the whole of earth evolution. No longer does the question arise as to how the soul relates to matter in sattva, rajas and tamas. For then the soul had not only to conquer tamas and rajas in order to lift itself above them in yoga, but it was left to itself to fight against Araman and Lucifer. Then begins the necessity to come to terms with what the past epoch had required, and with the demands of the new age as this is represented in the Song of the Bhagavad Gita. This poem shows us the conflict. There the human soul is revealed, living in its bodily sheaths whose forms are continually changing. As long as the soul lives in them, it is ensnared by the ordinary life of prakriti. Then in yoga the soul escapes this entanglement, breaks out of its restraining sheaths and enters the spiritual sphere entirely free. However, it is not enough that the soul merely frees itself. Here we have to consider what Christianity, the mystery of Golgotha, brought into evolution for the first time. Through yoga the soul would make itself free. Then it could attain a vision of Krishna in his full power. But this would be Krishna as he was before Araman and Lucifer had attained their full power. A kind divinity still concealed the fact that on either side of Krishna, visible in the exalted way we described yesterday, stood Araman and Lucifer. Such concealment was possible in old clairvoyance, because man had not yet descended into matter. But that condition can no longer continue. If now the soul merely passes through yoga, it would confront Araman and Lucifer and have to fight them. But the soul could not take its place beside Krishna without the help of that ally who does do battle with Araman and Lucifer. Tamas and Rajas do not suffice. This firm ally is the Christ. Thus we see how the bodily nature frees itself from the bodily body. Or we could also say the bodily nature was darkened in the body when the great hero, Krishna, appeared. On the other hand, we see something more powerful, how the soul abandoned to itself becomes exposed to the battle, something only visible in its own domain in the age when the mystery of Golgotha took place. I can well understand, my dear friends, that someone may say, quote, Truly, what 
Still greater vision can there be than to see in the vision of Krishna man's highest ideal, the perfection of humanity. Unquote. There can be something higher. It is that which must stand by us and permeate us when we first confront the powers in the spirit, not merely tamas and rajas, but the powers we must conquer if we are to gain this lofty human state. The force to help us is the Christ. So, if one wills to see the highest only in what Krishna stands for, one is prevented from seeing something still higher only by his own inability to do so. Then, to the superiority of the Christ impulse over that of Krishna is shown in the fact that the being incarnated in Krishna was incarnated in his total hum humanness. Krishna was born and grew to manhood as the son of Visudeva, but in his whole human development lived that highest human impulse that we recognize as Krishna. But that impulse which must come to our aid when we confront Lucifer and Araman, parenthesis, this confrontation, which like all the other things we have described in our mystery dramas, exists only in its beginning and will be comprehensible for man in future, parenthesis, that must be an impulse too great for mankind to contain as yet, an impulse that could not even live in such a body as Zarathustra could live in, but only when this body had attained the height of development that is, when it had reached its thirtieth year. For this reason the Christ impulse cannot last throughout a whole life, but only through its ripest years. <clears throat> Thus it is that this impulse was present in the body of Jesus for only three years. It is shown again directly in this fact that the Christ impulse stands higher than that of Krishna from birth onward. As to how the superiority of the Christ impulse shows itself further, we will still have more to say. But you will have seen and felt, from what has already been described, that the relation between the great Gita and the epistles of Paul must in truth be as we have indicated, because the Gita is the ripe fruit of many previous epochs. It can be a finished creation. The epistles, being the first seeds of a ripening, more perfect and comprehensive period in history yet to come, are of necessity much more imperfect. So in viewing the course of world history, one must recognize the imperfection of the Pauline epistles when comparing them to the Gita, those most significant imperfections which should not be passed over. But also, one should understand why these imperfections are inevitably there. The end of Lecture 4 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which is separated into two parts. This is the fifth and last lecture in the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner, the Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul. It is entitled The Spirituality of Maya, Krishna, the Luminosity of the Christ, Paul's Experience and Teaching of the Risen Christ, January 1, 1913. In these lectures we have considered two significant human documents, characterizing them only briefly, as was possible in our limited time, and we have seen what impulses had to flow into evolution in order that these two documents, the Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul, could come into being. It is still important for our understanding of them to show a fundamental difference between the whole spirit underlying these documents. We have already mentioned the teachings that Krishna was able to impart to his pupil Arjuna, teachings that could only be given to one person because of their intimate nature. Now, however, they are available to anyone because they come to light in the Gita. Of course, this was not the case at the time the poem was composed. Then these teachings did not reach all ears as they were only communicated by word of mouth. In those ancient times, teachers were careful to ascertain a pupil's ripeness to receive such teachings. In our time, that is no longer possible for any kind of instruction once it has come before the pupil in one way or another. We live in an age when spiritual life, to a certain degree, is open to all, which is not to say there is no longer any occult science, only that it does not cease to be occult science when it is printed or spread abroad. Indeed, there is plenty of occult science now. For example, Fichte's scientific teachings, available to anyone in print, are genuine occult teachings. Hegel's philosophy also is assuredly an occult teaching, as it is very little known and contains many expedients for keeping it secret. <laughs> that is the case with many things in our time. 
These writings of Fichte and Hegel have very simple means for keeping them secret, as they are so written that most people don't understand them and fall asleep after reading the first few pages. This is true of much else now, which many people think they know but really do not, so the things remain secret. In fact, such things as are contained in the Gita remain secret even though they have become known in the widest circles through print. In its mighty revelations, one person receive, per- perceives the evolution of his own nature, another sees in it only an interesting poem, and this reduces all its concepts and feelings to so much triviality. Let no one believe he has absorbed what lies in the words of the Gita when he has merely understood their literal meaning, which may be far from their real meaning. In this way the profundity of the poem in many respects protects it from being vulgarized. In any case it is certain that such teachings, expressed poetically, are for each person to work through for himself. He must experience them if he is to lift his soul to the point of finally experiencing a meeting with Krishna, the Lord of Yoga. So what the great teacher addresses to each person is a matter of individual concern. But it is otherwise with the epistles of Paul when we view them from this standpoint. Everything there is directed to the community, to the many. But when we see into the innermost core of the Krishna teaching, we find that it is to be expressed in the deep privacy of the individual soul. One can only achieve the meeting with Krishna as a solitary pilgrim if he is to find his way back to the primal revelations and experiences of mankind. That which Krishna can give must be given for each one singly. This was not the case with the revelation given to the world through the Christ impulse, which from the outset was to be thought of as directed to all humanity. The mystery of Golgotha was not accomplished as a deed for single souls. When we consider all humanity, from the beginning to the end of earth evolution, what took place on Golgotha occurred for all men. To the greatest possible extent it is a deed for the community of mankind. Therefore the style of these epistles, apart from what I have already pointed out, must be different from that of the sublime Gita. Bring vividly to mind once more the relationship of Krishna to Arjuna. As Lord of Yoga he gave him specific directions for lifting up his soul step by step so as to attain a vision of Krishna. Compare this now with a particularly pregnant section in the epistles where a group of followers goes to Paul and asks if this or that thing were true, whether they were in accord with what he had been teaching. And in Paul's instructions is a passage which in its greatness is equal throughout, even artistically, with what is in the sublime Gita. But it is in a quite different tone, a quite different way of expressing a soul experience. It is where Paul writes to the Corinthians about the variety in human talents present in a group and how they must be brought to work together. Krishna said to Arjuna, quote, You must be so and so, do this or that, then step by step your soul will progress. Unquote. Paul said, quote, One of you has this gift, another that, a third another. If these work together harmoniously, like the members of a human body, a spiritual wholeness results, which then can be permeated by the Christ. Unquote. Thus, through their common situation, he could direct them to the idea of men working together, that is, as a plurality. He made use of a special opportunity to do this, namely when the gift of speaking with tongues came up for consideration. Now what is this speaking with tongues we find in the Pauline epistles? <clears throat> it is none other than a survival of ancient spiritual faculties, which, in a renewed but fully conscious way, confront us again at the present time. In our methods of initiation, inspiration is a condition one may attain with the same clear consciousness one has in the everyday use of his reasoning and sense perception, but it was otherwise in olden times. Then the person concerned spoke as if he were an instrument of higher spiritual beings who made use of his organs of speech to express higher truths. Thus, one could say things he himself could not at all understand. Communications were made from the spiritual world that the transmitter did not need directly to understand. Right in Corinth, such things were occurring. 
A condition had arisen there in which a number of people had this gift of speaking with tongues. Now, with a person having this gift, what he brings forth is under all circumstances a revelation from the spiritual world. Nevertheless, it can be that one person says this, another that, because there are many regions in the spiritual world. These differences in inspiration bring it about that the revelations do not always agree. Only when one enters the different regions in full consciousness does he discover how they harmonize. Therefore Paul admonishes his followers, There are some who have this gift of speaking with tongues, and there are others who can interpret the message. They should work together like the left hand with the right. We should not merely listen to the one spoken through, but also to those who may not have this gift, but know how to interpret what want, what one or the other spiritual region imparts. End quote. In this way, Paul again urges them on to achievements as a community founded on their united efforts. Connected with this speaking with tongues, Paul gave that discourse, which, as I said, is so wonderful that in certain respects it can be compared in still another way with the communications in the Gita. He said in 1 Corinthians 12, 3 through 31, footnote, the quotations from Paul's epistles, epistle to the Corinthians have been translated from the German edition, since what Rudolf Steiner offers is somewhat different from the usual English translations. As he has pointed out, for example, in his knowledge of the higher worlds and its attainment, the source of his spiritual research lies beyond the scope of the documents of external history. End footnote. Quote, Concerning the spiritually gifted brethren, I will not leave you without directions. You know that in the period of your paganism a blind desire led you astray to dumb idols. Wherefore I give you to understand that as little as one speaking in the Spirit of God says, quote, Accursed be Jesus, unquote, so little can he call him Lord, except it be through the Holy Spirit. Now through grace there is a diversity of gifts, but only one Spirit. There is a diversity of men's achievements, but only one Lord. Individual, man, individual men have a diversity of strength, but only one God is active in all these forces. To every man is granted manifestations of the Spirit, to each one's prophet. Thus, to one is given words of prophecy, to another knowledge. Again, there are those who live by faith, others who have the gift of healing, others have the gift of prophecy, others have insight into the character of men, to others the gift of tongues, and others can interpret the speaking with tongues. But in every man works the one Spirit, apportioning to each his due. For as the body is one with many members, all the single members forming together one body, so is it also with the Christ. For through the Spirit we are all baptized as one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free man. We are all filled with one Spirit, as the body consists not of one but of many members. If the foot were to say, Because I am not the hand, I do not belong to the body, nevertheless it does belong to the body. If the ear were to say, Because I am not the eye, I do not belong to the body, it would even so belong to it. If the whole body were only I, where then is the hearing? If the whole body were only hearing, where then is smelling? But God has given each member a particular place in the body as he found it good. For there were many, for there were only, if there were only one member, there would be the body. Sorry. If there were only one member, where would be the body? So there are many members and only one body. The eye dare not say to the hand, I do not need you, neither the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Rather, the apparently weak members of the body are necessary, and those members we hold in low esteem prove to be especially important. God has put the body together and given to the undistinguished members their significance, in order that there will be no schism in the body, but that all members work together in harmony and have care for each other. When one member suffers, all suffer with it, and when one prospers, all rejoice. But you now are the body of Christ. All of you together form his members. Some among you he has appointed to be apostles, others to be prophets, a third portion to be teachers, a fourth to be miracle healers, a fifth to have other helping tasks, a sixth to be administrators of the community, and a seventh he has appointed to speak with tongues. Should all be apostles or prophets or teachers or healers or all speak with tongues? Should all be interpreters? Therefore it is right that the various gifts of grace work together. The more they do so, the better. End quote. Then Paul speaks of the force that may be active in each one, but also in the community, the force that brings together all the single members of the community, 
as the strength of the body unites the separate members of the body. Nothing more beautiful did Krishna say to one man than Paul said to humanity with its variety of members. Then he speaks about the power of Christ that unites diverse individuals as the body unites its various members, the force which thereby can live in each one like the life force in each member, yet also lives in the whole entity of a community. This Paul characterized with powerful words. Long quote again. Indeed, I will show you the way higher than all the other ways. Though I could speak out of the Spirit with tongues of men or of angels and have not love, my speech would sound as brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I could prophesy and reveal all mysteries and communicate all the world's knowledge, though I have such faith as would remove mountains and have not love, it all would come to nothing. Though I gave to others all my spiritual gifts, yes, though I gave my very body to be burned and have not love, everything would be in vain. Love endures. Love is kind. Love does not know envy, nor nor boasting, nor vanity. It does not violate property. Excuse me. It does not violate propriety, nor seek its own advantage. It does not let itself be provoked to anger. It bears no malice toward anyone, nor rejoices over injustice, but only over truth. Love encompasses everything, permeates all beliefs, is hopeful in all things, and in all matters practices tolerance. Love, if it be love, is never lost. A prophecy ceases after it is fulfilled. What is spoken with tongues dies away when it no longer speaks to human hearts. Knowledge vanishes as soon as its subject is exhausted, because all knowledge is fragmentary, likewise all prophesying. But when that which is complete has come, then the fragments have lost their meaning. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I felt as a child, I thought as a child. Since I have become a man, my world of childhood is past. Now we see only dark outlines in the mirror, but one day we shall see the spirit face to face. Now is my knowledge in fragments, but one day I shall know fully what I myself am. Lasting is faith, faith, lasting the certainty of hope, and lasting is love. But love is the greatest of these, therefore it is supreme. All spiritual gifts may be yours. He who is able to prophesy must also strive to attain love. He who speaks with tongues speaks not among men, but among gods. No one hears him just because he utters spiritual mysteries. Unquote. We see that Paul understands the nature of speaking with tongues. He means, quote, The speaker is carried away into spiritual worlds and talks among gods. He who prophesies speaks with men to edify them, exhort them, or give them consolation. The one speaking with tongues in a certain sense gives himself satisfaction in doing so, while the prophet edifies the community. Even if all of you are able to speak with tongues, it is much more important that you prophesy. The prophet is greater than the speaker with tongues, unless the tongue speaker is himself able to understand what he speaks in order that the community understand it. Suppose I come to you as a speaker with tongues. Of what use am I to you if I cannot tell you the significance of what I say as prophecy, as teaching, as revelation? My speaking would be like the tones of a flute, a zither, which you could not clearly distinguish from one from the other. How is one to distinguish the playing of a flute or zither if they did not produce different sounds? If the trumpet did not give out a distinctive sound, who would arm himself for battle? So it is with you. If you cannot put your tongue speaking into a distinct language, your speaking goes into thin air." All this shows that the various spiritual gifts must be distributed among the members of the community, and that the members as individuals must work together. With this we come to that moment in human evolution when the revelation of Paul occurred, and we see how it must differ fundamentally from that of Krishna. The Krishna revelation is directed to the one individual but actually to every person who is ripe to progress on the soul's path upward, as outlined by the Lord of Yoga. Ever again are we directed back to the primeval time of humanity, to which, according to the teaching of Krishna, we want to return in spirit. At that time, man was less individualized, so one could assume that the same teaching and guidance was suitable for everyone. Paul confronted humanity when individuals were becoming differentiated, when they had to become differentiated, each with his own special capacities and gifts. 
No longer could one count on pouring the same thing into every single soul. One had to point to what ruled invisibly over all, that which is in no one man separately but can be in every single one is the Christ impulse. This force is again similar to a new group soul for humanity, but such a one as is consciously sought by humanity. To make it clearer, let us imagine a number of Krishna pupils in the spiritual world and a like number of those who have been deeply impressed by the Christ impulse. Each of the Krishna pupils have been set alight by the same impulse given them by the Lord of Yoga. In spiritual life each is like the other. To one as to another the same instructions were given, but those stirred by the Christ impulse are disembodied in the spiritual world, each with his own particular individuality, his own differentiated spiritual forces. So that also in the spiritual world one person can function in one way, another in another way. The leader of both, the one who pours himself into each one, however individualized that one may be, this is the Christ. He lives in every soul and at the same time hovers over them all. Thus there is a differentiated community even when souls are disembodied, while the Krishna pupils are a unity if they have received direction from the Lord of Yoga. The meaning of evolution, however, is that souls become more and more differentiated. Therefore it was necessary that Krishna speak in another way. Basically he speaks as he did in the Gita to his pupil. But Paul has to speak otherwise. Actually, he speaks to every man. Then it is a matter of individual development whether each one, according to the degree of his maturity, stops with exoteric life only at this or that stage of his incarnation, or whether he embarks on esoteric development to raise himself to an esoteric Christianity. One can proceed further and further in Christianity to the most esoteric heights, but one begins on a different basis from that given in the Krishna teaching. There one starts from the standpoint of what he is as a human being and raises his soul however he can achieve it as a single person. In Christianity, before he can even begin to advance, he enters upon a relationship to the Christ impulse so that this transcends all else. The spiritual path to Krishna can only be followed by one who receives his instructions. Anyone can follow the path to Christ, because he brought the mystery for all people. All can find a relationship to it. That, however, was some, something consummated on the physical plane. The first step, therefore, is taken on the physical plane. That is the main point. Once a person grasps the world-historic significance of the Christ impulse, one truly needs nothing from this or that Christian doctrine in order to proceed. Particularly in our time, one can even take his start from an anti-Christian point of view or a feeling of indifference. When one looks deeply into what our time is able to bring to spiritual life, when one sees the contradictions and foolishness of materialism, then perhaps one is led most genuinely to the Christ these days, more so than if he came to him through some special creed. Therefore, when it is said outside our circle, that we set out from a special kind of Christian belief, it can be regarded as an especially vicious slander. For it is not a matter of starting out from some kind of denominational doctrine, but from the demands of spiritual life itself. Everyone, be he a Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, Hindu or Christian, can understand the Christ impulse in its full meaning for humanity's evolution. This is exactly what we see penetrating Paul's entire concept and presentation. He is the personality who sets the tone for the first proclamation of the Christ impulse in the world. Having described how the Sankhya philosophy was concerned with the changing of forms, with what pertains to Prakriti, we may now say that Paul, in all that underlies his most meaningful epistles, deals wholly with Purusha, with what is of the soul, what the soul is destined to become, the manifold ways in which it is to develop throughout man's evolution. All this Paul sets forth in quite definite, conclusive ways. There is a fundamental difference between what Oriental thinking was still able to produce and what comes from Paul in such a wonderful clarity. Yesterday we pointed out that with Krishna everything depended on man finding the way out of the changing forms. <clears throat> but Pakriti remains outside as something foreign to the soul. All striving 
within this Eastern method of development, even within Eastern initiation, is toward becoming free from material existence, from the outer world of nature, which according to the Veda philosophy is maya, illusion. Everything outside us is maya, and yoga is the way to become free of it. We have noted how, directly in the Gita, it is required that man free himself from everything he does, achieves, wills, and thinks, from what he desires and enjoys, and that in his soul he triumphs over everything external to him. The work he does falls away from him, so resting in itself it finds satisfaction in itself. Thus anyone who desires to develop himself according to the Krishna teaching has in mind so, so, becoming something like a Paramahamsa, a high initiate, who leaves behind all material existence and rises above all his deeds in the sense world, who lives in such a pure spiritual state as to lose all thirst for incarnating again, because he no longer has any connection with what lives in this sense world as his work. Thus we are confronted everywhere in the Gita with escape from this maya, this illusion, with the triumph over it. But it is not like this with Paul. If he had encountered this Eastern teaching, the following words would have risen from the depths of his soul. Quote, so you want to develop yourself away from everything that surrounds you, away from whatever you have accomplished in the outer world. Do you want to leave all that behind? Is it not the work of God? Is it not... Is not all that above which you wish to lift yourself the creation of the Divine Spirit? When you disdain that, that, do you not cast scorn upon God's work? Do not the revelations of God and His Spirit live everywhere in it? Did you not seek above all to reveal God in your own work with love and faith and devotion, and now you desire to triumph over God's work?" Unquote. It would be good to inscribe deep in our own souls these words of Paul, which, if not actually spoken, ruled in the depths of his soul, for in them comes to light a vital nerve of what we know as Occidental Revelation. Even in a Pauline sense we speak of the illusion that surrounds us. Indeed, we say, quote, all about us is Maya, unquote. But we also ask, quote, is this Maya then not divine revelation, not the work, or the work of divine spirit? Is it not blasphemy not to understand that in everything the divine spiritual is at work? Unquote? Now the other question arises. Why is there Maya? Why do we see illusion all around us? The Occident does not stop with asking if everything is illusion. It wants to know why. Here an answer leads directly into the realm of the soul, into Purusha, because the soul once came under the power of Lucifer, it sees everything through the veil of Maya, and of itself spreads the veil of illusion over everything. <clears throat> Is objectivity at fault that we, then that we see Maya? No, true objectivity would appear as a quality of soul if we were not under the power of Lucifer. It seems to be Maya because we are not capable of seeing to the roots of what is spread about us. Lucifer's power prevents it. The fault does not lie with the gods, but with our own soul. You as soul have yourself changed the world into Maya by the fact that you have succumbed to Lucifer. From the highest spiritual expression of this truth, a direct line leads down to Goethe's words, quote, It is not the senses that deceive, it is judgment. Unquote. The Philistines and the Zealots may oppose Goethe and his Christianity all they like, yet he still was entitled to say that he is one of the most Christian of men, because to the roots of his nature he thought like a Christian, right into that saying, quote, It is not the senses that deceive, it is judgment. Unquote. The soul is at fault in that what it sees does not appear as, as truth, but as maya. Thus what in Orientalism is simply an act of the gods is diverted into the depths of the human soul, where the great battle with Lucifer begins. So, when we truly observe Orientalism, we see that in a certain way it is, a mater it is materialism, just because it does not recognize the spirituality in Maya and wishes to rise above matter. Pulsing through the epistles of Paul, however, is a teaching for the soul, even though in germinal form and therefore easily misunderstood in our Tamas time. It is this that in future will leave its imprint everywhere throughout the whole world. This unique nature of Maya must be understood. 
for only then will it be thoroughly clear just what man's chief concern must be in the further progress of his evolution. Then one will understand what Paul meant in speaking of the first Adam, whose soul was victimized by Lucifer and thereby fell ever deeper into matter. This means nothing else than that it was ensnared in a false experiencing of matter. Matter in the external world as God's creation is good. What takes place in that realm is good. But that which the soul experienced in the course of human evolution became more and more evil because in the beginning it was overpowered by Lucifer. <clears throat> Paul named Christ as the second Adam because he entered the world untouched by Lucifer and could therefore be that friend to men who could gradually lead them away from Lucifer, that is, into a right relation to Lucifer. Paul could not communicate to people in his time everything he knew as an initiate. But whoever absorbs the contents of the epistles will discover that more lies in their depths than comes to expression on the surface. That is because Paul had to speak to a certain community and must therefore reckon with their ability to understand. So there is much in his epistles that seem to be contradictory. But if one penetrates their depths, one will indeed find everywhere in them the impulse coming from the being of Christ. Remember how we ourselves describe the entrance of the mystery of Golgotha into human life, how to make it possible, as we previously indicated, two differing children's histories were mentioned in the Matthew and Luke Gospels because actually there were two Jesus children. We pointed out that according to their physical descent, quote, after the flesh, unquote, as Paul put it, the two Jesus boys stemmed from the house of David, the one from the Nathan, the other from the Solomon line, and that two Jesus boys were born at about the same time. In the one cited in the Matthew Gospel, Zarathustra was incarnated. The other described by Luke was not endowed with an ego such as specially characterizes a human being. And as the other Jesus boy had, who was so highly developed because it was the ego of Zarathustra that lived in him, in the Luke, Jesus boy lived a part of man's being that had never before entered human evolution on earth. Footnote see Rudolf Steiner, The Spiritual Guidance of Man and Humanity, The Gospel of St. Luke and The Gospel of St. Matthew for a full exposition of the problem of the two Jesus children. End footnote. Here we come to a point where it is somewhat difficult to find the right concept. But try to imagine how the soul incarnated in Adam, in what could be designated as Adam as meant in my occult science, how that soul <clears throat> succumbed to the temptation of Lucifer, symbolized in the Bible by the fall into sin in paradise. One can get a picture of this. Then, further, besides that human element that incarnated in Adam's body, another part remained behind, a human entity that did not enter a physical body but remained purely soul. You need only to imagine that before physical man arose within human evolution, he was a soul, which then divided into two parts. <clears throat> the one part, a descendant of the common soul, incarnated in Adam, and thereby entered the ongoing stream of incarnation, succumbing to Lucifer, and so on. But the other part of the soul, the wise world rulership, foresaw that it would not be good if it also were incarnated. It was held back in the soul world, apart from the stream of incarnation. Only those initiated in the mysteries would have any connection with this sister soul. Also this soul, during evolution that preceded the mystery of Golgotha, would not take ego experience into itself, since that comes only with incorporation into a physical body. Therefore this soul possessed all the wisdom which could be experienced through the Saturn, Sun and Moon periods of evolution. It possessed all the love a human soul can attain. It remained innocent of all the guilt that humanity can incur in the course of its incarnations for the purpose of development. This soul was then such a one as could not be encountered outwardly as a man, but could only be perceived by means of the old clairvoyance. In this way it could also be seen communing, one could say, in the mysteries. Thus there was a soul, both within and yet above human evolution, visible only to spiritual perception, a primeval man, a veritable superman. It was this soul which, instead of an ego, incarnated in the Jesus boy of the Luke Gospel. 
It was similar to an ego, acted quite naturally like an ego as it penetrated the body of Jesus, yet it was different from the usual human ego. I have already mentioned that this boy could at birth speak a language understandable by his mother and other similar similar faculties were evident in him. The Jesus boy described by Matthew, in whom the Zarathustra ego lived, continued to grow up to his twelfth year, likewise the boy of the Luke Gospel. But the latter showed no special knowledge nor erudition, no particular gift for learning the external things people usually learn. Rather, he bore within him divine wisdom and a supreme capacity for sacrifice. We know further that the body of the Matthew boy was forsaken by the Zarathustra ego, which in his twelfth year took possession of the body of the Luke boy. That is the moment indicated as his appearance before the learned ones in the temple, teaching them while being lost from his parents. We also know that the Luke boy bore the Zarathustra ego within him up to his thirtieth year, that then this ego forsook the body of the Luke Jesus, and the sheaths that had surrounded it came into the possession of the Christ, a superhuman being from the hierarchies, who only under such circumstances could live in a human body. For him a body was provided that had been permeated up to its twelfth year by primeval wisdom, by powers of divine love. Then it was streamed through by all that the Zarathustra ego had attained during many incarnations through initiation. Through nothing, perhaps, does one acquire the right esteem, the right reverence, above all the right feeling for the being of Christ, so much as when one tries to understand what kind of a bodily nature was necessary for this Christ ego to be able to enter into humanity at all. In this presentation of the being of Christ, given by the holy mysteries of the modern age, many have found him to be less intimate, less human, than the Christ some people have honored as he is usually presented familiar, near to man, embodied in the ordinary kind of human organism in which nothing like a Zarathustra ego lived. Our teaching has been reproached for presenting Christ Jesus as combining forces from every region of the cosmos. Such reproach only arises from laziness in people's thinking and feeling, which will not lift them up to their true heights. Besides, the greatest is only to be grasped after exerting the soul to the utmost so as to attain that inner intensity of feeling needed to raise the soul even to approach the level of the greatest, of the highest there is. One's first feeling then is only heightened when the matter is seen in this light. In addition, we know how these words of the gospel are to be understood. Quote, Divine powers are being revealed in the heights and peace is spreading among men of good will. Unquote. The tidings of peace and love resound as the Luke Jesus child is born for the Buddha is intermingled with his astral body, that being who had already lived through his last incarnation as Gautama Buddha and had risen to total spirituality, so that in the astral body of the Luke Jesus boy the Buddha was revealed, showing how he had progressed up to the time of the event of Golgotha on earth. So we have pictured the being of Christ Jesus as it could be given to humanity for the first time. Today, we may say, out of the foundations of spiritual science. Paul, even though he was an initiate, had to speak in the more easily understood concepts of his time. He could not have assumed that a humanity would be able to at that time to comprehend such concepts as we have been able to bring to your hearts today. That which came about through his inspiration was due to the initiation bestowed upon him by an act of grace. Because he had not attained it in the regular prescribed schooling of the ancient mysteries, but through the risen Christ having appeared to him on his way to Damascus, I say this initiation took place through grace. But Paul's experience of this vision was such as to convince him that what had arisen from the grave and the mystery of Golgotha lives on, bound up with the earth's sphere ever since that event. He recognized the resurrected Christ, and him he proclaimed from that time onward. How was it that Paul was able to see the Christ just as he did see him? Here we must enter a little into the nature of such a manifestation as that of Damascus, for it was quite a special of a, for it was a quite special kind. Only those people people who do not want to learn about occult facts assume that everything visionary is the same.
They do not distinguish between a vision, such as Paul's, and the many others that have appeared to the saints in later times. What actually was the reason Paul was able to perceive the Christ in the appearance of Damascus? What was there in it that convinced Paul it was the risen Christ? This question leads back to another one, namely, what was necessary in order that the total being of Christ could descend completely into Jesus of Nazareth as indicated by the baptism by John in the Jordan? We have just said what was necessary to prepare the physical body in which the Christ was to dwell. But what was needed for the Risen One to appear to Paul in such a dense soul form? What was that ray of light, so to say, in which he appeared? What was it? Whence was it taken? If we are to answer this question, we must add several things to what I have already said. I told you of the sister soul, present along with the Adam soul, which had entered the sequence of human generations. This sister soul remained in the soul world. It was also the one incarnated in the Luke Jesus boy. But this was not the first time, in the strict sense of the word, that this soul was embodied as physical man. Previously it had once been prophetically incarnated, and earlier still had been used as a messenger of the holy mysteries. It came and went among them, was cherished and cultivated, so to say, and sent out wherever something important was taking place among mankind but it could only appear in the etheric body, and therefore, strictly speaking, could only be perceived as long as the old clairvoyance continued. That, however, did exist in earlier times, so this ancient sister soul of Adam did not need to come down as far as the physical body in order to be seen. Thus it actually appeared repeatedly within human evolution on earth, always sent forth by the mysteries when important things were to be done but it did not need to incarnate in ancient times while clairvoyance lasted. This incarnating became necessary for the first time when clairvoyance faded away during the transition from the third to the fourth Atlantean epoch. Then it took on a kind of substitute embodiment in order to continue its functions after clairvoyance had ceased. This sister soul of Adam was embodied, so to say, in Krishna, the only time when it had become physically visible, and then again it was embodied in the Luke, Jesus' boy. So, now we understand why Krishna spoke in such a hu superhuman way, why he is the best teacher for the human ego, why he appears as an overcoming of the human ego, why his soul qualities are so sublime. Because in that exalted moment we described several days ago, he appeared as man, not yet immersed in the stream of human incarnations. Then he appears again in order to be embodied in the Luke Jesus boy. Thereby the height of perfection was reached when the most profound world concepts of Asia in the ego of Zarathustra and the spirit of Krishna united in the twelve-year-old Jesus boy. The one speaking to the learned men in the temple was not only Zarathustra speaking as an ego, but also one having all the resources Krishna had once drawn upon in proclaiming yoga. He spoke about a yoga now raised a step higher. He united himself with the power of Krishna, with Krishna himself, in order to continue developing up to his thirtieth year. Only then was that physical organism so completely matured as to be ready for the Christ to take possession of it. Thus do the spiritual streams of humanity flow together. So when the mystery of Golgotha occurred, there was indeed a working together of the most important leaders of mankind, a summation, a synthesis of spiritual life. As Paul journeyed to Damascus, it was the Christ who appeared to him. The flood of light that enveloped him was Krishna. Because Christ took Krishna as his own soul sheath, through which he then continued to work, everything that once was the content of the sublime Gita streamed from him. So much in the revelations of the Testaments, even if in scattered fragments, comes from the ancient teaching of Krishna. But that teaching became something for all humanity, because the Christ as such is not merely a human ego belonging to mankind, but belonging to the higher hierarchies. For this reason also Christ belongs to those times when man was not yet separated from what now surrounds him as material existence and through his own luciferic temptation is enveloped in maya. 
a look back through the whole of evolution, shows that in ancient times there was not yet that sharp division between the spiritual and the material. <clears throat> the material was still spiritual, and the spiritual, if we may put it so, was still manifesting itself outwardly. Because in the Christ impulse something entered humanity that completely excluded such a sharp separation as existed in the Sankhya philosophy between Purusha and Prakriti, Christ became the leader in taking man out of himself, but also toward divine creation. Dare we say, then, that one must absolutely abandon Maya when we recognize that it appears to have been given us through a fault of our own? No, for that would be a blasphemy against the spirit in the world. It would mean assigning to matter qualities that we imposed upon it ourselves under the veil of Maya. Instead, we should much rather hope that when we conquer in ourselves that which caused matter to become Maya, we may again be reconciled with the world. Do we not hear sounding out from the world around us that it is a creation of the Elohim? That on the last day of creation the Elohim looked and found that all was good? It would be karma fulfilling itself if there were nothing but the teaching of Krishna, for nothing remains in the world that does not fulfill its karma. If in all eternity there had only been a Krishna teaching, the material world surrounding us, the manifestation of God, of which the Elohim said at the beginning of evolution, quote, Behold, all is very good, unquote, would be met by man's judgment, quote, It is not good, I must abandon it. Unquote. <clears throat> Human judgment would be placed above divine judgment. This is what we must learn to understand in the words that stand there as a mystery at the beginning of evolution, that we do not set human judgment above divine judgment. If ever all the things that could cling to us as guilt could fall away and only the one offense remain, that we blasphemed the creative work of the Elohim, the earth's karma would have to be fulfilled. Everything in future would have to crash down upon us and thus karma would have to take its course. That this should not happen, Christ came into the world. He came in order to bring us into true harmony with the world that we might learn to overcome the power in Lucifer's temptations, to penetrate the veil of Maya, to see divine revelation in its true form, that we recognize Christ as the one who reconciles man and his world and leads him into the reality of divine manifestation, so that through him those primeval words may be understood, quote, Behold, it all is very good, unquote. <clears throat> in order that we learn to attribute to ourselves what we must never attribute to the world. For that, we need the Christ. Could all other sins be lifted from us, this particular sin must be taken from us by Christ. Transformed into a moral feeling, this reveals a new aspect of the Christ impulse. At the same time, it shows why it became necessary for this impulse as a higher soul to envelop itself in the impulse of Krishna. My dear friends, such matters as I have brought before you in this series of lectures are not to be taken as mere theory, as a compilation of ideas and concepts to be absorbed. They should be received as a kind of New Year's gift, a gift to work influentially through the coming year. From these indications should flow a continuing experience of what one can understand of the Christ impulse and the way it throws light on the words of the Elohim which sounded forth at the beginning of the creation of our world. This must be understood. Look, too, at what at the same time has been our intention to show as the point of origin of our anthroposophical spiritual stream. Through it, the way man can come by himself into self-knowledge will be made ever more widely known. Not yet can he achieve self-knowledge completely. Not yet can anthropos attain knowledge of anthropos, man gain knowledge of man, so long as he considers that what he has to bring about in his own soul is an affair to be played out between himself and external nature. It is a requirement prepared by the gods that we see our world immersed in maya. It is a matter for our own souls, higher self-knowledge, that man be conscious of himself within his human situation. It is a concern of anthroposophy that though it, that through it we first experience what theosophy can be for mankind. 
It should be with the greatest modesty that one feels impelled to belong to the anthroposophical movement, a modesty that reminds one that if he wants to jump over the concerns of the soul and take at once the highest step into the divine, his humility can easily vanish and pride and conceit take its place. May the anthroposophical society also be a starting point to this higher moral sphere. Above all, may it avoid the pride, vanity, ambition, and lack of earnestness which have so easily slipped into and been a burden to the theosophical movement in receiving the highest wisdom. May the anthroposophical society at the outset avoid such hindrances by observing what solving the problem of maya entails as a concern of the human soul itself. One should feel that the anthroposophical society is the result of the deepest human modesty. Then out of this modesty will come the greatest earnestness in confronting the holy truths we shall reach when we enter the realm of the supersensible, the spiritual. Let us therefore regard the adoption of the name anthroposophical society with genuine humility and say to ourselves, may whatever pride, conceit, ambition, dishonesty which could have been working under the name of theosophy be eradicated as we begin humbly to look up to the gods and divine wisdom. May we dutifully seek likewise to know man and human wisdom when we reverently approach theosophy and dutifully devote ourselves to anthroposophy. <clears throat> this anthroposophy will lead us to the gods. If through it we learn to see ourselves truly and devotedly and see how we must struggle against all maya and error, by means of severe self-discipline and training, then, as if written on a bronze tablet, there will stand above us the word anthroposophy. May it be an admonition to us that above everything we should seek through anthroposophy self-knowledge, humbleness of self, and in this way endeavor to erect a structure founded upon truth. Because truth only blossoms when self-knowledge in full earnestness puts its roots deep down in the human soul. From what does all conceit, all untruthfulness arise? They result from failure in self-knowledge. From what alone can truth and genuine reverence for the divine worlds and divine wisdom spring? Only from real self-knowledge, self-discipline and self-development. May the forces streaming and pulsating through the anthroposophical movement serve this purpose. For this reason has this particular cycle of lectures been given at the start of this anthroposophical movement. They should prove that we are not dealing with something narrow, but that just in our movement our horizon can extend over those distances that encompass Eastern thought as well. But let us grasp this humbly in the anthroposophical way of self-education, arousing our will to self-discipline and training. If, my dear friends, anthroposophy is taken up by you in this way, it will lead to beneficial results. It will attain a goal bringing to every person and to every branch of human society a measure of regeneration. These words then spring these words then bring to a close this series of lectures, but perhaps from them you can take much with you for times to come, much that will be fruitful for our anthroposophical movement for which you have come together in these days for the first time. May we always so meet together under the sign of anthroposophy that we can always be justified in reaffirming the words with which we now conclude, words expressing a spirit of humility, of the desire for self-knowledge, as we now in this moment bring them before our souls as our ideal. The end of Lecture 5 and the end of the lecture cycle, the Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul, given by Rudolf Steiner in Cologne from December 28, 1912 to January 1, 1913. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of uh, a volume entitled The Bhagavad Gita in the West, which is uh, Collected Works Volumes 142 and 146 in one volume. Uh, part 1, which I have already read and I'm going to include in this collection, is five lectures entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of Paul. And I will be fixing those a little bit to... The second set, which I am now be going to begin in this first lecture, is in part two. It's in part two. It's entitled Lecture One. However, for the sake of the continuity of this file, I'm going to uh, label this Lecture Six, 
and this part is called the esoteric significance of the Bhagavad Gita and the first lecture was held in Helsinki May 28th 1913 or should I say the sixth lecture it is more than a year since I was able to speak here about those things that rest so deeply in our hearts things that we believe must enter more and more into human knowledge footnote between April 3rd and April 19th, Rudolf Steiner gave a lecture series in Helsinki called, titled The Spiritual Beings and the Heavenly Bodies and in the Kingdoms of Nature, published under the same title at the Pacific Press, 1992, and that is also on this website, recorded. End of footnote. From our time onward, the human soul will feel, increasingly, that these thoughts belong to its requirements to its deepest longings. And it is with great pleasure that I greet you in this place for the second time, along with all those who have traveled here, in order to show in your midst that their hearts and souls are connected to our sacred work the whole world over. The last time I was able to speak to you here, we let our spiritual gaze journey far into the wide regions of the universe. This time our task will keep us more in the regions of earthly evolution. Our thoughts will, nonetheless, penetrate to regions that lead us to the gateway of the eternal manifestation of the spiritual in the world. We shall speak about a subject that apparently leads us far away in time and in space from the here and now. It will, it will not on that account lead us any less to what lives in the here and now, but rather to what lives equally in all places, excuse me, in all times and all places on earth, because it will bring us near to the secrets of the eternal in all existence. It will lead us to the ceaseless human search for the wellsprings of eternity, for the springs where they can find the elixir of what humans have called all-powerful love. For wherever we are gathered, We are gathered in the name of the search for wisdom and the search for love. We are gathered in nostalgia for the wellsprings of this love. What we seek is extended out into space and can be observed in the far horizon of the cosmic all. But it can also be observed everywhere in the struggling human soul. It meets us especially when we turn our gaze to one of those mighty manifestations of the struggling human spirit that is given us in great works, like the one that is to form the basis of our present studies. We are going to speak of one of the greatest and most profound manifestations of the human spirit, the Bhagavad Gita, which, ancient as it is, yet in its foundations comes before us with renewed significance at the present time. A short time ago the peoples of Europe and those of the West generally knew little of the Bhagavad Gita. Only during the last century has the fame of this wonderful poem extended to the West. Only lately have Western peoples become familiar with this marvelous song. But these lectures of ours will show that a real and deep knowledge of this poem beyond mere familiarity with it can only come when its esoteric foundations are more and more revealed. For what meets us in the Bhagavad Gita sprang from an age of which we have often spoken in connection with our anthroposophical studies. The mighty sentiments, feelings and ideas it contains had their origin in an age that was still illumined by what was communicated to the old human clairvoyance. One who tries to feel what this poem breathes forth page by page as it speaks to us will experience page by page something like a breath of the ancient clairvoyance humanity once possessed. The Western world's first acquaintance with this poem came in an age that had little understanding of the original clairvoyant sources from which it sprang. Nevertheless, this lofty song of the divine struck into the Western world like a wonderful flash of lightning 
so that a certain European man, upon first encountering this Indian song, said that he must frankly consider himself happy to have lived until the time when he could become acquainted with the wondrous things expressed in it. This man was acquainted with the spiritual life of humanity through the centuries, indeed through thousands of years. He was a man who looked deeply into spiritual life, Wilhelm von Humboldt, the celebrated astronomer's brother. Other Westerners, people of widely different origins, have felt the same. What a wonderful feeling it produces in us when we let this Bhagavad Gita work upon us even in its opening verses. It seems that particularly in our circle, my dear friends, we often have to begin by working our way through to a fully unprejudiced position. Despite the fact that the Bhagavad Gita has been known for so short a time in the West, its holiness has so taken hearts by storm that we are inclined to approach it from the start with this sense of encountering a sacred text and are thus unable to see clearly the poem's actual starting point. Let us look at it quite dispassionately, perhaps even a little excessively so. We have before us a poem that from the very beginning sets us in the midst of a wild and stormy battle. We are introduced to a scene of action hardly less wild than that into which Homer straightway places us in the Iliad. We go on and are confronted in this scene with something that Arjuna, one of the foremost, perhaps the foremost, of the personalities in the song, feels from the start to be a fratricidal conflict. He comes before us as one horror-stricken by the battle, for there among the enemy he sees his own blood relations. His bow falls from his grasp when it becomes clear to him that he is to enter a murderous strife with men descended from the same ancestors as himself, men in whose veins flows the same blood as his own. We begin by empathizing with his dropping the bow and recoiling from the awful battle between brothers. Then, before our gaze, arises Krishna, Arjuna's great spiritual teacher, and a wonderful, sublime teaching is brought before us in vivid colors. It appears as a teaching given to his pupil, but where is it all leading? That is the question we must first of all set before ourselves, because it is not enough just to give ourselves up to the great, seemingly sacred teaching in Krishna's words to Arjuna. The circumstances of its being given must also be studied. We must visualize the situation in which Krishna exhorts Arjuna not to quail before this battle with his brothers, but to pick up his bow and hurl himself with all his might into the devastating conflict. Krishna's teachings emerge amid the battle like a cloud of spiritual light, incomprehensible at first. They require Arjuna not to recoil but to stand firm and do his duty in this battle. When we bring this picture before our eyes, it is almost as though the teaching becomes transformed by its setting. Then again, The setting leads us further into the whole weaving of the song of the Mahabharata, the mighty song of which the Bhagavad Gita is only a part. Krishna's teaching leads us out into the storms of everyday life, into the wild confusion of human battles, errors, and earthly strife. His teaching appears almost like a justification of these human conflicts. If we regard the picture before us quite dispassionately, the Bhagavad Gita will perhaps suggest to us altogether different questions from those that arise when we approach things, expecting to understand them as if they were ordinary human deeds. So it is perhaps necessary to point first to the setting of the Gita in order to realize its world historic significance, and then to be able to see how it can be of increasing and special significance in our own time. I have already said that this majestic song came into the Western world as something completely new. 
and almost equally new were the feelings, perceptions, and thoughts that lie behind it. For what did Western civilization really know of Indian culture before it became acquainted with the Bhagavad Gita? Apart from various things that have only become known in the last century, very little indeed. With the exception of certain secret societies, Western civilization has had no direct knowledge of what is actually the central nerve impulse of this great poem. When we approach such a thing, we feel how inadequate everyday human language, philosophy and ideas are for it, and how little they suffice for describing such heights of human spiritual life upon earth. We need something quite different from ordinary descriptions to express what shines out to us from such a revelation of the human spirit. I would like first of all to place two pictures before you as a foundation for further descriptions. The first is taken from the book itself, the other from the spiritual life of the West. The latter is comparatively easy to understand, whereas, for the time being, the one from the book appears quite remote. To start with the former, we are told how in the midst of the battle Krishna appears and unveils before Arjuna cosmic secrets, immense teachings. His pupils, his pupil is overcome by the strong desire to see the spiritual form of this soul, to know the one speaking such sublime teachings. He begs Krishna to show himself to him in his true spirit form, in whichever way he can do so. Krishna appears to him, we shall return to this description later, in a form that embraces all things, a sublime, glorious beauty, a nobility that reveals cosmic mysteries. We shall see that there is little in the world to approach the glory of this description of how the teacher's sublime spirit form is revealed to the clairvoyant eye of his pupil. Before Arjuna's gaze lies the wild battlefield where much blood will have to flow and where the fratricidal struggle is to develop. The soul of Krishna's disciple is to be wafted away from this battlefield of devastation. It is to perceive and plunge into a world where Krishna lives in his true form. That is a world of holy bliss, removed from all strife and conflict a world where the secrets of existence are unveiled, far away from everyday affairs. Yet the human soul, in its most inward, most essential being, belongs to that world. The soul must learn to know this world, and then it will have to descend from that world again to return to the chaotic, evil battles of this world. In truth, as we follow the description of this picture, we may well ask ourselves what is really taking place in Arjuna's soul. What is the matter with this soul? It stands in the midst of a raging battle, as though the battle in which it stands were forced upon it. This soul feels related to a heavenly world in which there is no human suffering, no battle, no death. It longs to rise into a world of the eternal but with the inevitability that can come only from the impulse of so sublime a being as Krishna. This soul must be forced downward into the chaotic confusion of the battle. Arjuna would gladly turn away from all this chaos, for the life of earth around him appears as something alien and remote altogether unrelated to his soul. We can distinctly feel that this soul is still one of those that long for the higher worlds that would live with the gods, and that perceives human life as something foreign and incomprehensible to them. In truth it is an astounding picture, containing matters of sublime import. A hero, Arjuna, surrounded by other heroes and by the warrior hosts. A hero who feels all that is spread before him as unfamiliar and remote. And a god, Krishna, who is needed to direct him to this world. He does not understand this world until Krishna makes it comprehensible to him. It may sound paradoxical, but I know that those who can enter into the matter more deeply 
will understand me when I say that Arjuna stands there like a human soul to whom the earthly aspect of the world must first be made comprehensible. Now, this Bhagavad Gita comes to Westerners who undoubtedly do have an understanding for earthly things. It comes to humans who have attained such a high degree of materialistic civilization that they have a very good understanding of for everything earthly. It has to be understood by souls that are separated by a deep, deep gulf from our observation of Arjuna's soul. Things for which Arjuna shows no inclination, requiring Krishna to force him to come down to earth, seem quite intelligible and obvious to the Westerner. The difficulty for Westerners seems rather to be an inability to lift themselves up to Arjuna, to whom must be imparted an understanding of what in the West is easily understood, physicality, earthly materiality. A god, Krishna, must make our civilization and culture intelligible to Arjuna. How easy it is in our time for people to understand what surrounds them. We need no Krishna. It is well for once to see clearly the mighty gulfs that can lie between different human natures and not overestimate how easy it is for a Western soul to understand a nature like Krishna's or Arjuna's. Arjuna is human, but utterly different from those who have slowly and gradually evolved in Western civilization. That is one picture I wanted to bring to you, for words cannot lead us more than a very little way into these things. Pictures that we can grasp with our souls can do better, because they speak not only to the understanding, but also to that in us which on earth will always be deeper than our understanding, to our power of perception and to our feeling. I now would like to place another picture before you, one no less sublime than that from the Bhagavad Gita, but one that stands infinitely nearer to Western culture. We have in the West a beautiful literary picture that Westerners know well and which is meaningful for them. But first let us ask, to what extent does Western humanity really believe that this being of Krishna once appeared before Arjuna and spoke those words? We are now at the starting point of a concept of the world that will lead us on until it is no mere matter of belief, but of knowledge. We are, however, only at the beginning of this conception, the point of departure of the anthroposophical conception of the world. The second picture is much nearer to us. It contains something to which Western civilization can respond. We look back some five centuries before the founding of Christianity to a soul whom one of the greatest spirits of Western lands made the central figure of all his reflections. We look back to Socrates. We watch in our mind's eye the dying Socrates, as Plato describes him in the circle of his disciples, in the famous discourse on the immortality of the soul. Footnote, see Plato uh, the dialogues Crito and Phaedo. End of footnote. In this picture, there are but slight indications of the beyond, represented in the daemon who speaks to Socrates. Let him stand before us in the hours that preceded his entrance into the spiritual worlds. There he is, surrounded by his disciples, and in the face of death he speaks to them of the immortality of the soul. Many people have read the wonderful discourse wherein Plato described for us the scene of his teacher's death. But people nowadays read only words, only concepts and ideas. There are even those, I do not mean to censure them, to whom this wonderful scene of Plato arouses questions as to the logical justification of what the dying Socrates sets forth for his disciples. These are people who cannot feel that for the human soul there is something more important, more significant than logical proofs and scientific arguments. Let us imagine a contemporary of ours, a person of great culture, depth and refinement, making the same statement Socrates makes about immortality, 
but in a different situation from that of Socrates, under different circumstances. Even if the words of this person were a hundred times more logically sound than those of Socrates, in spite of it all, they would perhaps have a hundred times less value. This will only be fully grasped when people begin to understand that there is for the human soul something of more value, even if less plausible than the most strictly correct logical demonstrations. If any highly educated and cultured teacher speaks to students on the immortality of the soul, it can indeed have significance, but its significance is not revealed in what is said. I know it will sound paradoxical, but it is true. Its significance depends also on the fact that the teacher, having spoken these words to the student, goes on to look after the ordinary business of life, and the students do the same. Socrates speaks in the hour immediately preceding his passage through the gates of death. He gives out his teaching in the brief moment when his soul is about to be severed from his bodily form. Let us now imagine one of Socrates' pupils, who could certainly have no doubt of the reality of all that surrounded him, being a Greek, and compare him with Krishna's disciple Arjuna. Think how the Greek must be introduced to the supersensible world, and then think of Arjuna, who can't have any doubt whatsoever about the supersensible world, but is confused instead by his relationship to the sensible physical world almost doubting the possibility of its existence. It is one thing to speak about immortality to the pupils he is leaving behind in the hour of his own death, which does not meet him unexpectedly but as an event predetermined by destiny, and another thing to return to the ordinary business of living after such a discourse. It is not Socrates' words that should work on us, as much as the situation in which he speaks them. Let us take all the power of this scene, all that we receive from Socrates' conversation on immortality, the full immediate force of this picture. What do we have before us? It is the world of everyday life in Greek times, the world whose conflicts and struggles led to the best of the country's sons being condemned to drink hemlock. This noble Greek spoke these last words with the sole intention of bringing the souls of the men around him to believe in something of which they could no longer have knowledge, to believe in what was for them a beyond, a spiritual world. That it needs a Socrates to lead earthly souls to gain an outlook into the spiritual worlds, that it needs him to do this by means of the strongest proofs, namely by his deed, is entirely comprehensible to Western souls. Socrates' culture is quite understandable for Western souls. The image of Socrates standing in front of his students, placing them in the immediate presence of the reality of death, is easily understood by Western souls. We only grasp Western civilization correctly if we recognize that in this respect it has been a Socratic civilization for centuries, for millennia. I know that history, philosophy, and other branches of knowledge may say, with apparently good reason, quote, yes, but if you only look at what is written in the Bhagavad Gita and at Plato's works, it is just as easy to prove the opposite of what you have just said. Close quote. I know, too, that those who speak like this do not want to feel the deeper impulses, the mighty impulses that arise on the one hand from that picture out of the Bhagavad Gita, and on the other from that of the dying Socrates, as described by Plato. A deep gulf yawns between these two worlds, despite all their similarities. This is because the Bhagavad Gita marks the end of the age of the ancient clairvoyance. We can catch there its last echo. While in the dying Socrates, we meet one of the first of those who through thousands of years wrestled with this kind of knowledge, these kinds of ideas, thoughts and feelings, with people who were as if cast off by the old clairvoyance and who continued to evolve 
in the intervening time because they must prepare the way for a new clairvoyance. Today we are striving toward this new clairvoyance by announcing and receiving what we call the anthroposophical conception of the world. From a certain angle we may say that no gulf is deeper than the one opening up between Arjuna and a disciple of Socrates. We now live in a time when human souls, having gone through manifold transformations and incarnations in the search for life in external knowledge, are once more seeking to make connections with the spiritual worlds. The fact that you are sitting here is living proof that your own souls are seeking this reunion. You are seeking the connection that will lead you in a new way up to the worlds so wondrously revealed to us in Krishna's words to his disciple Arjuna. So there is much in the esoteric wisdom on which the Bhagavad Gita is founded that resonates for us, that responds to our deepest longings. In ancient times, the soul was well aware of its bond with the spiritual. It was at home in the supersensible realm. We are now at the beginning of an age wherein the human soul will once again seek access to spiritual worlds in a new way. We must feel stimulated in this search when we think that such access was once available to human beings. Indeed, we shall find it to an unusual degree in the revelations of the sacred song of India. As is generally the case with the great human works, we find that the opening words of the Bhagavad Gita are full of meaning. Are not the opening words of the Iliad in the Odyssey most significant? The story is told by his charioteer to the blind king, the chief of the Kurus, who are engaged in fratricidal battle with the Pandavas, a blind chieftain. This already seems symbolic. Ancient people had vision into the spiritual worlds. With their whole heart and soul they lived in connection with gods and divine beings. Everything that surrounded them in the earthly sphere was in unceasing connection with divine existence. Then came another age, and just as Greek legend depicts Homer as a blind man, so the Gita tells us of the blind chief of the Kurus. It is to him that Krishna's discourses, in which he instructs Arjuna concerning goings-on in the world of the senses, are directed. He must even be told of those things of the sense world that are projections into it from the spiritual world. There is something deeply symbolic in the fact that old men who look back with perfect memory and a perfect spiritual connection into a primeval past were blind to the world immediately around them. They were seers in the spirit, seers in the soul. They could experience as though in lofty images all that lived as spiritual mysteries. Those who were to understand the events of the world in their spiritual connections were pictured as blind in the old songs and legends. Thus we find the same symbol in the Greek singer Homer as in the figure that meets us at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. This introduces us to the age of transition from ancient humanity to that of the present day. Now, why is Arjuna so deeply moved by the impending battle of the brothers? We know that the old clairvoyance was in a sense bound up with external blood relationships. In ancient times the flowing of the same blood in the veins of a number of people was rightly looked upon as something sacred, because it was connected to the ancient perception of a particular group soul. Those who not only felt but knew their blood relationship to one another did not yet have the same excuse me, did not yet have the kind of ego that lives in present day humans. Wherever we look in those ancient times, we find groups of people who did not at all feel that they were each an individual I capital as we do today. Each person's identity was felt only within the group, within a community based upon blood ties. What does the folk soul, the nation, nation soul, signify to a person today? 
Certainly it is often an object of the greatest enthusiasm. Yet compared with the individual eye of a person, we may say that this nation soul does not really count. This may be a hard saying, but it is true. Once upon a time a person did not say I to him or herself, but to the tribal or racial group. This group soul feeling was still living in Arjuna when he saw the fratricidal battle raging around him. That is the reason why this battle filled him with such horror. Let us enter Arjuna's soul and feel his horror when he realized how those who belonged together were about to murder each other. He felt that what lived in all the souls at that time was about to kill itself. He felt the way a soul would feel if its body, which is its very own, were being torn to pieces. He felt as though the members of one body were in conflict, the heart with the head, the left hand with the right. In this mood Arjuna is met by the great teacher Krishna. Here we must call attention to the incomparable manner with which Krishna is pictured in this scene, the holy God, who stands there teaching Arjuna what humanity must discard if we wish to take the right direction in its evolution. And what does Krishna mention? I and I and I and always only I. Quote, I am in the earth, I am in the water, I am in the air, I am in the fire, in all souls, in all manifestations of life, even in the holy Aum. I am the wind that blows through the trees, I am the greatest of the mountains, of the rivers, I am the greatest among men, I am all that is best in the old seer Kapila. Close quote. Truly, Krishna says nothing less than this, quote, I recognize nothing else than myself, and I admit the world's existence only in so far as it is I. Close quote. Nothing else than I speaks out from the teaching of Krishna. We should see once and for all quite plainly how Arjuna stands there as one who does not yet understand himself as an ego, but now must do so. The God confronts him like a cosmic egotist, admitting of nothing but himself, even requiring others to admit of nothing but themselves, each one an I. Yes, in all that is in earth, water, fire or air, in all that lives upon the earth, in the three worlds, we are to see nothing but Krishna. It is of momentous significance for us that one who cannot yet grasp the ego is brought for instruction before a being who demands to be recognized only as his own self. Let him who wants to see this in the light of truth read the Bhagavad Gita through and try to understand the question, quote, how can we designate what Krishna says of himself and that for which he demands recognition? Close quote. It is universal egotism that speaks in Krishna. It does indeed seem as though through the whole of the sublime Gita this refrain resounds in our spiritual ear, quote, Only if you recognize, you humans, my all-embracing egotism, only then can salvation be for you. The greatest achievements of human spiritual life always set us riddles. We only see them in the right light when we recognize that they set us the very greatest riddles. Truly a hard one seems to be given us when we are now confronted with the task of understanding how a most sublime teaching can be bound up with the announcement of universal egotism. It is not through logic but in the perception of the great contradictions in life that the esoteric mysteries unveil themselves to us. It will be our task to get beyond what seems so strange and come to the truth within Maya. Our task will be to reach truth by overcoming some remarkable aspects of Maya so that we shall know just what it is we call egotism when we speak from inside Maya. This riddle will lead us out of Maya to reality, to the light of truth. Our next lectures will examine how to take that step into reality. The end of Lecture 6 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com this is a reading of the Bhagavad Gita and the West. Uh, this is the second cycle in the book. 
It is lecture two in that cycle, however, for the sake of continuity in this file. I am referring to it as lecture seven, given in Helsinki, May 29th, 1913. The deeper we go into the esoteric records of various ages and peoples, that is to say, into the truly esoteric records, the more we are struck by one feature that meets us again and again. I already indicated this when discussing the Gospel of John, and on a later occasion when speaking of the Gospel of Mark. I refer to the fact that on looking deeply into any such esoteric record, it becomes ever clearer that it is really most wonderfully composed, that it forms an artistic whole. I could show, for instance, how John's Gospel, when we penetrate into its depths, reveals a wonderful artistic composition. With remarkable dramatic power, the story is carried stage by stage toward a great climax, and then continues from this point onward with a kind of renewal of dramatic power to the end. You can study this in the lectures I gave in Kassel on John's Gospel in relation to the three other Gospels, especially to that according to Luke, footnote, titled The Gospel of St. John and Its Relation to the Other Gospels, given in Kassel, June 24th to July 7th, 1909, New York at the Masophic Press, 1982. This cycle is also available on this website. End of footnote. Most impressive is the gradual enhancement of this inner dramatic composition, which becomes visible in John's Gospel, so that from so-called miracles and signs, the supersensible is presented from sign to sign, and from sign to sign there is continual enlargement until we get to the sign of the initiation of Lazarus. It makes us realize how we can always find artistic beauty at the foundation of these esoteric records. I could say the same about the composition of the Gospel of Mark. When we regard such records in their formal beauty and dramatic power, we can indeed conclude that just because they are true, such records cannot be other than artistically, beautifully composed, in the deepest sense of the word. For the moment, we will only indicate this fact as we may come back to it in the course of these lectures. Now it is remarkable that the same thing meets us again in the Bhagavad Gita. There is a wonderful intensification of the narrative. Let us begin by indicating a few of the outstanding points, and we will confine ourselves today to the first four discourses, because these points are important both for the artistic structure and for the deep esoteric truths that it contains. First Arjuna meets us, facing the bloodshed in which he is to take part he grows weak. He sees all that is to take place as a battle of brothers against brothers, his blood relations. He shrinks back. He will not fight against them. While fear and terror overcome him and he is horror-stricken, his charioteer suddenly appears as the instrument through which Krishna, God, is to speak to him. In this very first episode, we have a moment of great intensity and also an indication of deep esoteric truth. Anyone who finds the way by whatever path into the spiritual worlds, even though he or she may have gone only a few steps or even had only a dim presentiment of the way to be experienced, such a person will be aware of the deep significance of this moment. As a rule, we cannot enter the spiritual worlds without passing through a deep upheaval in our souls. We have to experience something that disturbs and shakes all our forces, flooding our soul with intense feelings and sensations. Emotions that are generally spread out over many moments, over long periods of living, whose permanent effect on the soul is therefore weaker. Such feelings are concentrated in a single moment and storm through us with tremendous force, when we enter the esoteric worlds. Then we experience a kind of inner shattering, which can indeed be compared to fear, terror, and anxiety, as though we were shrinking back from something in horror. Such experiences belong to the initial stages of esoteric development, 
to entering the spiritual worlds. Just for this reason, great care must be taken to give the right advice to those who would enter the spiritual world through esoteric training. We must be prepared so that we may experience this upheaval as a necessary event in our soul life without its encroaching on our bodily life and health and in so far as the body is included it must suffer a like upheaval. That is the essential thing. We must learn to suffer the convulsions of our soul with outward equanimity and calm. This is true not only for our bodily processes. The soul forces we need for everyday living, our ordinary intellectual powers, even those of imagination, of feeling and will, these too must not be allowed to become unbalanced. The upheaval that may be the starting point for esoteric life must take place in far deeper layers of the soul so that we go through our external life as before without anything being noticed in us outwardly while within we may be living through whole worlds of shattering soul experience. That is what it means to be ripe for esoteric development to be able to experience such inward convulsions without losing one's outer balance and calm. To this end, those striving to become ripe for esoteric development must widen the circle of their interests beyond everyday life. They must get away from the things which otherwise keep us going from morning to night and reach out to interests that move on the great horizon of the world. We must be able to undergo the experience of doubting all truth and all knowledge. We must have the power to do this with the same intensity of feeling people generally have only where their everyday interests are concerned. We must be able to feel with the destiny of all humankind with as much interest as we usually feel in our own destiny or perhaps in that of our nearest connections of clan, family or nation. If we cannot do this, we are not yet completely ready for esoteric development. For this reason, modern anthroposophy, if pursued earnestly and worthily, is the right preparation for true esoteric development in our age. Let those who are absorbed in the petty, material interests of the immediate present, who cannot find the interest to follow the anthroposophist in looking out over world and planetary destinies, over the historical epochs, and races of humankind. Let them scoff if they will. Those who would prepare themselves for esoteric development must lift up their eyes to the heights where the interests of humankind, of the earth, of the whole planetary system become their own. The person whose interests are gradually sharpened and widened through the study of anthroposophy, including esoteric training, to an understanding of esoteric truths is being rightly prepared for an esoteric path. There are many people nowadays who have such an interest in the whole of humankind. More often than not we shall not find them among intellectuals but among people who seem to lead quite simple lives and feel this interest as if by natural instinct. That is why anthroposophy is in such harmony with the spirit of our age. First, then, we must experience the mighty upheaval of the soul that has to come at the beginning of esoteric experience. With wonderful truth, the Bhagavad Gita sets such a moment of upheaval at the starting point of Arjuna's experience, only he does not undergo an esoteric training, but is placed into this moment by his destiny. He is placed into the battle without being able to recognize its necessity, its purpose, or its aim. All he sees is that his relatives are about to fight against each other. A soul such as Arjuna's can be shaken to its innermost core by that experience, for he has to say to himself, quote, Brother fights against brother. Surely then all tribal customs will be shaken, and then the tribe itself will wither away and be destroyed, and all its morality fall into decay. Those laws that place men into castes in accordance with an eternal destiny will be shaken, and then will everything be imperiled. 
humanity itself, the law, the whole world. The whole significance of humankind will be in the balance. Close quote. Such is his feeling. It is as though the ground were about to sink from under his feet, as though an abyss were opening up before him. Arjuna was a man who had received into his feeling something that people nowadays no longer know, but that in those ancient times was a primeval teaching of tradition. He knew that what is handed on from generation to generation in humankind is bound up with female nature, while the individual personal qualities, whereby a person stands out from blood connections and family line, are bound up with male nature. What a person inherits as common generic qualities is handed on to the descendants by the woman, whereas what forms that person into a unique individual being, tearing one out of the generic succession, is the part received from the father. Quote, if blood fights against blood, must it not then have an evil effect on the laws that rule woman's nature? Close quote. Arjuna says to himself, Arjuna has now absorbed another feeling, another impression, upon which depends for him what he sees as the healthy course of future human evolution. He feels that the forefathers of the tribe, the ancestors, are worthy of honor. He feels that their souls watch over the succeeding generations. For him it is a sublime service to offer up sacrificial fires to the manes, I'm going to, and I'm going to spell that. That is M-A-N-E-S. I believe that's a plural. Footnote. See Manas, Roman Dreams of the Dean, in Simon Hornblower and Anthony Spalforth, editors, the Oxford Classical Dictionary, New York, Oxford University Press, 1996, page 916. I believe M-A-N-E-S is the plural. I'm going to pronounce that manes. Read again. For him, it is a sublime service to offer up sacrificial fires to the manes, to the holy souls of the ancestors. But now, what is he forced to see? Instead of altars with sacrificial fires burning on them for the ancestors, he sees those who should join in kindling the fires assailing one another in battle. If we would understand a human soul, we must penetrate into its thoughts. Above all, we must enter deeply into its feelings because it is in feeling that the soul is intimately bound up with its very life. Think now of the great contrast between all that Arjuna would naturally feel and the bloody battle of brother against brother that is about to take place. Destiny is hammering at Arjuna's soul, shaking it to its very depths. It is as though he had to gaze down into a terrible abyss, such an upheaval awakens the forces of the soul and brings it to a vision of esoteric realities that are, at other times, hidden as behind a veil. That is what gives such dramatic intensity to the Bhagavad Gita. The ensuing discourse is thus placed before us with wonderful power, developing of necessity out of Arjuna's destiny, instead of being given as merely instead of being given us merely as an academic, pedantic course of instruction in esotericism. Now that Arjuna has been rightly prepared for the birth of the deeper forces of his soul, now that he has an inward vision of these forces, something happens which everyone with the power to behold will understand. His charioteer becomes the instrument through which the god Krishna speaks to him. In the first four discourses, we observe three successive stages, each higher than the last, each one introducing something new. Here in these first discourses, we find an accent that is a wonder of dramatic artistry, apart from the fact that it corresponds to a deep esoteric truth. The first stage is a teaching that may appear downright trivial to many Westerners in its given form, let us admit this at once. Parenthesis. Here I should like to remark, especially for the benefit of my dear friends here in Finland, that I mean by Western all that lies to the west of the Ural Mountains, the Volga, the Caspian Sea, and Asia Minor, in fact the whole of Europe. What is to be called Eastern land 
belongs essentially in Asia. Of course, America too forms part of the West. Close parentheses. To begin with, then, we find a teaching that may easily appear trivial, especially to a philosophical mind. For what is the first thing that Krishna says to Arjuna as an exhortation to battle? Quote, Look there, he says, at those who are to be killed by you, those in your own ranks who are to be killed, and those who are to remain behind. And consider well this one fact. What dies and what remains alive in your ranks and in those of the enemy is but the outer physical body. This deepest being of humanity is not affected in this battle. Rise, Arjuna, rise to the spiritual standpoint, and then you can go and give yourself up to your duty. You need not shudder nor be sad at heart, for in killing your enemies you are not killing their essential being. Close quote. Thus speaks Krishna, and upon first hearing them his words are in some sense trivial. Footnote. Steiner refers to Krishna's words about reincarnation and not to his directive to fight, which is hardly trivial. End of footnote. Yet trivial in a very remarkable way. In many respects, Westerners are short-sighted in their thinking and consciousness. They never stop to consider that everything is evolving. If they say that Krishna's exhortation, as I have described it, excuse me, expressed it, is trivial, it is as though one were to say, quote, Why do they honor Pythagoras as such a great man when every schoolboy and girl knows his theorem? Close quote. It would be foolish to conclude that Pythagoras was not a great man in having discovered his theorem just because every schoolchild now understands it. We see how foolish this is. But we do not notice when we fail to realize that the wisdom of Krishna, which any Western philosopher may recite by rote, that the spirit is eternal, immortal, etc., was a sublime wisdom at the time Krishna revealed it. Souls like Arjuna did indeed feel that blood relations ought not to fight. They still felt the common blood that flowed in a group of people. To hear it said that, quote, the spirit is eternal, close quote, parenthesis, spirit in the sense of what is generally conceived abstractly as the center of the human being, close parenthesis, this stated in abstract and intellectual terms was something absolutely new and epoch-making in its newness when it resounded in Arjuna's soul through Krishna's words. All the people in Arjuna's environment definitely believed in reincarnation, but as Krishna taught it as a general and abstract idea, it was new, especially in regard to Arjuna's situation. This is one reason why we had to say that such a truth can only be called trivial in a special sense. That holds true in another respect as well. Our abstract thinking, which we use even in the pursuit of popular science, which we regard today as quite natural. This thinking activity was by no means always so natural and simple. In order to illustrate what I say, let me give you a radical example. You will think it strange that while for all of you it is quite natural to speak of a fish, it was by no means natural for primeval peoples to do so. Ancient peoples were acquainted with trout and salmon, cod and herring, but, in quotes, fish, they did not know. They had no such word as fish, because their thought did not extend to such abstract generalization. They knew birch trees, cherry trees, orange trees, individual trees, but, in quotes, tree, they did not know. Even now, thinking in such general concepts is by no means natural to indigenous people. This mode of thinking has indeed only entered humanity in the course of its evolution. In fact, one who considers why it was that logic first began in the time of ancient Greece could scarcely be surprised when the statement is made on esoteric grounds that logical thinking has only existed since the period that followed the original composition of the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna impels Arjuna to think logically, to think in abstractions, to a new way of thinking that is only now entering humanity. Footnote. Steiner seems to mean that Arjuna was to be one of the first to be capable of this kind of thinking, which after two and a half millennia 
has only today become a widely shared capacity. End of footnote. But people have the most distorted and unnatural notions about this activity of thinking that human beings have developed and take for granted today. Western philosophers in particular have the most distorted ideas about thinking, for they generally take it to be merely a photographic reproduction of external sense reality. They imagine that concepts and ideas and all of human thinking simply arise out of the external physical world. While libraries of philosophical glossaries have been written in the West to prove that thought is merely something that originates in response to the stimuli of the external physical world, only in our time will thought be valued for what it really is. Here I reach a point that is most important for those who would undergo esoteric development in their own souls. I want to make every effort to get this point clear. Medieval alchemists used to say, I cannot now discuss what they really meant by it, that gold could be made from all metals, gold in any desired amount, but that one must first have a minute quantity of it. Without that, one could not make gold. Whether or not this is true of gold, it is certainly true of clairvoyance. No one could actually attain clairvoyance if one did not have a tiny amount of it already in one's soul. It is generally supposed that people are not as such clairvoyant. If that were true, they could never become clairvoyant at all, because just as the alchemist thought that one must have a little gold to conjure forth large quantities, so must one already be a little clairvoyant in order to be able to develop and extend it more and more. Now you may see two alternatives here and ask, quote, Do you think then that we all are clairvoyant, if only slightly, or do you think that those of us who are not clairvoyant can never become so? Close quote. This is just the point. It is most important to understand that there is really no one among you who does not have this starting point of clairvoyance, though you may not be conscious of it. You all have it. None of you is lacking in it. What is this that all possess? It is something not generally regarded or valued as clairvoyance. Let me uh, make a rather crude comparison. If a pearl is lying in the roadway and a chicken finds it, the chicken does not value the pearl. Most men and women today are chickens in this respect. They do not value the pearl that lies there in full view before them. What they value is something quite different. They value their concepts and ideas, but no one could think abstractly, could have thoughts and ideas without being clairvoyant. The pearl of clairvoyance is contained in our ordinary thinking from the start. Ideas arise in the soul through exactly the same process as what gives rise to its highest powers. It is immensely important to learn to understand that clairvoyance begins in something common and every day. We only have to recognize the supersensible nature of our concepts and ideas. We must realize that these come to us from the supersensible worlds. Only then can we look at the matter correctly. <clears throat> when I tell you of the upper hierarchies, of seraphim and cherubim and thrones, right down to archangels and angels. These are beings that must speak to the human soul from higher spiritual worlds. It is from those worlds that concepts and ideas come into the human soul, not from the world of the senses. In the 18th century, what was considered at the time a great call was uttered by one of the Enlightenment philosophers, quote, O humanity, make bold to use thy power of reason. Close quote. Footnote, Immanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804, exclaimed, Dare to reason. Close quote, or end of footnote. Today, a, a great word must resonate in human souls. Quote, O humanity, make bold to claim thy concepts and ideas as the beginning of thy clairvoyance. Close quote. What I have just expressed I said publicly many years ago in my books titled Truth and Science and titled The Philosophy of Freedom. In uh, footnote, Philosophy of Freedom is also translated and is in this uh, 
on this website as titled Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path. End of footnote. Continue. Where I showed that human ideas come from supersensible spiritual knowledge. It was not understood at the time. And no wonder, for those who should have understood it, understood it were, well, like the chickens. We must realize that at the moment when Krishna stands before Arjuna and gives him the power of abstract judgment, he is thereby giving him, for the first time, in the whole of evolution, the starting point for the knowledge of higher worlds. The spirit can be seen on the very surface of the changes that take place within the external world of sense. Bodies die. The spirit, the abstract, the essential being, is eternal. The spiritual can be seen playing on the surface of phenomena. This is what Krishna would reveal to Arjuna as the beginning of a new clairvoyance for human beings. When you have this experience in your world of ideas, when the full cup of doubt in all existence has been poured out with pain and bitterness over your soul, only then are you ripe to understand how, after all, it is not the infinite spaces and periods of time of the physical world from which your ideas have come. Only then, after the bitterness of doubt, can you open yourself to the regions of the spirit and know that your doubt was justified and in what sense it was justified. For it had to be, since you imagined that the ideas had come into your soul from the times and spaces of the physical world. How do you now feel your world of ideas, having experienced its origin in the spiritual world? Now, for the first time, you feel yourself inspired. Before, you were feeling the infinite void spread around you like a dark abyss. Now you begin to feel that you are standing on a rock that rises up out of the abyss. You know with certainty, quote, Now I am connected with the spiritual worlds. They, not the world of sense, have bestowed on me my world of ideas. Close quote. One thing is necessary for people today if they would attain an inward experience of truth. They must have once passed through the feeling of the fleeting nature of all outer transformations. They must have experienced the mood of infinite sadness, of infinite tragedy, and at the same time the exaltation of joy. They must have felt the breath of the ephemeral that streams out from all things. They must have been able to fix their interest on this coming forth and passing away again, the transitoriness of the world of sense. Then, when they have been able to feel the deepest pain and the fullest delight in the external world, they must once have been absolutely alone, alone with their concepts and ideas. They must have had the feeling, quote, In these concepts I grasp the mystery of the worlds, I take hold of the outer edge of cosmic being, close quote, the very expression I once used in my title Philosophy of Freedom. This must be experienced, not merely understood intellectually. And if you would experience it, it must be in deepest loneliness. Then you have another feeling. On the one hand, you experience the majesty of the world of ideas that is spread out over the all. On the other hand, you experience with the deepest bitterness that you have to separate yourself from space and time in order to be at one with your concepts and ideas. Loneliness. It is the icy cold of loneliness. Furthermore, it comes to you that the world of ideas has now drawn together as into a single point of loneliness. Now you say, I am alone with my world of ideas. You become utterly bewildered in your world of ideas, an experience that stirs you to the depths of your soul. At length, you can say to yourself, excuse me, at length you say to yourself, quote, perhaps all this is only I, myself. Perhaps the only truth about these laws is that they exist in the point of my own loneliness. Close quote. Thus you experience infinitely enhanced, utter doubt in all existence. This is the next stage for the evolving soul. 
It is the stage where we begin to be deeply in earnest with what has today come to be a trivial, commonplace truth. To bear this feeling in your heart will prepare you to receive in a true way the first truth that Krishna gives to Arjuna after the mighty upheaval and convulsion in his soul, the truth of the eternal spirit living through outer transformations. To abstract understanding we speak in concepts and ideas. Krishna speaks to Arjuna's heart. What may be trivial and commonplace to the understanding is infinitely deep and sublime to the human heart. We see how the first stage shows itself at once as a necessary consequence of the deeply moving experience that is presented to us at the start of the Bhagavad Gita. And now to the next stage. It is easy to speak of what is often called dogma in esotericism, something that is accepted in blind faith and given out as gospel truth. Let me suggest to you that it would be quite simple for someone to come forward and say, quote, This man has published a book on esoteric science, speaking in it about Saturn, Sun, and Moon evolutions, and there is no way of controlling these statements. They can only be accepted as dogma. Close quote. Footnote. Rudolf Steiner, uh, this book is called, title, An Outline of Esoteric Science, first published in 1909, end of footnote. I could understand such a statement, because it corresponds to the superficial nature of our age. And there is no getting away from it. Our age is superficial. Indeed, under certain conditions, this objection would not be without foundation. It would be justified, for example, if you were to tear out of the book all the pages that precede the chapter on the Saturn evolution. If anyone were to begin reading the book at this chapter, it would be nothing but dogma. If, however, the author prefaces it with the other chapters, he is by no means a dogmatist, because he knows what paths the soul has to travel in order to reach such conceptions. That is the point, that it has been shown in the book how every individual, reaching into the depths of his or her soul, is bound to come to such conceptions. Herein all dogmatism ceases. Thus it may feel natural that Krishna, having brought Arjuna into the world of ideas and wishing to lead him into the esoteric world, now proceeds to show him the next stage, how every soul can reach that higher world if it finds the right starting point. Krishna then must begin by rejecting every form of dogmatism, and he does so radically. Here we come up against a hard saying by Krishna, he absolutely rejects what for centuries had been most holy to the highest minds of that age, the contents of the Vedas. He says, quote, Hold not to the Vedas, nor to the word of the Vedas. Hold fast to yoga. Close quote. That is to say, quote, Hold fast to what is within thine own soul. Close quote. Let us grasp what Krishna means by this exhortation. He does not mean that the contents of the Vedas are untrue. He does not want Arjuna to accept what is given in the Vedas dogmatically, as do the disciples of the Vedic teaching. He wants to inspire him to take his start from the very first original point whence the human soul evolves. For this purpose all dogmatic wisdom must be laid aside. We can imagine Krishna saying to himself that even though Arjuna will in the end reach the very same wisdom that is contained in the Vedas, still he must be drawn away from them, for he must go his own way, beginning with the sources in his own soul. Krishna rejects the Vedas, whether their content is true or untrue. Arjuna's path must start from himself. Through his own inwardness he must come to recognize Krishna. Arjuna must be assumed to have in himself what one can and must have if one is really to enter into the concrete truths of the supersensible worlds. Krishna has called Arjuna's attention to something that from then onward is a common attribute of humanity. Having led him to this point, he must lead him further and bring him to recognize what he is to achieve through yoga. Thus Arjuna must first undergo yoga. 
Here the poem rises to another level. In this second stage we see how the Bhagavad Gita goes through the first four discourses with ever-increasing dramatic force, coming at length to what is most individual. Krishna describes to Arjuna the path of yoga. We shall speak of this in more detail tomorrow. He describes the path that Arjuna must take in order to pass from the everyday clairvoyance of concepts and ideas to what can only be attained through yoga. Concepts only require to be placed in the right light, but Arjuna has to be guided to yoga. This is the second stage. The third stage shows once more an enhancement of dramatic power and the expression of a deep esoteric truth. Let us assume that someone takes the yoga path. Such a person will rise at length from his ordinary consciousness to a higher state of consciousness, which includes not only the ego that lies between the limits of birth and death, but also what passes from one incarnation to the next. The soul awakens to know itself in an expanded ego. It grows into a wider consciousness. The soul goes through a process that is essentially an everyday process, but is not experienced fully in our everyday life because we go to sleep every night. As the sense world fades, we become unconscious of it. For every human soul the possibility exists of letting this world of sense vanish from consciousness, as it does when we go to sleep, and then to live in higher worlds as in an absolute reality. Thereby humans rise to a higher level of consciousness. We shall still have to speak of yoga, and also of the modern exercises that make this possible. But if we gradually reach a point where we no longer consciously live and feel and know in ourselves, but live and feel and know together with the whole earth, then we grow into a higher level of consciousness, where the things of the sense world vanish for us, as they do in sleep. However, before we can attain this level, we must be able to identify ourselves with the soul of the earth. We shall see that this is possible. We know that human beings not only experience the rhythm of sleeping and waking, but other rhythms of the earth as well, of summer and winter. When one follows the path of yoga or goes through a modern esoteric training, it is possible to lift oneself above the ordinary consciousness that experiences the cycles of sleeping and waking, summer and winter. One can learn to look at oneself from outside. One becomes aware of being able to look back at oneself just as one ordinary, ordinarily looks at things outside the self. Now we observe the cycles in external life. We see alternating conditions. We realize how the body, as long as one is outside of oneself, takes on a form similar to that of the earth in summer, with all its vegetation. What material science discovers and calls nerves, we begin to perceive as a sprouting forth of something plant-like when going to sleep. When we return to everyday consciousness, we feel how this plant-like life shrinks together again and becomes the instrument for thinking, feeling and willing in waking consciousness. One feels one's going out from the body and returning into it as analogous to the alternation of summer and winter on the earth. In effect we feel something summer-like in going to sleep and something winter-like in waking up. Not as one might imagine the opposite way around. From this moment onward we learn to understand what the spirit of the earth is and how it is asleep in summer and awake in winter, not vice versa. We realize the wonderful experience of identifying ourselves with the spirit of the earth. From this moment on, one says, quote, I live not only inside my skin, but as a cell lives in my bodily organism, so do I live in the organism of the earth. The earth is asleep in summer and awake in winter as I am asleep and awake in the alternation of night and day. And as the cell is to my consciousness, so am I to the consciousness of the earth. Close quote. 
The path of yoga, especially in its modern sense, leads to this expansion of consciousness, to the identification of our own being with a more comprehensive being. We feel ourselves interwoven with the whole earth. Then we no longer feel ourselves bound as humans to a particular time and place, but we feel our humanity such as it has developed from the very beginning of the earth. We feel the age-long succession of our evolutions through the course of earth evolution. Thus, yoga leads us on to feel our at one with what goes from one incarnation to another in the earth's evolution. That is the third stage. This is the reason for the great beauty in the artistic composition of the Bhagavad Gita. In its climaxes, its inner artistic form, it reflects deep esoteric truths. Beginning with an instruction in the ordinary concepts of our thinking, it goes on to an indication of the path of yoga. Then at the third stage, it describes the marvelous expansion of humanity's horizon over the whole earth where Krishna awakens in Arjuna the idea, quote, All that lives in your soul has lived often before, only you know nothing of it. But I have this consciousness in myself when I look back on all the transformations through which I have lived, and I will draw you to me so that you may learn to feel yourself as I feel myself. Close quote. This is a new moment of dramatic force as beautiful as it is deeply and mysteriously true. Thus we come to see the evolution of humankind from out of its everyday consciousness, from the pearl in the roadway that only needs to be recognized, from the particular world of thoughts and concepts that are a matter of everyday life in any one age, up to the point from where we can look out over all that we really have in us, which lives on from incarnation to incarnation on the earth. The end of lecture 7, which is also lecture 2 in the second part of the book, which, by the way, is entitled in the original edition The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita. You are listening to Rudolf Steiner Audio.com. This is a reading of uh, collected works of Rudolf Steiner, the title The Bhagavad Gita in the West. This is the second part, the lecture cycle that was called The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita given in Helsinki. This would be lecture 3, however in this set it is lecture 8, given the file I'm creating, given on May 30th, 1913. In the last lecture I was trying to show you how the thinking of the present day, which tends to the formation of abstract concepts, is not really a gift of the outer physical world, but a gift of the spiritual world. I tried to show you how fundamentally this abstract thinking enters the human soul in exactly the same way as the revelations of the beings of the upper hierarchies. The point then is this, that in our ordinary life we have something in us already that is related to clairvoyant perception, and we have something else in us as well, which is even more akin to clairvoyant perception, although in a less obvious way. I am referring to the consciousness that appears between our ordinary waking state and sleep, our dream consciousness. We cannot become familiar in a practical way with the ascent of the soul into higher worlds without trying to get a clear idea of the peculiar life that the soul leads in this twilight consciousness of dreaming. What then is a dream in reality? Let us begin by considering the dream pictures we have around or before us, which in general are more fleeting and less sharply outlined than the perceptions of ordinary life. These pictures seem to flit past our souls. When we analyze them objectively in retrospect, we may be struck by the fact that in most cases they have some kind of connection with our life on the physical plane. Of course, there are people who are only too ready to see lofty and wonderful things in their dreams or to interpret them at once as revelations of higher worlds. There are those who really believe that a dream has given them something altogether new, something that has never been there before. 
In most cases, we shall be mistaken in interpreting our dreams in such a way. In our careless haste, we fail to recognize how, after all, some experience or other we have had on the physical plane, more or less recently, or perhaps even many years ago, has reappeared in the changing, weaving pictures of our dreams. For this very reason, it is quite easy for the materialistic science of our age to reject the idea that there is anything remarkable in the revelations of our dreams, and to point out instead that dreams are simply copies or reflections of what has been experienced in external life. If you are acquainted with the contemporary science of dreams, you will realize that it is always at pains to prove that the dream contains nothing more than the reflections of the physical world stored in the brain. Admittedly, such an attitude can easily deny any higher significance to our dream life by showing that the exalted revelations many people claim to have are pictures characteristic of the age in which they live, pictures that could not have been seen at all in any other age. So, for example, people today often dream in images derived from inventions and discoveries only made in the 19th century. Of course, it is easy to prove that images derived from external life steal their way into the ever-changing play of dreams. Those who would gain a clear idea of their dream experiences, to learn something from them to help them access esoteric worlds, must therefore be exceedingly careful in this realm. They must make a habit <clears throat> to carefully follow out all the hidden connections. By doing so, they will realize that most of our dreams give us no more than was experienced in the outer world. But it is just when we become more careful in analyzing our dream life and ever aspiring esotericist, excuse me, and every aspiring esotericist should do so, that we gradually begin to notice how one thing or another wells up before us that we could not possibly have experienced in our external life during this incarnation. Readers following the indications given in my title, How to Know Higher Worlds, will notice that their dream life gradually begins to change. Their dreams do actually begin to assume a different character. One of the first experiences may be the following. Perhaps I have been thinking for a long time about some perplexing problem and have at last concluded that my understanding is not yet equal to solving it, nor is all that I have been able to learn from external sources adequate for solving it. Now it will not generally happen that I am immediately conscious of having a dream in which this problem is solved for me. Even so, I will be able to have a certain higher consciousness at a comparatively early stage. For instance, Awaking from a dream, I will seem to remember something. I can tell myself, quote, I have not been dreaming about this problem, nor was I conscious of a dream I have had earlier. Yet a kind of memory is arising in me. It is as though some being had come near to me who solved this problem for me by giving or suggesting a solution. Close quote. This experience comes fairly easily if one expands one's consciousness by following the indications I have given. One will recall something that was experienced as though in a dream, and will know that at the time one was not aware of experiencing it. Such an experience will seem to shine upward from the depths of the soul, and one may say to oneself, quote, When I wasn't there with my intelligence, my cleverness, when instead I was protecting my soul from the suggestions of my intellect, then my soul had greater power. My soul could come freely, in touch with the solution to the problem, before which my intellect and understanding were powerless. Quote. Here, too, scientists will no doubt often find it easy to give a materialistic explanation for such an experience. But the one who has had it knows full well that what appeared, emerging like the recollection of a dream experience, reveals something quite different from a mere reminiscence of ordinary life. The whole mood of soul following it tells the dreamer he or she has never had such an experience before. 
It triggers a wonderful feeling of bliss and elation to realize that in the depths of the soul something more is active than is present in ordinary consciousness. This recognition can become still more distinct and it happens in the following way. If one carries out energetically the exercises given in my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds, and if one continues to do so for a long time, even perhaps for several decades, then an experience may arise in the soul quite similar to what I have just been describing. For example, we may recollect an experience in everyday life years ago, perhaps a most disagreeable experience that was felt as a hard blow of fate and could never be recollected without pain and bitterness. Now, something like the memory of a dream arises in our consciousness, but it is a strange dream. It tells us that feelings live within us that drew this bitter experience to us with irresistible force, and welcomed it gladly. Something lives in us that felt a kind of delight, in bringing about all the circumstances that led up to this stroke of fate. When we have had such a dream remembrance, we know full well that while in our usual consciousness which regulates our external affairs there has not been a single moment, not one in the whole course of our present life, when we did not feel this stroke of fate with bitter pain, yet deep down within us something stands in quite a different relation to this blow of fate. It used all of its power and magnetic force to draw together the circumstances needed to bring about this misfortune. We did not know it at the time. Now we notice that behind our everyday consciousness another deeper layer of our soul life was wisely at work. If we have such an experience, and we shall have them, if we earnestly carry through the exercises I have indicated, from then onward we will have an extended area of knowledge and conviction. In ordinary life we feel ourselves in a certain relation to the outer world and to the events that come to us in the course of our destiny. We meet these events with sympathy and antipathy. In the case mentioned, this particular blow of fate was felt as a bitter and hateful experience. We did not know that all this time our soul had another, wider life, longing to live through what we felt to be so unwelcome. This feeling is quite different in quality from any recollection of ordinary life, for in our innermost being we are very different from what we imagine. It is just this difference that now becomes evident in our soul. It enters in such a way that we know it has brought us revelations from realms into which our everyday consciousness cannot penetrate. It widens our whole concept of our life of soul. We know then from experience that our soul life contains far more than its mere content within the limits of birth and death. Unless we penetrate into these deeper regions, we have no idea that beneath the threshold of consciousness We are quite different beings from what we imagine ourselves to be in everyday life. When a new significant feeling thus arises, the horizon of what we call our world expands into a new region. We realize why it is that in ordinary life we can enter it only under certain conditions. In attempting to describe to you what may be called the esoteric development of dream life, I have set before you two quite different conditions. Our ordinary dream life, which most people experience continually at the border of sleeping and waking, and which is nourished by images of everyday life, and an altogether new world of inner life that can arise steadily through a certain training. We have the power to plunge into the regions of the dream life in such a way as to find a new world dawning upon us one in which we have actual experiences of the spiritual worlds. However, if we would have these new experiences between sleeping and waking during the night, one condition must be fulfilled. We must be able to exclude the recollections and images of our ordinary life. So long as these interfere in the realm of dreams, they will become inflated 
and block the way to real experiences of the higher worlds? Why is it that the images from our everyday life thrust themselves so insistently into this higher realm? Because, whether we admit it or not, we have the liveliest interest in all that concerns our particular selves in the external world. If some people imagine that they no longer take any special interest in their life, that makes no difference at all. No one who realizes how in this connection people can give themselves up to the grossest illusions will be misled by such imaginings. After all, people are closely attached to the sympathies and antipathies of their everyday lives. If you really try to carry out the exercises I have given for soul development, you will soon realize that it all comes to this, that you must detach your interest from your everyday life. People carry out the directions given in title How to Know Higher Worlds in all sorts of ways. Many different people read the book, and for many different reasons. And one's reason for looking into it will determine one's attitude to it. Some may begin reading with the most beautiful feelings of how they may gain insight into the higher worlds. Then their curiosity is aroused. And why indeed should we not be curious about this realm? Curiosity often begins to stir, even if one begins with the holiest of feelings. That will only carry through for a little while, however, for all sorts of inner feelings start coming in and make us stop, so we give it up. But the feelings that we do not wish to recognize clearly and generally interpret wrongly are just those connected with sympathies and antipathies. We must free ourselves from them in quite another way if we really mean to carry out these exercises. In fact, we do not free ourselves from them. That is why we stop doing the exercises. Though we want, excuse me, though we say we want to break free of them, we do not do so. But when a person is really in earnest about doing the exercises, the effect they can have is seen very soon. One's sympathies and antipathies toward life change a little. I must say this does not happen very often. When it does happen, the change is of utmost significance, because it means we are struggling against the very forces that allow the images from our everyday life to arise in our dreams. If we have come so far as to alter our sympathies and antipathies in any sphere of life, no matter which one, these forces can no longer find their way in. This alteration in the forces of sympathy need not occur in a high realm of life, but in some domain it must be carried out, perhaps in the most mundane matters. There are people who say they do their exercises every mo day, morning and evening, and for hours at a time, and cannot go even one step into the spiritual worlds. Sometimes it is difficult to explain to them how easily one can understand this situation. In many cases, they need only realize the fact that they are still grumbling about the same things they were grumbling about twenty, even thirty years ago, although they have been doing exercises all of this time. The very language of their grumbling is still the same. Then there are those who try to apply external means that can have certain effects in esotericism. For example, they become vegetarians. But there are people who go about it with utmost seriousness, really attempt to break a habit, yet achieve no results at all despite decades of exercises. Such people will think, if only I could experience a tiny fragment of the spiritual world. It is as if they have returned to the flesh pots of Egypt. For them, as for the Israelites in the desert, longing for luxuries they had left behind in Egypt, the old sympathy for meat has not been suppressed. Others, thinking that they perhaps need meat, may say, My brain needs meat, for the whole sympathy, for the old sympathy for meat was not suppressed. People will come up with all kinds of other reasons, thinking that they perhaps need meat. Let us not imagine that it is an easy thing to transform one's sympathies and antipathies. To quote a passage from Faust, quote, 
easy it is, yet it is the easy that is hard. Close quote. This is an apt expression of the situation of the evolving soul trying to rise to the higher worlds. It is not a question of changing this or that particular sympathy or antipathy, but of changing anything whatsoever. If we do, then after certain exercises, we can enter the domain of dream life in such a way that we bring nothing into it of our everyday sense experiences. Thereby, in a certain sense, new experiences have room to enter. When, through esoteric development, we have really gone through such experiences in practice, we become aware of a certain layer of consciousness in us, lying behind the everyday consciousness with which we are all familiar. In ordinary life our dreams take place in this second layer of consciousness, in quotes, dream consciousness, but it only becomes such through our carrying into it what we experience from our waking consciousness. If, however, we hold back all of our everyday experiences from this region, then experiences from the higher worlds can enter. These higher experiences are present every day in our surrounding world. When they first arise, we begin to realize that our everyday consciousness itself seems like a dream compared to the reality of those experiences. We find that reality only begins on that higher level. Returning to the example of suffering a blow of fate that subsequently caused such bitter feelings, let us try to understand how one actually comes to realize the beginning of higher consciousness. Along with this bitterness, we notice that something in us sought out this misfortune. We even feel its necessity for our development. Now for the first time we realize in practice what karma is. We entered this incarnation with an imperfection in our soul. We felt it deeply and thus were drawn by a magnetic power toward this blow of fate. By fully experiencing it, we have mastered and done away with the imperfection. That is something real and important. How superficial, then, is everyday judgment in creating a feeling of antipathy toward the misfortune. Here, rather, is the higher reality. Our soul goes forward from one life to another. How short is the time in which it can feel antipathy toward a blow of fate? When it looks out beyond the horizon of this incarnation, it feels one thing only to be necessary, to become ever more perfect. This feeling is stronger than any we have in our ordinary consciousness, which, when confronted by this blow of fate, would have slunk past it like a coward, would not have chosen the compensating necessity. But the deeper consciousness, of which we know nothing, does not do this. Instead it seeks its destiny, and feels it as a process of growth toward perfection. It says, quote, I entered into this life, I was aware of an imperfection that has been in my soul since birth. If I would develop my soul, this imperfection must be remedied. But to do this I must go on to meet this misfortune. I must seek it out. Close quote. There we have the stronger element in the soul, compared to which the web of ordinary life, with all its sympathies and antipathies, is like a dream. In that realm of the beyond, we enter a life and feeling of which we can say, quote, It knows us better. It is stronger in us than our ordinary consciousness. Close quote. Now we notice another thing. If we really have the experience just described, if we do not merely know it in theory but truly experience it, then of necessity we have another experience at the same time. While we feel we can already enter into those regions where everything is different from what it is in ordinary consciousness, a feeling arises in us, quote, I do not want to enter. Close quote. This feeling is very deep. As a rule, the curiosity that impels people to enter the spiritual world is not nearly strong enough to overcome the feeling of revulsion that says, I will not enter. The aversion we feel at this particular stage arises with tremendous force 
and all sorts of misunderstandings about it are possible. Suppose that someone has even received personal instructions. He comes to his instructor and says, quote, I cannot, cannot get on at all. Your instructions are of no use. Close quote. Indeed, he may honestly think so. If the instructor gave him the answer, do him, however, he would not be able to understand it at all. This answer would have to be, quote, you can enter perfectly well, but you do not want to, close quote. Because his reluctance remains hidden in his subconsciousness, the pupil honestly believes he has the will to enter. Indeed, the moment one begins to realize this reluctance, one checks it. The idea that one does not want to enter is so horrifying that one immediately begins to damp down one's unwillingness. This reluctance is a subtle and insidious thing. We feel that we cannot enter with the ego, the self that we have acquired in this world. A person who wants to evolve to higher things feels very strongly that he or she must leave this self behind. That, however, is a difficult thing to do, because we would never have developed this self if we did not feel in our daily consciousness that we have this self in order to develop it here. Our ordinary ego has come into this world in order to evolve. Thus, when we want to enter the real world, we feel we must leave behind what we were able to evolve in the ordinary world. Then there is only one way. We must have developed this self more strongly than is required for ordinary consciousness. As a rule, we only develop it as far as needed for ordinary life. Now, if you observe the second point in title How to Know Higher Worlds, you will find that it amounts to this, that the self must be made stronger than is necessary for the purposes of daily life. Only then are we able to go out of our body at night and still retain something that we have not exhausted. It is only when we have fortified our ordinary self by our exercises and have an excess of self-reliance in us that we no longer want to shrink back from the higher worlds. But then a new and considerable danger arises. We perhaps no longer bring the recollections of ordinary life into our dreams, but we bring something else, our expanded and strengthened self-consciousness. It would be as though we filled that realm with it. Anyone who carries through such exercises as given in my book, and thus comes to have inner soul experiences like Arjuna's, enters the realm of dream life, with an expanded, strengthened self. The result is the same whether we have done a special training or were destined to expand the self at a definite period in our life. Arjuna is in this position. He stands at the boundary between the everyday world and that of dreams. He lives his way into that higher region because through his destiny he has a more powerful self in that realm than he needs for ordinary life. I shall have to elaborate this point still further, showing that Arjuna has this more powerful consciousness, because now, as soon as he penetrates into that realm, Krishna at once receives him. Krishna lifts him out of the self he has acquired in ordinary life, and thus he becomes a different man from what he would have been if his expanded self had not met Krishna. In that case he would certainly have said to himself, quote, Blood relations are fighting against one another. Events are taking place that must ruin the ancient holy caste distinctions and the service to our ancestors, events that must corrupt our womankind, and conditions that will prevent us from kindling the fires of sacrifice to our forefathers. Close quote. All of this was part of Arjuna's everyday consciousness, from which his destiny tore him away. He would have had to stand on ground where he would have had to break with all these accustomed feelings connected with old traditions. He would have had to say to himself, quote, Away with all I hold sacred, with all the traditions that have been handed down to me. I will hurl myself into the battle. Close quote. But that is not what happens. Krishna appears, and what he says must appear to Arjuna as utmost unscrupulousness as egoism driven beyond all bounds. The excess of force that Arjuna would otherwise have experienced, that he would have used to live through his own life, 
Krishna uses as a power whereby he makes himself visible to Arjuna. To make this thought still clearer, we may say that if Arjuna had simply met Krishna, even though the latter had actually come to him, he would have known nothing of him, just as we would know nothing of the sense world if we had not received something from the sense world itself that formed our senses for perceiving it. Similarly, Krishna must take from Arjuna his expanded and strengthened consciousness. He must, in a sense, remove Arjuna's self, so that with the help of what he has torn out, he may show himself to Arjuna. Thus he makes from what he has torn out, so to speak, a mirror in which to show himself to Arjuna. We have sought to explain what in Arjuna's consciousness enabled Krishna to meet him. This still leaves unexplained how Arjuna came to his higher consciousness in the first place. Nowhere do we see the statement that Arjuna had done esoteric exercises. In fact, he had not done any. How then is he able to meet Krishna? What was it that gave Arjuna a higher and stronger self-consciousness? We shall start from this question in the next lecture, the end of Lecture 8. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected works by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West. It consists of two cycles of lectures. One, the Bhagavad Gita and the Epistles of St. Paul, which is also found separately on this website, and that will now be included in this whole file for this one. And the second one, which I'm reading right now, I'm on lecture four of it, I'm about to read, is entitled The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita, but this is also technically lecture nine in this whole set, given in Helsinki on May 31st, 1913. We have seen that if one would enter into the realm to which, among other things, the woven fabric of our dreams belongs, one must take from the ordinary world something we described as an intensified self-consciousness. There must be a stronger and fuller life in the ego than one needs for one's purposes on the physical plane. In our age, this excess of self-consciousness is drawn forth from our soul by the experiences we gain through esoteric exercises such as I have given. Thus the first step consists in strengthening and intensifying one's inner self. Human beings instinctively feel that they need this strengthening, and if they have not yet attained it, a kind of fear and shyness comes over them. They tend to shrink from the prospect of experiencing higher worlds. We must continually bear in mind that in the course of evolution the human soul has passed through many different stages. Thus in the period of the Bhagavad Gita it was not yet possible for a human soul to intensify its self-consciousness by such esoteric exercises as may be practiced today. In that ancient time, however, something else was still present in the self, namely primeval clairvoyance. This is also a faculty that humans do not really need for ordinary life on the physical plane, if we can be content with what our epoch offers us. But the people of that ancient time still had the remnants of primeval clairvoyance. So we can look far back and put ourselves in the place of a person living at the time when the Bhagavad Gita originated. Such a person would express his or her experience this way, quote, When I look out into the world around me, I receive impressions through my senses. These impressions can be combined by the intellect, of which the brain is the organ. Apart from that, I still have another faculty, a clairvoyant power that enables me to acquire knowledge of other worlds. This power tells me that humanity belongs to other realms that my human nature extends far beyond the ordinary physical world. Close quote. This very power, by means of which there arises in the soul the instinctive knowledge that it belongs not only to the physical world, is actually a stronger kind of self-consciousness. 
It is as though these last remnants of ancient clairvoyance still had the power to surcharge the soul with selfhood. Nowadays, humans can again develop in themselves such surplus forces if they will undergo the right esoteric exercises. Now, some objections may be made. You know that in anthroposophical lectures we must always forestall objections of which the true esotericist is well aware. Someone may ask, quote, Why should it occur to present-day people to want to undertake esoteric exercises at all? Why shouldn't we be content with what our ordinary intellect offers us? Close quote. That, my friends, is a big question, because it touches upon an actual fact for every thoughtful soul in the present cycle of evolution. If we did not reach out to anything more than what our senses and our brain-bound intellect can show us, we would certainly be content with our existence. We would observe the things and events around us, their relationships, and how they come into being and pass away again. But we would ask no questions about this ebb and flow of activity. We would be content with it, as an animal may be content with its existence. In fact, if humans were really the beings that materialistic thinking considers us to be, we could well, quite well accept our life as such and ask no questions. This is the life of the animal, content with all that arises and passes before its senses. Why isn't this the case with us? Remember that we are speaking of present-day humanity, for even in ancient Greece the human soul was different in this respect from what it is today. When we today give ourselves with our whole soul to the study of natural science, or when we consider all the events of historical evolution and gain a knowledge of the external science of history, with all this, something else finds its way almost imperceptibly into our soul, something that has no purpose nor any sense for physical life. Many comparisons have been made to illustrate this fact. I would like to mention one of them, because people often make use of it without considering its deeper significance. A famous medical authority in the last third of the nineteenth century, wishing to enhance the honor of pure science, once drew attention to the Greek philosopher Pythagoras, who was asked, Quote, what do you mean of philosophers who spend their time speculating on the meaning and purpose of life? How does your, their occupation compare with the activities of ordinary men who pursue some useful calling and play a useful part in community life? Close quote. The philosopher replied, quote, Look at a fair or market. Some uh, excuse me, people come to buy and sell and everyone is busy but there are a few among them who do not want to buy or sell, but simply want to stroll about and watch what is going on. Close quote. The philosopher implied that the market represented life, people busy in all sorts of ways, but the philosophers are not busy with such affairs. Instead, they look at what is happening and try to learn all about it. Somehow a great respect for philosophers has penetrated deeply into the minds of an intellectual humanity, precisely because philosophers do not obviously take part in any productive activity. The philosophers are honored just because their science is independent, detached, self-sufficient. Yet this comparison ought to give us food for thought, for it is by no means as banal as it might appear at first sight. After all, it is curious that philosophers should be compared to idlers in the marketplace of life, useless folk, watching others labor. One might indeed think of it in this way. But we must realize that judgments are past that originally are quite correct, but become altogether wrong if they linger on for centuries, or, as in this case, for thousands of years. Therefore we ask again, if these people who stroll about in life are really to be judged as idlers. That depends upon the standards by which we value human life. Certainly there are those who regard the philosophers as useless loiterers and think they would do better to perform some productive work. From their point of view they may be quite right. 
But when we today observe life through the senses and consider it by means of the brain-bound intellect, something steals into the soul that obviously has no connection with the outer world of the senses. That is the point. This can be seen clearly in books that try to construct a satisfactory picture of the world and life on a purely materialistic basis. It usually turns out that the big questions do not arise until the end. The books claiming to solve the riddles of the universe actually only begin to set forth those riddles in their concluding pages. In effect, when one begins today to study the external world that is the subject treated in such books, the thought slips in that either humans exist for other worlds besides this world, or else the physical world deceives us and makes fools of us because it is continually raising questions for which we have no answer. If life really ends with death, if humans have no part in and no connection with a higher world, an enormous part of our soul life is meaningless. Indeed, it is not the longing for something we do not have, but the lack of understanding what we do have that impels us to follow up these questions and ask what it is that comes into the soul that does not belong to this world of the senses. Thus we are driven to cultivate something which is evidently without foundation in the external world. We are impelled to take up esoteric exercises. We would not say humankind has an inward longing for immortality and therefore invents the idea of it, but rather that the external world has implanted in our soul something that would be meaningless, unreal, if the whole of our existence were limited to the time between birth and death. Human beings are impelled to ask the nature of something they have, not of something they do not have. In fact, present-day humans are no longer quite in the position of mere loiterers or onlookers, so they cannot appeal now to the Greek philosopher. In those times the comparison held good, but today it does not. Today we might say that buyers and sellers come and go. When at length they close the market and make up accounts, they find something that certainly could neither have been bought nor sold, nor can they discover whence it came. That never happens in an ordinary market, but so it is in the market of life. Every comparison has its flaw, and this one is all the better for it. As we go on living, we are continually finding things that life opens to view, yet no explanation for them is to be found in the world of sense. That is the deeper reason for why there are people in the world today who despair of life, yet at the same time have vague, unrecognized longings. Something is active in them that does not belong to the physical world, but keeps on putting forth questions about other worlds. For this reason, we now have to acquire a spiritual culture. Otherwise, we shall be overcome by hopelessness and despair. What we now must acquire, someone like Arjuna possessed simply because he lived in the ancient age of primeval clairvoyance. Yet it also was a period of transition, because he belonged to that time in evolution when only the last remnants and echoes of that clairvoyance remained. If we are to understand the Bhagavad Gita, it is important to realize that at the time of its appearance humans were entering an age in which this old clairvoyance gradually became lost. In this lies the deep undercurrent of that sublime poem, or, we may say, the source of the breath poured out through it. For this song resounds with tones of a great turning point in time, when from the twilight of the old clairvoyance a night was to begin in which a new force could be born to humankind. Only in that night could a force be born that the soul of today possesses, but which souls of that time did not yet possess. About Arjuna, then, we can say that ancient clairvoyance is still present in his soul, but it is flickering out. It is no longer a strong, spontaneous force. Rather, it requires a harrowing experience, such as I have described, to reawaken it. 
What then can Arjuna perceive through this awakening of the ancient power of vision, which at other times was dying away within him? He sees the spiritual being called Krishna. Here it is necessary to point out that, through, that though humans may lift their souls today into that realm where dreams are woven, this is no longer enough to give a full understanding of Krishna's being. Even if we develop the forces enabling us to consciously pass into the region of dream consciousness, we still are unable today to fully discover what Krishna is. Referring again to what I said yesterday, let us call our everyday consciousness the lowest realm. Above it lies a realm of which we are unconscious in daily life. Or, rather, a world that becomes conscious only in a kind of illusory image as maya or dream consciousness. But when we, so to speak, wipe out the dreams, erase the maya, then impressions from another world enter this region of human consciousness. Into all the experiences we have of our physical environment, something now enters that is like a kind of overflow in the soul and really belongs to other worlds, to inner supersensible worlds. Now we have an experience that cannot be described as a reminiscence of ordinary life. The world now has a different aspect from anything known on the physical plane. We discover that we are seeing something we do not see in the ordinary world. Though we often imagine that we see light, in reality it is not so. On the physical plane we never see light, only color and different shades of color, darker and lighter colors. We see the effects of light, but light itself speeds invisibly through space. We can easily convince ourselves of this fact. When a ray of light strikes through the window, we see a kind of streak of light rays in the room caused by dust in the air. We see reflections of light from the glittering particles of dust, the light itself remaining invisible. After lifting our experience to the higher realm we have spoken of, we really do begin to see the light itself. There we are surrounded by flowing light, just as in the physical world we live in flowing air. Only we do not enter this world with a physical body. We have no need to breathe there. One enters that world with a part of one's being that needs light, as in the physical world one's body needs air. In this region, light is the element of life, light air, we might call it, and it is a necessity for existence. Further, that light is permeated and transfused with something not unlike the cloud forms shaping and reshaping in our atmosphere. The clouds are water, but up there what meets us like floating forms is nothing other than the weaving life of sound the music of the spheres. Still further we shall perceive the flowing of life itself. Thus we may begin to describe the world into which our souls enter, but the terms of our description must remain meaningless for the physical world. Perhaps those who use words most lacking in meaning for the physical world will best describe that other world that has a far higher reality. Of course, our materialistically-minded friends will find it easy to object to these ideas. Their arguments against what the esotericist has to say are plausible enough. The esotericist knows how easily such objections are made, for the very reason that the higher worlds are best described by words not suitable for things of the physical plane. For example, the esotericist would speak of light air or air light. On the physical plane there is no such thing, but over there, there is. Indeed, when we penetrate into that realm, we also discover what is to be deprived of this life element, to have insufficient light air. We feel feel the pain of suffocation in our soul, comparable to losing our breath for lack of air on the physical plane. There we also find the opposite condition, a fullness of pure, holy, light air in which we can live and perceive spiritual beings that live there too, manifesting themselves in full clearness. 
Those are the beings who stand under Lucifer's guidance. The moment we enter that realm without sufficient preparation, without proper training, Lucifer gains the power to deprive us of the light air we need. We can say that he suffocates our souls. The effect is not quite the same as suffocation on the physical plane, but like a polar bear transported south, we thirst and long for something that can reach us from the spiritual treasure, the spiritual light of the physical plane. That is just what Lucifer desires, for then we do not pay attention to all that comes from the upper hierarchies, but thirstily cleave to all that Lucifer has brought onto the physical plane. This is what happens if we have insufficiently trained ourselves in preparation. Then when we stand before Lucifer, he takes the light air away from us. We crave breath and long for the spiritual that comes from the physical plane. Let us suppose that a person goes through a training that brings him far enough to enter the higher worlds, to reach this upper region. But suppose he has not done all that belongs to the training. Suppose he has forgotten that with all his exercises he must at the same time be ennobling his moral sense, his moral feelings. Suppose that he must let go of all earthly ambitions and all lust for power in his soul. Indeed, one can reach the higher worlds even if he is vain and ambitious, but he takes these qualities with him. When a person has not purified his moral feelings, Lucifer takes the light air away from him so that he perceives nothing of what he is really there and instead he longs for things on the physical plane. He breathes in, so to speak, what he has been able to perceive on the physical plane. So he may imagine that he perceives something only to be seen spiritually in the light air. He imagines that he sees the different incarnations of various human beings, but it is not so. He does not see them, because he lacks the air light. Instead, like a thirsty being, he sucks up into that realm things of the physical plane below and describes all manner of things acquired there as though they were processes in the higher region. There is no more harmful way of raising one's soul into the higher worlds than by means of vain and earthly love of power. If one does this, one will forever remain unable to bring down true results of cognition. What one brings will be mere reflections, a phantom picture of the speculations and conjectures one may have made in the physical world. We have been describing what might be called the general scenery of that realm. There are also beings we meet there, whom we may call elemental beings. In the physical world we often speak of forces of nature. In that higher realm these forces manifest themselves as real beings. There we make a definite discovery. Through the actual facts that meet us, we discover that whereas on the physical plane good and evil exist together, in that higher realm there are separate specific forces of good and evil. Here in the physical world, good and evil are combined and interwoven in each human soul. One has more of a tendency to good, another less. In that realm there are evil beings who exist to battle against the work of good beings. Consequently, on entering that realm, we already have occasion to make use of the strengthened self-consciousness we mentioned yesterday. We have need of the more acute power of judgment that must come with our enhanced self. Then we may really be in a position to say that here in the higher realm there must be beings who have the mission of evil. Such beings have to exist alongside those who have the mission of good. We often hear it asked, Excuse me, we often hear it asked, quote, Why didn't the all-wise God of the universe simply create the good alone? Why isn't it everywhere always? Close quote. Now we gain this conviction, however, that if only the good were present, the world would become one-sided. It would not bring forth all the fullness of life that it does yield. The good must have something to oppose it. This, in fact, can already be realized on the physical plane, 
but in that higher realm we perceive it with far greater force. There we see that only people who are content with a merely sentimental and dreamy outlook can imagine that good beings alone could bring about the purposes of the universe. In the realm of everyday life we might do with sentimentality, but we cannot tolerate it when we enter the stern realities of the supersensible world. There we know that the good beings alone could not have made the world. They would be too weak to mold this universe. In the totality of evolution, those forces must be included which come from the evil beings. There is great wisdom in this fact that evil is mingled in cosmic evolution. Thus we have to get rid of sentimentality when we enter spiritual life. Bravely and unflinchingly we must approach the dangerous truths that dawn upon us when we perceive the battle that is fought in just this realm, the battle between the good and evil beings that can there be revealed to us. All these are experiences we have when we have trained and adapted our souls to enter consciously into this realm. So far we have only entered the realm of dreams. We human beings live in still another realm, one for which we are so little adapted in ordinary life that we generally have no perceptions whatsoever of it. It is the realm through which we live in dreamless sleep. Here an absolute paradox appears, for sleep, after all, is characterized by the complete cessation of consciousness. In normal human life today people cease to be conscious when they fall asleep, and they do not regain consciousness until they wake up again. In the age of primeval clairvoyance, this realm too was something the soul could experience. If we go back into those ancient periods of evolution, however, there was actually a condition of life corresponding to our sleep in which people could perceive in a still higher, still more spiritual world than the world of dreams. This was true even in early post-Atlantean times. There we find conditions that, in regard to the usual human processes, are exactly like the condition of sleep, but are not because they are permeated by consciousness. When we have reached this height, we do not see the physical world, even though we still see the world of light, air, of sound, of cosmic harmony, and of the battle between the good and evil beings. The world we see may be said to be still more fundamentally different than what I have described so far from all that exists in the physical world. So it is yet more difficult to describe than the world we find on entering the region of dream consciousness. I would like now to give you an idea of how one's consciousness in this realm works and of its actual effects. Anyone who describes that sublime world into which our dreams find their way, and about which I have given the merest hint, will be labeled a fantastic visionary by the prejudiced intellectualism of today. If anyone begins to speak of that still higher realm through which the human being ordinarily sleeps, then people, if they take any notice at all, will not stop at abusing that person as a visionary. They altogether lose their heads. We have already had an example of this. When my books were first published in Germany, the critics who were supposed to represent the intellectual culture of today attacked them with all sorts of insinuations. In one point, however, their criticism ran absolutely wild. In fact, they became foolish in their fury to the point where I had to call attention to something that could only originate in the spiritual realm we are now considering. This was the question of the two Jesus children mentioned in my book titled The Spiritual Guidance of the Individual and Humanity. For those of our friends who have not heard of this, I may say once more, that it appeared as a result of esoteric research, namely that at the beginning of our era not one but two Jesus' children were born. One was descended from the so-called Nathan line of the house of David, the other from the Solomon line. These two children grew up side by side. In the body of the Solomon child lived the soul of Zarathustra. In the twelfth year of the child's life this soul passed over into the other Jesus' child, and lived in that body until its thirtieth year. 
Here we have a matter of the deepest significance. Zarathustra's soul went on living in the body that until its twelfth year had been occupied by a mysterious soul. And then only from the thirtieth year onward there lived in this body the being whom we call the Christ, who remained on earth altogether for three years. We really cannot take amiss the critics' reaction to this statement. It is natural that they should want to have something to say about the matter from their scholarly viewpoint. But what they set out to criticize comes from a realm in which they are always fast asleep. So we cannot expect them to know anything about it. Yet a healthy human understanding is able to grasp this fact. When people do not give themselves a chance to understand, in their haste they change their powers of understanding into bitterness and fury. Such truths as these about the two Jesus children, which are to be found in this higher realm, never have anything to do with sympathy and antipathy. We find such truths. We never experience them in the way we gain experience in the usual manner of knowledge in the physical world or even in the realm of dream life. In both these areas we are there, so to speak. We are present at the origin of our knowing or perception. This is true also of those esotericists who are conscious only as far as the realm of dreams. We can say that a person witnesses the birth of his or her knowledge, of his or her perceptions in that realm. But truths like this concerning the two Jesus children can never be found in this way. When truths come to us in that higher realm and enter our consciousness, The moment in which we actually acquired them has long since passed. We experienced them long before we met them with our full consciousness, as we have to do in our time. We have them already in us, so that when we reach these truths, the most important, the most living and essential of all truths, we distinctly have the feeling that when we gained them we were in an earlier time than the present, that we are now drawing out of the depths of our soul what we acquired in an earlier time and are bringing it into our consciousness. Such truths we discover in ourselves, just as in the outer world we come across a flower or any other object. Even as in the outer world we can think about an object that is simply there before us, so can we think about these truths in this way when we have discovered them in ourselves, in our own self. In the outer world, we can only judge an object after we have perceived it. In the same way, we find those sublime truths objectively in ourselves. And only then do we study them in ourselves. We inwardly investigate them as we would investigate the external facts of nature. Just as it would have no meaning to ask of a flower whether it is true or false, There would be no sense in asking of these truths that we simply come upon in ourselves whether they are true or false. Truth and falsehood only come into the picture when it is a question of our power to describe what we find or what arises in our consciousness. Descriptions can be true or false. Truth and falsehood do not concern the facts. They concern the manner in which any thinking being approaches or deals with those facts. When we do research and get results in this realm, we are really looking into a region of the soul we have lived in before, but did not look there consciously. In carrying on our esoteric exercises, we are best able to enter this realm if we pay positive attention to those moments when from the depths of our soul arise not mere judgments but facts, facts that we know we did not consciously take part in originating. The more we are able to wonder at the things there unveiled, as with the objective things of the outer world, the more astonishing it all is for us, and the better we are prepared to enter into this realm. So as a general rule we do not make a good entrance if we have all sorts of conjectures and constructions in our minds. For example, there is no better way of finding nothing at all about the previous incarnations of some person than to speculate as to who they might have been earlier. Let us say you wanted to investigate the earlier incarnations of Robespierre. 
the best way of finding out nothing at all about him would be to search about for historical personalities you think might possibly have been his previous incarnations. In that way you never can discover the truth. You must get out of the habit of making conjectures and theories and forming opinions. Those who would become true esotericists should set themselves to making as few judgments as possible about the world. In that way they will most quickly attain the condition in which the facts can meet them. The more you cultivate silence in your conjectures and opinions, the more your soul will be filled with the actual truths of the spiritual world. Someone, for example, who had grown up with a particular religious bias, with definite feelings and ideas or perhaps views about the Christ, such a person in general would not be the most adapted to discover a truth like the history of the two Jesus children. Only when one feels a little bit neutral about the Christ event is one well prepared for such a discovery, provided, of course, one has made all the other necessary preparations. People with a Buddhist bias will least be able to talk sense about Buddha, just as those with a Christian bias will least be able to talk sense about Christ. This is always true. If we would enter the third realm just described, it is necessary that we go through all the bitterness, for in ordinary life we cannot help feeling this way, of becoming, so to say, a twofold person. We are, in fact, twofold beings in ordinary life, even if we make no conscious use of half of our existence, for we are both waking and sleeping beings. Different as these two conditions are, so is that third realm in the higher worlds different from this physical world. That realm has a peculiar existence of its own. There also we are surrounded by a world, but one so altogether new and different that we get to know it best if we extinguish not only the sense impressions of this world of ours, but even our feelings and sentiments, and all the things that have the power to arouse our passions and enthusiasms. In ordinary life one is so little fitted for conscious experience of that higher world that one's consciousness is extinguished every night. One can only attain experience there if one can become a twofold person. Those who have the power, at will, to forget and to blot out all their interests in this physical world are then able to enter that higher realm. The world between, that is to say where our dreams are woven, is made of the materials of both worlds. It is penetrated by reflections of the higher worlds of which we are generally not aware and by reminiscences of ordinary consciousness. That is why no one can perceive the true causes of events in the physical world who is not able to penetrate with understanding into that third realm. Now if people today wish to discover through their own experience who Krishna is, they can only make that discovery in the third realm. Arjuna's impressions, which in the sublime Gita are described to us through the words of Krishna, have their origin in that world. For this reason I have had to prepare the way today by speaking of humanity's ascent into the third realm. Only through this knowledge will you be able to understand the origin of the strange and wondrous truths that Krishna speaks to Arjuna, truths that sound so altogether different from anything that is spoken in ordinary life. These lectures are to help us gain knowledge of Krishna, that is to say, of the very essence of the Bhagavad Gita. Also the esoteric principles of this wonderful song are to give you something that if you really make use of it can enable you to find your way into the higher worlds because the way is open to every human being. We have only to realize that the grain of gold with which we must begin is ours once we become aware of the many ways in which the highest spiritual beings live and work and are interwoven in our everyday life. The end of Lecture 9 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of a, uh, a collected work of Rudolf Steiner called The Bhagavad Gita in the West, composed of two lecture cycles. This is the second lecture cycle, entitled The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita, Lecture 5. However, in this file, this would be Lecture 10. 
uh, in this whole collection. Uh, given in Helsinki on June 1st, 1913. If we wish to penetrate into the mysteries of human life, we must fix our attention on a great law of existence, what is called the cyclic law. As a rule, it is better to characterize and describe than to define. In this case also, I prefer not to use a definition of what is meant here by the cyclical course of life, for by comparison with actual reality, definitions must always appear insubstantial. A Greek philosophical school wishing to gain insight into the nature of definitions once set out to give a definition of the human being. As you know, definitions are intended to provide concepts corresponding to experienced phenomena, but those who have logical insight cannot help feeling the poverty and unfruitfulness of this process. The members of the Greek school eventually agreed to define the human being as a featherless biped. Footnote. In an effort to formulate an adequate definition of the human being, Plato dialogically defined man as a featherless biped animal. Subsequently, Diogenes, the cynic, presented a plucked chicken with the remark, Here is Plato's human being. Close quote. End of footnote. While this particular definition sounds rather like a silly epigram, it does represent human nature in certain respects. The next day, one of the members of this school brought in a plucked hen and said to the company, According to your definition, this is a human being. A silly way to show the unreality of attempts to define things. Being concerned with realities, we will proceed then to describe things and their essential characteristics. To begin, we will consider a cyclic familiar in everyday life that excuse me, I'll read that again. To begin, we will consider a cycle familiar in everyday life, that of our waking and sleeping. What does it really signify? We can only understand the nature of sleep if we realize that in the present epoch the sole activity of human waking life brings about a continual destruction of delicate structures in the nervous system. With our every thought and every impulse of will arising in us under the stimulus of the outside world, we are destroying delicate forms in our brain. In the near future it will be it will, more and more be, realized how sleep must supplement our waking day life. We are approaching the point where natural science will join with spiritual science in these matters. Natural science has already produced more than one theory to the effect that our waking life operates in a kind of destructive way in the nerves and brain. Owing to this fact, we have to allow the corresponding reverse process, the compensation to take place, during sleep. While we are asleep, forces of which we remain unconscious are at work in us that do not otherwise manifest themselves. They are busy reconstructing the finer nerve structures of our brain. Now it is this very destruction that enables us to have processes of thought and to acquire knowledge. Ordinary knowledge would not be possible if processes of disintegration did not take place in us during our waking hours. Two opposite processes are at work in our nervous system. While we are awake, a process of destruction, and during sleep, a repairing process. Since it is to the destructive process that we owe our consciousness, it is the, that process we perceive. Our waking life consists in perceiving disintegrating processes. When we sleep, we are not conscious because no destructive process is at work in us. The force that at other times creates our consciousness is used up in constructive work while we sleep. There you have a cycle. Let us now consider what happens during sleep. Because of this alternating cycle of build-up and break-down processes, we see why it is so dangerous to health to go without proper sleep. Certainly human life is so arranged that the danger is not immediately apparent, because what is present in us at any one time has been built up for a considerable time before. Abnormal processes cannot affect our nature as deeply as we might imagine. We could expect people who suffer from sleeplessness to go to pieces quickly 
but they do not. The reason for this is the same as that which holds for people both blind and deaf, like the famous Helen Keller, whose intellect could nevertheless be developed. In the present age, this should theoretically be possible, but what constitutes the greater part of our intelligence enters the brain through eyes and ears. The reason for Miss Keller's intellectual development is that through the portals of her sen- excuse me, is that though the portals of her senses are closed, she has inherited a brain that has the potential for development. If humans were not hereditary beings, a case like hers would be impossible. Which is to say, if humans did not have a much healthier brain through heredity than we generally give them credit for, sleeplessness would in a very short time completely undermine health. But most people have so much inherited strength that insomnia can persist for a long time without seriously injuring them. Nevertheless, the cycle of construction takes place with its resulting unconsciousness in sleep and destruction accompanying consciousness in waking life. In the totality of human life, we perceive not only these smaller cycles but larger ones as well. Here I will call your attention to a cycle I have often mentioned before. Anyone who follows the course of life in the Western world will observe a quite definite configuration of the spiritual life of humankind in the period from the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries to the last third of the 19th. In ordinary life these developments are observed vaguely and even inaccurately. But if we examine them in sufficient depth we shall see how, since the last third of the 19th century, there have been in all directions signs of an altogether different form of Western spiritual life. Of course, we are at the beginning of this new trend, so people do not notice it in its full significance. Just imagine someone trying to speak before an audience such as this, for instance in the 1840s or 50s, about the same things I am putting before you here. It is unthinkable, absurd, It would have been out of the question to speak of these things as we do now, at any rate from the 14th century to the last third of the 19th. This was the period when the natural scientific mode of thought, the way of thinking that produced the great materialistic achievements, reached its height. The stragglers of scientific intellectualism will go on adhering to it for some time to come, but the actual epoch of materialism is past. Just as the era of scientific thought began around the 15th century, so the era of spiritual thought is now beginning. These two sharply differentiated epochs meet in the very time in which we are living. It will become more and more evident that the new mode of thought must get in touch with the reality of things. Thought will become very different from the thought of the last four centuries, though the latter had to be so in its time. During this period, humanity's gaze had to be directed outward into the far spaces of the universe. I have often spoken of the great significance for Western spiritual evolution, of the moment when Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler and Giordano Bruno together burst open the blue vault of heaven. Until their time, it was believed that the blue cup of the heavens was suspended over our earth. These great thinkers declared that this hollow cup did not really exist. They taught humankind to look out into the infinite distances of cosmic space. Now, what was it that was so significant about Bruno's deed in explaining to humanity how the blue sphere they had set as the boundary of their power of sight was not really there? and that, quote, you have only to realize that it is you yourselves who project it out into space, close quote. It marked the beginning of an epoch that came to an end with the discovery that the spectroscope allowed one to investigate the material composition of the farthest heavenly bodies. A marvelous epoch, this epoch of materialism. Now we are at the starting point of another epoch, one that, though it has its origin in the same laws of growth as the preceding one, will be the epoch of spirituality. 
just as the epoch of natural science was prepared by Bruno's work in breaking through the limits of space, so will the firmament of time be broken through in the age now beginning. Humankind, imagining life to be enclosed between birth and death or conception and death, will learn that these are merely boundaries set set by the human soul itself. Just as in earlier times humans had set as the boundary of their senses a blue sphere above them, and then suddenly their vision expanded into the infinite spheres of space, so will the boundaries of time, of birth and death, be broken through set free of these, there will lie before our gaze in the infinite sea of time all the changes in the kernel of the human being as we follow it through its repeated incarnations. Thus a new age is beginning, the age of spiritual thought. Now if we can recognize the esoteric basis of these transitions from one age to another, where shall we see the cause of this change in human thought? It is not anything that philosophy or external physiology or anatomy can detect on its own. Yet forces have entered the active human soul and are being used today to gather spiritual knowledge. The same forces that have been working during the last four centuries as constructive energies in the human organism. These mysterious forces worked just as constructive forces work in the nervous system during sleep throughout the period from Copernicus to the last third of the 19th century. These forces were building up a definite structure in certain parts of the brain. The brains of Westerners are different from what they were five centuries ago. What is under our skulls today does not have the same appearance as it had then. Even though this cannot be proved externally, under the human forehead a delicate organ has developed, and the forces building it have now fulfilled their task. In the next cycle of history now approaching, it will become evident in more and more people. Now that it is there, the forces that built it are liberated, and Western humanity can use them to gain spiritual knowledge. Here we have the esoteric physiological foundation of the matter. Already we are beginning to work with the forces that humans could not use during the last 400 years because they were spent in building up the organ needed to allow spiritual knowledge to take its place in the world. Let us imagine a man of the 17th or 18th century. As he stands there before us, we know that certain esoteric forces are at work behind his forehead transforming his brain. These forces were perpetually at work in all the people of the West. Now, let us assume that this man had managed to suspend these forces for a moment, made them cease their work. The same thing would have happened to him as it did happen in certain cases, as takes place when in the middle of sleep one suspends the forces that ordinarily work at building up the nerve structures of the brain and lets them run loose. It is possible to experience moments when we seem to awaken in sleep and yet do not awaken, for for we remain motionless, we cannot move our limbs, we have no external perception, but we are awake. In the moments of free play of those regenerating forces, we can use them for clairvoyant vision, we can see into the spiritual worlds. A similar thing happened if a man two hundred years ago suspended the constructive activity of his brain. He allowed these forces to remain inactive for a moment and became briefly clairvoyant. What did he see? What did he perceive? He saw the forces working into the brain from the spiritual world, the forces that were preparing human beings from around the 15th century to the 19th century so that from the 20th century onward humans might rise to spiritual vision. There were always isolated individuals who had such experiences. Experiences of truly momentous force, indescribably impressive. There were always people who for brief moments lived in the supersensible forces working to bring forth in the sense world what did not exist in former cycles of evolution, the finer organ in the frontal cavity. Such individuals 
saw the gods. They saw spiritual beings at work in the whole building process of the human organism. In this we see clairvoyance described from a fresh aspect. We can bring about such moments during sleep by practicing the exercises I have given in my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds and thereby gain glimpses of spiritual life such as are described in my book titled A Way of Self-Knowledge. It is possible during a given cycle of evolution for the forces at work preparing the future to become free for a moment and become clairvoyantly visible. We may also call it by another name and designate as the forces of Gabriel these forces working at the subtle reconstruction of the human brain structure. We say Gabriel, but the point is to gain a brief insight into the supersensible where we perceive a spiritual being working from those worlds into the human organism. We perceive a sum of forces, in fact, directed by a being, Gabriel, of the hierarchy of the Archangeloi. From the 15th century to the last third of the 19th century, the Gabrielic force was at work on the human physical organism. And because of this, the power to understand the spiritual world was dormant for a while. It was this dormancy of spiritual understanding that brought forth the great triumphs of natural science. Now this force has reawakened. The spirit has done its work. We stand at the beginning of a spiritual age. The Gabrielic forces have been liberated. We can now use them, for they have become forces for the soul. Here we have a cycle of somewhat greater significance than that of waking and sleeping. There are, however, even mightier cycles in human evolution. We may note how self-consciousness, the pride of humankind in this era of our post-Atlantean age, was not always there but had to be developed gradually. Today the word evolution is often heard but people seldom take it in real earnest. Occasionally very curious experiences show how naive people can be in regard to the world surrounding them, for in their naivete people allow all kinds of things to emerge from the subconscious, but find it hard to resolve, to really attribute a supersensible origin to what enters their known world from the unknown. In the last few days I have again come across a curious instance of this logic that stops halfway. We can well understand why the anthroposophical outlook meets with so much resistance when we bear in mind that it takes a particular habit of thought to understand anthroposophy, namely the habit of any line of thinking. I have here a title, Free Thinker's Calendar, published in Germany. The first edition came out last year. In it, a perfectly sincere person attacks the custom of teaching children religious ideas. He points out that this is contrary to the child's nature, since he himself has observed that when children are allowed to grow up on their own, they develop no religious ideas. It is therefore unnatural to inculcate these ideas into children. Now we can be certain that this calendar will reach hundreds of people, who will henceforth imagine that they understand how senseless it is to teach children religion. There are many such arguments today, and people never notice their complete lack of logic. In reply, we need only ask, quote, If children for some reason have lived all their lives on an island alone and have not learned to speak, ought we, therefore, to refrain from teaching them to speak? Close quote. That would be the same kind of logic. Of course, people will not admit it is the same, since they found it so profound in the first instance. It is curious to observe on the broad horizon of external life today things that represent some after-effect of the passing materialist age. I have yet another example. Some remarkable essays recently published by Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States of America. There is one on the laws of human progress. He points out that people are influenced by the dominant thought of their age, so that, for example, in Newton's time, 
when everything was permeated with the idea of gravity, the effects of Newton's theories could be felt in social concepts, even in political terminology, though actually these theories are only applicable to the heavenly bodies. The idea of gravity was especially influential. All this is true. We need only read the literature of Newton's time to find everywhere words like attraction and repulsion. Wilson develops this point very ingeniously. He says how unsatisfactory it is to apply purely mechanical concepts as of celestial mechanism to human life and conditions. He shows how these ideas were completely embedded in human life at that time and how widely they influenced political and social affairs. He rightly denounces this application of purely mechanical laws in an age when Newtonism drew all thought under its yoke. Quote, we must think along different lines, says Wilson, and then he proceeds to construct his own concept of the state. Now the way he does it is that after all he has said about Newtonism, he himself allows Darwinism to speak through every page of his writing. In fact, he is naive enough to admit it. He says that Newtonian concepts were insufficient. We must apply the Darwinian laws of the organism. Here we have a living instance of the way people match, excuse me, march through the world today with half-baked logic, because in reality the laws derived purely from the living organism are also insufficient. We need laws of the soul and spirit. Thus we understand how objections are piled up against anthroposophical thought, for it requires an all-pervading thinking, a logic that penetrates to the core and does not stop halfway. This is just the virtue of the anthroposophical outlook. It forces its followers to think in an orderly manner. So we must think of evolution in the spiritual sense, not in Wilson's Darwinian sense. We must bear in mind that the self-consciousness that is the essential characteristic of today's humanity, this firm rooting in the ego, has only gradually developed. It too needed to be prepared, just as our spiritual thinking was being prepared in the last four centuries. Spiritual forces had to work down from the supersensible worlds in order to develop what later found expression in the self-conscious life of humans. <clears throat> in this connection we can speak of a break in evolution with a preceding and a succeeding epoch. We will call the latter the age of self-consciousness. Footnote, in many of his books and lectures, Steiner gives the dates of these ages, each approximately 2100 years, as follows. Sentient soul age, 3rd millennium to mid-8th century BCE, Intellectual Soul Age, mid-8th century to 1413, Consciousness Soul Age, 1413 to the mid-4th millennium. End of footnote. This period, fifth, uh, footnote the Consciousness Soul Age, end of footnote, is preceded in the cyclic interchange by one, that is the Intellectual Soul Age, in which the organ of self-consciousness was being built into the human being from the supersensible worlds. What now works as a soul force in self-consciousness was then working unrecognizably in the depths of human nature. The junction of these two great epochs is an important point in evolution. Before this time, most people had no self-consciousness at all. Even in the most advanced it was comparatively weak. People then did not think as they do today with the awareness, quote, I am thinking this thought, close quote. Their thoughts rose up like living dreams, nor did their impulses of will and feeling enter their consciousness as they do today. They lived more of an instinctive life in their souls. From the spiritual worlds, however, beings were working into the human organism, preparing it for a later time, when it would be capable of self-consciousness. Meanwhile, people had to live quite differently then, even as external experience is quite different from the 15th and 20th centuries CE, from what it will later 
what it will become later on. So we must say that until the period when self-consciousness entered the human soul, everything that could prepare the way for it had been flowing into human life. Now, let us imagine that toward the end of that ancient epoch, a mighty shock in one man's life suddenly cut off all that was binding him to the forces I just described, the forces of an earlier epoch, suspending their action for a moment. He would have experienced what we experience when in sleep we temporarily withdraw from the constructive forces and become clairvoyant. What an 18th century person would have experienced in suspending the forces then at work on his or her brain structure. If in that ancient time one withheld one's understanding and feeling for the sacrificial fires and reverence for the ancestors, one could for a moment use the forces normally used by understanding and gaze into the supersensible worlds. One could then see how human self-consciousness was being prepared from the spiritual world. This is what Arjuna did when, at the moment of battle, he experienced such a shock. The usually constructive forces stood still in him, and he could look upward to the divine being preparing the way for self-consciousness. This divinity was Krishna. In the region where self-consciousness first makes its appearance, people were strictly divided into castes. They respected this division. Those born in lower castes felt it as their highest endeavor to order their lives within their castes so that in later incarnations they might raise themselves to higher ones. It was a mighty driving force in the evolution of the human soul. People knew that by developing their soul forces they were making themselves fit to rise for their next life in a higher caste. So, too, they looked up to their ancestors, seeing in them something that is not bound to one particular body. People honored the ancestors because they had died, leaving behind the manes, the spiritual quality working after death from the higher spheres. Seeing in the cult of the ancestors something that is already present in us, unbound to the physical body, the self-conscious soul that goes through the gates of death into the spiritual world was good preparation for the great goal of human nature. For four hundred years, the best education in spirituality had been one that forced humans to think in natural scientific terms. Similarly, in ancient times, installation of the respect for caste was a wonderful preparation for the development of self-consciousness. Each person stood within a caste and developed a very special connection to the caste system. The pious reverence for ancestors and caste was an extraordinarily active force working deep into human life. Spiritual beings were at work preparing for a future when a person would be able to feel with every thought, I think, with every feeling, I feel, with every impulse of will, I will. Krishna, then, is that being who has worked through centuries, from the 7th and 8th centuries BCE onward, on the human organism, to make humans capable of gradually entering the epoch of self-consciousness. What kind of impression does he make, this master builder of the human ego nature? He must speak to Arjuna in words saturated through and through with self-consciousness. Thus, from another side, we understand Krishna as the divine architect of what prepared and brought about self-consciousness in humanity. The Bhagavad Gita tells us how, in particular circumstances, a man could come into the presence of this divine builder of his nature. There we have one aspect of Krishna's nature. In the succeeding lectures, we shall learn to know yet another aspect. The end of Lecture 10 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of the Bhagavad Gita in the West, uh, collected works of Rudolf Steiner. Uh, this is lecture 11 in this set. 
Uh, it is, however, in the second cycle embedded in this collected work. It is Lecture 6, given in Helsinki on June 2nd, 1913. It really is exceedingly difficult in our Western civilization to speak intelligently and intelligibly about such a work as the Bhagavad Gita. This is because the currently dominant tendency is to interpret any spiritual work of this kind as a kind of doctrine, an abstract teaching or a philosophy, which makes it hard for people to come to a sound judgment in such matters. They like to approach such spiritual creations from the ideal or conceptual point of view. Here we touch upon something that makes it most difficult in our time to gain a true judgment about the great historical impulses in human evolution. How often, for instance, do people point out that this or that saying occurring in the Gospels as the teaching of Christ can be found in some earlier work? no less profoundly expressed. Then they say, quote, You see, it is the same teaching, after all. Close quote. Certainly, that is not incorrect, because in countless instances it can be shown that the teachings of the Gospels occur in earlier spiritual works. Yet, while the statement is not incorrect, it may be nonsense from the standpoint of a truly fundamental knowledge of human evolution. People's thinking will have to get accustomed to this and realize that a statement can be perfectly correct and yet nonsense. Until we stop seeing this as a contradiction in terms, we will remain unable to judge certain matters in a truly unbiased way. For instance, one could call the Bhagavad Gita one of the greatest creations of the human spirit, a creation that has not been surpassed in later times. If one were to add that what entered the world with the revelation inherent in the Christ impulse is something altogether different, something to which the Bhagavad Gita could not attain even if its beauty and greatness were increased a hundred times, these two statements do not contradict each other. They may seem to do so according to the habits of modern abstract thinking. Yet in no sense is it truly a contradiction. Indeed, one might go further and ask, quote, When was that mightiest word spoken that may be regarded as giving the impulse to the human ego so that it may take its place in the evolution of humankind? Close quote. That significant word was uttered at the moment Krishna spoke to Arjuna, when he poured into Arjuna's ears the most powerful, incisive, burning words to quicken the consciousness of self in humanity. In the whole history of human life, we cannot find anything that kindled the human self more mightily than the living force of Krishna's words to Arjuna. Of course, we must not take those words in the way words are so often taken in Western countries, where the noblest words are given merely abstract philosophic interpretations. Any such interpretation would certainly miss the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. In this way, Western scholars today have outrageously misused and tortured the Bhagavad Gita. They have even gone so far as to dispute whether it is more representative of the Sankhya philosophy or of some other school of thought. In fact, a distinguished scholar in his edition of this poem has actually printed certain lines in small type, because in his view they ought to be expunged altogether, having crept in by mistake. He thinks nothing is really a part of the Gita except what accords with the Sankhya, or at the most with the Yoga philosophy. It may be said, though, that there is no trace in this great poem of what we understand by philosophy today. At most one could say that in ancient India certain basic dispositions of soul developed into certain philosophic tendencies. These really have nothing to do with the Bhagavad Gita, or at least not in the sense of being an interpretation or exposition of it. It is altogether unfair to the intellectual and spiritual life of the East to set it side by side with what the West knows as philosophy, 
because there was no philosophy in the East in the same sense that there is philosophy in the West. In this respect, the spirit of our age, just beginning, is as yet imperfectly understood. In the last lecture, we spoke of what humanity still has to learn. Above all, we must firmly realize how the human soul, under certain conditions, can meet the being whom we tried to describe from a certain aspect, calling him Krishna. Far more important than any dispute as to whether Sankhya or Vedic philosophy is contained in the Bhagavad Gita is the realization that under certain conditions Arjuna meets that spirit who prepared the age of self-consciousness. Footnote. Steiner seems here to be using the term, quote, age of self-consciousness, close quote, for what he more usually refers to as the intellectual soul age, 8th century BCE to 15th century CE. End of footnote. To understand it as a real description of world history, of history and of the color and temper of a particular age in which living individual beings are placed before us, is the important point. We have tried to describe their natures, speaking of Arjuna's thoughts and feelings as characteristic of that time, trying to throw light on the new age of self-consciousness and showing how a creative spiritual being preparing for a new age appeared before Arjuna. Now if we seek a living picture of spiritual beings and their relation to each other, we need to know this Krishna being more exactly. The following may therefore help us complete our picture of him. To penetrate into the region where we can perceive such a mighty being as Krishna, one must have progressed far enough to be able to have real perceptions and real experiences in the spiritual world. That may seem obvious. Yet when we consider what people generally expect of the higher worlds, the matter is by no means self-evident. I have often indicated that innumerable misunderstandings arise from the fact that people wish to lift their lives into the supersensible world while carrying a mass of prejudices with them. They desire to be led along the path into the supersensible toward something already familiar to them in the sense world. In that higher realm a person perceives forms, for instance, not of dense matter perhaps, but forms that appear as forms of light. One finds that people expect to hear sounds like the sounds of the physical world. They do not realize that by expecting such things, by entering the higher world with such preconceived ideas, they want a spiritual world just like the sense world, though in a refined form. In the here and now, we are accustomed to color and brightness, so we imagine we will only reach the higher realities if the beings there appear to us in the same way. It ought not to be necessary to say all this, since the supersensible beings are far above all attributes of the senses, and in their true form do not appear at all with sensory qualities, because this would presuppose eyes and ears, that is, sense organs. In the higher worlds, we do not perceive by means of sense organs, but by soul organs. What can happen in this connection, I can illustrate by a childish comparison. Suppose I am describing something to you verbally. Then I feel impelled to represent it with a few strokes on the blackboard, thereby materializing what I have expressed in words. No one would dream of taking the diagram for the reality. It is the same when we express what we have experienced supersensibly by giving it form and color and stamping it in words borrowed from the sense world. In doing so, we do not use our ordinary intellect, but a higher faculty of feeling that translates the supersensible into sense terms. In such a way, our souls live into invisible worlds, for instance, into that of the Krishna being. Then, they feel the need of representing to themselves that being. What they represent, however, is not the being himself, but a kind of sketch, a supersensible diagram. Such sketches, 
supersensible illustrations, so to speak, are imaginations. The misunderstanding that so often arises amounts to this, that we sensualize what the higher forces of the soul sketch out before us. By interpreting it sensually, we lose its real essence. The essence is not contained in these pictures, but through them it must be dimly felt at first, until by slow degrees we actually begin to see it. I have already mentioned in the second lecture the wonderful dramatic composition of the Bhagavad Gita. I tried to give an idea of the form of the first four discourses. This same dramatic impulse increases from one discourse to the next as we penetrate on and on into the realms of esoteric vision. A sound idea of the artistic composition of this poem may be suggested by looking to see if there is not a central point, a climax to this increase of force and feeling. There are eighteen discourses, therefore we might look for the climax in the ninth. In fact, in the ninth chapter, in the very middle, we read these striking words, quote, Because of your faith I will tell you the most profound of secrets. Close quote. Here, indeed, is a strange saying that seems to sound abstract, yet has deep significance. Then there follows this most profound mystery. Quote, All creatures find their existence in me, but I am not limited by them. Close quote. How often people ask today, quote, What is the judgment of true mystic wisdom about this or that? Close quote. They want absolute truths, but actually there are no such truths. There are only truths that hold good in certain contexts. In definite circumstances and under definite conditions, they are true. The statement, quote, I am in all beings, yet they are not in me, close quote, cannot be taken as an abstractly, absolutely true statement. Yet this was spoken out of the deepest wisdom of Krishna at the time when he stood before Arjuna, and its truth is real and immediate referring to him who is the creator of our inmost being, of our consciousness of self. Through this wonderful approach we are carried on to the central point of the Gita, to the ninth discourse, where these words are poured out to Arjuna. Then in the eleventh discourse another element enters. What may we expect here? realizing the artistic form of the poem and the deep esoteric truths contained in it. When we take up the ninth and tenth discourses, the very middle of the poem, we notice a remarkable thing, a peculiar difficulty in imagining and bringing to life in our souls the ideas presented to us in this part of the song. As you begin the first discourse, your soul is borne along by the continually increasing currents of feeling and idea. First, immortality is the subject. Then you are uplifted and inspired by the concepts awakened through yoga. All the while your feeling is being borne along by something in which we might say it can feel at home. We go on and the poem proceeds in a wonderful way to the concept of the one who inspired the age of self-consciousness. Our enthusiasm is kindled as we approach this being. All this time we are living in definite, familiar feelings. Then comes a still greater climax. We are told how the soul can become ever freer of the outer bodily life. We are led on to the idea, so familiar to Indian culture, that the soul can withdraw into itself, realizing inaction in the midst of actions experienced by the body. The soul can become a complete whole, independent of the outer world, as it gradually attains yoga and becomes one with Brahma. In the succeeding discourses, we see how our certainty of feeling, the feeling that can still gain nourishment from daily life, gradually vanishes. Then, as we approach the ninth discourse, our soul seems to rise to inspired heights of unknown experience. If, now, in the ninth and tenth discourses, we try to make the ideas borrowed from ordinary life suffice, we fail. As we reach this part of the song, we feel as if we are standing on a summit of human attainment, born directly out of the esoteric depths of life. 
If we are to understand it, it must bring, we must bring to it something that our developing soul must first attain by its own effort. It is remarkable how fine and unerring the composition of the Bhagavad Gita is in this respect. We can get as far as the fifth, sixth or seventh discourse by developing the concepts given us at the very beginning, in the first discourse. In the second, our soul is awakened to realize the presence of the eternal in the ever-changing flow of appearance. Then follows all that passes into the depths of yoga from the third song onward. After this, an altogether new mood begins to appear. Whereas the first discourses still have an intellectual quality, reminding us at times of the Western philosophic mode of thinking, something enters now with that requires yoga, the devotional mood for its understanding. As we continue purifying more and more this mood of devotion, our soul rises higher in reverence. The yoga of the first discourses no longer carries us. It ceases. And an altogether new mood of soul bears us up into the ninth and tenth discourses because the words here spoken are no more than a dry, empty sound echoing in our ear if we approach them intellectually. But they radiate warmth to us if we approach them devotionally. One who would understand this sublime poem may start with intellectual understanding and so follow the opening discourses. But as the song proceeds toward the ninth, a deep devotional mood must be awakened. Then the words of the mighty Krishna will be like wonderful music echoing and re-echoing in the soul. Whoever reaches this ninth song may feel this devotional mood as if taking off one's shoes before treading on holy ground where one feels one must walk with reverence. Then follows the eleventh discourse. What can come next, now that we have reached the climax of this devotional mood? When one has risen to the summit where Krishna has led Arjuna, a height that cannot be attained except in esoteric vision or in reverent devotion, it can only be the holy and formless, the supersensible that appears before one. Then the supersensible can be poured out into imagination. Following this, the uplifted and strengthened soul force that belongs not to the realm of the intellect, but to imaginative perception, can cast into living pictures what in its essential being is without form or likeness. This is what happens at the beginning of the second half of the sublime song, that is to say around the eleventh discourse. Here, after due preparation, the Krishna being to whom Arjuna has been led step by step is conjured up before his soul in imagination. This is where the majestic description in the Indian poem appears in its fullness, where Krishna finally appears in a picture, an imagination. We may truly say that experiences such as this, which only the innermost power of the human soul can undergo, have almost nowhere else been described in such a wonderful way, so filled with meaning. For those who are able to realize it, the imagination of Krishna as Arjuna now describes it will always be of most profound significance. Up to the tenth discourse we are led by Krishna as by an inspiring being. Now the radiant bliss of Arjuna's opened vision comes before us. Arjuna becomes the narrator and describes his imagination in words so wonderful that one fears to reproduce them. Quote, O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere without beginning, middle or end. You are the Lord of all creation, and the cosmos is your body. You wear a crown and carry a mace and discuss and discus. Your radiance is blinding and immeasurable. 
I see you, who are so difficult to behold, shining like a fiery sun blazing in every direction. You are the supreme changeless reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warms the cosmos. O Lord, your presence fills the heavens and the earth and reaches in every direction. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision of your wonderful and terrible form. The gods enter your being, cut some calling out and greeting you in fear. Great saints sing your glory, praying, May all be well. The multitudes of gods, demigods, and demons are all overwhelmed by the sight of you. O oh, mighty Lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths, arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. O oh, Vishnu, I can see your eyes shining with open mouth. You glitter in an array of colors, and your body touches the sky. I look at you and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning like the fires at the end of time, I forget where I am and have no place to go. O oh Lord, you are the support of the universe. Have mercy on me. Discourse, uh, Discourse 11, verses 15 through 25, close quote. Such is the imagination that Arjuna beholds when his soul has been raised to that height where an imagination of Krishna is possible. Then we hear what Krishna is echoing across to Arjuna once more as a mighty inspiration. In reality, it is as if it were not merely sounding for the spiritual ear of Arjuna, but echoing down through all the ages that followed. At this point we begin dimly to perceive what it means when a new impulse is given for a new epoch in the world's history. And when the author of this impulse appears to the clairvoyant gaze of Arjuna, we feel with Arjuna. We remind ourselves that he is in the midst of the turmoil of battle where brother blood is pitted against its kin. We know that what Krishna has to give depends above all upon the end of the old clairvoyant epoch, together with all that was holy in it and the beginning of a new epoch. When we reflect on the impulse of this new epoch that was to begin with fratricide, when we re rightly understand the impulse that forts, forced its way in through all the swaying concepts and institutions of the preceding epoch, then we get a correct concept of what Krishna Let's Arjuna hear. Close quote, uh, quote, I am time, the destroyer of all. I have come to consume the world. Even without your participation, all the warriors gathered here will die. Therefore, arise, Arjuna. Conquer your enemies and enjoy the glory of sovereignty. I have already slain all these warriors. You will only be my instrument. Bhishma, Drona, Jehadratha, Karna, many others are already slain. Kill those whom I have killed. Do not hesitate. Fight in this battle and you will conquer your enemies. From Discourse 11, 32 through 34, close quote. It was not in order to bring to human ears the voice that spoke of slaying that these words were uttered but to make them hear the voice that tells of the center in the human being that has to develop in the age to come. Into this center there were focused the highest impulses realizable by humanity at that time, and that there is nothing in human evolution with which the human ego is not connected. Here we find in the Bhagavad Gita something that lifts us up and sets us on the horizon of the whole of human evolution. When we think of the evolution of humanity over all the earth and trace it as we are able to do by means of what is given, for example, in our esoteric science, 
When in this sense we see the earth as the place where humanity has first been brought to the ego through many different stages, following one another and developing from age to age. When we thus follow the course of evolution through the epochs of time, then we may say to ourselves that having been planted here on earth, the highest these souls can attain is to become free souls. Free, that is what we will become if we bring to full development all the forces latent within us as individual souls. In order to make this possible, Krishna was active indirectly and almost imperceptibly at first, then ever more definitely, and at last quite directly in the period we have been describing. In all of earthly evolution there is no being who could give the individual human soul so much as Krishna. If we let the changing moods of this great poem work upon us, we shall gain much more than those who try to read into it pedantic doctrines of Sankhya or Yoga philosophies. If we can only dimly feel the dazzling heights that can be reached through Yoga, we shall begin to lay hold of the meaning and spirit of such a mighty imagination as that of Arjuna's presented to us here. Even as an image, it is so sublime and forceful that we are able to form some conception of the creative spirit which in Krishna is grafted onto the world. The highest impulse that can speak to the individual speaks through Krishna to Arjuna. The highest to which one can lift oneself by raising to their full pitch all the powers that reside within one's being, that is Krishna the highest to which one can soar by training oneself and working on oneself with wisdom, that is Krishna. I say expressly, the individual soul, because, and I say this deliberately, on earth there exists not only the individual human soul, but also humankind. Consider this in connection with all I have tried to give about Krishna, because on earth there are all those concerns that do not belong to the individual alone. Imagine a person feeling the inner impulse to perfect him or herself as far as a human soul can. Then imagine each person separately going on to develop indefinitely. And then there is humankind. For this earthly planet there are matters that bring humankind into connection with the whole universe. With the Krishna impulse coming into each individual soul, let us assume that every soul would have developed in itself a higher impulse, not immediately, nor even up to the present time, but sometime in the future. So that from the age of self-consciousness onward, the stream of humankind's collective evolution would have been split apart. Individual souls would have progressed and unfolded to the highest point, but separately, dispersed, broken apart from each other. Their paths would have diverged further and further as the Krishna impulse worked in each one. Human existence would have been uplifted in the sense that souls individualized themselves and so lifted themselves out of the common current, developing their self-life to the utmost. In this way the ancient time would have shone into the future like many, many rays from a single star. Every one of these rays would have proclaimed the glory of Krishna far into future cosmic eras. This is the path on which humankind was traveling in the 6th or 8th centuries before the foundation of Christianity. Then from the opposite side something else came in. The Krishna impulse comes into the human soul when from the depths of its own inner being the soul works, creates, and draws forth its powers more and more until it may rise to those realms where it may reach Krishna. But something came toward humanity from outside, which humans could never have reached through the forces that lived within themselves, something bending down to each individual. The souls that were separating and isolating themselves encountered the same being who came down out of the cosmic universe into the age of self-consciousness from outside. It 
came in such a way that it belonged to the whole of humanity, to all the earth. This other impulse came from the opposite side. It was the Christ. Though put rather abstractly for the present, we see how a continually increasing individualization was prepared and brought about in humankind, and how then those souls that had the impulse to individualize themselves more and more were met by the Christ impulse, leading them once more together into a common humanity. What I have tried to indicate has been a rather preliminary description of the two impulses from the Christ and Krishna. I have tried to show how closely the two impulses come together in the age of the midpoint of evolution, even though they come from diametrically opposite directions. We can make very great mistakes by confusing these two revelations. What I have developed today in a rather general way we will make more concrete in the succeeding lectures. But I would close today with a few words that may simply and clearly summarize what these two impulses are, truly the most important in human evolution. If we look back to all that happened between the 10th century before Christ and the 10th century afterward, we may say that into the universe the Krishna impulse flowed for every individual human soul, and into the earth the Christ impulse came for all humankind. Observe that for those who think specifically, quote, all of humankind, close quote, by no means signifies the same as the mere sum total of all individual human souls. The end of Lecture 11. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected works by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita in the West, which consists of two cycles. I'm in the second cycle. This is going to be lecture 12 in the total work. However, in the second cycle, it is lecture 7, given in Helsinki, June 3rd, 1913. It is a fact of nature, though usually ignored by science, that the makeup of human beings makes it impossible for us to know one particular part of our being. As we look upon the world, it roughly shows itself as an ascending scale from the mineral kingdom through the plant and animal kingdoms up to man. It goes without saying that we must assume some creative force behind all the forms we perceive around us in the kingdoms of nature. The point is, however, that as human beings we can gain knowledge of the world we live in just because the mineral plant and animal kingdoms are outside of us and we can observe them. As to all that is within ourselves, we can only know in so far as the same forces are at work in us as are active in the three kingdoms of nature outside us. The forces active within us that transcend those three kingdoms we cannot know using habitual methods for knowing nature, not in the least. Yet it is just what humans have over and above the kingdoms of nature that enables them to systematically build up knowledge of those kingdoms. Just as little as the I, Y-E, whose purpose it is to see outwardly can see itself, just so little can humans know what there is in themselves by which they may acquire knowledge. This is a very simple idea, but sound. It is impossible for the I to see itself, because its function is to look out, and it is impossible for those forces in us that help us acquire outer knowledge to acquire self-knowledge. Further, these very forces represent what it is in the human being that makes it something more than an animal. Materialistic Darwinism easily disposes of this fact by simply leaving out the fact that this special human power to know itself cannot be known by our usual cognitive instruments. Recognizing that this power is unknowable, science denies its existence and accordingly considers humans only in so far as they are still animal. You can see on what peculiar fallacy the illusion of materialistic Darwinism rests. Humans cannot know in themselves those forces that are the actual means of knowledge. 
but the eye can see another eye, and for this reason, other things being equal, it can believe in itself. With cognition, this is not the case. It would be logically possible for a human being to face another human being and perceive the cognitive faculty that raises human beings above animals. But even that is actually impossible, for the very reasons implied in what we have said previously about the effects of thinking. What does ordinary cognition involve in the outer world? We saw already that it involves a perpetual destruction, a wearing down of the nerve structures in the brain. In other words, if we were to look in, li- if we were to look in life on the physical plane for the facts of cognition, one would find a destructive process in the nervous system. One would not find any creative, constructive process. But the creative forces without which human beings don't even begin to rise above animals cannot unfold in the waking state in ordinary life, which is normally associated with cognition. So these forces must come into effect in such a way as not to interfere with the destruction of the nervous structure. This means that they rest, they are dormant during our waking time. Consider the important implications of this recognition. The forces one would need in order to recognize the nonsense of materialistic Darwinism are actually asleep from the time we awake to the time we go to sleep. And instead, during that time we have a destructive process, whereas the creative forces raising humans above animals are resting. The creative forces that form the animal organism are much less perfect than those working on the human organism. During the waking hours these constructive processes are not active at all, but instead another process continuously destroys precisely that which raises humans above the animal. These creative forces are paralyzed in waking life. They are just not there. So, during the waking hours, the forces that raise humans above animality are asleep. They come into action when we sleep. Everything that was destroyed is restored and completed. Thus it is only in a sleeping person that we can find these creative forces raising humans above animality. We are forced to say, that which restores during human sleep The forces that were eroded in the waking hours, these forces must be the ones that raise humans above animality. True, natural science doesn't know these forces. There is only beginning to be an intuition about them. But science is on its way to revealing these forces with entirely external means. They could only be truly observed if one were to observe the reorganization process that takes place during sleep. Once science learns to distinguish those forces in the human being that go beyond the realm of animality, then it will physically observe, precisely in the sleeping body, the transcendence of animality by human beings. Because one will recognize that the same forces that work creatively during sleep work destructively during waking life. Once science learns to distinguish the human forces of regeneration from what is present in animal bodies, it will recognize that the creative forces active in human life are only awake when the human being sleeps. This means that in true self-knowledge, human creative forces, the truly human forces, can only be perceived when human beings become clairvoyant during sleep, that is, in a person that awakens clairvoyantly in a state resembling sleep. We already mentioned this in the fifth lecture. I said today that to some extent, from the processes observable in a person during sleep, science will in time find indications of the forces whereby the human being transcends the animal, but they will only be indications. When these forces appear to clairvoyant consciousness today, they are seen to be of such a nature 
that they cannot be revealed to the senses in their true form. It will be possible to deduce their existence from certain scientific facts. Apart from their not being perceptible in their essence, there is quite another reason why it will become possible to discover them, although not to perceive them. These human creative forces have a very special relation to all the other forces of nature. We are here approaching a very difficult subject, but I may possibly clarify it in the following way. Let us imagine we have here the receptacle of an air pump, say a bell jar, and suppose we succeed in making a perfect vacuum in it, inside it. Everyone whose intellect is bound to the world of senses will now say, quote, There is no air inside, only an empty space. We cannot go any farther. There cannot be less than no air inside. Close quote. Actually, that is not true. We can pump until no air at all is left, then go on pumping, until we get a space still emptier of air than a vacuum. People dependent on the material world will find it difficult to imagine this close, quote, less than nothing, close quote. It is a bit easier to imagine this in regard to our sensations. Just imagine we are in a forest where many, many birds are singing. We stand in the midst of the bird song. Let us assume we walk farther and farther away. We go out of the woods. We hear the bird song less and less, until the point where we cannot hear it any more. But let us go farther, and the sense of being surrounded in our hearing will fade also. We come to silence. And when we go farther, we come to something that is less than the bird song, less than the silence, less than the complete peace. As you can see, this second thought, this second image, is much easier to follow than the first. We find it easy to imagine a boundary past which we no longer hear anything, and we can also imagine that we can go farther and hear less than nothing. It is sometimes remarkable how things can be accepted as self-evidences, axioms. Thus we can read in many Western philosophical treatises there is no such thing as less than nothing. It just can't be. Actually, some people even claim that nothing itself cannot truly exist. Let me turn, however, to a really trivial example. In real life, people have no trouble knowing that in some areas there is indeed such a thing as nothing, and even less than nothing. Suppose you have ten dollars in your pocket. You can gradually spend them until you have nothing left. In this domain of life there is a real, quote, less than nothing, close quote, it is often one of the strongest realities. You can go into debt for a few dollars. Everybody is presumably much happier having two, three, four, five dollars in their pocket than if they owe two, three, four, five dollars. In practical life, less than nothing is often more intensely real than the reality of possession. Yet, Less than nothing exists in the universe as well as in the above illustration. All philosophical dicta about nothing, however pretentious their form, are really rubbish. They are themselves a kind of ill-defined nothingness. It is true that the physical something that surrounds us can be reduced to nothing, and then, still further, to less than nothing. We must imagine the world that surrounds us, which we know in the forces of nature throughout the mineral plant and animal kingdoms, reduced to nothing, then below nothing. It is then that those forces arise that are creatively active in the sleeping human being. Natural science knows only the external side of these forces. In fact, it holds fast to a mere abstraction about them, and therefore cannot penetrate or appreciate them because ordinary science is to the reality in the forces of nature as the abstract number 10, for example, is to 10 beans or 10 apples. If we eliminate quality and say that all of these are, in quotes, 10 and nothing else, we are doing what natural science does, making no distinctions, touching only the surface of things. If we form the idea that regenerative forces must build up the organism again in sleep, then science will treat these forces in the same way as a man 
who when someone meets him, saying, quote, I have fifteen dollars in my pocket, close quote, replies, quote, Never mind the dollar part, you have fifteen, close quote. The speaker leaves out of account the very thing that matters. <laughs> I mention all this to show how difficult it is and must be for external science to know the truth. It will draw certain conclusions and thus come near the truth. For some persons this will not be necessary because science will gradually be supplemented by clairvoyant perception that experiences the difference between these forces and those active in the three kingdoms of nature. At present I cannot deal fully with the superficial objection that animals also sleep. Such objections have little logical value, but people do not notice this, for they judge according to abstract concepts instead of the real nature of things. Introducing animal sleep into the argument would be the same error as if someone were to say, quote, I sharpen my pencil with a knife and I also shave with a knife, close quote, and another person reply, quote, that is impossible, knives are there to cut meat, close quote. People are always making that kind of judgment. They think that a given thing must have the same function in different realms of nature. Sleep is an altogether different function in humans from what it is in animals. I wanted to call your attention to forces at work in human nature that we find at first in the regeneration of the sleeping organism. Now, these forces are closely related to other forces that also develop in humans with a certain unconsciousness, the forces having to do with reproduction. We know that up to a certain age human consciousness is filled with a pure and straightforward unconsciousness of these forces, the innocence of childhood. Then at a certain age this consciousness awakens. From that time onward the human organism, organism is permeated by an awareness of the forces henceforth known as sexual love. What lives as a sleeping force in earlier life and only awakens at puberty, seen in its original and essential form, is the very same as the forces that in sleep regenerate the outworn forces in the human being. It, however, is hidden by the other parts of human nature in which it is mingled. These invisible forces at work in the human being become capable of either good or evil only when they are only when they awaken, but they sleep or at most dream until the time of puberty. Since the forces that manifest themselves later must first be prepared, they are intermingled, though not yet awake, with the remaining forces in the organism from birth onward. During this time human nature is permeated by these sleeping forces. This is what meets us in the child as such a wonderful mystery. It is the sleeping generative forces that only awaken later on. Those who are sensitive to these things feel something like a gentle divine breath when they find behind the naughtiness, obstinacy and other more or less unpleasant characteristics a child may have the same forces that awaken later at puberty but are held back in childhood. The child's innocent qualities are those of the grown-up person but in childlike form. One who recognizes them as generative forces feels the breath of divine powers. While, in later life, they appear in a person's lower nature, they are so wonderful because they really breathe the pure breath of God so long as they work in unconscious innocence. We must feel these things and be sensitive to them, and then we shall perceive how wonderfully human nature is composed, the generative forces sleeping during the tender age of childhood awaken around the time of puberty and from then on are still innocently active when at night we sink back into sleep. Thus human nature falls into two parts. In every human being two persons confront us, the one that we are from the time we awaken until we go to sleep, the other from going to sleep to waking again. In our waking state we are continually at pains to wear and worry our nature down to the animal level with all that is not pure knowledge, pure spiritual activity. What raises us above humanity holds sway like a pure sublime force within the generative powers as they were 
during innocent childhood, and then in sleep it is awakened in the regeneration of what was worn away in the daytime. So we have in ourselves one person who is related to the creative forces in humanity and another who destroys them. The deeply significant thing in the double nature of the human being is that behind all that the senses perceive we have to surmise another person in whom creative forces dwell. This second person is really never there in a pure unmixed form during waking life or even in sleep. Because in sleep the physical and etheric body still remain permeated by the after effects of waking life by the disturbing and destructive forces. When at last the latter have been removed altogether, we wake up again. So it has been since what we call the Lemurian Age, the beginning, strictly speaking, of present-day humankind's evolution. At that time, as I describe in greater detail in my title outline of Esoteric Science, the Luciferic influence in human nature set in. From this influence there came, among other things, what today compels humans continually to wear and tear themselves down to the animal nature. The other element in human nature, which humans as now constituted do not yet know about, the creative forces in them, came into play in the early Lemurian time before the Luciferic impulses entered. We rise in thought from human, in quotes, completion, to human, in quotes, becoming, from human created to human being recreated. In so doing, we have to look back to that distant Lemurian time when the human being was as yet wholly permeated by the creating forces. At that time, humans came into being as they are today and entered a kind of lower nature. If we follow the human race from that epoch onward, we have this double nature continually before us in all that has happened since. Humanity then entered a kind of lower nature. At the same time, as we can see clairvoyantly, by looking back into the Akashic record, there appeared, beside ordinary people who themselves were permeated by the human creative forces, something like a brother or sister soul, a definite soul. It was as though this sister soul was held back, not thrown into the current of human evolution. It remained permeated through and through by human creative forces only, and by nothing else. Thus a certain brother or sister soul, in that ancient time there was no difference, Adam's brother soul remained behind. It could not enter the physical process of human evolution. It lived on, invisible to the physical world. It was not born the way human beings are born in the flowing stream of this life, because if it had gone through birth and death, it would have been part of the physical human process. It could only be perceived by those who rose to the heights of clairvoyance, who developed those forces that awaken in the state we otherwise know as sleep. In that state, human beings are near the pure forces that live and work in the sister soul. The human being entered evolution, but holding sway above this life, there lived in sacrifice a soul that throughout all the processes of human life never came down in bodily form. It did not strive like ordinary human souls for birth and death in successive incarnations, and it could only show itself to them when in their sleep they attained clairvoyant vision. Yet it worked on humankind wherever they could meet it with special clairvoyant gifts. There were humans who either by nature or special training in schools of initiation had this power and were able to recognize the creative forces. Wherever such schools are mentioned in history, we can always find evidence that they were aware of a soul accompanying humankind. In most instances it was only recognizable in those special conditions of clairvoyance that expand human spiritual vision into sleep consciousness. When Arjuna stood on the battlefield with the Kurus and Pandavas, arrayed against each other, 
when he felt all that was going on around him and deeply realized the unique situation in which he was placed, it came about that this sister's soul spoke to him through the soul of his charioteer. The manifestation of this special soul, speaking through a human soul, is none other than Krishna. For what soul was it that could instill into humanity the impulse to consciousness of self? It was the soul that had remained behind in the old Lemurian age, when humans entered actual earthly evolution. This soul had often been visible in manifestations before, but in a far more spiritual form. At the moment of which the Bhagavad Gita tells us, we have to imagine a kind of embodiment of this soul of Krishna, though much concealed in Maya. Later on in history a definite incarnation takes place. This soul actually incarnated in the body of a child. Those of our friends to whom I have spoken of this before know that at the time when Christianity was founded, two children were born in different families, both from the house of David. The one child is mentioned in Matthew's Gospel, the other in Luke's. This is the true reason for the external discrepancies between the two Gospels. Now this Jesus child of Luke's Gospel is an incarnation of the soul that had never before lived in a human body, but is nevertheless a human soul, having been one in the ancient Lemurian age. This is the soul that is re- that revealed itself as Krishna. We touch here upon a wonderful mystery. We see how the human soul, as it was before humans descended into the course of earthly incarnations, enters the body of the Luke Jesus child. We understand that this soul could hold sway in the human body only until the twelfth year of its life. After that another soul must take possession, the Zarathustra soul that had gone through all the transformations of humankind. This wonderful mystery is enacted that the innermost essence and self of humanity which we have seen hailed as Krishna permeates the Jesus child of the Luke Gospel. In this child are the innermost forces of humanity, the Krishna forces, for indeed we know their origin. This Krishna root takes us back into the Lemurian time, the very primeval age of humankind. At that time it was one with humanity, before the physical evolution of humankind began. In later time this root, these Krishna forces, flowing together and uniting in the unknown and unseen, worked to bring about the unfolding of each human's inner being from within. Concretely embodied, this root is present within a single being, the Luke Jesus child. And as the child grows up, it remains active beneath the surface of life in this special body after the Zarathustra soul has entered it. Thus, All that the Krishna impulse signifies is incarnated in the body of Luke's Jesus child. What was embodied is related to the forces that are asleep in every child in their sublime purity and innocence until they awaken as the sexual forces. In this child they can manifest themselves and be active until the age of puberty when one ordinarily becomes sexually mature. But the body of this child that had been taken from common humanity would no longer have been adapted to the forces related to the innocent sexual forces in the child. Thus the soul in the other Jesus child, which was the soul of Zarathustra, that had passed through many incarnations and reached its eminence by hard work and special striving, passed over into the body of the Luke Jesus child and from then on dwelt in that body. In the thirtieth year, at the time the Bible describes as the baptism in the Jordan, there comes toward this special human body what now belongs to all humanity. This is the moment indicated in the words, quote, This is my well-beloved Son, this day have I begotten Him. Close quote. Footnote. Luke 3.22 and Matthew 3.17 Virtually all translations of this text read as follows, quote, Thou art my beloved Son, with Thee. I am well pleased. Close quote. End of footnote.
Christ now comes toward the physical body from the other side. In the body that stands before us here, we have in concrete form what yesterday we thought of abstractly. What belongs to all of humankind comes to the body that contains what, through another impulse, has brought the inner human being to the highest ideal of individual strength and will carry it to yet greater heights. When you consider all that has been said today, leading up as it does to a certain understanding of that great moment pictorially represented as the baptism by John, you will have to admit that our anthroposophical outlook takes nothing away from the sublime majesty of the Christ idea. On the contrary, by shedding the light of understanding upon it, much is added to all that can be given to humankind exoterically. Today I have endeavored to present the matter in such a way as to give it sense and meaning for those who can consider it with an open mind in the light of external human history. That is not the way, however, by which this secret was found. Someone might ask in view of the lectures about Luke's gospel I delivered years ago in Basel. When, for the first time, I drew attention to the different genealogies of the two Jesus children, quote, what, why did you not explain then all you have added to it now? Close quote. Footnote, Basel, September 15th to the 25th, 1909. See title, According to Luke, The Gospel of Compassion and Love Revealed. Introduction and notes by Robert McDermott, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, Steiner Books, 2001. And an aside from the reader, that is also on this website. End of footnote. That depends on the whole way these things were discovered. Actually, this truth has not yet been found in one single and complete whole by the human understanding. It was not discovered in the form in which I have tried to convey it today. The truth itself was there first, as I indicated in a lecture a few days ago, and the rest followed of its own accord, adding itself to the main body of this piece of knowledge about the two Jesus children. From this you may gather that in the anthroposophical movement for which I am permitted for which I am permitted to stand before you, there is nothing of the nature of intellectual or logical construction. I do not mean to lay this down as a general rule for everybody, but I do regard it as my own personal task to say nothing that is given by the intellect as such, but to take things in the way they are directly and immediately given to esoteric vision. Only afterward are they permeated with the power of understanding. The truth about the two Jesus children was not discovered by external historical research, but from the beginning it was an esoteric fact. Afterward the connection with the Krishna mystery was revealed. You see in this how the science of the human being will have to work into the esoteric realm in the age we are entering how the fundamental impulses of earthly evolution will gradually be understood and realized by individual persons, and how this will throw more and more light on all that has happened in the past. True science will not only speak to the intellect, but will fill the whole soul. It is when we make ourselves acquainted with esoteric facts that we have a feeling for the real majesty, the greatness and wonder of these facts. Truly, the more deeply we penetrate the world of reality, the more we have this feeling of wonder. Not only our intellect and reason, but our whole soul is illumined when we let truth come to us in this way. Especially at such a point as this, the wondrous event when the whole inwardness of humanity lived in a human body, when a soul that had developed upward to this point through the whole course of earthly life took possession of this body, into which there came, during three years of its life, something that was vouchsafed to all humankind from the great universe beyond. Truly, this can stir our souls to their depths. The spiritual age that is dawning will in time make it possible to deepen our understanding still more. One thing is essential to the coming spiritual age. We must learn to take a different attitude to the great riddles and secrets of the cosmos, to approach them not as in the past with reason and intellect alone, but with all the faculties of our soul. 
then we shall ourselves become partakers in the whole of human evolution. It will be for us like a fountain of sublime all-human consciousness. We shall have fullness of soul. We shall feel that we may belong to that humanity that over all the earth is to develop such impulses as have been the subject of our thoughts today. The end of Lecture 12, also Lecture 7 in the second part of this book. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected works by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita in the West, which uh, consists of two separate cycles put together. I'm on the second cycle. Uh, this is In this full s- file is called is numbered Lecture 13, but in the cycle inside the book it's Lecture 8, given in Helsinki, June 4th, 1913. If we want to approach such a creation as the sublime Bhagavad Gita with full understanding, it is necessary for us to attune our souls to it, so to speak, to shift into the manner of thought and feeling that really lies at the basis of such a work. This is especially true for people who by situation and circumstances are as far removed from this great poem as Westerners are. It is natural for us to make a contemporary work our own without much difficulty. It is also natural that those who belong to a certain nation should always have an immediate feeling for a work that has sprung directly out of the substance of that nation, even though it might belong to a previous age. The population of the West, however, is altogether remote in sentiment and feeling from the Bhagavad Gita. If we would approach it then with understanding, we must prepare ourselves for the very different mood of soul, the different spirit that pervades it. Appalling misunderstandings can arise when people imagine they can approach this poem without first working on their own souls. A creation coming over to us from India from the ninth or 10th century before the foundation of Christianity cannot be understood as directly by Westerners as, say, the Finnish Kalevala or the Greek's Homeric poems. If we would go into the matter further, we must once more bring together different materials that can show us the way to enter the spirit of this wonderful poem. Footnote. Steiner usually refers to the Gita as originating in the 6th century BCE. There is no historical evidence for its origin in the 9th or 10th centuries BCE but the historic and mythic sources of the Mahabharata in which the Bhagavad Gita originated probably do date to these centuries. End of footnote. Here I would like first and foremost to draw attention to something. The summits of spiritual life have always been concealed from the wide plane of human intelligence, in a certain sense right up to the present age. It is true that one of the characteristics of our age, which is only now dawning, and which we have somewhat described, will be that certain things hitherto kept secret, and really known to only a few, will be spread abroad into large circles. That is the reason why you are present here, because our movement is the beginning of this spreading abroad of facts that until now have remained secret from the masses. Perhaps one subconscious reason that brought you to the anthroposophical view of the world and into this spiritual movement came precisely from the feeling that certain secrets must today be poured out into all people. Until our time, however, these facts remain secret, not because they were deliberately kept so, but because it lay in the natural course of human development that they had to remain secret. It is said that the secrets of the old mysteries were protected from the profane by certain definite, strictly observed rules. Far more than by rule, these secrets were protected by a fundamental characteristic of humankind in olden times, namely, that people simply could not have understood these secrets. This fact was a much more powerful protection than any external rule could be. For certain facts, this has been especially the case during the materialistic age, What I am about to say is extreme heresy from the point of view of our time. 
For example, there is nothing better protected in the regions of Central Europe than Fichte's philosophy. Footnote, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, 1762-1814, whom Steiner discussed in his doctoral dissertation, 1892, published as titled Truth and Knowledge, an Introduction to Philosophy of Spiritual Activity. End of footnote. Not that it is kept secret, for his teachings are printed and are read, but they are not understood. They remain secret. In this way, much of what pertains to the general development of humanity will remain esoteric knowledge, even though it is published and revealed in broad daylight. Not only in this sense, but in a rather different one too, there is an important peculiarity of human evolution concerning the ideas we must have in order to understand the Bhagavad Gita. Everything we may call the mood, the mode of feeling, the mental habit of ancient India from which the Gita sprang, was also accessible in its full spirituality to the understanding of only a few. What one age has produced through the activity of a few remains secret in regard to its real depth, even afterward when it passes over and becomes the property of a whole people. Again, this is a peculiar trait in human evolution that is full of wisdom, though it may seem paradoxical at first. Even for the contemporaries of the Bhagavad Gita and for their followers, for the whole race to which this high point of spiritual achievement belongs, and for its posterity, its teaching remained a secret. The people who came later did not know the real depth of this spiritual current. It is true that in the following centuries there grew up a certain religious belief in its teachings, combined with great fervor of feeling, but with this there was no deepening of perception. Neither the contemporaries nor those who followed developed a truly penetrating understanding of this poem. In the intervening time, only a few have really understood it. Thus it comes about that in the judgment of posterity, what was once present as a strong and special spiritual movement is greatly distorted and falsified. As a rule, we cannot find the way to approach an understanding of a given reality by studying the judgments of the descendants of the race that produced it. So, we will find no real understanding for the spiritual tendency that in the deepest sense permeates the Bhagavad Gita in the sentiments and feelings of the people of India today. Footnote, Sri Aurobindo began to write his essays on the Gita one year after this lecture. Close quote or excuse me, end of footnote. We will find enthusiasm, strong feeling and fervent belief in abundance, but not a deep perception of the poem's meaning. This is especially true of the age just past, from the 14th and 15th to the 19th century. As a matter of fact, it is especially true for the people who profess that religion. There is one anecdote that, like many others, reveals a deep truth, how a great European thinker said on his deathbed, quote, Only one person understood me, and he misunderstood me. Close quote. It can also be said of this age that has just run its course that it contains some spiritual substance that represents a great height of achievement, but has widely remained unknown as to its real nature, even to its contemporaries. Here is something to which I would like to draw your attention. Some exceptionally clever people can undoubtedly be found among the present people of the East and of India. By the whole configuration of their mind and soul, however, they are already far from understanding the feelings poured out in the Bhagavad Gita. Consider how these people receive from Western civilization a way of thought that does not reach to the depths, but is merely superficial understanding. This has a double result. For one, it is easy for the people of India to develop something that may easily make them feel how far behind a superficial Western culture is in relation to what has already been given by their great poem. In effect, they still have more ways to approach the meaning of that poem than to approach the deeper contents of Western spiritual and intellectual life. Then, there are others in India 
who would gladly be ready to receive such spiritual substance as is contained, let us say, in the works of Soloviev, Hegel and Fichte, to mention a, a few of many spiritualized thinkers. Footnote, Vladimir Soloviev, 1853-1900, Russian mystical philosopher and sophiologist. End of footnote. Many Indian thinkers would like to make these ideas their own. Footnote, Sri Aurobindo absorbed Hegelian philosophy at King's College, Cambridge, 1890-1892. End of footnote. I once experienced something of this kind. At the beginning of our founding of the German section in our movement, an Indian thinker sent me a dissertation, footnote, that is the Theosophical Society of which Steiner was the general secretary of the German branch, end of footnote. He sent it to many other Europeans besides. In this he tried to combine what Indian philosophy offers with important European concepts, such as might be gained in real truth, so he implied, if one entered deeply into Hegel and Fichte. In spite of the man's honest effort, the whole essay was of no use whatsoever. I do not mean to sound hostile. Rather, I would praise his effort, but the fact is, what this man produced could only appear as utter dilettantism to anyone who had access to the real concepts of Fichte and Hegel. There was nothing to be done with the whole thing. Here we have a person who honestly endeavors to penetrate a later spiritual stream altogether different from his own point of view. But he cannot get through the hindrances that time and evolution put in his way. When he attempts nevertheless to penetrate them, the result is untrue and impossible thoughts. I later heard a lecture by another person, one who does not know what European spiritual evolution really is and what its depths contain. He lectured in support of the same Indian thinker. He was a European who had learned the arguments of the Indian thinker and was bringing them forward as spiritual wisdom before his followers. They too, of course, were ignorant of the fact that they were listening to something that rested on the wrong intellectual basis. For one who could look keenly into what the European produced, it was simply terrible. If you will forgive the expression, it was enough to give one the creeps. It was misunderstanding grafted onto misunderstanding. So difficult is it to comprehend all that the human soul can produce. We must make it our ideal to truly understand all the masterpieces of the human spirit. If we feel this ideal through and through, and keep in mind what I just said, we shall gain a ray of light to show us how truly difficult it is to access the Bhagavad Gita. Also we shall realize how untold misunderstandings are possible and how harmful they can be. We in the West can well understand how the people of India look up to the old creative spirits of earlier times, whose activity flows through the Vedantic philosophy and permeates the Sankhya philosophy with its deep meaning. We can understand how Indian people look up with reverence to that climax of spiritual enlightenment that appears in Shankarakarya seven or eight centuries after the foundation of Christianity. But we must think of it in another way as well if we want to attain a truly deep understanding. To do so we must set up a kind of hypothesis, for it has not yet been realized in evolution. <laughs> Let us imagine that those who are the creators of the sublime spirituality that permeates the Vedas, the Vedantic literature, and the philosophy of Shankarakarya were to appear again in our time with the same spiritual faculty, the same keenness of perception they had when they were in the world in that ancient epoch. They would have come in touch with spiritual creations like those of Soloviev, Hegel and Fichte. What would they have said? We are assuming that what the adherents of those ancient philosophies say does not concern us, but only what those spirits themselves would say. I am aware that I am going to say something paradoxical, but we must think of what Schopenhauer once said, quote, There is no getting away from it. 
It is the sad fate of truth that it must always become paradoxical in the world. Truth is unable to sit on the throne of error, therefore it sits on the throne of time and appeals to the guardian angel of time. So great, however, is the spread of that angel's mighty wings that the individual dies within a single beat. Close quote. Footnote Arthur Schopenhauer, 1788 to 1860, German philosopher of pessimism and the will, and one of the earliest European interpreters of Hindu and Buddhist scriptures. End of footnote. So we must not shrink from the fact that truth must appear paradoxical. The following does also, and is true. If the poets of the Vedas, the founders of the Sankhya philosophy, even Shankaracharya himself, had returned in the nineteenth century and seen the works of Soloviev, Hegel, and Fichte, all those great men would have said, quote, These three men have achieved by the very quality and tenor of their minds what we were striving for back in that era, what we hoped our gift of spiritual vision would reveal to us. We thought we must rise to heights of clairvoyant vision. Then, in these heights, there would appear before us what permeates the souls of these nineteenth-century men quite naturally, almost as a matter of course. Quote. This sounds paradoxical to those Western people who with childlike lack of consciousness look to the people of the East, comparing themselves with them, all the while misunderstanding what the West actually contains, a peculiarly strange picture. We imagine those founders of Indian philosophy looking up fervently to Fichte and other Western thinkers, and along with them we see a number of people today who do not value the spiritual substance of Europe, but grovel in the dust before Shankarakarya and those before him, while they themselves are unconcerned with the, achieve the achievements of such thinkers as Hegel, Fichte, and Soloviev. We do so because only by such a, an hypothesis can we understand all the facts history presents to us. We shall understand this if we imagine those times from which the spiritual substance of the Bhagavad Gita flowed. Let us imagine human beings of that period somewhat as follows. What appears to a person today in varied, in varied ways in dream consciousness, the pictorial imagination of dream life, was, in that ancient time, the normal content of the soul, everyday consciousness. It was a dreamlike pictorial consciousness, by no means the same as in the old moon epoch, but much more evolved. This was the condition out of which human souls were passing on in the descending line of evolution. Still earlier was what we call sleep consciousness, a state wholly closed to us today, from which a kind of dreamlike inspiration came to human beings. It was the state closed to us today during our sleep. As dream consciousness is for us, so was this sleep consciousness for that ancient humanity. It found its way into normal picture consciousness, much as dream consciousness does for us, but more rarely. In yet another respect, it was somewhat different in those times. Our current dream consciousness generally brings up recollections of ordinary life. Then, when sleep consciousness could still penetrate the higher worlds, it allowed people to recollect those spiritual worlds. Then gradually this consciousness descended lower and lower. Anyone who at that time was striving as we do today in our esoteric education aimed for something quite different. When we today go through our esoteric development, we are aware that we have gone downhill to our everyday consciousness and are now striving upward. Those seekers who were also striving upward from their everyday dream consciousness. Let me read that again. Those seekers were also striving upward from their everyday dream consciousness. What was it then that they attained? With all their pains, it was something altogether different from what we are trying to attain. 
If someone had offered those people my book titled How to Know Higher Worlds, they would have had no use for it at all. Its contents would have been foolishness. For that ancient time, it only makes sense for humankind today. Then, everything they did with their yoga and sankhya was a striving toward a height that we have reached in the most profound works of our time, in those of the three European thinkers I have mentioned. They were striving to grasp the world in ideas and concepts. Therefore, one who really penetrates the matter finds no difference apart from differences of time, mood, form, and quality of feeling, between our three thinkers and the Vedantic philosophy. At that time the Vedantic philosophy was that to which men were striving upward. Today it has come down and is accessible to everyday consciousness. If we wish to describe the condition of our souls in this connection, we may start out by saying that sleep consciousness is closed for us, but for the ancient people of India it was still permeated by the light of spiritual vision. What we are now striving for lay hidden in the depths of the future for them. I mean what we call imaginative knowledge, fully conscious picture consciousness, permeated by the sense of the ego. I mean fully conscious imagination, as it is described in How to Know Higher Worlds. So much for the technical point that should be inserted here. In these abstract technicalities lies something far more important, that if a person today were to make vigorous use of the forces present in the soul, what the people of the Bhagavad Gita era strove for with all their might lies right at hand. It really does, even if only for a Soloviev, a Fichte, or a Hegel. One more thing. What today can be found right at hand was in ancient times attained by applying all the keen vision of Sankhya and the deep penetration of Yoga. It was attained with effort and pain, a sublime effort to lift the mind. Now imagine how different life is for a person who lives at the top of a mountain and is continually enjoying the magnificent view compared with a person who has never once seen the view but has to toil upward with trouble and pain from the valley. If you have the view every day, you get accustomed to it. It is not in the concepts, in their content, that the achievements of Shankaracharya, of the Vedic poets, and of their successors are different from those of Hegel and Fichte. The difference lies in the fact that Shankaracharya's predecessors were striving upward from the valley to the summit. It was their keenness of mind in Sankhya philosophy, their deepening of soul in yoga, that led them there. It was in this work, this overcoming of the soul, that the experience lay. It is the experience, not the content of thought, that is important here. This is the immensely significant thing, something from which we may in a certain sense derive comfort because Europeans do not value what they can find right at hand. Europeans prefer the form in which it meets them in Vedantic and Sankhya philosophies because there, without knowing it, they value the great efforts that achieved it. That is the personal side of the matter. It makes a difference whether you find a certain content of thought here or there or whether you attain it by the severe effort of the soul. It is the soul's work that gives a thing its life. We must take this into account. What was once attained alone by Shankaracharya and by the deep training of yoga can be found today right at hand, even if only by people like those we have named. This is not a matter for abstract commentaries. We only need the power to transplant ourselves into the living feelings of that time. We then begin to understand that the external expressions themselves, the outer forms of the ideas, were experienced quite differently from the way we can experience them. We must study those forms of expression that belong to the feeling, the mood, the mental habit of a human soul in the time of the Gita who might have lived through what that great poem contains. We must study the Gita, not in an external philological sense, not in order to provide academic commentaries, 
but to show how different its whole configuration of feeling and idea is from what we have now. Regarding the conceptual explanations of the world, which today, to use a graphic term, lie below but used to lie above, though the content of thought is the same, the form of expression is different. Whoever would stop with the abstract contents of these thoughts may find them easy to understand, but working one's way through to the real living experience will not be easy. It will cost great pains to go this way again and feel with the ancient Indians, because it was in this fashion that concepts first arose, such as flowed into the words sattva, rajas, tamas. Footnote, the three gunas, respectively truth or light, energy, and darkness or lethargy. And a footnote, I'll read the words again, sattva, rajas, tamas. I do not attach any importance to the ideal concepts these words imply in the Bhagavad Gita, but indeed we are inclined today to take them much too easily, thinking we understand them. We may add something further. We shall never reach an understanding beyond the limits of abstract concepts if we consider only the concepts of science regarding the activity of living beings. Sleep, for example, is not the same for humans and animals. Simply to define sleep would be like defining a knife as the same thing whether used for shaving or cutting meat. If we would keep an open mind and approach the concepts of tamas, rajas, and sattva once more from a different aspect, we can add something else taken from our present day life. Let us consider the way humans experience nature when they enter intellectually the three kingdoms that surround them. The mode and quality of knowledge is different in each case. I am not trying to make you understand sattva, rajas, and tamas exhaustively. I only want to help you come a little nearer to an idea of their meaning. When humans today approach the mineral kingdom, they feel they can penetrate it and its laws with their thinking, that they can, in a certain sense, live together with it. This kind of understanding at the time of the Gita would have been called a sattva understanding of the mineral kingdom. In the plant kingdom we always encounter an obstacle, namely that with our present intelligence we cannot penetrate life. The ideal now is to investigate and analyze nature from a physical, chemical standpoint and to comprehend it in this manner. In fact, some scientists spin their threads of thought so far as to ex- imagine they have come nearer to the idea of life by producing external forms that imitate as closely as possible the appearance of the generative process. This is idle fantasy. In our pursuit of knowledge, we do not penetrate the plant kingdom as far as we do the mineral. All we can do is observe plant life. What we can only observe but not penetrate with intellectual understanding is rajas understanding. When we come to the animal kingdom, its form of consciousness escapes our everyday intelligence far more than the life of plants. We do not perceive what the animal actually lives and experiences. What we can understand about the animal kingdom with today's science is a tamas understanding. What is it that actually lies in these words? Without a living sympathy for what was felt in them, we cannot follow a single line of the poem with the right quality of feeling, particularly in its later sections. At a higher stage, our inability to feel our way into these concepts is something like trying to read a book in a language we don't understand. For such a person there would be no question of seeking out the meaning of concepts in commentaries. One would just set to work to learn the language. So here, it is not a matter of interpreting and commenting on the word sattva, rajas, tamas in an academic way. In them lies the feeling of the whole period of the Gita, something of immense significance, because it led humans to an understanding of the world and its phenomena. If we would describe the way they were led, 
we must first free ourselves from many ideas that cannot be found in the writings of Soloviev, Hegel, and Fichte, yet lie in the widespread, fossilized thinking of the West. By sattva, rajas, tamas is meant a certain kind of finding one's way into the different conditions of universal life in its varied kingdoms. It would be abstract and wrong to interpret these words simply on the basis of the ancient Indian quality of thought and feeling. It is easier to take them in the true sense of the life of that time, but to interpret them as much as possible through our own life. It is better to choose the external contour and coloring of these conceptions freely out of our own experience. Human beings to today feed themselves with various substances, animal, plant and mineral. These foods, of course, have different effects on their constitution. When they eat plants, they permeate themselves with sattva conditions. When they try to understand them, they are, for them, a rajas condition. Nourishment from the assimilation of mineral substance, salts and the like, represents a rajas condition. That brought, ab- that brought about by eating meat represents tamas. Notice that we cannot keep the same order of sequence as if we were starting from an abstract definition. We have to keep our concepts fluid. I have not told you this to inspire horror in those who feel bound to eating meat. In a moment I shall mention another matter where the connection is again different. Let us imagine that a man is trying to assimilate the outer world, not through ordinary science, but by that kind of clairvoyance that is legitimate for our age. Suppose that he now brings the facts and phenomena of the surrounding world into his clairvoyant consciousness. All this will call forth a certain condition in him, just as, for ordinary understanding, the three kingdoms of nature call forth sattva, rajas, and tamas conditions. In effect, what can enter the purest form of clairvoyant perception, corresponding to purified clairvoyance, calls forth tamas. Parenthesis, I use the word purified, although not in the moral sense. Close parenthesis. A man who would truly see spiritual facts, objectively, with the kind of clairvoyance we can attain today, must by this activity bring about in himself the tamas condition. Then when he returns into the ordinary world, where he immediately forgets his clairvoyant knowledge, he feels that with his ordinary approach he enters a new condition, a new relation to knowledge, namely the sattva condition. Thus in our present age, everyday knowledge is the sattva condition. In the intermediate stage of belief, building on authority, we are in the rajas condition. Knowledge in the higher worlds brings about tamas in the human soul. Knowledge in our everyday environment is the condition of sattva, while faith, religious belief, resting on authority, brings about the condition of rajas. So you see, those whose constitution compels them to eat meat need not be horrified at the fact that meat puts them in a tamas condition, but the same condition is brought about by purified clairvoyance. It is that condition of an external thing when by some natural process it is most detached from the spiritual. If we call the spirit, in quotes, light, then the tamas condition is devoid of light. It is darkness. So long as our organism is permeated by the spirit in the normal way, we are in the sattva condition, that of our ordinary perception of the external world. When we are asleep, we are in tamas. We have to bring about this condition in sleep in order that our spirit may leave our body and enter the higher spirituality around us. If we would teach the higher, if we would reach the higher worlds, and the evangelist already tells us what humanity's darkness is, our human nature must be in the condition of tamas. Footnote: John, the author of the fourth gospel and three letters was an important object of Steiner's esoteric research. End of footnote. Since humanity is in the condition of sattva, not of tamas, which is darkness, the words of the evangelist, quote, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not, close quote, can be rendered somewhat as follows. 
quote, the higher light penetrated as far as humanity, but they were filled by a natural sattva that they would not give up, close quote. Thus the higher light couldn't find entrance because it can only shine in darkness. If we seek knowledge of such living concepts as sattva, rajas and tamas, we must get accustomed to not taking them in an absolute sense. They are always, one might say, turning this way and that. For a right concept of the world, there is no absolute higher or lower, only a relative sense. A European professor took objection to this. He translated sattva as goodness and objected to another man who translated it as light, though he translated tamas as darkness. Such things truly express the source of all misunderstanding. When humanity is in the condition of tamas, whether by sleep or clairvoyant perception, to take only these two cases, then, in effect, it is in darkness as far as the external human is concerned. So ancient Indian thought was right, yet it could not use a word like light in place of the word sattva. Tamas may always be translated darkness, but for the external world the sattva condition could not always be interpreted simply as light. Suppose we are describing light. It is entirely correct to call the light colors red excuse me, it is entirely correct to call the light colors. Red, orange and yellow, according to Sankhya philosophy, are the sattva colors. Under the same concept we must also place, for example, goodness kindness and loving human behavior. It is true that light falls under the concept of sattva, but this concept is broader. Light is not really identical with it. Therefore it is wrong to translate sattva as light, though it is quite possible to translate tamas as darkness. Nor is it correct, however, to say that light does not convey the idea of sattva. The criticism that the professor made of a man who may have been well aware of this is also not quite justified, for the simple reason that if someone said, quote, here is a lion, close quote, nobody would attempt to correct him by saying, no, here is a beast of prey, close quote. Both are correct. This comparison hits the nail right on the head. As regards external appearance, it is correct to associate sattva with what is full of light but it is wrong to say sattva is only of light. It is a more general concept than light, just as beast of prey is more general than lion. The same cannot be said of darkness, for the reason that in tamas, things that are different and specific in rajas and sattva merge into something more general. After all, a lamb and a lion are two very different creatures. If I wanted to describe them as to their sattva characters, the form that the natural element of life and force and spirit takes in lambs and lions, I would describe them very differently. But if I wish to describe them in the tamas condition, the differences do not come into consideration, because in the tamas condition the lamb or lion is simply lying lazily on the ground. In the sattva condition lambs and lions are very different, but on a cosmic level, the indolence of both is, after all, one and the same. Our power of truly looking into such concepts must therefore adapt to great differentiation. As a matter of fact, the three concepts with the qualities of feeling in them are among the most illuminating components in the whole of Sankhya. In all that Krishna puts before Arjuna, when he presents himself as the founder of the age of self-consciousness, he has to speak in words altogether permeated by those shades of feeling derived from the concepts sattva, rajas and tamas. About these three concepts, and what at length leads to a climax in the Bhagavad Gita, we shall speak more fully in the last lecture of this course. This is the end of lecture 13, which in this cycle, The Occult Significance of the Bhagavad Gita, the second part of this book, is lecture 8. You're listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf, Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, which co- is composed of two separate cycles. 
This is the last lecture of the second cycle, which I am numbering lecture 14 in order to have this one file complete. After this lecture, there is an appendix, which is the Gospel of St. Mark lecture, which is also in another place on this website, but I have copied it here as well for convenience. So this is lecture 14, uh, also numbered lecture 9 in this particular cycle, the occult significance of the Bhagavad Gita. Given in Helsinki on June 5, 1913. The latter part of the Bhagavad Gita is permeated by feelings and shades of meaning, saturated with ideas of sattva, rajas, and tamas. In these last chapters, our whole mode of thinking and feeling must be attuned so as to understand what is meant by those three conditions. In the last lecture, I sought to give an idea of those important concepts by making use of present-day experiences. Certainly anyone who enters the poem in depth must perceive that since the time when it arose, those concepts have shifted to some extent. Nevertheless, it would not be incorrect to refer to them simply by verbal quotations from the poem. Our mode of feeling is different from what is contained there, and we are unable to make those very different feelings our own. If we tried to do so, we would only be describing the unknown by the unknown. So, in the Bhagavad Gita you will find, with regard to food, that the concepts we developed last time have shifted a little. What is true for us today about plant food was true for the ancient Indian of the food Krishna calls in quotes mild or in quotes gentle food. Whereas Rajas food, which we described correctly for us today as mineral food, salt for instance, would have been designated at that time as sour or sharp. For our constitution, meat is essentially a tamas food. But the Indian meant by this something that could hardly be considered food at present, which gives us an idea of how different people were then. They meant food that had become rotten, had stood so long, and had a foul smell. In our present incarnation, we could not properly call that tamas food, because the human organism has changed, even as far as our physical body. In order to understand these feelings of sattva, rajas, and tamas, so fundamental in the Gita, it is well for us to apply them to our own conditions. Now, if we wish to consider what sattva really is, it is best to begin by taking the most striking conception of it. In our time, the person who can give him or herself up to knowledge as penetrating as our present knowledge of the mineral kingdom is a sattva person. For the Indian, such a person was not one who had such knowledge, but one who went through the world with intelligent understanding, we would say with heart and head in the right place a person who takes on without prejudice or bias the phenomena the world offers, a person who always perceives the world with sympathy and conceives it with intelligence, one who receives the light of ideas, of feelings and sentiments streaming out from all the beauty and loveliness of the world, one who avoids all that is ugly, developing him or herself rightly. One who does all this in the physical world is a sattva person, In the inorganic world, a sattva impression is that of a surface not too brilliant, bright yet illuminated in such a way that its details of color can be seen in their right luster. A rajas person is, in a certain way, prevented by his or her own emotions, impulses and reactions, or by the thing itself, from fully penetrating his or her surroundings so that one does not give oneself up to the world, but meets it with what one is oneself. For example, one becomes acquainted with the plant kingdom. One can admire it, but one brings one's own emotions to bear on it and therefore cannot penetrate it to its depths. A tamas person is altogether given up to the bodily life, so that he or she is blunt and apathetic toward the environment, as we might be toward a consciousness different from our own. While we dwell on the physical plane, 
We know nothing of the consciousness of a dog or a horse, not even of another human being. In this respect, the human being as a rule is blunt and dull, withdrawing into his or her own bodily life. Humans live in impressions of tamas, but humans must gradually become apathetic to the physical world in order to have access to the spiritual worlds in clairvoyance. In this way we can best read the ideas of sattva, rajas and tamas. In external nature a rajas impression would be that of a moderately bright surface, say of green, a uniform green shade. A dark colored surface would represent a tamas impression. Where we look out into the darkness of universal space, when the beautiful spectacle of the free heavens appears to us, the blue color we see is almost a tamas color. If we saturate ourselves with the feeling these ideas give, we can apply them to everything that surrounds us. These ideas are really comprehensive. For the ancient Indians, to comprehend this threefold nature of their surroundings meant not only a certain understanding of the outer world, it also meant bringing to life their own inner being. They felt it somewhat as follows. Imagine an ancient countryman who sees the glory of nature around him, the early morning sky, the sun and stars, everything he can see. He does not think about it, however. He does not build up concepts and ideas about the world, but just lives in utmost harmony with it. If he begins to feel himself as an individual person, distinguishing his soul from his environment, he has to do so by learning to understand his surroundings through ideas about them. To set one's environment objectively before one is always a certain way of grasping the reality of one's own being. The Indian of the time of the Bhagavad Gita said, quote, So long as one does not penetrate and perceive the sattva, rajas and tamas conditions in one's environment, one continues merely to live in it. One is not yet there independently in one's own being, but is bound up with one's own surroundings. However, when the world around one becomes so objective that one can pursue it everywhere with the awareness that this is a sattva condition, this a rajas, that a tamas, then one becomes ever freer of the world, more independent in oneself. This, therefore, is one way of bringing about consciousness of self. At bottom, this is Krishna's concern, to free Arjuna's soul from all those things that surround him and are characteristic of the time in which he lives. So Krishna explains, Subquote, Behold all the life there on the bloody field of battle, where brothers confront brothers, with all that thou feelest thyself bound to, dissolved in, a part of. Learn to know that all that is there outside you runs its course in conditions of sattva, rajas and tamas. Then wilt thou contrast thyself with it. Know that in thine own highest self thou dost not belong to it, and wilt experience thy separate being within thyself, the spirit in thee. Close subquote, close long quote, footnote. Rather than a quotation, this passage seems to be Steiner's summary of Krishna's teaching concerning the gunas, for which see especially chapters 14 and 18, and a footnote. Here we have another of the beautiful elements in the dramatic composition of the Bhagavad Gita. At first we are gradually made acquainted with its ideas as abstract concepts, but then afterward these become more and more vivid. The concepts of sattva, rajas and tamas take on living shape and form in the most varied spheres of life. Then at length the separation of Arjuna's soul from it all is accomplished, so to speak, before our spiritual gaze. Krishna explains to him how we must free ourselves from all that is bound up with these three conditions. There are sattva people who are so bound up with existence as to be attached to all the happiness and joy they can draw from their environment. They speed through the world, drinking in their blissfulness from all that can give it to them. The Rajas people are diligent, people of action, 
but they act because they are attached to the consequences of their action. They depend on the joy of action, on the impression action makes upon them. Tamas people are attached to laziness. They want to be comfortable. They really do not want to act at all. All of those whose souls and spirits are bound into external conditions belong to one or other of these three groups. Quote, but thine eyes shall see the daybreak of the age of self-consciousness. Thou shalt learn to hold thy soul apart. Thou shalt be neither sattva rajas nor tamas. Close quote. That's from Discourse 17, 53 through 66. Thus is Krishna the great educator of the human ego. He shows its separation from its environment. He explains soul activities according to how they partake of sattva, rajas, or tamas. If one raises one's belief to the divine creators of the world, one is a sattva person. In the time of the Gita, however, there were those who knew nothing of the divine beings guiding the universe. They were completely attached to the so-called nature spirits, those behind the immediate beings of nature. Such people are rajas people, the Tamas people are those who, in viewing the world, get only so far as what we may call the ghost-like, which in its spiritual nature is nearest to the material. So these three groups may also be distinguished in regard to religious feeling. If we wished to apply these concepts to religious feeling in our time, we should say that those who strive after anthroposophy are sattva people, those attached to external faith are rajas people, and those who in a material or spiritual sense will only believe in what has bodily shape and form, the materialists and spiritualists, are the tamas people. Spiritualists do not ask for spiritual beings in whom they may believe. They are quite prepared to believe in them, but they do not want to lift themselves up to the spiritual beings. They want the beings to come down. Spiritual beings must rap, because rapping can be heard with physical ears. They must appear in clouds of light, because clouds can be seen with physical eyes. Hence, spiritualists and materialists are tamas people, quite in the sense of the tamas people of Krishna's time. There are also unconscious tamas people, the materialistic thinkers of our time, who deny all that is spiritual. When materialists meet in conference today, they persuade themselves that they adhere to materialism on logical grounds, but this is an illusion. Materialists are people who remain so, not on the basis of logic, but for fear of the spiritual. They deny the spirit because they are afraid of it. They are in effect compelled to deny it by the logic of their own unconscious soul, which penetrates to the door of the spiritual but cannot pass through it. One who can see reality can see in a materialistic congress how each person in the depths of his or her soul is afraid of the spirit. Materialism is not logic, it is cowardice before the spiritual. All its arguments are nothing but an opiate to damp down this fear. Actually, Araman, the giver of fear, has every materialist by the neck. This is a grotesque but an austere and fundamental truth that one may recognize if one goes to any materialistic meeting. Why is such a meeting called? The illusion is that people there discuss views of the universe, but in reality it is a meeting to conjure up the devil Araman, to beckon him into their chambers. Krishna, then, indicates to Arjuna how the different religious beliefs may be classified and speaks to him of the different ways human beings may approach the gods in actual prayer. In all cases, the temper of the human soul can be described in terms of these three conditions. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas people are different in the way they relate to their gods. Tamas people may be priests whose priesthood depends on a kind of habit. They have their office, but no living connection with the spiritual world. So they repeat Aum, 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 which proceeds from the dullness, the tamas condition of their spirit. They pour forth their subjective nature in the Aum. Rajas people 
look out on the surrounding world and begin to feel that it has something in it akin to themselves, that it is related to them, and therefore that it is worthy of worship. They are the people of Tat, who worship the that, the cosmos, as being akin to themselves. Sattva people perceive that what lives within us is one with all that surrounds us in the universe outside. In their prayer they have a sense for Sat, the all-being, the unity without and within, unity of the objective and the subjective. Krishna says that one who would truly become free in the soul, one who does not wish to be merely a sattva, a rajas or a tamas person in any single respect or another, must attain to a transformation of these conditions within the self so that one wears them like a garment while in one's real self one grows out beyond them. This is the impulse that Krishna, as the creator of self-consciousness, must give. He stands before Arjuna and teaches him to, quote, look upon all the conditions of the world, with all that is to humankind highest and deepest, but free thyself from the highest and deepest of the three conditions, and in thine own self become as one who lays hold of the self. Learn and know that thou canst live without feeling thyself bound up with rajas or tamas or sattva. Close quote. That's uh, C. Discourse 18, 11, and 12. One had to learn this at that time because it was the beginning of the dawn of self-liberation. But here again, what then required the greatest effort can today be found right at hand. This is the tragedy of present life. There are too many today who stand in the world and burrow down into their own soul, finding no connection with the outer world. In their feelings and all their inner experiences, they are lonely souls. They neither feel themselves bound up with the conditions of sattva, rajas, or tamas, nor are they free from them, but are cast out into the world like an endlessly, aimlessly revolving wheel. Such people who live only in themselves and cannot understand the world, who are unhappy because in their soul life they are separated from all external existence, these represent the shadow side of the fruit that it was Krishna's task to develop in Arjuna and in all his contemporaries and successors. What had to be Arjuna's highest endeavor has become the greatest suffering for many people today. Thus do successive ages change. Today we must say that we are at the end of the age that began with the time of the Bhagavad Gita. This may penetrate our feelings with deep significance. It may also tell us that just as in that ancient time those seeking self-consciousness had to hear what Krishna told Arjuna, those seeking their soul's salvation today, in whom self-consciousness is developed to a morbid degree, these too should listen, to hear what can lead them once more to an understanding of the three external conditions. What might this teaching be? Let us put forward some more preliminary ideas before we set out to answer this question. Let us ask again, what is it that Krishna really wants for Arjuna, whose relation to external conditions was right for his time? What is it that he says with divine simplicity and naivete? He reveals what he wishes to be, to be even to our present time. Let me read that again. He reveals what he wishes to be even to our present time. We have described how a kind of picture consciousness, a living imagery, lit up the human soul, how there was hovering above it, so to speak, what today is self-consciousness, which people at that time had to strive for with all their might, but which today is right at hand. Try to live into the soul condition of that time before Krishna introduced the new age. The world did not call forth clear concepts and ideas, but pictures like those of our dreams today. The lowest region of soul life was a picture-like consciousness, and this was illumined from the higher region of sleep consciousness through inspiration. In this way souls could rise to still higher conditions. This ascent was called, quote, entering into Brahma, close quote. 
To ask a soul today, living in the West, to enter into Brahma would be a senseless anachronism. It would be like requiring a person who is halfway up a mountain to reach the top by the same way as one still down in the valley. To ask a soul today to do Hindu or yogic exercises and enter into Brahma presupposes that a person is at the stage of picture consciousness, which as a matter of fact certain Asians still are. What those people of the Gita age found in rising into Brahma, Westerners already have in their concepts and ideas. Truly, Shankarakarya would today introduce the ideas of Soloviev, Hegel and Fichte to his reverend disciples as the first stage of rising into Brahma. It is not the content, however, but the pains of the way they are excuse me. It is not the content, however, but the pains of the way that are important. Krishna indicates a main characteristic of this rising into Brahma, through which we have a beautiful characterization by Krishna himself. At that time, the constitution of the soul was entirely passive. The world of pictures came to you, and you gave yourself up to these flowing pictures. Compare this with the altogether different nature of our everyday world. Devotion, giving ourselves up to things, does not help us to understand them, even though there are many who do not wish to advance to what must necessarily take place in our time. Nevertheless, for our age, we have to exert ourselves, we have to be alive and active in order to achieve ideas and concepts of our surrounding world. Herein lies all the trouble in our education. We have to educate children so that their minds are awake when their concepts of the surrounding world are being formed. Today the soul must be more active than it was in the age before the origin of the Bhagavad Gita. We can put it so, quote, Bhagavad Gita age, rising to Brahma with passive souls, consciousness soul age, which is our present age, actively working our way up into the higher worlds. Close quote. What then must Krishna say when he wishes to introduce that new age in which the active way of gaining an understanding of the universe is gradually to begin? He must say, quote, I have to come, I have to give thee the I, human, a gift that shall impel thee to activity. Close quote. If it had all remained passive as before, The human being interwoven with the world, devoted to the world, the new age would never have begun. Everything connected with the entry of the soul into the spiritual world before the time of the Gita, Krishna calls devotion. All is devotion to Brahma. This he compares to the feminine in humankind. While what is the self in humans, the active working element that pushes up from within as the generator of the self-consciousness that is to come, Krishna calls the masculine in humankind. What human beings can attain in Brahma must be fertilized by Krishna. So his teaching to Arjuna is, quote, all human beings until now were Brahma people. Brahma is all that is spread out as the mother womb of the whole world. But I am the Father who came into the world to fertilize the maternal womb. Close quote, footnote. My womb is pra, quote, my womb is praktiri, excuse me, is prakriti, in that I place the seed. Thus all created things are born. Everything born, Arjuna, comes from the womb of prakriti, and I am the seed giving Father. Close quote, end of footnote. Thus the consciousness of self is created which is to work on all human beings. This is indicated as clearly as possible. Krishna and Brahma are related to each other as father and mother in the world. Together they produce the self-consciousness that human beings must have in the further course of their evolution. The self-consciousness that makes it possible for them to become ever more perfect as individual beings. The Krishna faith has altogether to do with the single person, the individual person. To follow his teaching exclusively means to strive for the perfection of oneself as an individual. 
This can be achieved only by liberating the self, loosening it from all that adheres to external conditions. Fix your attention on this backbone of Krishna's teaching, on the way it directs human beings to put aside all externals, to become free from the life that takes its course in continually changing conditions of every kind, to comprehend oneself in the self alone, that it may be born ever onward to higher perfection. See how this perfection depends on human beings leaving behind the external configuration of things, casting off the whole of outer life like a shell, becoming free and ever more inwardly alive, tearing the self away from the environment, no longer asking what goes on in external processes of perfection, but asking how shall one perfect oneself. This is the teaching of Krishna. Lucifer directed human attention to the outer world. By his instigation, humans had to learn to know the external and therefore had to go through the long course of evolution down to the time of Christ. Then he who was once withdrawn from Lucifer came in Krishna and later in the Luke Jesus child. In two stages, he gave that teaching that from another side was to be the antithesis of the teaching of Lucifer in Paradise. Quote, he wanted to open your eyes to the conditions of sattva, rajas and tamas. Shut your eyes to these conditions and you will find yourselves as human beings, as self-conscious human beings. Close quote. Thus does the imagination appear before us. On the one side the imagination of Paradise, where Lucifer opens our eyes to the three conditions in the external world when, for a while, the opponent of Lucifer withdraws. Then humans go through their evolution and reach the point where in two stages another teaching is given them of self-consciousness, which bids them close their eyes to the three external conditions. Both teachings are one-sided. If the Krishna-Jesus influence alone had continued, one one-sidedness would have been added to another. Humankind would have taken leave of all that surrounds it and would have lost all interest in external evolution. Each, per each person would only have sought his or her own perfection. Striving for perfection is right, but such striving bought at the price of a lack of interest in the whole of humanity is one-sided, even as the Luciferic influence was one-sided. Hence the all-embracing Christ impulse entered the higher synthesis of the two one-sided tendencies. Krishna, that is the spirit who worked through Krishna, appeared again in the Jesus child of the Nathan line of the house of David, described in Luke's Gospel. Thus, fundamentally, this child embodied the impulse, all the forces that tend to make human beings independent and loosen them from external reality. What was the intention of this soul that did not enter human evolution, but worked in Krishna and again in this Jesus child? At a far distant time this soul had had to go through the experience of remaining outside human evolution because the antagonist Lucifer had come, he who said, quote, Your eyes will be opened and you will distinguish good and evil and be as God, close quote. In the ancient Indian sense, Lucifer said to humanity, quote, You will be as the gods and will have power to find the sattva, rajas and tamas conditions in the world. Close quote. In the personality of the Luke, Jesus child himself, the Christ impulse lived for three years. The Christ who came to humankind to bring together these two extremes. Through each of them, humankind would have fallen into weakness and sin. Through Lucifer, humanity would have been condemned to live one-sidedly in the external conditions of sattva, rajas and tamas. Through Krishna, they were to be educated for the other extreme, to close their eyes and seek only their own perfection. Christ took sin upon himself. He gave to humanity what re reconciles the two one-sided tendencies. He took upon himself the sin of self-consciousness, 
which would close its eyes to the world outside. He took upon himself the sin of Krishna and of all who would commit his sin. He took upon himself the sin of Lucifer and of all who would commit the sin of fixing their attention on externalities. By taking both extremes upon himself, he he makes it possible for humanity by degrees to find a harmony between the inner and the outer world, because in that harmony alone the salvation of humanity is to be found. An evolution that has once begun, however, cannot end suddenly. The urge to self-consciousness that began with Krishna went on and on, increasing and intensifying self-consciousness more and more, bringing about estrangement from the outer world. In our time, too, this course is tending to continue. At the time when the Krishna impulse was received by the Luke Jesus child, Humankind was in the midst of this development, an increase of self-consciousness and estrangement from the outer world. It was this that was brought home to those who received the baptism of John in the Jordan, so that they understood the Baptist when he said to them, quote, Change your disposition, walk no longer in the path of Krishna, close quote, though he did not use this word. The path on which humankind had then entered we may call the Jesus path, if we would speak in an esoteric sense. In effect, the pursuit of this Jesus path alone went on and on through the following centuries. In many respects, human civilization in the centuries following the foundation of Christianity was only related to Jesus, not to the Christ who lived in Jesus for the three years from the baptism by John until the mystery of Golgotha. Every line of evolution, however, works its way onward, up to a certain tension. In the course of time, this longing for individual perfection was driven to such a pitch that humanity was in a certain sense brought more and more into the tragedy of estrangement from the divine in nature, from the outer world. Today we are experiencing this in many ways. So many people today have little understanding left of our environment. Therefore, it is just in our time that an understanding of the Christ impulse must break in upon us. The Christ path must be added to the Jesus path. The path of one-sided striving for perfection has become too strong. In many respects, we are so remote from our surroundings that certain movements, when they arise, overreach themselves immediately, and the longing for the opposite is awakened. Many human souls now feel how little they can escape from this enhanced self-consciousness, and this creates an impulse to know the divinity of the outer world. It is such souls as these who in our time will seek the understanding of the Christ impulse that is opened up by true anthroposophy, the force that does not merely strive for the one-sided perfection of the individual soul, but belongs to the whole progress of humanity. To understand the Christ means not merely to strive toward perfection, but to receive in oneself something expressed by St. Paul, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote. I is the Krishna word, not I, but Christ in me is the Christian word. So we see how every spiritual movement in history has its justification in a certain sphere. No one should ever imagine that the Krishna impulse could have been dispensed with. No one should ever think either that one human spiritual movement is fully justified in its one-sidedness. The two extremes, the Luciferic and the Krishna impulses, had to find their higher unity in the mission of the Christ. One who would understand it in the true anthroposophic sense, the impulse necessary for the further evolution of humankind must realize how anthroposophy has to become a means of shedding light on all religions. He or she must learn to see how the different streams in evolution all flow into the one main current of development. It would be a dilettante beginning if one tried to find again in the Krishna stream what what can be found in the stream of Christianity. Only when we regard the matter in this way 
Do we understand what it means to seek a unity in all religions? There is, however, another way of doing so. One may repeat over and over, quote, In all religions the same fundamental essence is contained, close quote. In effect, the same essence is contained in the root of a plant, in the stem, leaves, flowers, the pollen, and the fruit. That is true, but it is an abstract truth. It is no more profound than if one were to say, quote, Why make any distinctions? Salt, pepper, vinegar, and milk all have their place on the table. All are one, for all are substance. Close quote. Here you can tell how futile such a way of thought can be. But you do not notice it so easily when it comes to comparing religions. It will not do to compare the Chinese, Hindu, Buddhist, Zoroastrian, Muslim, and Christian faiths in this abstract way, saying, quote, Look, everywhere we find the same principles. In each case there is a Savior. Close quote. Abstractions can indeed be found in countless places and in countless ways, but this is a dilettante method because it leads to nothing. One may form societies to pursue the study of all religions and do so in the same sense as saying pepper, salt, etc. are one because they are all substance. That has no importance. What is important is to regard things as they really are. To persist in declaiming the equality of all religions is an example of esoteric dilettantism. It is as though it were one and the same whether what lived in the Christ were the pivot of the whole of evolution or whether it could be found in the first person you meet in the street. For one who wishes to guide his or her life by truth, it is an atrocity to associate the impulse in the world's history that is bound up with the mystery of Golgotha and for which the name Christ has been preserved with any other impulse in history, because in truth it is the central point of the whole of earthly evolution. In these lectures I have tried by means of a particular instance to indicate how present-day esotericism must try to throw light on the different spiritual movements that have appeared in the course of human history. Though each has its right and proper point of contact, one must distinguish between them as between the stem of a plant and the green leaf, and between the green leaf and the colored petal, though all together form a unity. If one tries with this truly modern esotericism to penetrate with one's soul into what has flowed into humanity in diverse currents, one recognizes how the different religious faiths lose nothing of their greatness and majesty. How sublime was the greatness that appeared to us in the figure of Krishna, even when we simply tried to get a definite view of his place in evolution. All such lines of thought as we can give only in outline are indeed imperfect, and you may be assured that no one is more aware of their imperfection than the present speaker. But the endeavor has been to show in what spirit a true consideration of the spiritual movement toward individuality in humankind must be carried out. I purposely tried to derive our thoughts from a spiritual creation remote from us, the Bhagavad Gita, to show how Western minds can perceive and feel what they owe to Krishna, what he, through the continued working of his impulse, still signifies for their own upward striving. However, the spiritual movement we represent here necessarily demands that we enter concretely and with real love into the special nature of every current in humanity's spiritual history. This is a bit inconvenient because it brings us all too near to the humble thought of how little, after all, we really penetrate into their depths. Another idea follows upon this namely that we must continue striving further and ever further. Both of these ideas are inconvenient. It is the sad fate of that movement we call anthroposophy that it produces inconvenient results for many souls. It requires that we actively lay hold of the definite, separate facts of the world's development. At the same time, it requires all of us to say earnestly to ourselves, quote, I can indeed reach something higher, and I will. Whatever I have attained, it is always only a certain stage and standpoint. 
I must forever go on striving, on and on, without end. Close quote. Thus all along it has been not quite comfortable to belong to the spiritual movement that by our efforts is endeavoring to take its place in what is called the Theosophical Movement. Footnote. This is a reference to Steiner's break with the Theosophical Society in 1912 and the formation of the Anthroposophical Society. End of footnote. It has not been easy because we demand that people shall learn to strive ever more deeply to penetrate the sacred mysteries. We could not supply you with anything so easy as introducing some person's son or daughter saying, quote, You need only wait. The Savior of humankind will appear physically embodied in this boy or girl. Close quote. Footnote. This would seem to be a reference to the claim in 1911 by Annie Besant and C. W. Ledbetter that J. Krishnamurti, 1895-1986, who was then 16 years old, was the reincarnation of Jesus. This claim and the creation of the Order of the Star of the East, beginning in 1909, contributed to the break, perhaps inevitable, between Rudolf Steiner and Annie Passant, then president of the Theosophical Society. End of footnote. We could not do this, because we must be true. Yet one who perceives what is happening cannot but regard these latest proceedings as the final grotesque outcome of the dilettante comparison of religions that can also be put forward so easily and that continually repeats what should be taken as a matter of course, the tritest of all sayings, quote, all religions contain the same essence. Close quote, footnote, H. P. Blavatsky taught the unity of all religions, end of footnote. The last weeks and months have shown, and my speaking here on this significant subject has shown it again, that a circle of people can be found at the present time who are ready to seek spiritual truths. We have no other concern than to put these truths forward, though many or even everyone may leave us. If so, it will make no difference in the way the spiritual truths are here proclaimed. The sacred obligation to truth will guide the movement that underlies this cycle of lectures. Whoever would go with us must do so under the conditions that have now become necessary. It is certainly more convenient to proceed otherwise, not entering into another side of the matter as we do by pointing out the reality in all things. But that also is part of our obligation to truth. It is simpler to inform people of the equality and unity of religions or tell them they are to wait for the incarnation of a Savior who is predestined, whom they are to recognize not by themselves, but on someone's authority. Human souls today will themselves have to decide how far a spiritual movement can be carried on and upheld by pure devotion to the ideal of truthfulness. In our time, it had to come, that, it had to, come to that sharp cleavage whose climax was reached when those who had no other desire than to set forth what is true and genuine in evolution were described as Jesuits. Footnote. During the years of tension between the teaching of Rudolf Steiner and the leaders of the Theosophical Society, Andy Besant repeated the accusation, which was without foundation, that Rudolf Steiner was a student of the Jesuits. End of footnote. This was a convenient way of separating but the external evidence was the work of objective falsehood. This cycle of lectures may once more have shown you that we have been working out of no one-sided tendency, since it comprises the present, the past, and the primal past, in order to reveal the unique fundamental impulse of human evolution. So I too may say that it fills me with the deepest satisfaction to have been able to give these lectures here before you. This shows me there is no that there is hope because there are souls here who have the impulse, the urge, toward what works also in the supersensible with nothing but simple, honest truthfulness. I was forced to add this final word to these lectures, for it is necessary, in view of all that has happened to us in the course of time, down to the point of being excluded from the Theosophical Society. Considering all we have suffered and all that is now being falsely asserted in numerous pamphlets, 
it was necessary to say something, although a discussion of these matters is always painful to me. Those who desire to work with us must know that we have taken for our banner the humble yet unconditional, honest striving for truth, striving ever upward into the higher worlds. The end of Lecture 14, uh, which was Lecture 9 in this sub-cycle of the book, The Bhagavad Gita in the West, there is still an appendix. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. This is a reading of the collected, uh, collected works by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Bhagavad Gita in the West. Uh, this particular lecture, which I'm numbering Lecture 15, is actually from the lecture cycle by Rudolf Steiner entitled The Gospel of St. Mark. And it is that lecture from the other part of this website, which I am transferring a copy of over here and retitling uh, Lecture 15, Gita and the West. And uh, it is part of the, it is an appendix in this book, the Bhagavad Gita and the West. Yesterday we endeavored to place before our minds, from a certain point of view, the world historical position that existed at the moment in time when the mystery of Golgotha occurred. We tried to do this by presenting the picture of two significant leaders of mankind, the Buddha and Socrates, both of whom lived several centuries before the mystery of Golgotha. In doing this we remarked that the Buddha represented something like the significant conclusion of one stream of evolution. There Buddha stands in the fifth or sixth century before the mystery of Golgotha, proclaiming what has since then been recognized as a deeply significant teaching the revelation of Benares that in a certain way encompasses and renews all that had been able to flow into human souls during thousands of years was proclaimed in the only way it could be half a millennium before the mystery of Golgotha. We can see even more clearly how far the Buddha represented the great conclusion of one cosmic stream when we place before our minds his great predecessor who recedes far back into the twilight of human evolution, Krishna, who is quite a different who in quite a different sense appears to us as the final moment of a revelation thousands of years old <clears throat> krishna can be placed several centuries before the buddha but that is not the issue here the main point is that the more we allow the being of krishna and the being of the buddha to affect us the more clearly do we recognize that in krishna what was later to be proclaimed by the buddha appears in an even brighter light whereas with Buddha, as we wish to demonstrate in a moment, in a certain way it comes to an end. <clears throat> the name Krishna embraces something that for many thousands of years has shown into the spiritual development of mankind. If we immerse ourselves in all that is meant by the proclamation of Krishna, we look up into the sublime heights of human spiritual evolution, instilling the feeling within us that nothing can possibly surpass, nothing can enhance what is contained in what resounds from Krishna's revelation. What resounds from this revelation of Krishna is a kind of climax. In saying this we are attributing to the person of Krishna what also was revealed by others before him. For it is indeed true that everything that had been given out gradually for thousands of years before his time by those who were given the task of becoming the bearers of knowledge was renewed, summed up, and brought to a conclusion in the revelations of Krishna to his people. If we take into consideration how Krishna speaks about the divine spiritual worlds and the relation of these worlds to mankind and about the course of cosmic events, and if we also consider the spirituality to which we ourselves must rise if we wish to penetrate the deeper meaning of the teaching of Krishna, then we may say that only one event in the whole subsequent development of humanity can in even a slight degree be compared with it. We may say of the revelation of Krishna that it is in a certain sense an occult teaching. Why occult? It is occult for the simple reason that few people can achieve the inner capacity to ascend to those spiritual heights where understanding can be gained. There is no need to keep secret what Krishna revealed in an external way to lock it up in a safe so that it stays occult. It remains occult for no other reason than that too few people rise to the heights to which they must rise if they are to understand it. However widely such revelations as those of Krishna are disseminated among the people, and put into their hands, 
they still remain occult. For they can be brought out of the realm of the occult not by disseminating them among the people, but only when there are souls who can rise high enough to be able to unite with them. It is true that such revelations hover above us at a certain spiritual height, yet they speak to us as if from a high point of spirituality. Anyone who simply picks up the words that are contained in such revelations should by no means believe he understands them, not even if he is a learned man of the twentieth century. It is entirely comprehensible that it is is widely asserted today that there is no occult teaching. This is understandable, because those who say such things do indeed possess the words, and with them think they have everything. But it is in the very nature of occult teaching that they do not understand what they possess. Earlier I said that there is just one thing that can be compared with the teaching of Krishna, and indeed what we associate with the name Krishna can be compared with what may remind us of three later names, which are in a certain sense closely connected with us, though in the case of these three, the method, conceptual and philosophical, is quite different. I am referring to everything that in recent years has been linked to the names of Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, and the teachings of these men have a slight resemblance to other occult teachings of mankind. For though we can undoubtedly acquire the writings of Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, it cannot be denied that in the widest sense of the words they have remained occult teaching. Truly they have remained occult to this day. There are very few people who wish to achieve any kind of relation to what these three men have written. From a certain kind of what I may call philosophical courtesy, there is today in certain circles some talk about Hegel again, and if something is said like what I have just said myself, then the reply is made that, after all, there really are some people who busy themselves with Hegel. However, if one listens to what these people say and what they contribute to the understanding of Hegel, then we are all the more compelled to the view that for these people Hegel has remained an occult teaching. What shines out toward us from the East, from Krishna, appears again in Fichte, Schelling and Hegel in an abstract, conceptual way, and it is not easy to notice the similarity. Indeed, it requires a special constitution of soul to be able to do so. I should like to speak candidly about this <clears throat> and state clearly what is required. When a man of today who believes he has enjoyed not an average but a superior education takes up a philosophical work by Fichte or Hegel, he believes he is reading something concerned only with the development of advanced concepts. Most people will agree that it is difficult really to warm up to it if, for example, they turn to Hegel's Encyclopedia of the Phil Philosophical Sciences and read for the first time about being, non-being, becoming, existence and the like. We have probably heard it said that in these, this work a man has cooked up a collection of highly abstract concepts, beautiful enough, no doubt, but providing nothing capable of kindling warmth in heart or soul. I have known many people who, after three or four pages of this particular work, have promptly closed the book. But they are not at all prepared to admit that perhaps the guilt lies in themselves, that they do not warm up and have avoided the struggles that have to be endured in going from hell to heaven. <clears throat> this they do not willingly admit. Yet it is possible by means of these so-called abstract concepts to experience a veritable life struggle and to feel not only a living warmth but the whole range of feeling from the most extreme cold to the highest soul warmth. Then one can come to feel that these things are written not in simply abstract concepts but in the heart's blood. We may compare what radiates over to us from Krishna with what is regarded as the newest evolutionary phase of the human ascent toward the spiritual heights. Yet there is a significant difference. What we meet with in Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, these most mature thinkers of Christianity, we meet with in a pre-Christian era in the form it had to take then in Krishna. For what is Krishna's revelation? It is something that can never again be repeated whose greatness of its kind and in its own way can never be surpassed. If we have an understanding for such things, we may have a conception, an idea of the strength of that spiritual light that shines over to us, if we let such things affect us as are connected with the culture from which Krishna emerged. If we do this, if we allow words like the following to influence us, 
could take a few examples from the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna indicates in words his real being, we arrive at thoughts, feelings, and emotions that will be characterized later. <clears throat> Thus, in the tenth canto, Krishna speaks as follows, quote, I am the spirit of creation, its beginning, its center, and its end. Among all beings, I am always the noblest of all that has come into being. Among spiritual beings, I am Vishnu. I am the sun among the stars. Among the lights, I am the moon. Among the elements, I am fire. Among the mountains, I am the lofty Meru. Among the water, I am the great cosmic sea. Among the rivers, I am the Ganges. Among the multitude of trees, I am Ashvata. In the true sense of the word, I am the ruler of men and of all the beings that live. Among the serpents, I am the one that is eternal, the very ground of existence itself. End quote. Let us take another example <clears throat> from the same culture which we find in the Vedas. The Divas were gathered around the throne of the Almighty, and in deep reverence they ask who he himself is. Then the Almighty, that is to say the cosmic God in the old Indian sense, answered, quote, If there were another than I, I would describe myself through him. I have been from all eternity, and through all eternity I shall be. I am the primal cause of everything, of all that is in west and east and north and south. I am the cause of all that is in the heights above and in the depths below. I am all. I am more ancient than anything that is. I am the ruler of rulers. I am the truth itself. I am revelation itself and the cause of revelation. I am knowledge. I am piety. I am the law. I am almighty. End quote. And when, as the ancient documents re document records, it was asked what was the cause of all things, the answer was given, quote, The cause of the world, it is fire. It is the sun, and it is also the moon. It is also this true Brahman, and this water, and this highest of all creatures. All moments, and all weeks, and all months, and all centuries, and all millennia, and all millions of years have proceeded from him, have emerged from his radiant personality, which no one can comprehend, neither above nor below, nor in the circumference, nor in the center, here where we stand. End quote. Such words sound over to us from very ancient times, and we surrender ourselves to them. If we approach these words without preconceptions, how do we feel in relation to them? Certain things are said in the words. We have seen that Krishna says something about himself, and things are said about the cosmic God and about cosmic origins. From the tone of these thoughts, as they sound forth through these words, things are said that could never have been expressed in a greater or more significant way. And one knows that they never could have been spoken in a greater or more significant manner. That is to say, something was placed into human evolution that must stand just as it is and be accepted as it is since it has come to a conclusion. And wherever people in later times have thought about such things, and may perhaps have believed in accordance with methods employed in these later times that one thing or another could have been expressed in clearer concepts or could have been modified in one way or another, they have nevertheless been unable to say it better. They have never done so. <clears throat> Indeed, if anyone wished to say something better about precisely these things, it would be sheer presumption. Let us first consider the passage of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna, so to speak, characterizes his own nature. What is he really characterizing? His way of speaking is truly remarkable. He says of his nature that he is the spirit of all that has come into being, that he is among the heavenly spirits Vishnu, among the stars the sun, among the lights the moon, among the elements the fire, and so on. If we wish to paraphrase this and compress it into a formula, we can say that Krishna points to himself as the essence, the entity of all things. He is this entity in such a way that it represents always the purest, the most divine kind of nature. Hence, according to this passage, if we penetrate beyond the actual things and seek to find behind them the nature of their true being, we arrive at the being of Krishna. If we take a number of plants of the same species and look for the entity of this species, which is not in itself visible, but comes to expression in the single plant forms, and ask what lies behind them as their essence, the answer is Krishna. But we must not think of this being as identical with any single plant, but must think of him as the highest and purest element in the form. Thus we have not only what the essence is, but this essence in its highest, noblest, purest form. So of what is Krishna actually speaking? 
of nothing else but what a man can recognize as his own essence when he sinks into himself, not his being as it appears to him in ordinary life, but something that lies behind man and the human soul as they manifest themselves in life. He speaks of the human essence that is within us because the true human essence is at one with the universe. This is by no means a knowledge that works egotistically within Krishna. It is something in Krishna that wishes to point to the highest in man, something that may perceive itself as identical and at one with what lives as being in all things. Just as we speak today for our own age, so Krishna spoke to his own age of what he had in mind for his culture. If today we look into our own being, we first of all glimpse the ego as you will find it pictured in the book Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and its Attainment. We distinguish the ordinary ego from the higher supersensible ego, which does not appear in the world of sense. This supersensible ego appears in such a manner that it is not only in us, but is at the same time poured out over the being of all things. So when we speak of our higher ego, the higher being dwelling in man, we do not speak of what a man says when he says in his customary manner, I am, although in our language it has the same sound. In Krishna's mouth it would not have had the same sound. He is speaking of the nature of the human soul as it would have been interpreted in that day, in the same way as we today speak of the ego. How did it come about that Krishna expresses something that is so similar to what we express when we speak of the highest of which we have knowledge? This was possible because the culture out of which Krishna emerged was preceded by thousands of years by a clairvoyant culture, because human beings were accustomed to rising to clairvoyant vision when they looked into the being of things. And we can understand a language such as resounds here to us from the Bhagavad Gita when we look upon it as the close of the old clairvoyant view of the world, when we recognize that when a man in those ancient times passed into the intermediate state between sleeping and waking, that was at that time common to all human beings, he was not placed among things in such a way that they were here and he was outside them, as is the case in ordinary sense perception. He felt himself poured out over all things, felt himself in all beings and at one with them. It was with the best of things that he felt himself to be at one, and his best was in all things. And if you do not start out from an abstract feeling and an abstract perception, in the way customary with men of the present time, but rather start out from the old way of feeling and perception, as we have just characterized them, then you will understand such words as resound over to us from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. If then you ask how men with the old clairvoyance perceived themselves, you will understand them and realize that in the same way that a man, when his etheric body is freed through spiritual scientific training, feels himself spread and poured out into what lives in everything, so did the man of former times experience this as a natural condition, although not in the same way as would now be the case as the result of spiritual scientific training. Ancient, man felt them, excuse me, ancient men felt themselves to be inside things, and this condition came about by itself, without their volition. And when these revelations were shaped into forms, and what had been seen was expressed in beautiful, wonderful words, then something appeared like, for example, these revelations of Krishna. For this reason it could also be said that Krishna spoke to his fellow men in this way, quote, I wish to proclaim in words what the best of us have perceived when they were in the supersensible worlds, and how the best of us have perceived their relationship to the world. In future times, such men as these will no longer be found, and you yourselves cannot be as your ancestors were. I wish to put into words what these ancestors perceived, so that it will endure, because humanity can no longer possess this as a natural condition. End quote. Thus, something which had belonged to mankind for thousands of years was brought in words such as were possible at that time in the form of the revelations of Krishna, so that mankind in subsequent ages might possess this revelation of what they were no longer able to perceive for themselves. Other sayings can also be interpreted in a similar manner. Let us suppose that at a period when Krishna was giving his revelations, a pupil had stood before his initiate teacher and asked him, quote, What lies behind the things which my eyes see? Can you, my initiated teacher, tell me? 
unquote. The initiated teacher might well have answered, quote, Behind those things which are now seen by your external material eyes lies the spiritual, the supersensible. But in former times men could still see the supersensible while they were in their normal condition. They were able to look into the nearest supersensible world, the etheric world that borders on our material world. Here in this world is to be found the cause of everything that is material, and these men of old were able to see what this cause is. In our time I can do no more than express in words what could in earlier times be seen. Quote, it is fire, it is the sun, unquote. but not the sun as it now appears. I'm still in the quotes, smaller, uh, the larger quotes. But not the sun as it now appears. For what can now be seen by the eye, E-Y-E, was precisely what for ancient clairvoyance could least of all be seen. The white, fiery globe of the sun was darkness for them, while the effects of the sun were spread over all space. The radiations and the sun's aura in many colored light pictures flowed in and out of each other, coming forth from each other, in such a way that when they merged into things they became immediately creative light. It is the sun. It is also the moon, though this too was seen in, in a different manner, for pure Brahman is altogether in it. End quote. What is pure Brahman? When we breathe in the air and breathe it out again, the materialistic person believes he is only inhaling oxygen. But that is a delusion. With every breath we inhale and exhale spirit. The spirit that lives in the air we breathe penetrates into us and goes out from us again. And when an old clairvoyant saw that, he did not, like the materialist, believe that he was breathing in oxygen. That is a materialistic prejudice. The clairvoyant of ancient times was aware that the etheric element of the spirit, Brahman, from whom all life comes, was being inhaled. In the same way that today we believe that life comes from the oxygen in the air, so did ancient man know that life comes from Brahman, and in that he takes up Brahman, he lives. The purest Brahman is the source of our life. <clears throat> and of what nature are the conceptual heights to which this very ancient, this ether-like, light-like wisdom aspires? Today people believe they are able to think with great sub subtlety. But when we see how people jumble up everything in a higgledy-piggledy way as soon as they try to explain something, then we lose all respect for the thinking of today, especially for its logical thinking. At this point I really must engage in a short discussion that may seem abstract. I shall make it as short as possible. Let us suppose that we encounter an animal that has a mane and is yellow, then we call this animal a lion. Now we begin to ask, what is a lion? The answer, a beast of prey. Next we ask, what is a beast of prey? Answer, a mammal. We ask further, what is a mammal? Answer, a living creature. And so we continue describing one thing through another. Most people believe they are being very lucid when they go on asking ever more questions in the same way as they asked about the lion, the mammal, and so on. And people often ask similar questions about spiritual matters, even about the highest spiritual things, in just the same way as they ask what a lion is, what a beast of prey is, and the rest. And at the end of lectures, when slips of paper are handed in with questions, questions such as these are asked countless numbers of times. For example, what is God? How did the world begin? How will the world end? There are many people who have no wish to know anything at all beyond these questions. They ask them in just the way as they in just the same way as they ask, What is a lion? and so on. People think that what is valid for everyday life must also be equally valid for the highest things. They do not take into consideration that it is just the highest things that are of such a nature that we cannot ask such questions about them. If we proceed from one thing to another, from the lion to the beast of prey, and so on, we must eventually come to something that cannot be described in this way, when there is no longer any sense in asking, What is this? For in this kind of questioning a predicate is sought for the subject. But when we reach the highest being, this being can be comprehended only through itself. From a logical point of view, it is absolutely meaningless to ask the question, what is God? Everything can be led upward to the highest, but to the highest no predicate can be added, for the answer would have to be God is ellipsis. And God would then have to be described in terms of something higher, so the question itself would involve the strangest contradiction possible. 
The fact that this question is still invariably asked today shows how highly exalted Krishna was when he appeared in a very early epoch and spoke as follows, quote, The divas gather around the throne of the Almighty and in deep devotion ask who he himself is. Then he answers, small quote, If there were anyone else other than I myself, I should describe myself through him. End quote, end all quote. But this he does not do. do. He does not describe himself through another. And so we also, as we could say, like the divas, are led in devotion and humility to this ancient and holy culture and admire its grandiose logical elevation, which it did not achieve through thinking, but through the old clairvoyance. In those times people knew at once that when they reached the causes, then questioning must cease. The causes must be perceived. At this point we stand in admiration, in front of what has come down to us from those very ancient times, as though the spirits who transmitted it to us wished to say to us, the times have gone when men could see directly into the spiritual worlds, nor will they be able to do so in the future. But we wish to record what we can aspire to, something that at one time was granted to human clairvoyance. So we find recorded in the Bhagavad Gita and in the Vedas all those things that were brought together by Krishna as in a kind of conclusion. Such things cannot be surpassed, though they will be perceived again when clairvoyance is renewed. But they will never be perceived through those faculties that have been attained by men in subsequent times. For this reason, it is always correct to say that if we remain within the realm of contemporary culture, an external culture whose content is determined by sense perception, we shall never again attain to that ancient sacred revelation which found its conclusion in Krishna unless it is attained through a trained clairvoyance. But through its own evolution, through spiritual science, the soul can again raise itself and attain it again. What was at one time given to man in a normal way, if I can express myself in this way, is not now given to mankind in ordinary life and it cannot be attained by him under natural conditions. It is for this reason that these truths came down to us. When there are thinkers like Fichte, Schelling and Hegel, who reached the highest possible purity in their thinking. Then we can meet with these things again, not indeed as life-filled as they were, nor with the direct personal impact of Krishna, but in the form of ideas, though never in the way in which they were understood in the time of the old clairvoyance. And, as I have often stated, it was a spiritual necessity that the old clairvoyance should slowly and gradually die out in the post-Atlantean era. If we look back to the ancient Indian civilization, the first post-Atlantean cultural period, we may say that no records are extant from this epoch, for at that time men still could see into the spiritual world. Only the Akasha Chronicle can there be rediscovered. Let me read that again. Only through the Akasha Chronicle can there be rediscovered what was then revealed to mankind. It was a lofty revelation. But then mankind sank down lower and lower. In the old Persian epoch, the second post-Atlantean cultural period, though the revelations still continued, they had lost their original purity. They were still less pure in the third cultural period, that of ancient Egypt. If we wish to visualize what were the real conditions of the time, we must bear in mind that as far as the first cultural epochs are concerned, no records exist, and this is true for all the peoples of that age, whether or not a cultural epoch has been called after them. If we speak of the ancient Indian culture, we are referring to a culture from which nothing has come down to us in writing. It is just the same with the primeval Persian culture. Written records exist only from the Egyptian, Babylonian, Chaldean culture, which belongs to the third cultural period. But during the period of the unfolding of the primeval Persian culture, within Indian culture there was a second Indian period running parallel to the old Persian. And yet a third period began in India, contemporary with the Egyptian Babylonian Chaldean culture. And it was during this period that the first written records began to be kept. These first records date from the latter part of this third culture. Such records are, for example, those contained in the Vedas, which then penetrated into external life. It is these records which also speak of Krishna. So no one should believe when he speaks of written records that they go back to the first Indian cultural epoch. 
Everything contained in the documents are records first written down in the third period of ancient India, for the reason that precisely in the third period the old clairvoyance was dying out more and more. These are the records assembled around the person of Krishna. Thus ancient India tells us something that can be externally investigated. If we examine things fundamentally, everything agrees with what can be discovered in the external documents. As the third world age came to an end and men lost what they had originally possessed, Krishna appeared on the scene to preserve what otherwise would have been lost. When tradition says that Krishna appeared in the third world age, what age is meant by this? This age is what we call the egypto chaldean cultural epoch. The Indian oriental teaching of Krishna accords precisely with what we have been characterizing. When the old clairvoyance and all its treasures were on the point of being lost, then Krishna appeared and revealed them so that they could be preserved into later times. Thus Krishna is the conclusion of something great and powerful, and everything that has been said here over the years agrees entirely with what is given also in the Oriental documents if we read them rightly. <clears throat> it is pure nonsense to talk in this context of quote, Occidental unquote, and quote, Oriental unquote, because this is only a matter of language, of vocabulary. What is important is that we speak with a full understanding of that which we proclaim. And the more you go into what has been given out over the years, the more you will see that it is an incomplete that, excuse me, the more you will see that it is in complete agreement with all the documents of the Orient. So Krishna stands there as a conclusion. Then a few centuries later comes the Buddha. In what sense is the Buddha, if we may so express it, the other pole of this conclusion? In what relation does the Buddha stand to Krishna? Let us place before our souls what we have just spoken of as characteristic of Krishna, great, powerful, clairvoyant revelations of primordial ages, couched in such words that men of future times will be able to understand and feel and sense in them the ancient clairvoyance of humanity. Krishna's revelation, as he stands before us, is something that men can accept and can say to each other that herein is contained the wisdom of the spiritual world that lies behind the sense world, the world of causes and spiritual facts. This wisdom is expressed in great powerful words in Krishna's revelations. If we immerse ourselves in the Vedas, in all that we can sum up in conclusion as the revelation of Krishna, then we may say that this is the world in which man is at home, the world that lies behind what our eyes can see, our ears hear, our hands grasp, and so on. Yes, the human soul belongs to the world revealed by Krishna. How could the human soul itself feel in the course of sub subsequent centuries? It could perceive how these marvelous revelations of an older time spoke about the true spiritual celestial home of mankind. It could then look into all that surrounded it. It saw with eyes, heard with ears, grasped things with a sense of touch. It could think with the intellect about things, the intellect that never penetrates into the spiritual element proclaimed in the revelation of Krishna. And the soul could say to itself, quote, There is an ancient holy teaching from times past which tells of a world, <clears throat> our spiritual home, which lies all around us, around that world which is all that we now recognize. We no longer live in that spiritual home. We have been expelled from that world of which Krishna spoke so magnificently. Unquote. Then comes the Buddha. How does he speak of the marvels of the world spoken of by Krishna to human souls? which could perceive only what eyes can see and ears hear. He says, quote, Certainly you live in the world of the senses. The yearning that drives you from incarnation to incarnation has led you into this world. But I am telling you of that path which can lead you out of this world and into that world of which Krishna spoke. I am telling you about the path through which you will be redeemed from the world that is not the world of Krishna, unquote. Buddha's teaching in these later centuries resounds like a kind of nostalgia for the world of Krishna. In this respect, the Buddha seems to us like the last successor of Krishna, as Krishna's successor who had to come. And if the Buddha himself had spoken of Krishna, how would he have been able to speak about him? He would have said something like this, quote, I have come to proclaim to you again the greater one who was my predecessor. Turn your mind backward to the Krishna who is greater than I, and you will see what you can attain if you leave this world which is not your true spiritual home. 
I will show you the path by which you can redeem yourselves from the world of sense. I lead you back to Krishna. Unquote. The Buddha would have, could have spoken in this way, but he did not use these exact words. Nevertheless, he did say them in a somewhat different form when he said, quote, In the world in which you live there is suffering, there is suffering, there is suffering, birth is suffering, age is suffering, illness is suffering, death is suffering. To be apart from that which one loves is suffering. To be bound to that which one does not love is suffering. The longing for that which one loves but may not attain is suffering, end quote. And so he gave his eightfold path. It was a teaching that did not go beyond that of Krishna because, in fact, it was the same teaching as the one given by Krishna. Quote, I have come after him who is greater than I, and I will show you the way back to him who is greater than I, unquote. These are the world historical tones that ring forth to us from the land of the Ganges. <clears throat> now let us go a little further toward the west and place once more before our souls the figure of the Baptist and remember the words that the Buddha could have spoken. Quote, I have come after Krishna who is greater than I and I will show you the way back to him away from the world bereft of the divine of which Krishna spoke. Turn your minds backward. Unquote. Now consider the figure of the Baptist. How did he speak? How did he express his views? How did he express the facts he had received from the spiritual world? He too pointed to another, but he did not say as the Buddha could have said, I have come after him. On the contrary, he said, quote, After me there will come one greater than I. Unquote. Mark chapter 1, verse 7. This is what the Baptist said. Nor did he say, quote, Here in the world is suffering, and I wish to lead you to something that is not of this world. Unquote. No. He said, quote, change your way of thinking. Do not continue to look backward, but look forward. When he comes, who is greater than I, the time will be fulfilled. Then the divine world will enter into the world of suffering, and what was lost of the revelations of past times will enter in a new way into human souls. End quote. Matthew chapter 5, verse 2. So the successor of Krishna is the Buddha, and John the Baptist is the forerunner of Christ Jesus. Thus everything is reversed. We are faced with the six hundred years that elapsed between these two events, and we have before us the two comets with their nuclei, the one comet pointing backward with Krishna as nucleus, together with the one who leads men backward, the Buddha. Then we have the other comet pointing forward with Christ as its nucleus, together with him who stands before us as the forerunner. If, in the best sense, you recognize the Buddha as the successor of Krishna and John the Baptist as the foreigner of Christ Jesus, then this formula expresses in the simplest way what took place in human evolution around the time of the mystery of Golgotha. It is in this way that we should look at things, and then we can understand them. <clears throat> All this has no bearing on any religious confession, nor should it be linked with any particular religion. These are facts of world history. No one who understands them in their innermost depths can present them or will ever present them in a different way. Do such statements impair in any way any revelation ever given to mankind? It is curious that it is sometimes said that we assign in some way a higher place to Christianity than to other religions. Do such words as higher or deeper have any meaning in this context? Are not such words as higher or lower, larger or smaller the most abstract words we can use? Are we praising Krishna any less than do those who put him higher than Christ? We refrain from using such words as higher or less high and wish only to characterize these matters in accordance with the truth. It is not a matter of whether we place Christianity higher or lower, but whether we characterize in the right way what belongs to Krishna. Look up all that has been said about Krishna and ask yourselves whether anyone else has ever said anything about Krishna higher than what has been presented here. Everything else is idle talk. But truth comes to light when there begins to be active that feeling for truth that goes to the essence of things. Here, when we are characterizing the simplest and grandest of the Gospels, we have the opportunity of studying the whole position of the Christ as a cosmic and earthly being. It was therefore necessary to go into the greatness of what came to its conclusion centuries before the mystery of Golgotha, in which the new morning glow of the future of humanity dawned. The end of Lecture 5 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com This is a reading of the Bhagavad Gita. 
and uh, I do apologize for my attempt at the pronunciation of some of these names. Number one, the war within. Dritta Rashtra. O Sanjaya, tell me what happened at Kurukshetra, the field of Dharma, where my family and the Pandavas gathered to fight. Sanjaya. Having surveyed the forces of the Pandavas, arrayed for battle, Prince Duryodhana approached his teacher Drona and said, O oh, my teacher, look at this mighty army of the Pandavas assembled by your own gifted disciple Yudhishthira. There are heroic warriors and great archers who are equals of Bhima and Arjuna, Yuyudana, Virata, the mighty Drupada, Drish, Taketu, Chakitana, the valiant king of Kashi, Purujit, Kuntiboja, the great leader Shaibya, the powerful Yudamanyu, the valiant Uta Maujas, and the son of Subhadra, in addition to the sons of Draupadi. All these command mighty chariots. O best of Brahmins, listen to the names of those who are distinguished among our own forces, Bhishma, Karana, and the victorious Kripa, Ash, Fatama, Vikarna, and the son of Zomadatta. There are many others too, heroes giving up their lives for my sake, all proficient in war and armed with a variety of weapons. Our army is unlimited and commanded by Bhishma. Theirs is small and commanded by Bhima. Let everyone take his proper place and stand firm supporting Bhishma. Then the powerful Bhishma, the grandsire, oldest of all the Kurus, in order to cheer Duryodhana, roared like a lion and blew his conch horn. And after Bhishma, a tremendous noise arose of conches and cow horns and pounding on drums. Then Sri Krishna and Arjuna, who were standing in a mighty chariot yoked with white horses, blew their divine conches. Sri Krishna blew the conch named Panchajanya, and Arjuna blew that called Devadatta. The mighty Bhima blew the huge conch Pondra. Yudhishthira, the son, excuse me, the king, the son of Kunti, blew the conch Adanta Vijaya. Nakula and Sahadeva blew their conches as well. Then the king of Kashi, the leading bowman, the great warrior Shikhandi, Drish Tadyomna, Virata, the invincible Satyaki, Drupada, all the sons of Draupadi and the strong-armed son of Zubhadra joined in. And the noise tore through the heart of Duryodhana's army. Indeed, the sound was tumultuous, echoing throughout heaven and earth. Then, O Dhritarashtra, Lord of the earth, having seen your son's forces set in their places and the fighting about to begin, Arjuna spoke these words to Sri Krishna. Arjuna, O Krishna, drive my chariot between the two armies. I want to see those who desire to fight with me. With whom will this battle be fought? I want to see those assembled to fight for Duryodhana, those who seek to please the evil-minded son of Dhritarashtra by engaging in war. Sanjaya Thus Arjuna spoke, and Sri Krishna, driving his splendid chariot between the two armies, facing Bhishma and Drona and all the kings of the earth, said, Arjuna, behold all the Kurus gathered together. And Arjuna, standing between the two armies, saw fathers and grandfathers, teachers, uncles and brothers, sons and grandsons, in-laws and friends. Seeing his kinsmen established in opposition, Arjuna was overcome by sorrow. Despairing, he spoke these words. Arjuna, O Krishna, I see my own relations here anxious to fight, and my limbs grow weak. My mouth is dry, my body shakes, and my hair is standing on end. My skin burns, and the bow Gandiva has slipped from my hand. I am unable to stand. My mind seems to be whirling. These signs bode evil for us. I do not see that any good can come from killing our relations in battle. O Krishna, I have no desire for victory, or for a kingdom or pleasures. Of what use is a kingdom or pleasure, or even life, 
if those for whose sake we desire these things, teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, in-laws, grandsons, and others with family ties, are engaging in this battle, renouncing their wealth and their lives. Even if they were to kill me, I would not want to kill them, not even to become ruler of the three worlds. How much less for the earth alone? O Krishna, what satisfaction could we find in killing Dhritarashtra's sons? We would become sinners by slaying these men, even though they are evil. The sons of Dhritarashtra are related to us, therefore we should not kill them. How can we gain happiness by killing members of our own family? Though they are overpowered by greed and see no evil in destroying families or injuring friends, we see these evils. Why shouldn't we turn away from this sin? When a family declines, ancient traditions are destroyed. With them are lost the spiritual foundations for life, and the family loses its sense of unity. Where there is no sense of unity, the women of the family become corrupt, and with the corruption of its women, society is plunged into chaos. Social chaos is hell for the family and for those who have destroyed the family as well. It disrupts the process of spiritual evolution begun by our ancestors. The timeless spiritual foundations of family and society would be destroyed by these terrible deeds which violate the unity of life. It is said that those whose family dharma has been destroyed dwell in hell. This is a great sin. We are prepared to kill our own relations out of greed for the pleasures of a kingdom. Better for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, were to attack me in battle and kill me unarmed and unresisting. Sanjaya, overwhelmed by sorrow, Arjuna spoke these words, and casting away his bow and his arrows, he sat down in his chariot in the middle of the battlefield. Number 2 Self-realization. Sanjaya. These are the words that Sri Krishna spoke to the despairing Arjuna, whose eyes were burning with tears of pity and confusion. Krishna. This despair and weakness in a time of crisis are mean and unworthy of you, Arjuna. How have you fallen into a state so far from the path to liberation? It does not become you to yield to this weakness. Arise with a brave heart, and destroy the enemy. Arjuna How can I ever bring myself to fight against Bhishma and Drona, who are worthy of reverence? How can I, Krishna? Surely surely it would be better to spend my life begging than to kill these great and worthy souls. If I killed them, every pleasure I found would be tainted. I don't even know which would be better, for us to conquer them or for them to conquer us. The sons of Dhritarashtra have confronted us, but why would we care to live if we killed them? My will is paralyzed, and I am utterly confused. Tell me which is the better path for me. Let me be your disciple. I have fallen at your feet. Give me instruction. What can overcome a sorrow that saps all my vitality? Even power over men and gods or the wealth of an empire seem empty. Sanjaya This is how Arjuna, the great warrior, spoke to Sri Krishna. With the words, O Krishna, I will not fight, he fell silent. As they stood between the two armies, Sri Krishna smiled and replied to Arjuna, who had sunk into despair. Krishna You speak sincerely, but your sorrow has no cause. The wise grieve neither for the living nor for the dead. There has never been a time when you and I and the kings gathered here have not existed nor will there be a time when we will cease to exist. As the same person inhabits the body through childhood, youth, and old age, so too at the time of death he attains another body. The wise are not deluded by these changes. When the senses contact sense objects, a person experiences cold or heat, pleasure or pain. These experiences are fleeting, they come and go. Bear them patiently, Arjuna. Those who are unaffected by these changes, who are the same in pleasure and pain, are truly wise and fit for immortality. Assert your strength and realize this. The impermanent has no reality. Reality lies in the eternal. Those who have seen the boundary between these two have attained the end of all knowledge. 
realize that which pervades the universe and is indestructible. No power can affect this unchanging, imperishable reality. The body is mortal, but that which dwells in the body is immortal and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight in this battle. One believes he is the slayer, another believes he is the slain. Both are ignorant. There is neither slayer nor slain. You were never born, you will never die, you have never changed, you can never change. Unborn, eternal, immutable, immemorial, you do not die when the body dies. Realizing that which is indestructible, eternal, unborn and unchanging, how can you slay or cause another to slay? As one abandons worn-out clothes and acquires new ones, so when the body is worn out a new one is acquired by the self who lives within. The self cannot be pierced by weapons or burned by fire. Water cannot wet it, nor can the wind dry it. The self cannot be pierced or burned, made wet or dry. It is everlasting and infinite, standing on the motionless foundations of eternity. The self is unmanifested, beyond all thought, beyond all change. Knowing this, you should not grieve. O mighty Arjuna, even if you believe the self to be subject to birth and death, you should not grieve. Death is inevitable for the living. Birth is inevitable for the dead. Since these are unavoidable, you should not sorrow. Every creature is unmanifested at first and then attains manifestation. When its end has come, it once again becomes unmanifested. What is there to lament in this? The glory of the self is beheld by a few, and a few describe it, a few listen, but many without understanding. The self of all beings, living within the body, is eternal and cannot be harmed. Therefore, do not grieve. Considering your dharma, you should not vacillate. For a warrior, nothing is higher than a war against evil. The warrior confronted with such a war should be pleased, Arjuna, for it comes as an open gate to heaven. But if you do not participate in this battle against evil, you will incur sin, violating your dharma and your honor. The story of your dishonor will be repeated endlessly, and for a man of honor, dishonor is worse than death. These brave warriors will think you have withdrawn from battle out of fear, and those who formerly esteemed you will treat you with disrespect. Your enemies will ridicule your strength and say things that should not be said. What could be more painful than this? Death means the attainment of heaven. Victory means the enjoyment of the earth. Therefore rise up, Arjuna, resolved to fight. Having made yourself alike in pain and pleasure, profit and loss, victory and defeat, engage in this great battle and you will be freed from sin. You have heard the intellectual explanation of Sankhya Arjuna. Now listen to the principles of yoga. By practicing these you can break through the bonds of karma. On this path, effort never goes to waste and there is no failure. Even a little effort towards spiritual awareness will protect you from the greatest fear. Those who follow this path, resolving deep within themselves to seek me alone, attain singleness of purpose. For those who lack resolution, the decisions of life are many-branched and endless. There are ignorant people who speak flowery words and take delight in the letter of the law, saying that there is nothing else. Their hearts are full of selfish desires, Arjuna. Their idea of heaven is their own enjoyment, and the aim of all their activities is pleasure and power. The fruit of their actions is continual rebirth. Those whose minds are swept away by the pursuit of pleasure and power are incapable of following the supreme goal and will not attain samadhi. The scriptures describe the three gunas, but you should be free from the action of the gunas established in eternal truth, self-controlled, without any sense of duality or the desire to acquire and hoard. Just as a reservoir is of little use when the whole countryside is flooded, Scriptures are of little use to the illuminated man or woman who sees the Lord everywhere. You have the right to work, but never to the fruit of work. You should never engage in action for the sake of reward, nor should you long for inaction. Perform work in this world, Arjuna, as a man established within himself without selfish attachments, 
and alike in success and defeat, for yoga is perfect evenness of mind. Seek refuge in the attitude of detachment, and you will amass the wealth of spiritual awareness. Those who are motivated only by desire for the fruits of action are miserable, for they are constantly anxious about the results of what they do. When consciousness is unified, however, all vain anxiety is left behind. There is no cause for worry, whether things go well or ill. Therefore devote yourself to the disciplines of yoga, for yoga is skill in action. The wise unify their consciousness and abandon attachment to the fruits of action, which binds a person to continual rebirth. Thus they attain a state beyond all evil. When your mind has overcome the confusion of duality, you will attain the state of holy indifference to things you hear and things you have heard. When you are unmoved by the confusion of ideas, and your mind is completely united in deep samadhi, you will attain the state of perfect yoga. Arjuna Tell me of those who live established in wisdom, ever aware of the Self, O Krishna. How do they talk? How sit? How move about? Krishna They live in wisdom who see themselves in all and all in them, who have renounced every selfish desire and sense craving and sense craving tormenting the heart. Neither agitated by grief nor hankering after pleasure, they live free from lust and fear and anger. Established in meditation, they are truly wise. Fettered no more by selfish attachments, they are neither elated by good fortune nor depressed by bad. Such are the seers. Even as a tortoise draws in its limbs, the wise can draw in their senses at will. Aspirants abstain from sense pleasures, but they still crave for them. These cravings all disappear when they see the highest goal. Even of those who tread the path, the stormy senses can sweep off the mind. They live in wisdom who subdue their senses and keep their minds ever absorbed in me. When you keep thinking about sense objects, attachment comes. Attachment breeds desire, the lust of possession that burns to anger. Anger clouds the judgment. You can no longer learn from past mistakes. Lost is the power to choose between what is wise and what is unwise, and your life is utter waste. But when you move amidst the world of sense, free from attachment and aversion alike, there comes the peace in which all sorrows end, and you live in the wisdom of the self. The disunited mind is far from wise. How can it meditate? How be at peace? When you know no peace, how can you know joy? When you let your mind follow the call of the senses, they carry away your better judgment as storms drive a boat off its charted course on the sea. Use all your power to free the senses from attachment and aversion alike and live in the full wisdom of the self. Such a sage awakes to light in the night of all creatures. That which the world calls day is the night of ignorance to the wise. As rivers flow into the ocean but cannot make the vast ocean overflow, so flow the streams of the sense world into the sea of peace that is the sage. But this is not so with the desirer of desires. They are forever free who renounce all selfish desires and break away from the ego cage of capital I, me, and mine to be united with the Lord. This is the supreme state. Attain to this and pass from death to immortality. The end of part two. Section three. Selfless service. Arjuna. O Krishna, you have said that knowledge is greater than action. Why then do you ask me to wage this terrible war? Your advice seems inconsistent. Give me one path to follow to the supreme good. Krishna. At the beginning of time I declared two paths for the pure heart. Jnana Yoga, the contemplative path of spiritual wisdom, and Karma Yoga, the active path of selfless service. One who shirks action does not attain freedom. No one can gain perfection by abstaining from work. Indeed, there is no one who rests for even an instant. All creatures are driven to action by their own nature. Those who abstain from action while allowing the mind to dwell on sensual pleasure 
cannot be called sincere spiritual aspirants. But they excel who control their senses through the mind, using them for selfless service. Fulfill all your duties. Action is better than inaction. Even to maintain your body, Arjuna, you are obliged to act. Selfish action imprisons the world. Act selflessly, without any thought of personal profit. At the beginning, mankind and the obligation of selfless service were created together. Through selfless service you will always be fruitful and find the fulfillment of your desires. This is the promise of the Creator. Honor and cherish the devas as they honor and cherish you. Through this honor and love you will attain the supreme good. All human desires are fulfilled by the devas who are pleased by selfless service. But anyone who enjoys the things given by the devas without offering selfless acts in return is a thief. The spiritually minded who eat in the spirit of service are freed from all their sins. But the selfish who prepare food for their own satisfaction eat sin. Living creatures are nourished by food, and food is nourished by rain. Rain itself is the water of life which comes from selfless worship and service. Every selfless act, Arjuna, is born from Brahman, the eternal, infinite Godhead. Brahman is present in every act of service. All life turns on this law, O Arjuna. Those who violate it, indulging the senses for their own pleasure and ignoring the needs of others, have wasted their life. But those who realize the self are always satisfied. Having found the source of joy and fulfillment, they no longer seek happiness from the external world. They have nothing to gain or lose by any action. Neither people nor things can affect their security. Strive constantly to serve the welfare of the world. By devotion to selfless work one attains the supreme goal of life. Do your work with the welfare of others always in mind. It was by such work that Janaka attained perfection. Others too have followed this path. What the outstanding person does, others will try to do. The standards such people create will be followed by the whole world. There is nothing in the three worlds for me to gain, Arjuna, nor is there anything I do not have. I continue to act, but I am not driven by my need, by any need of my own. If I ever refrained from continuous work, everyone would immediately follow my example. If I stopped working, I would be the cause of cosmic chaos, and finally of the destruction of this world and these people. The ignorant work for their own profit, Arjuna. The wise work for the welfare of the world, without thought for themselves. By abstaining from work you will confuse the ignorant who are engrossed in their actions. Perform all work carefully, guided by compassion. All actions are performed by the gunas of prakriti. Deluded by identification with the ego, a person thinks, I am the doer. But the illumined man or woman understands the domain of the gunas and is not attached. Such people know that the gunas interact with each other, they do not claim to be the doer. Those who are deluded by the operation of the gunas become attached to the results of their action. Those who understand these truths should not unsettle the ignorant. Performing all actions for my sake, completely absorbed in the self and without expectations, fight, but stay free from the fever of the ego. Those who live in accordance with these divine laws, without complaining, firmly established in faith, are released from karma. Those who violate these laws, criticizing and complaining, are utterly deluded and are the cause of their own suffering. Even the wise act within the limitations of their own nature. Every creature is subject to prakriti. What is the use of repression? The senses have been conditioned by attraction to the pleasant and aversion to the unpleasant. Do not be ruled by them. They are obstacles in your path. It is better to strive in one's own dharma than to succeed in the dharma of another. Nothing is ever lost in following one's own dharma, but competition in another's dharma breeds fear and insecurity. Arjuna What is the force that binds us to selfish deeds, O Krishna? What power moves us, even against our will, as if forcing us? Krishna it is selfish desire and anger. 
arising from the guna of rajas. These are the appetites and evils which threaten a person in this life. Just as a fire is covered by smoke and a mirror is obscured by dust, just as the embryo rests deep within the womb, knowledge is hidden by selfish desire, hidden, Arjuna, by this unquenchable fire for self-satisfaction, the inveterate enemy of the wise. Selfish desires found in the senses, mind and intellect, misleading them and burying the understanding in delusion. Fight with all your strength, Arjuna, Controlling your senses, conquer your enemy, the destroyer of knowledge and realization. The senses are higher than the body, the mind higher than the senses. Above the mind is the intellect, and above the intellect is the Atman. Thus knowing that which is supreme, let the Atman rule the ego. Use your mighty arms to slay the fierce enemy that is selfish desire. The End of Discourse 3 Discourse 4. Wisdom in Action Krishna I told this eternal secret to Vivasvat. Vivasvat taught Manu, and Manu taught Ikshvaku. Thus, Arjuna, eminent sages received knowledge of yoga in a continuous tradition. But through time the practice of yoga was lost in the world. The secret of these teachings is profound. I have explained them to you today because you are my friend and devotee. Arjuna, you were born much after Vivasvat. He lived very long ago. Why do you say that you taught this yoga in the beginning? Krishna, you and I have passed through many births, Arjuna. You have forgotten, but I remember them all. My true being is unborn and changeless. I am the Lord who dwells in every creature. Through the power of my own maya, I manifest myself in a finite form. Whenever dharma declines and the purpose of life is forgotten, I manifest myself on earth. I am born in every age to protect the good, to destroy evil, and to re-establish dharma. Those who know me as their own divine self break through the belief that they are the body and are not reborn as separate creatures. Such a one, Arjuna, is united with me. Delivered from selfish attachment, fear and anger, filled with me, surrendering themselves to me, purified in the fire of my being, many have reached the state of unity in me. As they approach me, so I receive them. All paths, Arjuna, lead to me. Those desiring success in their actions worship the gods. Through action in the world of mortals their desires are quickly fulfilled. The distinctions of caste, guna, and karma have come from me. I am their cause, but I myself am changeless and beyond all action. Actions do not cling to me because I am not attached to their results. Those who understand this and practice it live in freedom. Knowing this truth, aspirants desiring liberation in ancient times engaged in action. You too can do the same, pursuing an active life in the manner of those ancient sages. What is action and what is inaction? This question has confused the greatest sages. I will give you the secret of action with which you can free yourself from bondage. The true nature of action is difficult to grasp. You must understand what is action and what is inaction and what kind of action should be avoided. The wise see that there is action in the midst of inaction and inaction in the midst of action. Their consciousness is unified and every act is done with complete awareness. The awakened sages call a person wise when all his undertakings are free from anxiety about results, all his selfish desires have been consumed in the fire of knowledge. The wise, ever satisfied, have abandoned all external supports. Their security is unaffected by the results of their actions. Even while acting, they really do nothing at all. Free from expectations and from all sense of possession, with mind and body firmly controlled by the self, they do not incur sin by the performance of physical action. They live in freedom who have gone beyond the dualities of life. Competing with no one, They are alike in success and failure and content with whatever comes to them. They are free without selfish attachments. Their minds are fixed in knowledge. 
They perform all work in the spirit of service, and their karma is dissolved. The process of off the process of offering is Brahman. That which is offered is Brahman. Brahman offers the sacrifice in the fire of Brahman. Brahman is attained by those who see Brahman in every action. Some aspirants offer material sacrifices to the gods. Others offer selfless service as sacrifice in the fire of Brahman. Some renounce all enjoyment of the senses, sacrificing them in the fire of sense restraint. Others partake of sense objects, but offer them in service through the fire of the senses. Some offer the workings of the senses and the vital forces through the fire of self-control kindled in the path of knowledge. Some offer wealth, others offer sense restraint and suffering. Some take vows and offer knowledge and study of the scriptures, and some make the offering of meditation. Some offer the forces of vitality, regulating their inhalation and exhalation, and thus gain control over these forces. Others offer the forces of vitality through restraint of their senses. All these understand the meaning of service and will be cleansed of their impurities. True sustenance is in service, and through it a man or woman reaches the eternal Brahman. But those who do not seek to serve are without a home in this world, Arjuna. Uh, are without a home in this world. Arjuna, how can they be at home in any world to come? These offerings are born of work and each guides mankind along a path to Brahman. Understanding this you will attain liberation. The offering of wisdom is better than any material offering, Arjuna, for the goal of all work is spiritual wisdom. Approach those who have realized the purpose of life and question them with reverence and devotion. They will instruct you in this wisdom. Once you attain it, you will never again be deluded. You will see all creatures in the self and all in me. Even if you were the most sinful of sinners, Arjuna, you could cross beyond all sin by the raft of spiritual wisdom. As the heat of a fire reduces wood to ashes, the fire of knowledge burns to ashes all karma. Nothing in this world purifies like spiritual wisdom. It is the perfection achieved in time through the path of yoga, the path which leads to the self within. Those who take wisdom as their highest goal, whose faith is deep and whose senses are trained, attain wisdom quickly and enter into perfect peace. But the ignorant, indecisive and lacking in faith waste their lives. They can never be happy in this world or any other. Those established in the self have renounced selfish attachments to their actions and cut through doubts with spiritual wisdom. They act in freedom. Arjuna, cut through this doubt in your own heart with the sword of spiritual wisdom. Arise, take up the path of yoga. The end of Discourse 4 Discourse 5 Renounce and Rejoice Arjuna, O Krishna, you have recommended both the path of selfless action and sannyasa, the path of renunciation of action. Tell me definitely which is better. Krishna, both renunciation of action and the selfless performance of action lead to the supreme goal, but the path of action is better than renunciation. Those who have attained perfect renunciation are free from any sense of duality. They are unaffected by likes and dislikes, Arjuna and are free from the bondage of self-will. The immature think that knowledge and action are different, but the wise see them as the same. The person who is established in one path will attain the rewards of both. The goal of knowledge and the goal of service are the same. Those who fail to see this are blind. Perfect renunciation is difficult to attain without performing action, but the wise, following the path of selfless service, quickly reach Brahman. Those who follow the path of service, who have completely purified themselves and conquered their senses and self-will, see the self in all creatures and are untouched by any action they perform. Those who know this truth, whose consciousness is unified, think always, I am not the doer. While seeing or hearing, touching or smelling, eating, moving about or sleeping, breathing or speaking, letting go or holding on, even opening or closing the eyes, they understand that these are only the movements of the senses among sense objects. Those who surrender to Brahman all selfish attachments 
are like the leaf of a lotus floating clean and dry in water. Sin cannot touch them. Renouncing those, their selfish attachments, those who follow the path of service work with body, senses, and mind for the sake of self-purification. Those whose consciousness is unified abandon all attachment to the results of action and attain supreme peace. But those whose desires are fragmented, who are selflessly attached to the results of their work, are bound in everything they do. Those who renounce attachment in all their deeds live content in the city of nine gates, the body as its master. They are not driven to act, nor do they involve others in action. Neither the sense of acting nor actions nor the connection of cause and effect comes from the Lord of this world. These three arise from nature. The Lord does not partake in the good and evil deeds of any person. Judgment is clouded when wisdom is obscured by ignorance. But ignorance is destroyed by knowledge of the self within. The light of this knowledge shines like the sun, revealing the supreme Brahman. Those who cast off sin through this knowledge absorbed in the Lord and established in Him as their one goal and refuge, are not reborn as separate creatures. Those who possess this wisdom have equal regard for all. They see the same self in a spiritual aspirant and an outcast, in an elephant, a cow, and a dog. Such people have mastered life. With even mind they rest in Brahman, who is perfect and is everywhere the same. They are not elated by good fortune or depressed by bad. With mind established in Brahman, they are free from delusion. Not dependent on any external support, they realize the joy of spiritual awareness. With consciousness unified through meditation, they live in abiding joy. Pleasures conceived in the world of the senses have a beginning and an end and give birth to misery, Arjuna. The wise do not look for happiness in them. But those who overcome the impulses of lust and anger which arise in the body are made whole and live in joy. They find their joy, their rest, and their light completely within themselves. United with the Lord, they attain nirvana in Brahman. Healed of their sins and conflicts, working for the good of all beings, the holy sages attain nirvana in Brahman. Free from anger and selfish desire, unified in mind, those who follow the path of yoga and realize the self are established forever in that supreme state. Closing their eyes, steadying their breath, breathing, and focusing their attention on the center of spiritual consciousness, the wise master their senses, mind and intellect through meditation. Self-realization is their only goal. Freed from selfish desire, fear, and anger, they live in freedom always. Knowing me as the friend of all creatures, the Lord of the universe, the end of all offerings and all spiritual disciplines, they attain eternal peace. The end of Discourse 5 Discourse 6 The Practice of Meditation Krishna It is not those who lack energy or refrain from action but those who work without expectation of reward, who attain the goal of meditation. Theirs is true renunciation. Therefore, Arjuna, you should understand that renunciation and the performance of selfless service are the same. Those who cannot renounce attachment to the results of their work are far from the path. For aspirants who want to climb the mountain of spiritual awareness, the path is selfless work. For those who have ascended to yoga, the path is stillness and peace. When you have freed yourself from attachment to the results of work and from desires for the enjoyment of sense objects, you will ascend to the unitive state. Reshape yourself through the power of your will. Never let yourself be degraded by self-will. The will is the only friend of the self, and the will is the only enemy of the self. To those who have conquered themselves the will is a friend, but it is the enemy of those who have not found the self within them. The supreme reality stands revealed in the consciousness of those who have conquered themselves. They live in peace, alike in cold and heat, pleasure and pain, praise and blame. They are completely fulfilled by spiritual wisdom and self-realization. Having conquered their senses, they have climbed to the summit of human consciousness. 
To such people a clod of dirt, a stone, and gold are the same. They are equally disposed to family, enemies, and friends, to those who support them and those who are hostile, to the good and the evil alike. Because they are impartial, they rise to great heights. Those who aspire to the state of yoga should seek the self in inner solitude through meditation. With body and mind controlled, they should constantly practice one-pointedness, free from expectations and attachment to material possessions. Select a clean spot, neither too high nor too low, and seat yourself firmly on a cloth, a deerskin, and kusha grass. Then, once seated, strive to still your thoughts. Make your mind one-pointed in meditation and your heart will be purified. Hold your body, head and neck firmly in a straight line and keep your eyes from wandering. With all fears dissolved in the peace of the self and all actions dedicated to Brahman, controlling the mind and fixing it on me, sit in meditation with me as your only goal. With senses and mind constantly controlled through meditation, united with the self within, an aspirant attains nirvana, the state of abiding joy and peace in me. Arjuna, those who eat too much or eat too little, who sleep too much or sleep too little will not succeed in meditation. But those who are temperate in eating and sleeping, work and recreation, will come to the end of sorrow through meditation. Through constant effort they learn to withdraw the mind from selfish cravings and absorb it in the self. Thus they attain the state of union. When meditation is mastered, the mind is unwavering like the flame of a lamp in a windless place. In the still mind, in the depths of meditation, the self reveals itself. Beholding the self by means of the self, an aspirant knows the joy and peace of complete fulfillment. Having attained that abiding joy beyond the senses, revealed in the stilled mind, they never swerve from the eternal truth. They desire nothing else and cannot be shaken by the heaviest burden of sorrow. The practice of meditation frees one from all affliction. This is the path of yoga. Follow it with determination and sustained enthusiasm. Renouncing wholeheartedly all selfish desires and expectations, use your will to control the senses. Little by little through patience and repeated effort, the mind will become stilled in the self. Wherever the mind wanders, restless and diffuse in its search for satisfaction without, lead it within, train it to rest in the self. Abiding joy comes to those who still the mind freeing themselves from the taint of self-will. With their consciousness unified, they become one with Brahman. The infinite joy of touching Brahman is easily attained by those who are free from the burden of evil and established within themselves. They see the self in every creature and all creation in the self. With consciousness unified through meditation, they see everything with an equal eye. I am ever present to those who have realized me in every creature. Seeing all life as my manifestation, they are never separated from me. They worship me in the hearts of all, and all their actions proceed from me. Wherever they may live, they abide in me. When a person responds to the joys and sorrows of others as if they were his own, he has attained the highest state of spiritual union. Arjuna O Krishna, the stillness of divine union which you describe is beyond my comprehension. How can the mind which is so restless attain lasting peace? Krishna, the mind is restless, turbulent, powerful, violent, trying to control it is like trying to tame the wind. Krishna, it is true that the mind is restless and difficult to control, but it can be conquered, Arjuna, through regular practice and detachment. Those who lack self-control will find it difficult to progress in meditation, but those who are self-controlled, striving earnestly through the right means, will attain the goal. Arjuna Krishna, what happens to one who has faith, but who lacks self-control, and wanders from the path not attaining success in yoga? If he becomes deluded on the spiritual path, will he lose the support of both worlds, like a cloud scattered in the sky? 
Krishna, you can dispel all doubts. Remove this doubt which binds me. Krishna Arjuna, my son, such a person will not be destroyed. No one who does good work will ever come to a bad end, either here or in the world to come. When such people die, they go to other realms where the righteous live. They dwell there for countless years and then are reborn into a home which is pure and prosperous. Or they may be born into a family where meditation is practiced. To be born into such a family is extremely rare. The wisdom they have acquired in previous lives will be reawakened, Arjuna, and they will strive ever even harder for self-realization. Indeed, they will be driven on by the strength of their past disciplines. Even one who in Choirs after the practice of meditation rises above those who simply perform rituals. Through constant effort over many lifetimes a person becomes purified of all selfish desires and attains the supreme goal of life. Meditation is superior to severe asceticism and the path of knowledge. It is also superior to selfless service. May you attain the goal of meditation, Arjuna. Even among those who meditate, that man or woman who worships me with perfect faith, completely absorbed in me, is the most firmly established in yoga. The end of Discourse 6 Discourse 7 Wisdom from Realization Krishna With your mind intent on me, Arjuna, discipline yourself with the practice of yoga. Depend on me completely. Listen and I will dispel all your doubts. You will come to know me fully, and be united with me. I will give you both jnana and vijnana. When both these are realized, there is nothing more you need to know. One person in many thousands may seek perfection, yet of these only a few reach the goal and come to realize me. Earth, water, fire, air, akasha, mind, intellect, and ego, these are the eight divisions of my prakriti, but beyond this I have another higher nature, Arjuna. It supports the whole universe and is the source of life in all beings. In these two aspects of my nature is the womb of all creation. The birth and dissolution of the cosmos itself takes place in me. There is nothing that exists separate from me, Arjuna. The entire universe is suspended from me as my necklace of jewels. Arjuna, I am the taste of pure water and the radiance of the sun and moon. I am the sacred word and the sound heard in air, and the courage of human beings. I am the sweet fragrance in the earth and the radiance of fire. I am the life in every creature and the striving of the spiritual aspirant. My eternal seed, Arjuna, is to be found in every creature. I am the power of discrimination in those who are intelligent and the glory of the noble. In those who are strong I am strength, free from passion and selfish attachment. I am desire itself, if that desire is in harmony with the purpose of life. The states of sattva, rajas and tamas come from me, but I am not in them. These three gunas deceive the world. People fail to look beyond them to me, supreme and imperishable. The three gunas make up my divine maya, difficult to overcome, but they cross over this Maya who take refuge in me. Others are deluded by Maya, performing evil deeds. They have no devotion to me. Having lost all discrimination, they follow the way of their lower nature. Good people come to worship me for different reasons. Some come to the spiritual life because of suffering, some in order to understand life, some come through a desire to achieve life's purpose, and some come who are men and women of wisdom. Unwavering in devotion, always united with me, the man or woman of wisdom surpasses all the others. To them I am the dearest beloved, and they are very dear to me. All those who follow the spiritual path are blessed, but the wise who are always established in union, for whom there is no higher goal than me, may be regarded as my very self. After many births the wise seek refuge in me, seeing me everywhere and in everything. Such great souls are very rare. There are others whose discrimination is misled by many desires. Following their own nature, they worship lower gods, practicing various rites. When a person is devoted to something with complete faith, 
I unify his faith in that. Then when faith is completely unified, one gains the object of devotion. In this way every desire is fulfilled by me. Those whose understanding is small attain only transient satisfaction. Those who worship the gods go to the gods, but my devotees come to me. Through lack of understanding, people believe that I, the unmanifest, have entered into some form. They fail to realize my true nature, which transcends birth and death. If you see through the veil of Maya, the world, deluded, does not know that I am without birth and changeless. I know everything about the past, the present, and the future, Arjuna, but there is no one who knows me completely. Delusion arises from the duality of attraction and aversion, Arjuna. Every creature is deluded by these from birth. But those who have freed themselves from all wrongdoing are firmly established in worship of me. Their actions are pure and they are free from the delusion caused by the pairs of opposites. Those who take refuge in me, striving for liberation from old age and death, come to know Brahman, the self, and the nature of all action. Those who see me ruling the cosmos, who see me in Adibhuta, Adidaiva and the Adiyanjna are conscious of me even at the time of death. The end of Discourse 7 Discourse 8 The Eternal Godhead Arjuna O Krishna, what is Brahman and what is the nature of action? What is the Adhyatma, the Adhibhuta and the Adhidaiva? What is the Adhyanjna? the supreme sacrifice, and how is it to be offered? How are the self-controlled united with you at the time of death? Krishna My highest nature, the imperishable Brahman, gives every creature its existence and lives in every creature as the Adhyatma. My action is creation and the bringing forth of creatures. The Adhibhuta is the perishable body. The Adhidaiva is Purusha, eternal spirit. The Ad Hiyanjna, the supreme sacrifice, is made to me as the Lord within you. Those who remember me at the time of death will come to me. Do not doubt this. Whatever occupies the mind at the time of death determines the destination of the dying. Always they will tend toward that state of being. Therefore remember me at all times and fight on. With your heart and mind intent on me, you will surely come to me. When you make your mind one-pointed through regular practice of meditation, you will find the supreme glory of the Lord. The Lord is the supreme poet, the first cause, the sovereign ruler, subtler than the tiniest particle, the support of all, inconceivable, bright as the sun beyond darkness. Remembering Him in this way at the time of death, through devotion and the power of meditation, with your mind completely stilled and your concentration fixed in the center of spiritual awareness between the eyebrows, you will realize the Supreme Lord. I will tell you briefly of the eternal state all scriptures affirm, which can be entered only by those who are self-controlled and free from selfish passions. Those whose lives are dedicated to Brahman attain this supreme goal. Remembering me at the time of death, Close down the doors of the senses and place the mind in the heart. Then, while absorbed in meditation, focus all energy upward to the head. Repeating in this state the divine name, the syllable Om, that represents the changeless Brahman, you will go forth from the body and attain the supreme goal. I am easily attained by the person who always remembers me and is attached to nothing else. Such a person is a true yogi, Arjuna. Great souls make their lives perfect and discover me. They are freed from mortality and the suffering of the separate existence. Every creature in the universe is subject to rebirth, Arjuna, except the one who is united with me. Those who understand the cosmic laws know that the day of Brahma ends after a thousand yugas and the night of Brahma ends after a thousand yugas. When the day of Brahma dawns, Forms are brought forth from the unmanifest. When the night of Brahma comes, these forms merge in the formless again. This multitude of beings is created and destroyed again and again in the succeeding days and nights of Brahma. 
But beyond this formless state there is another unmanifested reality, which is eternal and is not dissolved when the cosmos is destroyed. Those who realize life's supreme goal know that I am unmanifested and unchanging. Having come home to me, they never return to separate existence. This Supreme Lord, who pervades all existence, the true self of all creatures, may be realized through undivided love. There are two paths, Arjuna, which the soul may follow at the time of death. One leads to rebirth and the other to liberation. The six months of the northern path of the sun, the path of light, of fire, of day, of the bright fortnight, leads knowers of Brahman to the supreme goal. The six months of the southern part of the sun, the path of smoke, of night, of the dark fortnight, leads other souls to the light of the moon and to rebirth. These two paths, the light and the dark, are said to be eternal, leading some to liberation and others to rebirth. Once you have known these two paths, Arjuna, you can never be deluded again. Attain this knowledge through perseverance in yoga. There is merit in studying the scriptures in selfless service, austerity, and giving. But the practice of meditation carries you beyond all these to the supreme abode of the highest Lord. The end of Discourse 8 Discourse 9 The Royal Path Krishna because of your faith, I shall tell you the most profound of secrets. Obtaining both Janana and Vijnana, you will be free from all evil. This royal knowledge, this royal secret is the greatest purifier. Righteous and imperishable, it is a joy to practice and can be directly experienced. But those who have no faith in the supreme law of life do not find me, Arjuna. They return to the world, passing from death to death. I pervade the entire universe in my unmanifested form. All creatures find their existence in me, but I am not limited by them. Behold my divine mystery. These creatures do not really dwell in me, and though I bring them forth and support them, I am not confined within them. They move in me as the winds move in every direction in space. At the end of the eon, these creatures return to unmanifested matter. At the beginning of the next cycle, I send them forth again. Controlling my prakriti, again and again I bring forth these myriad forms and subject them to the laws of prakriti. None of these actions binds me, Arjuna. I am unattached to them, so they do not disturb my nature. Under my watchful eye, the laws of nature take their course. This is the world set in motion. Thus the animate and the inanimate are created. The immature do not look beyond physical appearances to see my true nature as the Lord of all creation. The knowledge of such deluded people is empty, their lives are fraught with disaster and evil, and their work and hopes are all in vain. But truly, seek so but truly great souls seek my divine nature. They worship me with a one-pointed mind, having realized that I am the eternal source of all. Constantly striving, they make firm their resolve and worship me without wavering. Full of devotion, they sing of my divine glory. Others follow the path of Jnana, spiritual wisdom. They see that where there is one, that one is me. Where there are many, all are me. They see my face everywhere. I am the ritual and the sacrifice. I am true medicine and the mantram. I am the offering and the fire which consumes it and the one to whom it is offered. I am the father and mother of this universe and its grandfather too. I am its entire support. I am the sum of all knowledge, the purifier, the syllable Om. I am the sacred scriptures, the Rig, Yajur and Samavedas. I am the goal of life the Lord and support of all, the inner witness, the abode of all. I am the only refuge, the one true friend. I am the beginning, the staying, and the end of creation. I am the womb and the eternal seed. I am heat. I give and withhold the rain. I am immortality and I am death. I am what is and what is not. Those who follow the rituals given in the Vedas, who offer sacrifices and take soma, free themselves from evil and attain the vast heaven of the gods where they enjoy celestial pleasures. When they have enjoyed these fully, their merit is exhausted and they return to this land of death. 
thus observing Vedic rituals, but caught in an endless chain of desires, they come and go. Those who worship me and meditate on me constantly without any other thought, I will provide for all their needs. Those who worship other gods with faith and devotion also worship me, Arjuna, even if they do not observe the usual forms. I am the object of all worship, its enjoyer and lord. But those who fail to realize my true nature must be reborn. Those who worship the devas will go to the realm of the devas. Those who worship their ancestors will be united with them after death. Those who worship phantoms will become phantoms, but my devotees will come to me. Whatever I am offered in devotion with a pure heart, a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, I partake of that love offering. Whatever you do, make it an offering to me, the food you eat, the sacrifices you make, the help you give, even your suffering. In this way you will be freed from the bondage of karma and from its results both pleasant and painful. Then, firm in renunciation and yoga, with your heart free, you will come to me. I look upon all creatures equally. None are less dear to me and none more dear. But those who worship me with love live in me and I come to life in them. Even sinners become holy when they worship me alone with firm resolve. Quickly their souls conform to dharma and they attain to boundless peace. Never forget this, Arjuna. No one who is devoted to me will ever come to harm. All those who take refuge in me, whatever their birth, race, sex or caste, will attain the supreme goal. This realization can be attained even by those whom society scorns. Kings and sages too seek this goal with devotion. Therefore, having been born in this transient and forlorn world, give all your love to me. Fill your mind with me. Love me. Serve me. Worship me always. Seeking me in your heart, you will at last be united with me. The end of Discourse 9 Discourse number 10 Divine Splendor Krishna Listen further, Arjuna, to my supreme teaching, which gives you such joy. Desiring your welfare, O strong-armed warrior, I will tell you more. Neither gods nor sages know my origin, for I am the source from which the gods and sages come. Whoever knows me as the Lord of all creation, without birth or beginning, knows the truth and frees himself from all evil. Discrimination, wisdom, understanding, forgiveness, truth, self-control, and peace of mind, pleasure and pain, birth and death, fear and courage, honor and dishonor, non-violence, charity, equanimity, contentment, and perseverance in spiritual disciplines, all the different qualities found in living creatures have their source in me. The seven great sages and the four ancient ancestors were born from my mind and received my power. From them came all the creatures of this world. Whoever understands my power and the mystery of my manifestations comes without doubt to be united with me. I am the source from which all creatures evolve. The wise remember this and worship me with loving devotion. Their thoughts are all absorbed in me and all their vitality flows to me. Teaching one another, talking about me always, they are happy and fulfilled. To those steadfast in love and devotion I give spiritual wisdom, so that they may come to me. Out of compassion I destroy the darkness of their ignorance. From within them I light the lamp of wisdom and dispel all darkness from their lives. Arjuna, you are Brahman supreme the highest abode, the supreme purifier, the self-luminous, eternal spirit, first among the gods, unborn and infinite. The great sages and seers, Narada, Asita, Devala and Vyasa too, have acclaimed you thus. Now you have declared it to me yourself. Now, O Krishna, I believe that everything you have told me is divine truth. O Lord, neither gods nor demons know your real nature. Indeed, you alone know yourself, O Supreme Spirit. You are the source of being and the master of every creature, God of gods, the Lord of the universe. Tell me all your divine attributes, leaving nothing unsaid. Tell me of the glories with which you fill the cosmos. Krishna, you are a supreme master of yoga. Tell me how I should meditate to gain constant awareness of you. In what things and in what ways should I meditate on you? O Krishna, you who stir up people's hearts, 
Tell me in detail your attributes and your powers. I can never tire of hearing your immortal words. Krishna All right, Arjuna, I will tell you of my divine powers. I will mention only the most glorious, for there is no end to them. I am the true self in the heart of every creature, Arjuna, and the beginning, middle, and end of their existence. Among the shining gods I am Vishnu, of luminaries I am the sun. Among the storm gods I am Marichi, and in the night sky I am the moon. Among scriptures I am the Samaveda, and among the lesser gods I am Indra. Among the senses I am the mind, and in living beings I am consciousness. Among the Rudras I am Shankara. Among the spirits of the natural world I am Kubera, god of wealth, and Pavaka, the purifying fire. Among mountains I am Meru. Among priests I am Brihaspati, and among military leaders I am Skanda. Among bodies of water I am the ocean. Among the great seers I am Brigu, and among words the syllable Om. I am the repetition of the holy name, and among mountains I am the Himalayas. Among trees I am the Ashvata, the sacred fig. Among the Gandharvas, the heavenly musicians, I am Chitrarata. Among divine seers I am Dharada, and among sages I am Kapila. I was born from the nectar of immortality as the primordial horse and as Indra's noble elephant. Among human beings I am the king. Among weapons I am the thunderbolt. I am Kamadhuk, the cow that fulfills all desires. I am Kandarpa, the power of sex, and Vasuki, the king of snakes. I am Ananta, the cosmic serpent, and Varuna, the god of water. I am Aryaman, among the noble ancestors. Among the forces which restrain, I am Yama, the god of death. Among animals, I am the lion. Among birds, the eagle Garuda. I am Pralada, born among the demons, and of all that measures, I am time. Among purifying forces, I am the wind. Among warriors, Rama. Of water, creatures, I am the crocodile, and of rivers, I am the Ganges. I am the beginning, middle, and end of creation. Of all the sciences, I am the science of self-knowledge, and I am logic in those who debate. Among letters, I am A. Among grammatical compounds, I am the Dvandva. I am infinite time and the sustainer whose face is seen everywhere. I am death which overcomes all, and the source of all beings still to be born. I am the feminine qualities, fame, beauty, perfect speech, memory, intelligence, loyalty, and forgiveness. Among the hymns of the Samaveda, I am the Brahat. Among poetic meters, the Gayatri. Among months, I am Margarishra, first of the year. Among seasons, I am spring that brings forth flowers. I am the gambling of the gambler and the radiance of all that shines. I am effort, I am victory, and I am the goodness of the virtues. I am the Vishnis, I am Krishna, and among the Pandavas I am Arjuna. Among sages I am Vyasa, and among poets Ushanas. I am the scepter which meets out punishment, and the art of statesmanship in those who lead. I am the silence of the unknown and the wisdom of the wise. I am the seed that can be found in every creature, Arjuna, for without me nothing can exist, neither animate nor inanimate. But there is no end to my divine attributes, Arjuna. These I have mentioned are only a few. Wherever you find strength or beauty or spiritual power, you may be sure that these have sprung from a spark of my essence. But of what use is it to you to know all this, Arjuna? Just remember that I am and that I support the entire cosmos with only a fragment of my being. The end of Discourse 10 Discourse 11 The Cosmic Vision Arjuna Out of compassion you have taught me the supreme mystery of the self. Through your words my delusion is gone. You have explained the origin and end of every creature. O lotus-eyed one, and told me of your own supreme limitless existence, just as you have described your infinite glory, O Lord, how long, how I long to see it. I want to see you as the supreme ruler of creation. O Lord, master of yoga, if you think me strong enough to behold it, show me your immortal self. Krishna Behold, Arjuna, a million divine forms with an infinite variety of color and shape. 
Behold the gods of the natural world and many more wonders never revealed before. Behold the entire cosmos turning within my body and the other things you desire to see. But these things cannot be seen with your physical eyes. Therefore I give you spiritual vision to perceive my majestic power. Sanjaya Having spoken these words, Krishna, the master of yoga, revealed to Arjuna his most exalted lordly form. He appeared with an infinite number of faces, ornamented by heavenly jewels, displaying unending miracles and the countless weapons of his power. Clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet-smelling with heavenly fragrances, he showed himself as the infinite Lord, the source of all wonders, whose face is everywhere. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that Supreme Spirit. There, within the body of the God of Gods, Arjuna saw all the manifold forms of the universe united as one. Filled with amazement, his hair standing on end in ecstasy, he bowed before the Lord with joined palms and spoke these words. Arjuna, O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the Creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere without beginning, middle or end. You are the Lord of all creation, and the cosmos is your body. You wear a crown and carry a mace and discus. Your radiance is blinding and immeasurable. I see you, who are so difficult to behold, shining like a fiery sun blazing in every direction. You are the supreme, changeless reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle, or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warms the cosmos. O Lord, your presence fills the heavens and the earth and reaches in every direction. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision of your wonderful and terrible form. The gods enter your being, some calling out and greeting you in fear. Great saints sing your glory, praying, May all be well. The multitudes of gods, demigods, and demons are all overwhelmed by the sight of you. O mighty Lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths, arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. O Vishnu, I can see your eyes shining, with open mouth you glitter in an array of colors, and your body touches the sky. I look at you and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning like the fires at the end of time, I forget where I am and I have no place to go. O oh Lord, you are the support of the universe. Have mercy on me. I see all the sons of Dhritarach, Rashtra. I see Bhishma, Drona and Karna. I see your warriors and all the kings who are here to fight. All are rushing into your awful jaws. I see some of them crushed by your teeth. As rivers flow into the ocean, all the warriors of this world are passing into your fiery jaws. All creatures rush to their destruction like moths into a flame. You lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole of creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord of terrible form. I bow before you. Have mercy. I want to know who you are, who... You who existed before all creation, your nature and workings confound me. Krishna, I am time, the destroyer of all. I have come to consume the world. Even without your participation, all the warriors gathered here will die. Therefore arise, Arjuna, conquer your enemies and enjoy the glory of sovereignty. I have already slain all these warriors. You will only be my instrument. Bhishma, Drona, Jahadratha, Karna, and many others are already slain. Kill those whom I have killed. Do not hesitate. Fight in this battle, and you will conquer your enemies. Sanjaya Having heard these words, Arjuna trembled in fear. 
With joined palms he bowed before Krishna and addressed him, stammering, Arjuna, O Krishna, it is right that the world delights and rejoices in your praise, that all the saints and sages bow down to you and all evil flees before you to the far corners of the universe. How could they not worship you, O Lord? You are the eternal spirit who existed before Brahma the Creator and who will never cease to be. Lord of the gods, you are the abode of the universe. Changeless you are what is and what is not and beyond the duality of existence and non-existence. You are the first among the gods, the timeless spirit, the resting place of all beings. You are the knower and the thing which is known. You are the final home. With your infinite form you pervade the cosmos. You are Vayu, god of wind, Yama, god of death, Agni, god of fire, Varuna, god of water. You are the moon and the creator Prajapati and the great grandfather of all creatures. I bow before you and salute you again and again. You are behind me and in front of me. I bow to you on every side. Your power is immeasurable. You pervade everything. You are everything. Sometimes, because we were friends, I rashly said, O Krishna, say friend. Casual, careless remarks. Whatever I may have said lightly, whether we were playing or resting, alone or in company, sitting together or eating, if it was disrespectful, forgive me for it, O Krishna. I did not know the greatness of your nature, unchanging and imperishable. You are the father of the universe, of the animate and the inanimate. You are the object of all worship, the greatest guru. There is none to equal you in the three worlds. Who can match your power? O gracious Lord, I prostrate myself before you and ask for your blessing. As a father forgives his son, or a friend a friend, or a lover his beloved, so should you forgive me? I rejoice in seeing you as you have never been seen before, yet I am filled with fear by this vision of you as the abode of the universe. Please let me see you again as the shining God of gods, though you are the embodiment of all creation. Let me see you again, not with a thousand arms, but with four, carrying the mace and discus and wearing a crown. Krishna Arjuna, through my grace you have been united with me and received this vision of my radiant universal form, without beginning or end, which no one else has ever seen. Not by knowledge of the Vedas, nor sacrifice, nor charity, nor rituals, nor even by severe asceticism has any other mortal seen what you have seen, O heroic Arjuna. Do not be troubled. Do not fear my terrible form. Let your heart be satisfied and your fears dispelled in looking at me as I was before. Sanjaya Having spoken these words, the Lord once again assumed the gentle form of Krishna and consoled his devotee, who had been so afraid. Arjuna, O Krishna, now that I have seen your gentle human form, my mind is again composed and returned to normal. Krishna, it is extremely difficult to obtain the vision you have had. Even the gods long always to see me in this aspect. Neither knowledge of the Vedas, nor austerity, nor charity, nor sacrifice can bring the vision you have seen. But through unfailing devotion, Arjuna, you can know me, see me, and attain union with me. Those who make me the supreme goal of all their work and act without selfish attachment, who devote themselves to me completely and are free from ill will for any creature, enter into me. End of Discourse 11 Discourse 12 the way of love. Arjuna Of those steadfast devotees who love you and those who seek you as the eternal formless reality, who are the most established in yoga? Krishna Those who set their hearts on me and worship me with unfailing devotion and faith are more established in yoga. As for those who seek the transcendental reality, without name, without form, contemplating the unmanifested, beyond the reach of thought and of feeling, with their senses subdued and mind serene, and striving for the good of all beings, they too will verily come unto me. Yet hazardous and slow is the path of the unrevealed, difficult for physical creatures to tread. But they for whom I am the supreme goal, who do all work renouncing self for me and meditate on me with single-hearted devotion, 
These I will swiftly rescue from the fragments cycle of birth and death, for their consciousness has entered into me. Still your mind in me, still your intellect in me, and without doubt you will be united with me forever. If you cannot still your mind in me, learn to do so through the regular practice of meditation. If you lack the will for such self-discipline, engage yourself in my work, for selfless service can lead you at last to complete fulfillment. If you are unable to do even this, surrender yourself to me, disciplining yourself and renouncing the results of all your actions. Better indeed is knowledge than mechanical practice. Better than knowledge is meditation. But better still is surrender of attachment to results, because there follows immediate peace. That one I love who is incapable of ill will, who is friendly and compassionate, living beyond the reach of I and mine and of pleasure and pain, patient, contented, self-controlled, firm in faith, with all their heart and all their mind given to me, with such as these I am in love. Not agitating the world or by it agitated, they stand above the sway of elation, competition and fear. That one is my beloved. They are detached, pure, efficient, impartial, never anxious, selfless in all their undertakings. They are my devotees, very dear to me. That one is dear to me who runs not from the pleasant or away from the painful, grieves not, lusts not, but lets things come and go as they happen. That devotee who looks upon friend and foe with equal regard, who is not buoyed up by praise nor cast down by blame, alike in heat and cold, pleasure and pain, free from selfless attachments, the same in honor and dishonor, quiet, ever full, in harmony everywhere, firm in faith, such a one is dear to me. Those who meditate upon this immortal dharma, as I have declared it, full of faith and seeking me as life's supreme goal, are truly my devotees, and my love for them is very great. The end of Discourse 12 Discourse number 13, The Field and the Knower Krishna The body is called a field, Arjuna. The one who knows it is called the knower of the field. This is the knowledge of those who know. I am the knower of the field in everyone, Arjuna. Knowledge of the field and its knower is true knowledge. Listen and I will explain the nature of the field and how change takes place within it. I will also describe the knower of the field and his power. These truths have been sung by great sages in a variety of ways and expounded in precise arguments concerning Brahman. The field, Arjuna, is made up of the following, the five areas of sense perception, the five elements, the five sense organs, and the five organs of action, the three components of the mind, manas, buddhi, and ahamkara, and the undifferentiated energy from which all these evolved. In this field arise desire and aversion, pleasure and pain, the body, intelligence, and will. Those who know truly are free from pride and deceit. They are gentle, forgiving, upright and pure, devoted to their spiritual teacher, filled with inner strength and self-controlled. Detached from sense objects and self-will, they have learned the painful lesson of separate birth and suffering, old age, disease and death. Free from selfish attachment, they do not get compulsively entangled even in home and family. They are even-minded through good fortune and bad. Their devotion to me is undivided. Enjoying solitude and not following the crowd, they seek only me. This is true knowledge, to seek the self as the true end of wisdom always. To seek anything else is ignorance. I will tell you of the wisdom that leads to immortality, the beginningless Brahman, which can be called neither being nor non-being. It dwells in all, in every hand and foot and head, in every mouth and eye and ear in the universe. Without senses itself, it shines through the functioning of the senses. Completely independent, it supports all things. Beyond the gunas, it enjoys their play. It is both near and far, both within and without every creature. It moves, 
and is unmoving. In its subtlety it is beyond comprehension. It is indivisible, yet appears divided in separate creatures. Know it to be the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer. Dwelling in every heart, it is beyond darkness. It is called the light of light, the object and goal of knowledge, and knowledge itself. I have revealed to you the nature of the field and the meaning and object of true knowledge. Those who are devoted to me, knowing these things, are united with me. Know that Prakriti and Purusha are both without beginning, and that from Prakriti come the gunas and all the changes. Prakriti is the agent, cause and effect of every action, but it is Purusha that seems to experience pleasure and pain. Purusha, resting in Prakriti, witnesses the play of the gunas born of Prakriti. But attachment to the gunas leads a person to be born for good or evil. Within the body, the supreme Purusha is called the witness, approver, supporter, enjoyer, the supreme lord the highest self. Whoever realizes the true nature of Purusha, Prakriti and the Gunas, whatever path he or she may follow, is not born separate again. Some realize the self within them through the practice of meditation, some by the path of wisdom, and others by selfless service. Others may not know these paths, but hearing and following the instructions of an illumined teacher, they too go beyond death. Whatever exists, Arjuna, animate or inanimate, is born through the union of the field and its knower. They alone see truly who see the Lord, the same in every creature, who see the deathless in the hearts of all that die. Seeing the same Lord everywhere, they do not harm themselves or others. Thus they attain the supreme goal. They alone see truly who see that all actions are performed by Prakriti, while the self remains unmoved. When they see the variety of creation rooted in that unity and growing out of it, they attain fulfillment in Brahman. This supreme self is without a beginning, undifferentiated, deathless. Though it dwells in the body, Arjuna, it neither acts nor is touched by action. As Akasha pervades the cosmos but remains unstained, the self can never be tainted, though it dwells in every creature. As the sun lights up the world, the self dwelling in the field is the source of all light in the field. Those who with the eye of wisdom distinguish the field from its knower and the way to freedom from the bondage of Prakriti attain the supreme goal. The end of Discourse 13 Discourse 14 The Forces of Evolution Krishna Let me tell you more about the wisdom that transcends all knowledge through which the saints and sages attained perfection. Those who rely on this wisdom will be united with me. For them there is neither rebirth nor fear of death. My womb is prakriti, in that I place the seed. Thus all created things are born. Everything born, Arjuna, comes from the womb of prakriti, and I am the seed-giving father. It is the three gunas born of prakriti, sattva, rajas, and tamas, that bind the immortal self to the body. Sattva, pure, luminous, and free from sorrow, binds us with attachment to happiness and wisdom. Rajas is passion, arising from selfish desire and attachment. These bind the self with compulsive action. Tamas, born of ignorance, deludes all creatures through heedlessness, indolence, and sleep. Sattva binds us to happiness. Rajas binds us to action. Tamas, distorting our understanding, binds us to delusion. Sattva predominates when rajas and tamas are transformed. Rajas prevails when sattva is weak and tamas overcome. Tamas prevails when rajas and sattva are dormant. When sattva predominates, the light of wisdom shines through every gate of the body. When rajas predominates, A person runs about pursuing selfish and greedy ends, driven by restlessness and desire. When tamas is dominant, a person lives in darkness, slothful, confused, and easily infatuated. Those dying in the state of sattva attain the pure worlds of the wise. Those dying in rajas are reborn among people driven by work. 
but those who die in tamas are conceived in the wombs of the ignorant. The fruit of good deeds is pure and sattvic. The fruit of rajas is suffering. The fruit of tamas is ignorance and insensitivity. From sattva comes understanding, from rajas greed, but the outcome of tamas is confusion, infatuation and ignorance. Those who live in sattva go upward, those in raja remain where they are, but those immersed in tamas sink downward. The wise see clearly that all action is the work of the gunas. Knowing that which is above the gunas, they enter into union with me. Going beyond the three gunas which form the body, they leave behind the cycle of birth and death, decrepitude and sorrow, and attain to immortality. Arjuna What are the characteristics of those who have gone beyond the gunas, O Lord? How do they act? How have they passed beyond the guna's hold? Krishna They are unmoved by the harmony of sattva, the activity of rajas, or the delusion of tamas. They feel no aversion when these forces are active, nor do they crave for them when these forces subside. They remain impartial, undisturbed by the actions of the gunas. Knowing that it is the gunas which act, they abide within themselves and do not vacillate. Established within themselves, they are equal in pleasure and pain, praise and blame, kindness and unkindness. Clay, a rock and gold are the same to them. Alike in honor and dishonor, alike to friend and foe, they have given up every selfish pursuit. Such are those who have gone beyond the gunas. By serving me with steadfast love, a man or woman goes beyond the gunas. Such a one is fit for union with Brahman. For I am the support of Brahman, the eternal, the unchanging, the deathless, the everlasting Dharma, the source of all joy. The end of Discourse 14 Discourse 15 The Supreme Self <coughs> Krishna Sages speak of the immutable Ashvata tree with its taproot above and its branches below. On this tree grow the scriptures. Seeing their source, one knows their essence. Nourished by the gunas, the limbs of this tree spread above and below. Sense objects grow on the limbs as buds. The roots hanging down bind us to action in this world. The true form of this tree, its essence beginning and end, is not perceived on this earth. Cut down this strong-rooted tree with the sharp axe of detachment, then find the path which does not come back again. Seek, seek that, the first cause, from which the universe came long ago. Not deluded by pride, free from selfish attachment and selfish desire, beyond the duality of pleasure and pain, ever aware of the self, the wise go forward to that eternal goal. Neither the sun nor the moon nor fire can add to that light. This is my supreme abode, and those who enter there do not return to separate existence. An eternal part of me enters into the world, assuming the powers of action and perception and a mind made of prakriti. When the divine self enters and leaves a body, it takes these along as the wind carries a scent from place to place. Using the mind, ears, eyes, nose and the senses of taste and touch, the self enjoys sense objects. The deluded do not see the self when it leaves the body or when it dwells within it. They do not see the self enjoying sense objects or acting through the gunas, but they have the eye of wis- but they who have the eye of wisdom see. Those who strive resolutely on the path of yoga see the self within. The thoughtless who strive imperfectly do not. The brightness of the sun which lights up the world, the brightness of the moon and of fire, these are my glory. With a drop of my energy I enter the earth and support all creatures. Through the moon, the vessel of life-giving fluid, I nourish all plants. I enter breathing creatures and dwell within as the life-giving breath. I am the fire in the stomach which digests all food. Entering into every heart, I give the power to remember and understand. It is I again who take the, that power away. All the scriptures lead to me. I am their author and their wisdom. In this world there are two orders of being the perishable separate creature and the changeless spirit. 
But beyond these there is another, the Supreme Self, the Eternal Lord, who enters into the entire cosmos and supports it from within. I am that Supreme Self, praised by the scriptures as beyond the changing and the changeless. Those who see in me that Supreme Self see truly. They have found the source of all wisdom, Arjuna, and they worship me with all their heart. I have shared this profound truth with you, Arjuna. Those who understand it will attain wisdom. They will have done that which has to be done. The end of Discourse 15 Discourse 16 Two Paths Krishna Be fearless and pure. Never waver in your determination or your dedication to the spiritual life. Give freely. Be self-controlled sincere, truthful, loving, and full of the desire to serve. Realize the truth of the scriptures. Learn to be detached and to take joy in renunciation. Do not get angry or harm any living creature, but be compassionate and gentle. Show good will to all. Cultivate vigor, patience, will, purity. Avoid malice and pride. Then, Arjuna, you will achieve your divine destiny. Other qualities, Arjuna, make a person more and more inhuman. Hypocrisy, arrogance, conceit, anger, cruelty, ignorance. The divine qualities lead to freedom, the demonic to bondage. But do not grieve, Arjuna. You are born with divine attributes. Some people have divine tendencies, others demonic. I have described the divine at length, Arjuna. Now listen while I describe the demonic. The demonic do things they should avoid and avoid the things they should do. They have no sense of uprightness, purity or truth. There is no God, they say, no truth, no spiritual law, no moral order. The basis of life is sex. What else can it be? Holding such distorted views, possessing scant discrimination, they become enemies of the world, causing suffering and destruction. Hypocritical, proud and arrogant, living in delusion and clinging to deluded ideas, insatiable in their desires, they pursue their unclean ends. Although burdened with fears that end only with death, they still maintain with complete assurance gratification of lust is the highest that life can offer. Bound on all sides by scheming and anxiety, driven by anger and greed, They amass, by any means they can, a hoard of money for the satisfaction of their cravings. I got this today, they say. Tomorrow I shall get that. This wealth is mine, and that will be mine too. I have destroyed my enemies. I shall destroy others too. Am I not like God? I enjoy what I want. I am successful. I am powerful. I am happy. I am rich and well-born. Who is equal to me? I will perform sacrifices and give gifts and rejoice in my own generosity. This is how they go on, deluded by ignorance. Bound by their greed and entangled in a web of delusion, whirled about by a fragmented mind, they fall into a dark hell. Self-important, obstinate, swept away by the pride of wealth, they ostentatiously perform sacrifices without any regard for their purpose egotistical, violent, arrogant, lustful, angry, envious of everyone. They abuse my presence within their own bodies and in the bodies of others. Life after life I cast those who are malicious, hateful, cruel, and degraded into the wombs of those with similar demonic natures. Birth after birth they find themselves with demonic tendencies. Degraded in this way, Arjuna, they fail to reach me and fall lower still. There are three gates to this self-destructive hell, lust, anger, and greed. Renounce these three. Those who escape from these three gates of darkness, Arjuna, seek what is best and attain life's supreme goal. Others disregard the teaching of the scriptures. Driven by selfish desire, they miss the goal of life, miss even happiness and success. Therefore, let the scriptures be your guide in what to do and what not to do. Understand their teachings, then act in accordance with them. The End of Discourse 16 Discourse 17 The Power of Faith Arjuna O Krishna, what is the state of those who disregard the scriptures but still worship with faith? Do they act from sattva, rajas or tamas? 
Krishna. Every creature is born with faith of some kind, either sattvic, rajasic, or tamasic. Listen, and I will describe each to you. Our faith conforms to our nature, Arjuna. Human nature is made of faith. A person is what his shrada is. Those who are sattvic worship the forms of God. Those who are rajasic worship power and wealth. Those who are tamasic worship spirits and ghosts. Some invent harsh penances. Motivated by hypocrisy and egotism, they torture their innocent bodies and me who dwells within. Blinded by their strength and passion, they act and think like demons. The three kinds of faith express themselves in the habits of those who hold them, in the food they like, the work they do, the disciplines they practice, the gifts they give. Listen, and I will describe their different ways. Sattvic people enjoy food that is mild, tasty, substantial, agreeable and nourishing, food that promotes health, strength, cheerfulness and longevity. Rajasic people like food that is salty or bitter, hot, sour or spicy, food that promotes pain, discomfort and disease. Tamasic people like overcooked, stale, leftover and impure food, food that has lost its taste and nutritional value. The sattvic perform sacrifices with their entire mind fixed on the purpose of the sacrifice. Without thought of reward they follow the teachings of the scriptures. The rajasic perform sacrifices for the sake of show and the good it will bring them. The tamasic perform sacrifices ignoring both the letter and the spirit. They omit the proper prayers, the proper offerings, the proper food and the proper faith. To offer service to the gods, to the good, to the wise, and to your spiritual teacher, purity, honesty, continence, and non-violence, these are the disciplines of the body. To offer soothing words, to speak truly, kindly, and helpfully, and to study the scriptures, these are the disciplines of speech. Calmness, gentleness, silence, self-restraint, and purity, these are the disciplines of the mind. When these three levels of self-discipline are practiced without attachment to the results, but in a spirit of great faith, the sages call this practice sattvic. Disciplines practiced in order to gain respect, honor, or admiration are rajasic. They are undependable and transitory in their effects. Disciplines practiced to gain power over others or in the confused belief that to torture oneself is spiritual are tamasic. Giving simply because it is right to give, without thought of return, at a proper time and proper circumstances and to a worthy person, is sattvic giving. Giving with regrets or in the expectation of receiving some favor or of getting something in return is rajasic. Giving at an inappropriate time, in inappropriate circumstances, and to an unworthy person, without affection or respect, is tamasic. Om Tat Sat. These three words represent Brahman, from which come priests and scriptures and sacrifice. Those who follow the Vedas therefore always repeat the word Om when offering sacrifices, performing spiritual disciplines or giving gifts. Those seeking liberation and not any personal benefit add the word Tat when performing these acts of worship, discipline and charity. Sat means that which is. It also indicates goodness. Therefore it is used to describe a worthy deed. To be steadfast in self-sacrifice, self-discipline and giving is sat. To act in accordance with these three is sat as well. But to engage in sacrifice, self-discipline and giving without good faith is asat, without worth or goodness, either in this life or in the next. The end of Discourse 18. And the last discourse, discourse, excuse me, that was the end of Discourse 17. This is the last discourse, Discourse 18, entitled Freedom and Renunciation. Arjuna, O Krishna, destroyer of evil, please explain to me sannyasa and tiaga and how one kind of renunciation differs from another. Krishna. To refrain from selfish acts is one kind of renunciation called sannyasa. To renounce the fruit of action is another called tiyaga. 
Among the wise, some say that all action should be renounced as evil. Others say that certain kinds of action, self-sacrifice, giving and self-discipline, should be continued. Listen, Arjuna, that will explain three kinds of tiaga and my conclusions concerning them. Self-sacrifice, giving and self-discipline should not be renounced, for they purify the thoughtful. Yet even these Arjuna should be performed without desire for selfish rewards. This is essential. To renounce one's responsibilities is not fitting. The wise call such deluded renunciation tamasic. To avoid action from fear of difficulty or physical discomfort is rajasic. There is no reward in such renunciation. But to fulfill your responsibilities, knowing that they are obligatory, while at the same time desiring nothing for yourself, this is sattvic renunciation. Those endowed with sattvic Those endowed with sattva clearly understand the meaning of renunciation and do not waver. They are not intimidated by unpleasant work, nor do they seek a job because it is pleasant. As long as one has a body, one cannot renounce action altogether. True renunciation is given up is giving up all desire for personal reward. Those who are attached to personal reward will reap the consequences of their actions, some pleasant, some unpleasant, some mixed. But those who renounce every desire for personal reward go beyond the reach of karma. Listen, Arjuna, and I will explain the five elements necessary for the accomplishment of every action as taught by the wisdom of Sankhya. The body, the means, the ego, the performance of the act, and the divine will. These are the five factors in all actions, right or wrong, in thought, word, or deed. Those who do not understand this think of themselves as separate agents. With their crude intellects they fail to see the truth. The person who is free from ego, who has attained purity of heart, though he slays these people, he does not slay and is not bound by his action. Knowledge, the thing to be known and the knower, these three promote action. The means, the act itself and the doer, these three are the totality of action. Knowledge, action and the doer can be described according to the gunas. Listen and I will explain their distinctions to you. Sattvic knowledge sees the one indestructible being in all beings, the unity underlying the multiplicity of creation. Rajasic knowledge sees all things and creatures as separate and distinct. Tamasic knowledge, lacking any sense of perspective, sees one small part and mistakes it for the whole. Work performed to fulfill one's obligations without thought of personal reward or of whether the job is pleasant or unpleasant is sattvic. Work prompted by selfish desire or self-will full of stress is rajasic. Work that is undertaken blindly, without any consideration of consequences, waste, injury to others, or one's own capacities, is tamasic. Sattvic workers are free from egotism and selfish attachments, full of enthusiasm and fortitude in success and failure alike. Rajasic workers have strong personal desires and crave rewards for their actions, covetous, impure and destructive, they are easily swept away by fortune, good or bad. Tamasic workers are undisciplined, vulgar, stubborn, deceitful, dishonest and lazy. They are easily depressed and prone to procrastination. Listen, Arjuna, as I describe the three types of understanding and will. To know when to act and when to refrain from action, what is right action and what is wrong, what brings security and what insecurity, what brings freedom and what bondage, these are the signs of a sattvic intellect. The rajasic intellect confuses right and wrong actions and cannot distinguish what is to be done from what should not be done. The tamasic intellect is shrouded in darkness, utterly reversing right and wrong wherever it turns. The sattvic will, developed through meditation, keeps prana, mind and senses in vital harmony. The rajasic will, conditioned by selfish desire, pursues wealth, pleasure and respectability. 
The tamasic will shows itself in obstinate ignorance, sloth, fear, grief, depression, and conceit. Now listen, Arjuna. There are also three kinds of happiness. By sustained effort one comes to the end of sorrow. That which seems like poison at first but tastes like nectar in the end, this is the joy of sattva, born of a mind at peace with itself. Pleasure from the senses seems like nectar at first, but it is bitter as poison in the end. This is the kind of happiness that comes to the rajasic. Those who are tamasic draw their pleasures from sleep, indolence and intoxication. Both in the beginning and in the end, this happiness is a delusion. No creature, whether born on earth or among the gods in heaven, is free from the conditioning of the three gunas. The different responsibilities found in the social order, distinguishing Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya and Shudra, have their roots in this conditioning. The responsibilities to which Brahmins are born based on their nature are self-control, tranquility, purity of heart, patience, humility, learning, austerity, wisdom and faith. The qualities of Kshatriya based on their nature are courage, strength, fortitude, dexterity, generosity, leadership and the firm resolve never to retreat from battle. The occupations suitable for a Vaishya are agriculture, dairying and trade. The proper work of a Shudra is service. By devotion to one's own particular duty, everyone can attain perfection. Let me tell you how. By performing one's own work, one worships the Creator who dwells in every creature. Such worship brings that person to fulfillment. It is better to perform one's own duties imperfectly than to master the duties of another. By fulfilling the obligations he is born with, a person never comes to grief. No one should abandon duties because he sees defects in them. Every action, every activity is surrounded by defects as a fire is surrounded by smoke. One who is free from selfish attachments, who has mastered himself and his passions, attains the supreme perfection of freedom from action. Listen, and I shall explain now, Arjuna, how one who has attained perfection also attains Brahman, the supreme consummation of wisdom. Unerring in discrimination, sovereign of the senses and passions, free from the clamor of likes and dislikes, such a one leads a simple, self-reliant life based on meditation, controlling speech, body and mind. Free from self-will, aggressiveness, arrogance, anger and the lust to possess people or things, they are at peace with themselves and others and enter into the unitive state. United with Brahman, ever joyful, beyond the reach of desire and sorrow, they have equal regard for every living creature and attain supreme devotion to me. By loving me they come to know me truly, then they know my glory and enter into my boundless being. All their acts are performed in my service, and through my grace they win eternal life. Make every act an offering to me. Regard me as your only protector. Relying on interior discipline, meditate on me always. Remembering me, you shall overcome all difficulties through my grace. But if you will not heed me in your self-will, nothing will avail you. If you egotistically say, I will not fight this battle, your resolve will be useless, your own nature will drive you into it. Your own karma, born of your own nature, will drive you to do even that which you do not wish to do because of your delusion. The Lord dwells in the hearts of all creatures and whirls them round upon the wheel of Maya. Run to him for refuge with all your strength and peace profound will be yours through his grace. I give you these precious words of wisdom. Reflect on them and then do as you choose. These are the last words I shall speak to you, dear one, for your spiritual fulfillment. You are very dear to me. Be aware of me always, adore me, make every act an offering to me, and you shall come to me, this I promise, for you are dear to me. Abandon all supports and look to me for protection. I shall purify you from the sins of the past. Do not grieve. Do not share this wisdom with anyone who lacks in devotion or self-control, lacks the desire to learn or scoffs at me. 
Those who teach this supreme mystery of the Gita to all who love me perform the greatest act of love. They will come to me without doubt. No one can render me more devoted service. No one on earth can be more dear to me. Those who meditate on these holy words worship me with wisdom and devotion. Even those who listen to them with faith, free from doubts, will find a happier world where good people dwell. Have you listened with attention? Are you now free from your doubts and confusion? Arjuna, you have dispelled my doubts and delusions, and I understand through your grace. My faith is firm now, and I will do your will. Sanjaya, this is the dialogue I heard between Krishna, the son of Vasudeva, and Arjuna, the great-hearted son of Pritha. The wonder of it makes my hair stand on end. Through Vyasa's grace I have heard the supreme secret of spiritual union directly from the Lord of Yoga, Krishna himself. Whenever I remember these wonderful holy words between Krishna and Arjuna, I am filled with joy. And when I remember the breathtaking form of Krishna, I am filled with wonder and my joy overflows. Wherever the divine Krishna and the mighty Arjuna are, there will be prosperity, victory, happiness and sound judgment. Of this I am sure. The end of the reading of the Bhagavad Gita and the end of this entire text then, entitled The Bhagavad Gita and the West, from the collected works of Rudolf Steiner, uh, two lecture cycles 142 and 146 together. <laughs>